1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20-year-old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's, it's just it's shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Jane Winehouse and her husband, Michael, are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator, because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island... <laughs> When Korean War veteran Her Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade Don't to his front hands, door. I'll shake your hands. I'll salute you, though. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Glad to hear about some progress. Miguel, thank you. Thousands of families across the country are left without homes after violent storms sparked a string of tornadoes across the southeast. That severe weather began Easter Sunday in the deep south and moved up the east coast, killing over 30 people. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look. We got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. A string of deadly tornadoes tearing a path from the deep south. Oh my through the East Coast. It's a war zone, looks like. The battle with Mother Nature leaving more than 20 dead, dozens more wounded. Storms swallowing entire communities. Easter Sunday prayers quickly shifting to pleas for survival. Lord, I pray everybody okay. This is the Lord Jesus. In Charlotte, teams worked for 45 minutes. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. You know? She was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. Digging a resident from the debris. In Virginia, a stranded driver is pulled from the rising floodwaters. The wreckage stretches across multiple states. Homes and businesses in ruins, vehicles tossed on their sides, power lines ripped down. More than a million left without electricity across the strike zone after reports of more than 40 twisters. Survivors now struggling to piece together what they can and still protect themselves from COVID-19. I mean, we all teaming up together to help each other. It is tough to social distance in a shelter. But those who rush to safety are doing what they can, now dealing with two threats, the virus and the violent weather. Jay Gray, NBC News. Let's get the latest on that weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning. Just a kind of devastating situation that continues to really unfold across the south and southeast. The storm system pushing offshore, but in that two-day period starting on Easter Sunday, we saw over 700 reports of wind and tornado damages. So today, the threat, it still continues for southern Georgia to northern Florida as well. It is a small area, but Jacksonville, you're on our radar this afternoon with some damaging winds and a few isolated tornadoes. Also behind that potent, strong cold front, is a lot cooler air. Temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. So our temperatures cooling off. You can see for central Texas back in the mid-50s, even for the northeast, a few winds still picking up for northern New England, but a pretty quiet day finally. So we're going to leave this severe weather behind, but man, we're still talking about snow for the southern plains. Gosh, severe weather now into snow. You know, just adding to the craziness that is these times. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Well, the Sesame Street friends are coming together virtually to bring some families something very special. Elmo knows it can be hard to be away from your friends. So Elmo's mommy and daddy are helping Elmo set up a video play date. Yeah. 
Well, the nonprofit behind Sesame Street put together a simulcast as part of their initiative to support families during the COVID-19 crisis. And a few stars liked the idea. They decided to tag along. Elmo's Playdate airs tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern on PBS Kids. Hi everyone, I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses, and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe. Jennifer Lopez, they're sending a warm message of gratitude to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. While there is no official cure or vaccine for the coronavirus, medical teams around the world are working to develop treatments to help those already infected. Some patients are participating in clinical drug trials that experts say are showing some promise. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. On the ICU floor at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, a drug trial for a potential lifesaver. This is um, remdesivir versus placebo for one of our patients. Doctors prescribing remdesivir delivered in IV form to patients sick with COVID-19. The Emory trial is one of the largest in the world. Infectious disease expert Dr. Anish Mehta is the chief investigator. What we're searching for are medications that will help people get over the infection more rapidly and allow their immune systems to really kick in and knock the virus out of their body. Remdesivir was originally tested to treat Ebola patients, but early results suggest it could be far more effective in treating COVID-19. It's a double-blind NIH study, meaning patients and doctors don't know who gets a placebo. What we have seen is lots of patients recovering. Whether that's because they're getting a study drug or a placebo, we don't know. In Washington state, ICU doctors did give remdesivir to Chris Kane as he struggled to breathe. I mean, within 48 hours, I was feeling a lot better. We're just so thankful. And then I, yeah, to get him on this, to get him on this <laughs> drug so quickly was just an absolute godsend. Now, researchers could be just two to three weeks away from a major breakthrough, determining whether remdesivir should be the go-to treatment in hospitals. Meanwhile, doctors are increasingly cautious about an unproven treatment touted by President Trump, hydroxychloroquine combined with an antibiotic. Researchers in Brazil canceled a small chloroquine study after some patients developed cardiac arrhythmias and even died. But back at Emory, some COVID patients are insisting on getting what they heard President Trump talk up. And they say, I don't want an experimental drug. I want the drug on the news. If approved, drug maker Gilead says it could have enough remdesivir to treat 140,000 people immediately and half a million by October. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Tom? Thank you. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns grow for voters' health. Obama said in a statement that Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed for $20,000 to help the restaurant maintain its staff, but a veteran bought it for $40,000. Ultra's World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making debut. It became the highest-grossing digital title in movie history, scoring the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an online demand release. Stocks were down on Monday, but today kicks off major earnings season with a few of the bigs, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Johnson & Johnson, reporting in the age of coronavirus. Here with a preview and some good news on the hiring front is CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi, uh, Juliana, good morning. Good morning. Yes, so U.S. stock futures point to a stronger day of trade this morning after a weaker day yesterday. Of course, this follows a very strong week last week where we saw stocks rebound very strongly. Uh, J.P. Morgan kicks it off in the banking space with Wells Fargo today, Johnson & Johnson in the healthcare space. And overall, investors are bracing for a weak earnings season. Oh, putting it all together, analysts expect earnings to have declined 10% year-on-year year in the first quarter as the pandemic takes hold. Uh, 
we have had some encouraging comments on the virus front, and perhaps that's boosting sentiment as well with New York Governor uh, Cuomo saying it appears the worst is over if we continue to be smart going forward. And on the hiring front, you mentioned one company is in focus hiring 75,000 more workers on top of the 100,000 they've already hired last month. That is Amazon. They're experiencing an increase in demand. And as a result, they're looking to hire more warehouse workers, more delivery workers. So hopefully they can absorb some of those workers who've been not laid off in other parts of the economy. Back to you. A lot of people needing a job right around now. Juliana, thank you. Right, everyone, we continue to try to flatten the curve, and this is actually some great data that we're going to show you region by region. This is a down tick compared to last Sunday and the Sunday before, where we're finally at a two to three percent across the north and south. So, we continue to really need to be dealing with it for the next few days. Okay. All right, Janessa, thank you. Most of us took it for granted and now it is in short supply. Of course, we are talking about toilet paper. And Nelson Garcia from Denver's KUSA has the story on one Colorado artist commemorating the item left on so many shopping lists. Lately, I've been doing a lot of foliage paintings. The author Oscar Wilde once said, quote, life imitates art. This is a very, very close friend and fellow painter. Far more than art imitates life. That one is a, a blackberry bramble with the berries partway through the ripening process. Capturing the world's essence through the eyes of artist Robin Cole. You have a, an interesting moment with a wild animal, you know, something like that. Uh, those moments really, really stand out to me and that sort of magical realism that happens is something I'm, I'm really interested in representing in my creative work. But throughout her career in color. I've noticed that all of my painting has become a little less hard-edged, a little less over-informative, and a little more natural and expressive and brushy. Cole never painted anything like this. This ridiculous substance has achieved a, a pretty divine place in our society for this moment in time, such that it's totally unattainable. She calls it art in the time of corona. It seems like this would make a lot of people happy and smile, maybe if they hang it above their toilet in their bathroom. So. A tribute to that elusive item that left shoppers empty-handed, staring at empty shelves. Which is why I decided to paint it with this, you know, bathed in holy light type of environment, which is something I invented a little bit with the setup I had. I was just painting a roll that I had in my bathroom. That beautiful Renaissance rust gold brown that you see in the background is, is really actually a visual interpretation of particle board. <laughs> Out of all her work... This situation in which we find ourselves, I think everybody's going through their own process of trying to grapple with the bizarre new reality in so many ways. Cole says this one is well received. I've had a number of inquiries actually, uh, so many that I'm, I'm thinking of maybe doing a limited edition run of prints, which is not something I do very often with my pieces. Art inspired by life. I would prefer not to be remembered <laughs> for summing up the coronavirus with a toilet paper painting. Giving people something Cole believes. I would just throw out there that a quarantine is a great time to learn to paint. Everyone seems to need. People really like looking at beautiful things. You know, it's there's something very pleasing about that. And they just get a laugh out of it, which was my ultimate goal. We hope your Tuesday is on a roll. It I'm is. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Two ply masterpiece. I love it. Thanks for watching early today. I am Philip Mena along for the Corey Coffin here. We leave you with this neighborhood performance. It is an Ecuadorian firefighter bringing a little joy to families in quarantine, climbing up his ladder to serenade them with his trumpet. Have a great day. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international 
international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Coronavirus cases have now topped 2 million worldwide as testing ramps up, but optimism is also growing as social distancing is having an impact on flattening the curve. Governor Cuomo forms a seven-state joint task force to look at reopening the economies, but President Trump claims it's really his call to make. We'll go behind the decision-making impacting your lives. And we're just now getting a real assessment of the damage caused by some wicked storms that spread from the deep south to the northeast. It is Tuesday, April 14th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. Governors are coming together to discuss when and how to reopen their states. But during this pandemic, during a pandemic pre press briefing yesterday, President Trump says he has total authority over them. Here's what you need to know at this hour. It has been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today, the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000 as the number of confirmed cases creeps even higher towards 600,000. In New York City, they're in such dire need of medical supplies that officials are now getting creative. According to the Wall Street Journal, staffers with the mayor's office reached out to the New York Mets to get rain ponchos from them. Meantime, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. Company also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. A new change to Ticketmaster policies has created outrage with consumers. The company is no longer offering refunds on postponed or rescheduled shows. The platform is now only giving refunds for canceled events. John Krasinski surprises healthcare workers in Boston on his latest episode of the show, Some Good News. He spoke to staff at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center with the help from the legendary Big Poppy, David Ortiz. The Red Sox donated four tickets for life to employees. A group of New Yorkers are suing Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, and Uber Eats, accusing them of price gouging during the pandemic. The suit claims that these services jacked up the prices of orders, imposing fees of 10 to 40 percent. The accusers are seeking class action status. Companies have declined to respond. And Burger King is putting students to the test. The fast food chain is offering free Whoppers if students can answer a few math problems correctly. The offer is available through their app. College students are trying to recover their tuition money as well. Students at Drexel University and the University of Miami have filed class action lawsuits claiming they've paid for services they're no longer using. The universities have declined to comment. Students at NYU have also started a petition to get a partial reimbursement. And the state of Florida has deemed WWE SmackDown an essential business. Governor Ron DeSantis has given the WWE the green light to resume wrestling matches on live TV starting next week. Those events will run without fans. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. What to expect is anyone's guess, though, after last night's brief devolved into a fiery clash with the press. NBC's Alice Barr has more. President Trump on offense, responding to criticism. He didn't act quickly enough to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Everything we did was right. Reporting from the New York Times and other outlets documents repeated early warnings in January and February inside the Trump administration, weeks before the president finally called on Americans to stop the spread in mid-March. In response, he played a campaign-style video from the briefing room, attacking the media, touting compliments from governors, and again highlighting his late January travel ban from China. So I issued travel restrictions on that date, even though nobody died, and I got brutalized over it by the press. That ban bought the country time to prepare. The president pressed on how his administration used it. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. You? A lot. Top health official Dr. Anthony Fauci also clarifying his comments that earlier action could have saved lives, saying President Trump listened to his advice. The first and only time that I went in and said we should do mitigation strongly, the response was yes, we'll do it. 
After retweeting a comment with the hashtag Fire Fauci, President Trump saying they work well together. The president also saying he hopes to reopen the country ahead of schedule. He's been eyeing a May 1st target date, insisting it's his decision to make, though the Constitution leaves it to the states. The president of the United States calls the shots. The head of the Centers for Disease Control said each community will need a targeted approach. It's going to be a a step-by-step gradual process. Faced with what he calls his toughest decision yet, President Trump now weighing the potential human cost of reopening the U.S. economy. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging and clusters of cases where the numbers are still rising. Social distancing is making a difference, but in some regions it could get worse before it gets better. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota, at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. Yo, While in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20-year-old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's it's just shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Jane Winehouse and her husband, Michael, are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator, because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island... When Korean War veteran Her Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade to his front door. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Progress in L.A. and New York. All right, Miguel, thank you. Medical experts are racing around the clock to find a vaccine for coronavirus. But most say the key to jumpstarting the economy will depend on testing and tracking. And this morning, there are new developments on both fronts, including antibody testing, which could help people fight the virus. NBC's Gotti Schwartz explains. With much of America shut down, the promise of progress. New COVID-19 blood tests called antibody tests could help get some Americans back to work. Dr. Margaret Zhang just took one in New York. Having antibodies and knowing that I'm as immune as one could be to COVID right now makes me feel even more kind of inclined to serve. UCLA began using its own version of antibody testing, focusing on thousands of medical workers. How can we expect our health workforce to be protecting us if we're not doing everything that we can to protect them? The concept is simple. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, it's because of special antibodies in your immune system that have developed to fight it off, and those will likely protect you from future infection. In the case of medical workers, those with antibodies could become super soldiers in the fight against COVID-19. I think that healthcare workers who know that they have antibodies will be able to go into the to to their work more confident that they're not going to be getting themselves sick or then passing this virus on to to others around them. Other tests are being given to the general public in Los Angeles as well. 64-year-old Deborah Presley had her finger pricked and blood drawn as part of a USC study. Within minutes, she learned she had antibodies to fight off coronavirus. When you found out that you had the antibodies, what went through your mind? 
I'm a caregiver and I go to different people's homes and it's just such a relief because of now that I can, now I can help other people. Now, dozens of labs all across the country are working on their own antibody tests. Last week, the Trump administration said they are working to make antibody testing free and widely available. Starting with the next week or so, we'll be able to scale up the kind of antibody testing to give you a good feel for what the penetrance of the infection is. But you can start think about some aspect of getting back to normal without having tested everybody in the country, that's for sure. But the FDA commissioner also warning not every antibody test is accurate. No test is 100 percent perfect, but what we don't want are wildly inaccurate tests. Then there are the diagnostic coronavirus tests, but all told, still less than 1 percent of the U.S. population has been tested. Just a fraction of what experts say is needed to get a clear sense of how many people may be infected. For now, making complete contact tracing still out of reach. Something authorities say is vital for stopping the virus's spread. And our thanks to Gotti Schwartz for that report. The South is recovering after being hit by severe tornadoes. The violent weather began Easter Sunday in the Deep South and moved up the East Coast. More than 30 people were killed by the twisters and many more left homeless. NBC's Dan Shenneman has more. Destruction from the Deep South to the Mid-Atlantic. A storm system unleashed dozens of tornadoes. In Mississippi, buildings flattened, a truck flipped over like a toy. The governor reported damage in almost every region of the state. Tens of thousands of Mississippians lost power. We already know that hundreds of homes were destroyed or badly damaged. In Georgia, rubble is now scattered where homes once stood just a day earlier. That is the house my mama grew up in that I raised my kids in. Storms also hit the Carolinas. A tree fell on a home in Charlotte, North Carolina. Neighbors called for help. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. Uh, she was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. So we ended up had to call the ambulance, like knock on the door to make sure she okay. The region must now go into recovery mode while it struggles to deal with a pandemic. I was dealing with one situation with the coronavirus and all that stuff, and now you have this, you know. This is right here in your face. It's right, right now. It's like you have to deal with it. A lot to deal with in a region ravaged by storms. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. And NBC's meteorologist Janessa Webb has been following all of that extreme weather for us. Let's check in with her now. Janessa, good morning. Good morning. These storms have finally pushed out of the area, but we had reports of over 700 wind damages and also combined with tornadoes in a two day period starting on Easter Sunday. And unfortunately, that severe risk is pretty minor for South Georgia into Florida this afternoon, but it's still there. Temperatures are well above normal. So we're going to continue to deal with that severe weather until it pushes offshore. Now, on the back end of this system, though, we do have a colder air that is producing freeze watches and warnings across the central plains all the way into the southern plains as well. Temperatures are nearly 25 to 30 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So we'll continue to watch for Florida today where highs will continue to be well above normal. We're back in the mid 90s, but cooler air even for the northeast all the way into the central plains. So watching the severe weather, hopefully after this pushes offshore, we'll finally get a break. Guys, we can only hope. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. A disinfection station was installed in Brazil to help stop the spread of coronavirus. It was placed at the entrance of a train station in the city of Osasco. Tents are set up and a solution is sprayed into the air, covering people as they pass underneath. The mayor of Osasco said that the solution is recommended by the World Health Organization to protect against the virus. If you're looking for work, tech giant Amazon is ramping up its hiring yet again. The company has announced it's looking to hire some 75,000 more workers. This is in addition to the more than 100,000 positions the company filled across the country over the last month. Amazon says the hiring spree is to help meet a surge in demand tied to the coronavirus outbreak. Outbreak. A FedEx driver went out of his way to help ease concerns about delivery for a family whose daughter has an autoimmune disease. The driver noticed the sign that was hanging on the family's front door, so he wiped down the box and told the family the package had been sanitized. 
The mother posted a picture of the wipe down box on Twitter and had one word to describe the situation. Amazing. And the smiley face at the bottom there. Stay safe. <laughs> we love that. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses, and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe. I keep Hi, these everyone. messages coming. Jennifer Lopez sending a message of gratitude there to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. A 50-year-old man has now recovered after surviving a harrowing battle with coronavirus. He spent three weeks on a ventilator but was finally able to go home on Easter Sunday. NBC's Steve Patterson has his inspiring story. This Easter Sunday, a California hospital resonating with waves of applause for 50-year-old Ramon Zuniga, who fought the coronavirus and won after spending 19 days on a ventilator. I seemed to exist, but I really wasn't sure if I existed. I didn't know if I had passed on or not. For over a month, ICU doctor Alex Hakim documented Ramon's journey and, in a way, his own. I don't know if I have the right words right now to express just how I feel. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And as for Ramon, he's grateful for the gift of life. I've managed to beat this, but all the credit goes to them. All the nurses, all the doctors. But you gave them hope. Hope. That's what doctors and nurses who saved Ramon will carry with them as they head back to the front lines. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Los Angeles. the last month we've always had this uptick on Mondays Sundays we kind of go down but look at this this is finally the consistency we were looking for for a three-day period of time and then also look by region the percentage almost down to one to two percent so we are seeing a slight growth in our deaths and that's really unfortunate but case by case we are on that downward curve so hopefully this is a consistent we were hoping to go for a five-day period of time so we're really going to be watching today wednesday and thursday very closely all right we'll thank right you ahead. thank you janessa We are back with a huge outpouring of support for a 25-year-old Minnesota man who's recovering after spending nearly two weeks on a ventilator in the ICU battling COVID-19. His Iowa hometown rallying to show they care. Reporter Boyd Hooper from CARE 11 in Minneapolis has the story. Fewer than 1,000 people live in Buffalo Center, Iowa. And on March 31st, all of them seem to be on the same road. United in support for Troy Ketwick and his family. It was scary. <laughs> There's no way around that. Rachel Rowling is Troy's fiance, unable to be by the side of her high school sweetheart, as the previously healthy 25-year-old with no underlying conditions spent 12 days on a ventilator at St. Paul's United Hospital with COVID-19. He was just showing your basic flu-like symptoms. And then that Monday following, he started to run a really high fever. With Troy heavily sedated, his family and Rachel were briefed two to three times a day by Troy's doctor and nurses. There's something Thing so difficult and just not being able to be present with your loved one, even if they're not awake, to have them know that you're there for support. No doubting the support in Troy's hometown. It looped past the nursing home where his grandma lives, then out to his parents in the country. There are no words to describe that. It's a very field of dreams moment. <laughs> a week after the drive-by, the moment got better. When did he come off the ventilator? Tuesday morning. Good day. Very good day. Rachel is hoping yeah. Troy will be back with her sometime this week, back preparing for their August wedding. He so appreciates all the love and all the prayers. Back on the road to recovery. 
The entire town participating. Yeah, love and support is something that everyone needs when they're trying to recover from something like that. And Troy has it all he could ever want, even at a distance. Yeah. In between uh, at-home workouts, athletes have been working on new hobbies to share with everyone on social media. Philadelphia Eagles kicker Jake Elliott showed off some of his talents. Catch that one. In a whole different sport. He's been sinking those in his house from that fake green. He used this pool table here. That is a nice man cave. The Lynx wow. could be in Elliott's future when his time on the gridiron ends. I don't know if we're going to have an NFL on Sundays. I hope we do. But if we don't, I have a feeling we might be watching a lot of these uh, trick shot videos. Yeah, these Sunday. videos could suffice. <laughs> I'd like to know, just like the, the gentleman we featured yesterday, how many attempts did it take him to get mm, it right? <laughs> we'll never know that. The magic of editing. <laughs> All right. Have a safe Tuesday, everyone. Thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. As the worldwide pandemic passes the two million mark, President Trump says he has the last word on reopening the country. States may beg to differ when it comes to the facts. This morning, more encouraging patterns emerging in different parts of the U.S. with almost 600,000 COVID-19 cases reported so far. We will break it down for you with the very latest details. To the heartland where America's farmers are battling to deliver fresh produce, but finding it's a whole lot harder during quarantine. Plus, we'll look at the suddenly unemployed millions struggling to put food on the table and what's being done about it. Early today starts right now. Good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this coronavirus pandemic. There is hope that we are beginning to see a flattening of the curve, but the death toll continues to rise with the virus claiming the lives of more than 23,000 people. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. A food bank in San Antonio says they're feeding about 120,000 people per week instead of their usual 58,000. Scenes like this are playing out all across the country. Let's head over to West Palm Beach, where a group called Feeding South Florida has started a new weekly service. Organizers hope to distribute a week's worth of groceries to 1,000 families in need every Monday. The program started this week. They have so far been able Able to feed about 800 families. They've had to turn away hundreds more. Burger King is offering students a chance to win a free Whopper. All they have to do is make a purchase using their app and correctly answer a question to get that free burger. The fast food chain says it's trying to feed minds while schools are closed. And John Krasinski rewarded healthcare workers in Boston with some help from the legendary Big Boppy David Ortiz. <laughs> in the latest episode of Krasinski's online show, Some Good News, employees at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center found out that they are getting Red Sox tickets for life. Well, this global pandemic continues to cause so many historic moments. For the first time ever, the Supreme Court is going virtual. They will hear arguments on half of their remaining cases by phone. Audio of those sessions will be made available to the public. And guess who's also working remotely? Here you go, everyone on Sesame Street. Elmo is hosting a virtual play date tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. He'll be joined by friends like Anne Hathaway and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Some people who will be returning to work are the wrestlers for the WWE. The company has now been deemed an essential business in Florida so they can resume taping for their audience-free shows in Orlando. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 they hired last month.
In New York, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak is seeing signs of hope that the curve is flattening in the state. The encouraging news comes as New York marks more than 10,000 COVID-19 related deaths. But a decline in cases and hospitalizations has led Governor Cuomo to meet with other Northeast governors about plans to reopen. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. As powerful winds and heavy rain pound the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, a break in the ongoing storm. While the death toll has topped 10,000 in New York State, ICU admissions and intubations are dropping. The number of newly hospitalized patients is the lowest it's been in two weeks. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Governor Andrew Cuomo is clashing publicly with Bill de Blasio over whether the New York City mayor has the authority to close schools through the remainder of the academic year. It is not shocking that sometimes there's just differences of perspective. Strong winds threatened this field hospital in Central Park and forced the closure of several testing facilities across the region. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. I was holding the iPad and I was holding her hand and I'm hysterical crying and I'm in all my gear so like my glasses are all foggy and um, I was just like oh my gosh like how am I going to handle doing this for multiple people? One of her patients died on Sunday. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there. Among the lives lost, William Sullivan, a beloved police detective in Yonkers. Anthony Cousy was known as one of the best sports photographers in New York City. For decades, Rakan Kim had been a mailman in the Bronx. We were just hoping for the best, but um, in the end, they said that he isn't going to make it past today. At this rate, COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. Now, the governors of six northeastern states have formed what is essentially a regional task force to discuss how best to reopen the economy here. Corey? Okay, Gabe, thank you. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. The president is increasingly turning his focus on one goal, reopening the U.S. economy. Now, he has May 1st circled on his calendar, but even his own health experts warn that it must be gradual. NBC's Peter Alexander has more. President Trump eagerly eyeing what he's called a big bang to restart the economy as early as May 1st, expressing optimism. We're getting rid of the plague. It's a plague on our country like nobody's ever seen. Dr. Anthony Fauci envisioning, in his words, a rolling re-entry, possibly next month. It is not going to be a light switch that we say, OK, it is now June, July or whatever. Click the, the, the light switch goes back on. The CDC director cautions against moving too quickly. It's going to be a, a step by step gradual process. It's got to be data driven. Among the keys to safely getting back to business, according to public health experts, a major increase in tests to see who has the virus, wide use of an antibody test to determine who's already had it and may now have immunity, and contact tracing to isolate people who've interacted with someone who's infected. Vice President Mike Pence asking governors for help ramping up testing, with concerns testing machines still are not running anywhere near full capacity. Increasing in testing will, you know, is continuing on a daily basis, and it is going to need to be in place in order for us to effectively reopen. And after weeks saying it was up to governors to impose stay-at-home orders, President Trump is now insisting he has the sole power to decide how and when states reopen, tweeting, it is the decision of the president and for many good reasons. But most legal experts disagree, arguing the president does not have the authority to direct states to lift their emergency orders. The governors of seven northeastern states that represent more than half the nation's coronavirus cases are banding together to outline the steps they will take to ease restrictions. Three western states doing the same. This has to be informed by experts and by data. You take one step forward, you see how it works, and then you measure the next step. Also making headlines, President Trump's retweet of a post with the hashtag FireFauci, after Dr. Fauci acknowledged more lives could have been saved if the country had been shut down earlier. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. 
Late Monday, when the president called Dr. Fauci to the podium during the briefing, Fauci said that was the wrong choice of words and said the president has taken his advice. President Trump later said he is not firing Dr. Fauci. Corey. Peter, thanks. 130... 130 million people are under wind alerts from Florida to Maine after dozens of twisters killed at least 33 people in the South. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in the storm zone. The South facing a disaster nightmare. Watch it coming! Yep, I see it, I see it. More than 50 reported tornadoes since Sunday. All I heard was like a loud roaring sound and a lot, a lot of cracking sound. In Louisiana, Willie Grayson's family was watching an Easter service on TV. The dinner table was here. When the tornado struck. I'm getting the kids, telling them to get under the bed. I'm yelling for my wife. She's screaming, the roof coming off. She runs, trying to run to me. And then the howl roof flew up. This home ripped right off its own foundation, stopping drivers in their tracks after being tossed into the road. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Georgia. Now all of a sudden I heard that train noise. I was getting the closet. Front end of the trailer was coming up. With you inside. With us both inside. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. In Mississippi, a tornado so powerful, radar captured debris thrown up to 60 miles away. The damage these storms leave behind forces an incredibly tough call. How to enforce stay at home orders for a virus when hundreds have no house? to go home to. We would typically go to a, a school gymnasium or something like that that we'd set up a shelter. So we're trying to get people into um, hotel rooms. In Alabama, those stay-at-home orders suspended. Images inside storm shelters capturing people doing whatever they can to social distance. Our thanks uh, to Morgan Chesky for that report. Let's head on over to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Tracking those storms the last two days, thankfully moving on. J Janessa, good morning. Good morning. Just a very devastating situation that continues to really unfold for the South and Southeast, even the Mid-Atlantic yesterday. We we're dealing with wind gusts in New York City up to 73 miles per hour. And so hopefully the storm system will continue to push offshore. But the severe weather threat, it is still enhanced for southern Georgia to northern Florida for today. Damaging wind gusts and isolated tornado possible. We're also watching the backside of the system. Cool air. I mean, this is April spring chill that's happening across the southern plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So temperatures below average, we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the Ohio Valley. Going to finally see a peak of sunshine for the northeast this afternoon. Enjoy. So watching the severe weather for Florida, then finally things clear out. Mm. Can't wait for that, right, Janessa? Thank you so much. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns for voters' health grow. In a statement, she says Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed at 20000 It sold to a veteran for 40000 Trolls World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making digital debut, becoming the highest grossing digital title in movie history, the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an on-demand release. A 93-year-old woman gets crafty during the pandemic. Olive Veronesi found herself all tapped out and held up a sign that said she needed more beer. Well, Coors Light answered the call, giving her 150 cans. Now this golden girl is indebted to Golden Colorado and chugging her way into our hearts. Talk about an American <laughs> treasure. That's how you this do is it. fantastic. You <laughs> just got to ask for what you need for it, right? Now, there you go. We're all here to help. Well, the U.S. Treasury Department says 80 million Americans will get some much-needed help get those relief checks this week. But that leaves millions more still waiting with money getting tighter. As Stephanie Rule reports, food banks now facing unprecedented crunches. Bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. 
I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Gary Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. A lot of great advice. Stephanie, thank you. Tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. It starts at 10, 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC and MSNBC. Global cases of coronavirus continue to grow. There are now almost 2 million infections worldwide. And as the cases surge, sadly, so do the number of deaths. In Europe, Italy has reached another grim milestone, while in Spain, they have appeared to reach their peak. Uh, for the latest on this global fight against COVID-19, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry, joining us live from London this morning. Hey, Cal, good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So it was on April 2nd when the world hit a million cases of coronavirus. We're now at 2 million. So just in 11 days, a million more cases. This, as countries across Europe have now been in lockdown for a month, and some are looking to ease restrictions here in the United Kingdom. We will probably see things stay the way they are. This country is going through the worst of it right now, and there's some concern that the death toll is actually being underreported, that we're only seeing uh, death tolls reported of people who have tested positive and died in hospital. That leaves out a lot of people who may have died in rest homes or in their own homes. Now, in Spain, we are seeing some restrictions eased. Non-essential workers will be headed to work today, really, for the first time, yesterday being a holiday. In Italy, we are going to also see some essential stores open. That is key there. In France and India, however, we will see a continuation of the lockdown. India, in particular, 1.3 billion people there continue to be locked down, guys. Cal Perry with the very latest on the global fight against COVID-19. Cal, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We continue to track COVID-19 by region, and we're still seeing that uptick for the Northeast. But look at this. Last Sunday, the Sunday before that, we always see the uptick. And finally, we're seeing that downward trend. We'll wait at least two more to really say if we're flattening the curve, but we're on the right track. Guys. Got to keep with that compliance, Janessa. Thank you. The agricultural industry has been hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Across the country, crops at their peak are now going to waste. NBC's Carrie Sanders explains why from a farm in Palm Beach County, Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. Ripe zucchini and squash dumped, rotting. 
Tractors plowing under a ready-to-pick crop of green beans. It's a harvest of sadness driven by coronavirus. On just this one farm, one million pounds of green beans already mulched back into the soil. It's the same story with sweet corn, cabbage, cucumbers, blueberries. Why? A large percentage of those were meant for restaurants and schools and, you know, ships and cruise lines and... And, you know, obviously that industry just shut down. Crops like these endless acres of sweet corn here. Grocery stores unable to absorb this immense added harvest, ripening all at once because stores are already stocked. And in this refrigerated warehouse, three million ears of sweet corn. Farmers say they're heartbroken because... This is all going to be thrown away. Some is donated, like the 4,000 ears of corn we saw given to a local fire department, but... Well, the supply chain is not there to cover the... Even if you wanted to give it away to people that weren't needy, it's not there. You know, it's just not. It's not just vegetables. In Wisconsin, dairy farmers dumping more than 3 million gallons of milk a day after schools closed. So far, the fourth generation Hinchley dairy avoiding those milk dumps. Still, it's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Hit especially hard the Harpke family in Dania Beach, Florida, a $250,000 a year boutique farm growing microgreens for high end chefs whose restaurants are now closed. We need the restaurants, yes, absolutely. Without them? Without them, we've got some serious things to figure out around here if we want to stay, stay, stay afloat and keep five people employed with us. All this while the Harpkeys are expecting their first child. Adding to the Harpke family challenge, Claire, who is pregnant, has had a recurrence of cancer. Meantime, farmers say none of this makes sense. They're destroying crops while at the same time, imports are still crossing the border from Mexico. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Pahokee, Florida. And thanks for waking up with us. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. The death toll in the U.S. fast approaching 24,000, with the worldwide number of COVID-19 cases surpassing 2 million. But the governor of New York says the worst is over if we stick to social distancing. This morning, our exclusive look inside the ICU conducting trials on a potential coronavirus treatment with surprising results. Are they close to a breakthrough? My dad come around, came on around, and we both pushed that we lived top of the house off of my mom as my son was trying to hold it and pull my mom out at the same time. Acts of heroism amid the despair of violent tornadoes taking the lives of almost three dozen people in the South. And art imitates life, how one precious commodity during the time of quarantine has reached a whole new status. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this pandemic. It's been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000. The number of confirmed cases in the U.S. now creeping towards 600,000. State leaders in California, Oregon and Washington are working together on a plan to slowly lift restrictions. Governor Gavin Newsom called it a regional pact to recovery. And 
will provide more details later today. Meantime, seven crew members on the hospital ship USNS Mercy have tested positive for COVID-19. They are now in isolation. The ship is docked in the port of Los Angeles. Officials say this doesn't affect their ability to treat patients. Meanwhile, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. The company is also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. Cars snaked around the block to get supplies at a food bank in Phoenix. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. St. Mary's Food Bank gives out 45,000 food boxes every month normally. That number almost doubled since the pandemic. And a champion on and off the court, Houston Rockets star Russell Westbrook is helping students by donating 650 laptops to families who can't afford them. Westbrook's Why Not Foundation teamed up with nonprofit CompuDot to help students in Houston during the pandemic. And the PGA has also created a relief fund for $5 million to help workers in the golf industry. The company has also pledged to match up to $2.5 million of donations. That relief fund will provide need-based grants. As we stay locked inside, wild animals are reclaiming national parks. More than ever before, Yosemite National Park employees are spotting coyotes, bears, and bobcats. The bear population has reportedly quadrupled in the area. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 that they hired last month. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today. That will be before his uh, hosting his task force briefing later on this evening. Now, what to expect is anyone's guess, especially after last night's briefing devolved into a fiery clash with the press. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us from D.C. with the latest. Tracy, the president railed on reports that he ignored the threat of the virus early on. Right. The president continues to defend how he dealt with this virus in the beginning, uh, saying at this briefing that he did everything right and that thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives were saved. He also talked about what to do going forward. As you know, he wants to reopen the economy sooner rather than later. The president said there will be guidance on that in a few days. And he claimed that he has total authority to do do so even though it was states who actually shut down business. The president of the United States has the authority to do what the president has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The president of the United States calls the shots. They can't do anything without the approval of the president of the United States. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. Even not all uh, Republicans are agreeing with that. This from Wyoming Rep. Liz Cheney. The federal government does not have absolute power. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states or reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Now, there are two groups of states, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, uh, disagreeing with the president, all but one Democratic governor saying that they will come up with their own plans on when to reopen for business in their states based on what's happening with this virus. Testing continues to be a big concern with the president pushing to reopen for business as of May 1st. Again, he says he's going to issue some guidance on that after consulting with his task force in the next few days. Corey. Wow, just about two weeks away. Tracy, thank you. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve. Social distancing is making a difference, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging, especially if restrictions are lifted too soon. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota, at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. Yo, you can feel it. 
while in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20-year-old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's, it's just it's shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Thank you, thank you, thank you! Jane Winehouse and her husband Michael are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island... <laughs> When Korean War veteran Her Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade to his front door. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Glad to hear about some progress. Miguel, thank you. Thousands of families across the country are left without homes after violent storms sparked a string of tornadoes across the southeast. That severe weather began Easter Sunday in the Deep South and moved up the East Coast, killing over 30 people. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. A string of deadly tornadoes tearing a path from the Deep South. Oh my through the East Coast. It's a war zone, looks like. The battle with Mother Nature leaving more than 20 dead, dozens more wounded. Storms swallowing entire communities. Easter Sunday prayers quickly shifting to pleas for survival. Lord, I pray everybody okay. This is the Lord Jesus. In Charlotte, teams worked for 45 minutes. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. You know? She was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. Digging a resident from the debris. In Virginia, a stranded driver is pulled from the rising floodwaters. The wreckage stretches across multiple states. Homes and businesses in ruins, vehicles tossed on their sides, power lines ripped down. More than a million left without electricity across the strike zone after reports of more than 40 twisters. Survivors now struggling to piece together what they can and still protect themselves from COVID-19. I mean, we all teaming up together to help each other. It is tough to social distance in a shelter. But those who rush to safety are doing what they can, now dealing with two threats, the virus and the violent weather. Jay Gray, NBC News. Let's get the latest on that weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning. Just a kind of devastating situation that continues to really unfold across the south and southeast. The storm system pushing offshore, but in that two-day period starting on Easter Sunday, we saw over 700 reports of wind and tornado damages. So today, the threat, it still continues for southern Georgia to northern Florida as well. It is a small area, but Jacksonville, you're on our radar this afternoon with some damaging winds and a few isolated tornadoes. Also behind that potent, strong cold front is a lot cooler air. Temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. So our temperatures cooling off. You can see for central Texas back in the mid-50s, even for the northeast, a few winds still picking up for northern New England, but a pretty quiet day, finally. So we're going to leave this severe weather behind, but, man, we're still talking about snow for the southern plains. Gosh, severe weather now into snow. You know, just adding to the craziness that is these times. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Well, the Sesame Street friends are coming together virtually to bring some families something very special. Elmo knows it can be hard to be away from your friends. So Elmo's mommy and daddy are helping Elmo set up a video play date. Yay! 
Well, the nonprofit behind Sesame Street put together a simulcast as part of their initiative to support families during the COVID-19 crisis. And a few stars liked the idea. They decided to tag along. Elmo's Playdate airs tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern on PBS Kids. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses, and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe. Jennifer Lopez there sending a warm message of gratitude to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. While there is no official cure or vaccine for the coronavirus, medical teams around the world are working to develop treatments to help those already infected. Some patients are participating in clinical drug trials that experts say are showing some promise. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. On the ICU floor at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, a drug trial for a potential lifesaver. This is um, remdesivir versus placebo for one of our patients. Doctors prescribing remdesivir delivered in IV form to patients sick with COVID-19. The Emory trial is one of the largest in the world. Infectious disease expert Dr. Anish Mehta is the chief investigator. What we're searching for are medications that will help people get over the infection more rapidly and allow their immune systems to really kick in and knock the virus out of their body. Remdesivir was originally tested to treat Ebola patients, but early results suggest it could be far more effective in treating COVID-19. It's a double-blind NIH study, meaning patients and doctors don't know who gets a placebo. What we have seen is lots of patients recovering. Whether that's because they're getting a study drug or a placebo, we don't know. In Washington state, ICU doctors did give remdesivir to Chris Kane as he struggled to breathe. I mean, within 48 hours, I was feeling a lot better. We're just so thankful. And then I, yeah, to get him on this, to get him on this <laughs> drug so quickly was just an absolute godsend. Now, researchers could be just two to three weeks away from a major breakthrough, determining whether remdesivir should be the go-to treatment in hospitals. Meanwhile, doctors are increasingly cautious about an unproven treatment touted by President Trump, hydroxychloroquine combined with an antibiotic. Researchers in Brazil canceled a small chloroquine study after some patients developed cardiac arrhythmias and even died. But back at Emory, some COVID patients are insisting on getting what they heard President Trump talk up. And they say, I don't want an experimental drug. I want the drug on the news. If approved, drug maker Gilead says it could have enough remdesivir to treat 140,000 people immediately and half a million by October. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful, Tom? Thank you. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns grow for voters' health. Obama said in a statement that Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed for $20,000 to help the restaurant maintain its staff, but a veteran bought it for $40,000. Well, Tro's World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making debut. It became the highest-grossing digital title in movie history, scoring the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an online demand release. Stocks were down on Monday, but today kicks off major earnings season with a few of the bigs, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Johnson & Johnson, reporting in the age of coronavirus. Here with a preview and some good news on the hiring front is CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi, uh, Juliana, good morning. Good morning. Yes, so U.S. stock futures point to a stronger day of trade this morning after a weaker day yesterday. Of course, this follows a very strong week last week where we saw stocks rebound very strongly. Uh, J.P. Morgan kicks it off in the banking space with Wells Fargo today, Johnson & Johnson in the healthcare space. And overall, investors are bracing for a weak earnings season. Oh, putting it all together, analysts expect earnings to have declined 10% year-on-year in the first quarter as the pandemic takes hold. Uh, 
we have had some encouraging comments on the virus front, and perhaps that's boosting sentiment as well with New York Governor uh, Cuomo saying it appears the worst is over if we continue to be smart going forward. And on the hiring front, you mentioned one company is in focus hiring 75,000 more workers on top of the 100,000 they've already hired last month. That is Amazon. They're experiencing an increase in demand, and as a result, they're looking to hire more warehouse workers, more delivery workers. So hopefully they can absorb some of those workers who've been not laid off in other parts of the economy. Back to you. A lot of people needing a job right around now. Juliana, thank you. All right, everyone, we continue to try to flatten the curve. And this is actually some great data that we're going to show you region by region. This is a down tick compared to last Sunday and the Sunday before, where we're finally at a 2 to 3 percent across the north and south. So we continue to really need to be diligent for the next few days. Thanks. All right, Janessa, thank you. Most of us took it for granted, and now it is in short supply. Of course, we are talking about toilet paper. And Nelson Garcia from Denver's KUSA has the story on one Colorado artist commemorating the item left on so many shopping lists. Lately, I've been doing a lot of foliage paintings. The author Oscar Wilde once said, quote, life imitates art. This is a very, very close friend and fellow painter. Far more than art imitates life. That one is a, a blackberry bramble with the berries partway through the ripening process. Capturing the world's essence through the eyes of artist Robin Cole. You have a, an interesting moment with a wild animal, you know, something like that. Uh, those moments really, really stand out to me and that sort of magical realism that happens is something I'm, I'm really interested in representing in my creative work. But throughout her career in color. I've noticed that all of my painting has become a little less hard-edged, a little less over-informative, and a little more natural and expressive and brushy. Cole never painted anything like this. This ridiculous substance has achieved a, a pretty divine place in our society for this moment in time, such that it's totally unattainable. She calls it art in the time of corona. It seems like this would make a lot of people happy and smile, maybe if they hang it above their toilet in their bathroom. So. A tribute to that elusive item that left shoppers empty-handed, staring at empty shelves. Which is why I decided to paint it with this, you know, bathed in holy light type of environment, which is something I invented a little bit with the setup I had. I was just painting a roll that I had in my bathroom. That beautiful Renaissance rust gold brown that you see in the background is, is really actually a visual interpretation of particle board. <laughs> Out of all her work. This situation in which we find ourselves, I think everybody's going through their own process of trying to grapple with the bizarre new reality in so many ways. Cole says this one is well received. I've had a number of inquiries actually, uh, so many that I'm, I'm thinking of maybe doing a limited edition run of prints, which is not something I do very often with my pieces. Art inspired by life. I would prefer not to be remembered <laughs> for summing up the coronavirus with a toilet paper painting. Giving people something Cole believes. I would just throw out there that a quarantine is a great time to learn to paint. Everyone seems to need. People really like looking at beautiful things. You know, it's there's something very pleasing about that. And they just get a laugh out of it, which was my ultimate goal. We hope your Tuesday is on a roll. It I'm is. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Two ply masterpiece. I love it. Thanks for watching early today. I am Philip Mena along with Corey Coffin here. We leave you with this neighborhood performance. It is an Ecuadorian firefighter bringing a little joy to families in quarantine, climbing up his ladder to serenade them with his trumpet. Have a great day. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international 
international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Coronavirus cases have now topped 2 million worldwide as testing ramps up, but optimism is also growing as social distancing is having an impact on flattening the curve. Governor Cuomo forms a seven-state joint task force to look at reopening the economies, but President Trump claims it's really his call to make. We'll go behind the decision-making impacting your lives. And we're just now getting a real assessment of the damage caused by some wicked storms that spread from the deep south to the northeast. It is Tuesday, April 14th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. Governors are coming together to discuss when and how to reopen their states. But during this pandemic, during a pandemic pre press briefing yesterday, President Trump says he has total authority over them. Here's what you need to know at this hour. It has been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today, the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000 as the number of confirmed cases creeps even higher towards 600,000. In New York City, they're in such dire need of medical supplies that officials are now getting creative. According to the Wall Street Journal, staffers with the mayor's office reached out to the New York Mets to get rain ponchos from them. Meantime, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. Company also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. A new change to Ticketmaster policies has created outrage with consumers. The company is no longer offering refunds on postponed or rescheduled shows. The platform is now only giving refunds for canceled events. John Krasinski surprises healthcare workers in Boston on his latest episode of the show, Some Good News. He spoke to staff at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center with the help from the legendary Big Poppy, David Ortiz. The Red Sox donated four tickets for life to employees. A group of New Yorkers are suing Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, and Uber Eats, accusing them of price gouging during the pandemic. The suit claims that these services jacked up the prices of orders, imposing fees of 10 to 40 percent. The accusers are seeking class action status. Companies have declined to respond. And Burger King is putting students to the test. The fast food chain is offering free Whoppers if students can answer a few math problems correctly. The offer is available through their app. College students are trying to recover their tuition money as well. Students at Drexel University and the University of Miami have filed class action lawsuits claiming they've paid for services they're no longer using. The universities have declined to comment. Students at NYU have also started a petition to get a partial reimbursement. And the state of Florida has deemed WWE SmackDown an essential business. Governor Ron DeSantis has given the WWE the green light to resume wrestling matches on live TV starting next week. Those events will run without fans. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. What to expect is anyone's guess, though, after last night's brief devolved into a fiery clash with the press. NBC's Alice Barr has more. President Trump on offense, responding to criticism. He didn't act quickly enough to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Everything we did was right. Reporting from the New York Times and other outlets documents repeated early warnings in January and February inside the Trump administration, weeks before the president finally called on Americans to stop the spread in mid-March. In response, he played a campaign-style video from the briefing room, attacking the media, touting compliments from governors, and again highlighting his late January travel ban from China. So I issued travel restrictions on that date, even though nobody died, and I got brutalized over it by the press. That ban bought the country time to prepare. The president pressed on how his administration used it. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. You? A lot. Top health official Dr. Anthony Fauci also clarifying his comments that earlier action could have saved lives, saying President Trump listened to his advice. The first and only time that I went in and said we should do mitigation strongly, the response was yes, we'll do it. 
After retweeting a comment with the hashtag Fire Fauci, President Trump saying they work well together. The president also saying he hopes to reopen the country ahead of schedule. He's been eyeing a May 1st target date, insisting it's his decision to make, though the Constitution leaves it to the states. The president of the United States calls the shots. The head of the Centers for Disease Control said each community will need a targeted approach. It's going to be a a step-by-step, gradual process. Faced with what he calls his toughest decision yet, President Trump now weighing the potential human cost of reopening the U.S. economy. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging and clusters of cases where the numbers are still rising. Social distancing is making a difference, but in some regions it could get worse before it gets better. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota, at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. Yo, you feel it. While in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20 year old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's, it's just it's shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Thank you, thank you, thank you! Jane Winehouse and her husband Michael are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island, (laughs) when Korean War veteran Herb Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade to his front door. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Progress in L.A. and New York. All right, Miguel, thank you. Medical experts are racing around the clock to find a vaccine for coronavirus. But most say the key to jumpstarting the economy will depend on testing and tracking. And this morning, there are new developments on both fronts, including antibody testing, which could help people fight the virus. NBC's Gotti Schwartz explains. With much of America shut down, the promise of progress. New COVID-19 blood tests called antibody tests could help get some Americans back to work. Dr. Margaret Zhang just took one in New York. Having antibodies and knowing that I'm as immune as one could be to COVID right now makes me feel even more kind of inclined to serve. UCLA began using its own version of antibody testing, focusing on thousands of medical workers. How can we expect our health workforce to be protecting us if we're not doing everything that we can to protect them? The concept is simple. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, it's because of special antibodies in your immune system that have developed to fight it off, and those will likely protect you from future infection. In the case of medical workers, those with antibodies could become super soldiers in the fight against COVID-19. I think that healthcare workers who know that they have antibodies will be able to go into the to to their work more confident that they are not going to be getting themselves sick or then passing this virus on to to others around them. Other tests are being given to the general public in Los Angeles as well. 64-year-old Deborah Presley had her finger pricked and blood drawn as part of a USC study. Within minutes, she learned she had antibodies to fight off coronavirus. When you found out that you had the antibodies, what went through your mind? 
I'm a caregiver and I go to different people's homes and it's just such a relief because now that I can, now I can help other people. Now dozens of labs all across the country are working on their own antibody tests. Last week, the Trump administration said they are working to make antibody testing free and widely available. Starting with the next week or so, we'll be able to scale up the kind of antibody testing to give you a good feel for what the penetrance of the infection is. But you can start think about some aspect of getting back to normal without having tested everybody in the country, that's for sure. But the FDA commissioner also warning not every antibody test is accurate. No test is 100% perfect, but what we don't want are wildly inaccurate tests. Then there are the diagnostic coronavirus tests, but all told, still less than 1% of the U.S. population has been tested. Just a fraction of what experts say is needed to get a clear sense of how many people may be infected. For now, making complete contact tracing still out of reach. Something authorities say is vital for stopping the virus's spread. And our thanks to Gotti Schwartz for that report. The South is recovering after being hit by severe tornadoes. The violent weather began Easter Sunday in the Deep South and moved up the East Coast. More than 30 people were killed by the twisters and many more left homeless. NBC's Dan Shenneman has more. Destruction from the Deep South to the Mid-Atlantic. A storm system unleashed dozens of tornadoes. In Mississippi, buildings flattened, a truck flipped over like a toy. The governor reported damage in almost every region of the state. Tens of thousands of Mississippians lost power. We already know that hundreds of homes were destroyed or badly damaged. In Georgia, rubble is now scattered where homes once stood just a day earlier. That is the house my mama grew up in that I raised my kids in. Storms also hit the Carolinas. A tree fell in a home in Charlotte, North Carolina. Neighbors called for help. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. She's she was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. So we ended up having to call the ambulance, like knock on the door to make sure she's okay. The region must now go into recovery mode while it struggles to deal with a pandemic. It's dealing with one situation with the coronavirus and all that stuff, and now you have this, you know. This is right here in your face. It's right, right now. It's like you have to deal with it. A lot to deal with in a region ravaged by storms. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. And NBC's meteorologist Janessa Webb has been following all of that extreme weather for us. Let's check in with her now. Janessa, good morning. Good morning. These storms have finally pushed out of the area, but we had reports of over 700 wind damages and also combined with tornadoes in a two-day period starting on Easter Sunday. And unfortunately, that severe risk is pretty minor for South Georgia into Florida this afternoon, but it's still there. Temperatures are well above normal. So we're going to continue to deal with that severe weather until it pushes offshore. Now, on the back end of this system, though, we do have a colder air that is producing freeze watches and warnings across the central plains all the way into the southern plains as well. Temperatures are nearly 25 to 30 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So we'll continue to watch for Florida today where highs will continue to be well above normal. We're back in the mid 90s, but cooler air even for the northeast all the way into the central plains. So watching the severe weather, hopefully after this pushes offshore, we'll finally get a break. Guys, we can only hope. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. A disinfection station was installed in Brazil to help stop the spread of coronavirus. It was placed at the entrance of a train station in the city of Osasco. Tents are set up and a solution is sprayed into the air, covering people as they pass underneath. The mayor of Osasco said that the solution is recommended by the World Health Organization to protect against the virus. If you're looking for work, tech giant Amazon is ramping up its hiring yet again. The company has announced it's looking to hire some 75,000 more workers. This is in addition to the more than 100,000 positions the company filled across the country over the last month. Amazon says the hiring spree is to help meet a surge in demand tied to the coronavirus outbreak. A FedEx driver went out of his way to help ease concerns about delivery for a family whose daughter has an autoimmune disease. The driver noticed a sign that was hanging on the family's front door, so he wiped down the box and told the family the package had been sanitized. 
The mother posted a picture of the wipe down box on Twitter and had one word to describe the situation. Amazing. And the smiley face at the bottom there. Stay safe. <laughs> we love that. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses, and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe. I keep Hi, these everyone. messages coming. Jennifer Lopez sending a message of gratitude there to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. A 50-year-old man has now recovered after surviving a harrowing battle with coronavirus. He spent three weeks on a ventilator but was finally able to go home on Easter Sunday. NBC Steve Patterson has his inspiring story. This Easter Sunday, a California hospital resonating with waves of applause for 50-year-old Ramon Zuniga, who fought the coronavirus and won after spending 19 days on a ventilator. I seemed to exist, but I really wasn't sure if I existed. I didn't know if I had passed on or not. For over a month, ICU Dr. Alex Hakim documented Ramon's journey and, in a way, his own. I don't know if I have the right words right now to express just how I feel. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And as for Ramon, he's grateful for the gift of life. I've managed to beat this, but all the credit goes to them. All the nurses, all the doctors. But you gave them hope. Hope. That's what doctors and nurses who saved Ramon will carry with them as they head back to the front lines. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Los Angeles. month we've always had this uptick on Mondays Sundays we kind of go down but look at this this is finally the consistency we were looking for for a three-day period of time and then also look by region the percentage almost down to one to two percent so we are seeing a slight growth in our deaths and that's really unfortunate but case by case we are on that downward curve so hopefully this is a consistent we were hoping to go for a five-day period of time so we're really going to be watching today wednesday and thursday very closely all right we'll thank you ahead. thank you janessa We are back with a huge outpouring of support for a 25-year-old Minnesota man who's recovering after spending nearly two weeks on a ventilator in the ICU battling COVID-19. His Iowa hometown rallying to show they care. Reporter Boyd Hooper from CARE 11 in Minneapolis has the story. Fewer than 1,000 people live in Buffalo Center, Iowa. And on March 31st, all of them seem to be on the same road. United in support for Troy Ketwick and his family. It was scary. <laughs> There's no way around that. Rachel Rowling is Troy's fiance, unable to be by the side of her high school sweetheart, as the previously healthy 25-year-old with no underlying conditions spent 12 days on a ventilator at St. Paul's United Hospital with COVID-19. He was just showing your basic flu-like symptoms. And then that Monday following, he started to run a really high fever. With Troy heavily sedated, his family and Rachel were briefed two to three times a day by Troy's doctor and nurses. There's something so difficult and just not being able to be present with your loved one, even if they're not awake, to have them know that you're there for support. No doubting the support in Troy's hometown. It looped past the nursing home where his grandma lives, then out to his parents in the country. There are no words to describe that. It's a very field of dreams moment. <laughs> a week after the drive-by, the moment got better. When did he come off the ventilator? Tuesday morning. Good day. Very good day. Rachel is hoping yeah. Troy will be back with her sometime this week, back preparing for their August wedding. He so appreciates all the love and all the prayers. Back on the road to recovery. 
The entire town participating. Yeah, love and support is something that everyone needs when they're trying to recover from something like that. And Troy has it all he could ever want, even at a distance. Yeah. In between uh, at-home workouts, athletes have been working on new hobbies to share with everyone on social media. Philadelphia Eagles kicker Jake Elliott showed off some of his talents. Catch that one. In a whole different sport. He's been sinking those in his house from that fake green. He used this pool table here. That is a nice man cave. The links wow. could be in in Elliot's future when his time on the gridiron ends. I don't know if we're going to have an NFL on Sundays. I hope we do. But if we don't, I have a feeling we might be watching a lot of these uh, trick shot videos. Yeah, these Sunday. videos could suffice. <laughs> I'd like to know, just like the, the gentleman we featured yesterday, how many attempts did it take him to get mm, it right? <laughs> we'll never know that. The magic of editing. <laughs> All right. Have a safe Tuesday, everyone. Thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. As the worldwide pandemic passes the two million mark, President Trump says he has the last word on reopening the country. States may beg to differ when it comes to the facts. This morning, more encouraging patterns emerging in different parts of the U.S. with almost 600,000 COVID-19 cases reported so far. We will break it down for you with the very latest details. To the heartland where America's farmers are battling to deliver fresh produce, but finding it's a whole lot harder during quarantine. Plus, we'll look at the suddenly unemployed millions struggling to put food on the table and what's being done about it. Early today starts right now. Good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this coronavirus pandemic. There is hope that we are beginning to see a flattening of the curve, but the death toll continues to rise with the virus claiming the lives of more than 23,000 people. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. A food bank in San Antonio says they're feeding about 120,000 people per week instead of their usual 58,000. Scenes like this are playing out all across the country. Let's head over to West Palm Beach, where a group called Feeding South Florida has started a new weekly service. Organizers hope to distribute a week's worth of groceries to 1,000 families in need every Monday. The program started this week. They have so far been able to feed about 800 families. They've had to turn away hundreds more. Burger King is offering students a chance to win a free Whopper. All they have to do is make a purchase using their app and correctly answer a question to get that free burger. The fast food chain says it's trying to feed minds while schools are closed. And John Krasinski rewarded healthcare workers in Boston with some help from the legendary Big Boppy David Ortiz. In the latest episode of Krasinski's online show, Some Good News, employees at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center found out that they are getting Red Sox tickets for life. Well, this global pandemic continues to cause so many historic moments. For the first time ever, the Supreme Court is going virtual. They will hear arguments on half of their remaining cases by phone. Audio of those sessions will be made available to the public. And guess who's also working remotely? Here you go, everyone on Sesame Street. Elmo is hosting a virtual play date tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. He'll be joined by friends like Anne Hathaway and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Some people who will be returning to work are the wrestlers for the WWE. The company has now been deemed an essential business in Florida so they can resume taping for their audience-free shows in Orlando. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 they hired last month.
In New York, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak is seeing signs of hope that the curve is flattening in the state. The encouraging news comes as New York marks more than 10,000 COVID-19 related deaths. But a decline in cases and hospitalizations has led Governor Cuomo to meet with other Northeast governors about plans to reopen. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. As powerful winds and heavy rain pound the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, a break in the ongoing storm. While the death toll has topped 10,000 in New York State, ICU admissions and intubations are dropping. The number of newly hospitalized patients is the lowest it's been in two weeks. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Governor Andrew Cuomo is clashing publicly with Bill de Blasio over whether the New York City mayor has the authority to close schools through the remainder of the academic year. It is not shocking that sometimes there's just differences of perspective. Strong winds threatened this field hospital in Central Park and forced the closure of several testing facilities across the region. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. I was holding the iPad and I was holding her hand and I'm hysterical crying and I'm in all my gear so like my glasses are all foggy and um, I was just like oh my gosh like how am I gonna handle doing this for multiple people. One of her patients died on Sunday. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there. Among the lives lost, William Sullivan, a beloved police detective in Yonkers. Anthony Cousy was known as one of the best sports photographers in New York City. For decades, Rakan Kim had been a mailman in the Bronx. We were just hoping for the best, but um, in the end, they said that he isn't going to make it past today. At this rate, COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. Now, the governors of six northeastern states have formed what is essentially a regional task force to discuss how best to reopen the economy here. Corey? Okay, Gabe, thank you. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. The president is increasingly turning his focus on one goal, reopening the U.S. economy. Now, he has May 1st circled on his calendar, but even his own health experts warn that it must be gradual. NBC's Peter Alexander has more. President Trump eagerly eyeing what he's called a big bang to restart the economy as early as May 1st, expressing optimism. We're getting rid of the plague. It's a plague on our country like nobody's ever seen. Dr. Anthony Fauci envisioning, in his words, a rolling re-entry, possibly next month. It is not going to be a light switch that we say, OK, it is now June, July or whatever. Click the, the, the light switch goes back on. The CDC director cautions against moving too quickly. It's going to be a step-by-step -step gradual process. It's got to be data-driven. Among the keys to safely getting back to business, according to public health experts, a major increase in tests to see who has the virus, wide use of an antibody test to determine who's already had it and may now have immunity, and contact tracing to isolate people who've interacted with someone who's infected. Vice President Mike Pence asking governors for help ramping up testing with concerns testing machines still are not running anywhere near full capacity. Increasing in testing will, is continuing on a daily basis and it is going to need to be in place in order for us to effectively reopen. And after weeks saying it was up to governors to impose stay at home orders, President Trump is now insisting he has the sole power to decide how and when states reopen tweeting, it is the decision of the president and for many good reasons. But most legal experts disagree, arguing the president does not have the authority to direct states to lift their emergency orders. The governors of seven northeastern states that represent more than half the nation's coronavirus cases are banding together to outline the steps they will take to ease restrictions. Three western states doing the same. This has to be informed by experts and by data. You take one step forward, you see how it works. And then you measure the next step. Also making headlines, President Trump's retweet of a post with the hashtag Fire Fauci after Dr. Fauci acknowledged more lives could have been saved if the country had been shut down earlier. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then.
Late Monday, when the president called Dr. Fauci to the podium during the briefing, Fauci said that was the wrong choice of words and said the president has taken his advice. President Trump later said he is not firing Dr. Fauci. Corey. Peter, thanks. 130. 130 million people are under wind alerts from Florida to Maine after dozens of twisters killed at least 33 people in the South. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in the storm zone. The South facing a disaster nightmare. Watch it coming! Yep, I see it, I see it. More than 50 reported tornadoes since Sunday. Like a loud roaring sound and a lot, a lot of cracking sound. In Louisiana, Willie Grayson's family was watching an Easter service on TV. The dinner table was here. When the tornado struck. I'm getting the kids, telling them to get under the bed. I'm yelling for my wife. She's screaming, the roof coming off. She runs, trying to run to me. And then the whole roof flew up. This home ripped right off its own foundation, stopping drivers in their tracks after being tossed into the road. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Georgia. Now all of a sudden I heard that train noise. I was getting the closet. Front end of the trailer was coming up. With you inside. With us both inside. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. In Mississippi, a tornado so powerful, radar captured debris thrown up to 60 miles away. The damage these storms leave behind forces an incredibly tough call. How to enforce stay-at-home orders for a virus when hundreds have no house? to go home to. We would typically go to a, a school gymnasium or something like that that we'd set up a shelter. So we're trying to get people into um, hotel rooms. In Alabama, those stay-at-home orders suspended. Images inside storm shelters capturing people doing whatever they can to social distance. Our thanks uh, to Morgan Chesky for that report. Let's head on over to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Tracking those storms the last two days, thankfully moving on. J Janessa, good morning. Good morning. Just a very devastating situation that continues to really unfold for the South and Southeast, even the Mid-Atlantic yesterday. We we're dealing with wind gusts in New York City up to 73 miles per hour. And so hopefully the storm system will continue to push offshore. But the severe weather threat, it is still enhanced for southern Georgia to northern Florida for today. Damaging wind gusts and isolated tornado possible. We're also watching the backside of the system. Cool air. I mean, this is April spring chill that's happening across the southern plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So temperatures below average, we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the Ohio Valley. Going to finally see a peak of sunshine for the northeast this afternoon. Enjoy. So watching the severe weather for Florida, then finally things clear out. Mm. Can't wait for that, right, Janessa? Thank you so much. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns for voters' health grow. In a statement, she says Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed at 20000 It sold to a veteran for 40000 Trolls World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making digital debut, becoming the highest grossing digital title in movie history, the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an on-demand release. A 93-year-old woman gets crafty during the pandemic. Olive Veronesi found herself all tapped out and held up a sign that said she needed more beer. <laughs> well, Coors Light answered the call, giving her 150 cans. Now this golden girl is indebted to Golden Colorado and chugging her way into our hearts. Talk about an American <laughs> treasure. That's how this you do it. It's fantastic. You <laughs> just got to ask for what you need for it, right? Now, there you go. We're all here to help. Well, the U.S. Treasury Department says 80 million Americans will get some much-needed help, get those relief checks this week. But that leaves millions more still waiting with money getting tighter. As Stephanie Rule reports, food banks now facing unprecedented crunches. Bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. 
I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Terry Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. A lot of great advice, Stephanie. Thank you. Tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. It starts at 10.10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC and MSNBC. Global cases of coronavirus continue to grow. There are now almost 2 million infections worldwide. And as the cases surge, sadly, so do the number of deaths. In Europe, Italy has reached another grim milestone, while in Spain, they have appeared to reach their peak. Uh, for the latest on this global fight against COVID-19, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry, joining us live from London this morning. Hey, Cal, good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So it was on April 2nd when the world hit a million cases of coronavirus. We're now at 2 million. So just in 11 days, a million more cases. This, as countries across Europe have now been in lockdown for a month, and some are looking to ease restrictions. Here in the United Kingdom, we will probably see things stay the way they are. This country is going through the worst of it right now, and there's some concern that the death toll is actually being underreported, that we're only seeing uh, death tolls reported of people who have tested positive and died in hospital that leaves out a lot of people who may have died in rest homes or in their own homes. Now, in Spain, we are seeing some restrictions eased. Non-essential workers will be headed to work today, really for the first time, yesterday being a holiday. In Italy, we are gonna also see some essential stores open. That is key there. In France and India, however, we will see a continuation of the lockdown. India, in particular, 1.3 billion people there continue to be locked down, guys. Cal Perry with the very latest on the global fight against COVID-19. Cal, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We continue to track COVID-19 by region, and we're still seeing that uptick for the Northeast. But look at this. Last Sunday, the Sunday before that, we always see the uptick. And finally, we're seeing that downward trend. We'll wait at least two more days to really say if we're flat in the curve, but we're on the right track. Guys. Got to keep with that compliance, Janessa. Thank you. The agricultural industry has been hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Across the country, crops at their peak are now going to waste. NBC's Carrie Sanders explains why from a farm in Palm Beach County, Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. Ripe zucchini and squash dumped, rotting. 
Tractors plowing under a ready-to-pick crop of green beans. It's a harvest of sadness driven by coronavirus. On just this one farm, one million pounds of green beans already mulched back into the soil. It's the same story with sweet corn, cabbage, cucumbers, blueberries. Why? A large percentage of those were meant for restaurants and schools and, you know, ships and cruise lines and... And, you know, obviously that industry just shut down. Crops like these endless acres of sweet corn here. Grocery stores unable to absorb this immense added harvest, ripening all at once because stores are already stocked. And in this refrigerated warehouse, three million ears of sweet corn. Farmers say they're heartbroken because... This is all going to be thrown away. Some is donated, like the 4,000 ears of corn we saw given to a local fire department, but... Well, the supply chain is not there to cover the... Even if you wanted to give it away to people that weren't needy, it's not there. You know, it's just not. It's not just vegetables. In Wisconsin, dairy farmers dumping more than 3 million gallons of milk a day after schools closed. So far, the fourth generation Hinchley dairy avoiding those milk dumps. Still, it's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Hit especially hard the Harpke family in Dania Beach, Florida, a $250,000 a year boutique farm growing microgreens for high end chefs whose restaurants are now closed. We need the restaurants, yes, absolutely. Without them? Without them, we've got some serious things to figure out around here if we want to stay, stay, stay afloat and keep five people employed with us. All this while the Harpkeys are expecting their first child. Adding to the Harpke family challenge, Claire, who is pregnant, has had a recurrence of cancer. Meantime, farmers say none of this makes sense. They're destroying crops while at the same time, Imports are still crossing the border from Mexico. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Pahokee, Florida. And thanks for waking up with us. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. The death toll in the U.S. fast approaching 24,000, with the worldwide number of COVID-19 cases surpassing 2 million. But the governor of New York says the worst is over if we stick to social distancing. This morning, our exclusive look inside the ICU conducting trials on a potential coronavirus treatment with surprising results. Are they close to a breakthrough? My dad come around, came on around, and we both pushed and we lived top of the house off of my mom as my son was trying to hold it and pull my mom out at the same time. Acts of heroism amid the despair of violent tornadoes taking the lives of almost three dozen people in the South. And art imitates life, how one precious commodity during the time of quarantine has reached a whole new status. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this pandemic. It's been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000. 
The number of confirmed cases in the U.S. now creeping towards 600,000. State leaders in California, Oregon, and Washington are working together on a plan to slowly lift restrictions. Governor Gavin Newsom called it a regional pact to recovery and will provide more details later today. Meantime, seven crew members on the hospital ship USNS Mercy have tested positive for COVID-19. They are now in isolation. The ship is docked in the port of Los Angeles. Officials say this doesn't affect their ability to treat patients. Meanwhile, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. The company is also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. Cars snaked around the block to get supplies at a food bank in Phoenix. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. St. Mary's Food Bank gives out 45,000 food boxes every month normally. That number almost doubled since the pandemic. And a champion on and off the court, Houston Rockets star Russell Westbrook is helping students by donating 650 laptops to families who can't afford them. Westbrook's Why Not Foundation teamed up with nonprofit CompuDot to help students in Houston during the pandemic. And the PGA has also created a relief fund for $5 million to help workers in the golf industry. The company has also pledged to match up to $2.5 million of donations. That relief fund will provide need-based grants. As we stay locked inside, wild animals are reclaiming national parks. More than ever before, Yosemite National Park employees are spotting coyotes, bears, and bobcats. The bear population has reportedly quadrupled in the area. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 that they hired last month. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today. That will be before his uh, hosting his task force briefing later on this evening. Now, what to expect is anyone's guess, especially after last night's briefing devolved into a fiery clash with the press. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us from D.C. with the latest. Tracy, the president railed on reports that he ignored the threat of the virus early on. Right. The president continues to defend how he dealt with this virus in the beginning, uh, saying at this briefing that he did everything right and that thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives were saved. He also talked about what to do going forward. As you know, he wants to reopen the economy sooner rather than later. The president said there will be guidance on that in a few days. And he claimed that he has total authority to do do so even though it was states who actually shut down business. The president of the United States has the authority to do what the president has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The president of the United States calls the shots. They can't do anything without the approval of the president of the United States. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. Even not all uh, Republicans are agreeing with that. This from Wyoming Rep. Liz Cheney. The federal government does not have absolute power. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states or reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, there are two groups of states, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, uh, disagreeing with the president, all but one Democratic governor saying that they will come up with their own plans on when to reopen for for business in their states based on what's happening with this virus. Testing continues to be a big concern with the president pushing to reopen for business as of May 1st. Again, he says he's going to issue some guidance on that after consulting with his task force in the next few days. Corey. Wow, just about two weeks away. Tracy, thank you. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve. Social distancing is making a difference, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging, especially if restrictions are lifted too soon. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. 
We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. Yo, While in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20 year old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's, it's just it's shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt, among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Jane Winehouse and her husband, Michael, are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator, because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island... <laughs> When Korean War veteran Her Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade Don't to his front hands, door. I'll shake your hands. I'll salute you, though. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Glad to hear about some progress. Miguel, thank you. Thousands of families across the country are left without homes after violent storms sparked a string of tornadoes across the southeast. That severe weather began Easter Sunday in the deep south and moved up the east coast, killing over 30 people. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. A string of deadly tornadoes tearing a path from the deep south. Oh my through the East Coast. It's a war zone, looks like. The battle with Mother Nature leaving more than 20 dead, dozens more wounded. Storms swallowing entire communities. Easter Sunday prayers quickly shifting to pleas for survival. Lord, I pray everybody okay. This is the Lord Jesus. In Charlotte, teams worked for 45 minutes. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. You know? She was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. Digging a resident from the debris. In Virginia, a stranded driver is pulled from the rising floodwaters. The wreckage stretches across multiple states. Homes and businesses in ruins, vehicles tossed on their sides, power lines ripped down. More than a million left without electricity across the strike zone after reports of more than 40 twisters. Survivors now struggling to piece together what they can and still protect themselves from COVID-19. I mean, we all teaming up together to help each other. It is tough to social distance in a shelter. But those who rush to safety are doing what they can, now dealing with two threats, the virus and the violent weather. Jay Gray, NBC News. Let's get the latest on that weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning. Just a kind of devastating situation that continues to really unfold across the south and southeast. The storm system pushing offshore, but in that two-day period starting on Easter Sunday, we saw over 700 reports of wind and tornado damages. So today, the threat, it still continues for southern Georgia to northern Florida as well. It is a small area, but Jacksonville, you're on our radar this afternoon with some damaging winds and a few isolated tornadoes. Also behind that potent, strong cold front, is a lot cooler air. Temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. So our temperatures cooling off. You can see for central Texas back in the mid 50s, even for the northeast, a few winds still picking up for northern New England, but a pretty quiet day finally. So we're going to leave this severe weather behind, but man, we're still talking about snow for the southern plains. Gosh, severe weather now into snow. You know, just adding to the craziness that is these times. All right. Thank you, Janessa.
All the Sesame Street friends are coming together virtually to bring some families something very special. Elmo knows it can be hard to be away from your friends, so Elmo's mommy and daddy are helping Elmo set up a video play date. <laughs> well, the nonprofit behind Sesame Street put together a simulcast as part of their initiative to support families during the COVID-19 crisis. And a few stars liked the idea. They decided to tag along. Elmo's play date airs tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern on PBS Kids. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe. Jennifer Lopez, they're sending a warm message of gratitude to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. While there is no official cure or vaccine for the coronavirus, medical teams around the world are working to develop treatments to help those already infected. Some patients are participating in clinical drug trials that experts say are showing some promise. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. On the ICU floor at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, a drug trial for a potential lifesaver. This is um, remdesivir versus placebo for one of our patients. Doctors prescribing remdesivir delivered in IV form to patients sick with COVID-19. The Emory trial is one of the largest in the world. Infectious disease expert Dr. Anish Mehta is the chief investigator. What we're searching for are medications that will help people get over the infection more rapidly and allow their immune systems to really kick in and knock the virus out of their body. Remdesivir was originally tested to treat Ebola patients, but early results suggest it could be far more effective in treating COVID-19. It's a double-blind NIH study, meaning patients and doctors don't know who gets a placebo. What we have seen is lots of patients recovering. Whether that's because they're getting a study drug or a placebo, we don't know. In Washington state, ICU doctors did give remdesivir to Chris Kane as he struggled to breathe. I mean, within 48 hours, I was feeling a lot better. We're just so thankful. And then I, yeah, to get him on this, to get him on this <laughs> drug so quickly was just an absolute godsend. Now, researchers could be just two to three weeks away from a major breakthrough, determining whether remdesivir should be the go-to treatment in hospitals. Meanwhile, doctors are increasingly cautious about an unproven treatment touted by President Trump, hydroxychloroquine combined with an antibiotic. Researchers in Brazil canceled a small chloroquine study after some patients developed cardiac arrhythmias and even died. But back at Emory, some COVID patients are insisting on getting what they heard President Trump talk up. And they say, I don't want an experimental drug. I want the drug on the news. If approved, drug maker Gilead says it could have enough remdesivir to treat 140,000 people immediately and half a million by October. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Tom? Thank you. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns grow for voters' health. Obama said in a statement that Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed for $20,000 to help the restaurant maintain its staff, but a veteran bought it for $40,000. Ultra's World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making debut. It became the highest-grossing digital title in movie history, scoring the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an online demand release. Stocks were down on Monday, but today kicks off major earnings season with a few of the bigs, including J.P. Morgan Chase and Johnson & Johnson, reporting in the age of coronavirus. Here with a preview and some good news on the hiring front is CNBC's Juliana Tattlebaum. Hi, uh, Juliana, good morning. Good morning. Yes, so U.S. stock futures point to a stronger day of trade this morning after a weaker day yesterday. Of course, this follows a very strong week last week where we saw stocks rebound very strongly. Uh, J.P. Morgan kicks it off in the banking space with Wells Fargo today, Johnson & Johnson in the healthcare space. And overall, investors are bracing for a weak earnings season. Oh, putting it all together, analysts expect earnings to have declined 10% year-on-year year in the first quarter as the pandemic takes hold. Uh, 
we have had some encouraging comments on the virus front, and perhaps that's boosting sentiment as well with New York Governor uh, Cuomo saying it appears the worst is over if we continue to be smart going forward. And on the hiring front, you mentioned one company is in focus hiring 75,000 more workers on top of the 100,000 they've already hired last month. That is Amazon. They're experiencing an increase in demand. And as a result, they're looking to hire more warehouse workers, more delivery workers. So hopefully they can absorb some of those workers who've been laid off in other parts of the economy. Back to you. A lot of people needing a job right around now. Juliana, thank you. Right, everyone, we continue to try to flatten the curve, and this is actually some great data that we're going to show you region by region. This is a down tick compared to last Sunday and the Sunday before, where we're finally at a two to three percent across the north and south. So, we continue to really need to be dealing with it for the next few days. Right? All right, Janessa, thank you. Most of us took it for granted and now it is in short supply. Of course, we are talking about toilet paper. And Nelson Garcia from Denver's KUSA has the story on one Colorado artist commemorating the item left on so many shopping lists. Lately, I've been doing a lot of foliage paintings. The author Oscar Wilde once said, quote, life imitates art. This is a very, very close friend and fellow painter. Far more than art imitates life. That one is a, a blackberry bramble with the berries partway through the ripening process. Capturing the world's essence through the eyes of artist Robin Cole. You have a, an interesting moment with a wild animal, you know, something like that. Uh, those moments really, really stand out to me and that sort of magical realism that happens is something I'm, I'm really interested in representing in my creative work. But throughout her career in color. I've noticed that all of my painting has become a little less hard-edged, a little less over-informative, and a little more natural and expressive and brushy. Cole never painted anything like this. This ridiculous substance has achieved a, a pretty divine place in our society for this moment in time, such that it's totally unattainable. She calls it art in the time of corona. It seems like this would make a lot of people happy and smile, maybe if they hang it above their toilet in their bathroom. So. A tribute to that elusive item that left shoppers empty-handed, staring at empty shelves. Which is why I decided to paint it with this, you know, bathed in holy light type of environment, which is something I invented a little bit with the setup I had. I was just painting a roll that I had in my bathroom. That beautiful Renaissance rust gold brown that you see in the background is, is really actually a visual interpretation of particle board. <laughs> Out of all her work. This situation in which we find ourselves, I think everybody's going through their own process of trying to grapple with the bizarre new reality in so many ways. Cole says this one is well received. I've had a number of inquiries actually, uh, so many that I'm, I'm thinking of maybe doing a limited edition run of prints, which is not something I do very often with my pieces. Art inspired by life. I would prefer not to be remembered <laughs> for summing up the coronavirus with a toilet paper painting. Giving people something Cole believes. I would just throw out there that a quarantine is a great time to learn to paint. Everyone seems to need. People really like looking at beautiful things. You know, it's there's something very pleasing about that. And they just get a laugh out of it, which was my ultimate goal. We hope your Tuesday is on a roll. It I'm is. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Two ply masterpiece. I love it. Thanks for watching early today. I am Philip Mena along for the Corey Coffin here. We leave you with this neighborhood performance. It is an Ecuadorian firefighter bringing a little joy to families in quarantine, climbing up his ladder to serenade them with his trumpet. Have a great day. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, 
you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we got our very own Today Family Getaway! Yeah. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? As the worldwide pandemic passes the two million mark, President Trump says he has the last word on reopening the country. States may beg to differ when it comes to the facts. This morning, more encouraging patterns emerging in different parts of the U.S. with almost 600,000 COVID-19 cases reported so far. We will break it down for you with the very latest details. To the heartland where America's farmers are battling to deliver fresh produce, but finding it's a whole lot harder during quarantine. Plus, we'll look at the suddenly unemployed millions struggling to put food on the table and what's being done about it. Early today starts right now. Good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this coronavirus pandemic. There is hope that we are beginning to see a flattening of the curve, but the death toll continues to rise with the virus claiming the lives of more than 23,000 people. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. A food bank in San Antonio says they're feeding about 120,000 people per week instead of their usual 58,000. Scenes like this are playing out all across the country. Let's head over to West Palm Beach, where a group called Feeding South Florida has started a new weekly service. Organizers hope to distribute a week's worth of groceries to 1,000 families in need every Monday. The program started this week. They have so far been able to feed about 800 families. They've had to turn away hundreds more. Burger King is offering students a chance to win a free Whopper. All they have to do is make a purchase using their app and correctly answer a question to get that free burger. The fast food chain says it's trying to feed minds while schools are closed. And John Krasinski rewarded healthcare workers in Boston with some help from the legendary Big Boppy David Ortiz. <laughs> in the latest episode of Krasinski's online show, Some Good News, employees at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center found out that they are getting Red Sox tickets for life. Well, this global pandemic continues to cause so many historic moments. For the first time ever, the Supreme Court is going virtual. They will hear arguments on half of the remaining cases by phone. Audio of those sessions will be made available to the public. And guess who's also working remotely? 
Here you go, everyone on Sesame Street. Elmo is hosting a virtual play date tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. He'll be joined by friends like Anne Hathaway and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Some people who will be returning to work are the wrestlers for the WWE. The company has now been deemed an essential business in Florida so they can resume taping for their audience-free shows in Orlando. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 they hired last month. In New York, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak is seeing signs of hope that the curve is flattening in the state. The encouraging news comes as New York marks more than 10,000 COVID-19 related deaths. But a decline in cases and hospitalizations has led Governor Cuomo to meet with other Northeast governors about plans to reopen. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. As powerful winds and heavy rain pound the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, a break in the ongoing storm. While the death toll has topped 10,000 in New York State, ICU admissions and intubations are dropping. The number of newly hospitalized patients is the lowest it's been in two weeks. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Governor Andrew Cuomo is clashing publicly with Bill de Blasio over whether the New York City mayor has the authority to close schools through the remainder of the academic year. It is not shocking that sometimes there's just differences of perspective. Strong winds threaten this field hospital in Central Park and force the closure of several testing facilities across the region. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. I was holding the iPad and I was holding her hand and I'm hysterical crying and I'm in all my gear so like my glasses are all foggy and um, I was just like oh my gosh like how am I gonna handle doing this for multiple people? One of her patients died on Sunday. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there. Among the lives lost, William Sullivan, a beloved police detective in Yonkers. Anthony Cousy was known as one of the best sports photographers in New York City. For decades, Rakan Kim had been a mailman in the Bronx. We were just hoping for the best, but um, in the end, they said that he isn't going to make it past today. At this rate, COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. Now, the governors of six northeastern states have formed what is essentially a regional task force to discuss how best to reopen the economy here. Corey? Okay, Gabe, thank you. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. The president is increasingly turning his focus on one goal, reopening the U.S. economy. Now, he has May 1st circled on his calendar, but even his own health experts warn that it must be gradual. NBC's Peter Alexander has more. President Trump eagerly eyeing what he's called a big bang to restart the economy as early as May 1st, expressing optimism. We're getting rid of the plague. It's a plague on our country like nobody's ever seen. Dr. Anthony Fauci envisioning, in his words, a rolling re-entry, possibly next month. It is not going to be a light switch that we say, OK, it is now June, July or whatever. Click the, the, the light switch goes back on. The CDC director cautions against moving too quickly. It's going to be a step-by-step -step gradual process. It's got to be data-driven. Among the keys to safely getting back to business, according to public health experts, a major increase in tests to see who has the virus, wide use of an antibody test to determine who's already had it and may now have immunity, and contact tracing to isolate people who've interacted with someone who's infected. Vice President Mike Pence asking governors for help ramping up testing, with concerns testing machines still are not running anywhere near full capacity. Increasing in testing will, is continuing on a daily basis, and it is going to need to be in place in order for us to effectively reopen. And after weeks saying it was up to governors to impose stay-at-home orders, President Trump is now insisting he has the sole power to decide how and when states reopen, tweeting, it is the decision of the president and for many good reasons. But most legal experts disagree 
arguing the president does not have the authority to direct states to lift their emergency orders. The governors of seven northeastern states that represent more than half the nation's coronavirus cases are banding together to outline the steps they will take to ease restrictions. Three western states doing the same. This has to be informed by experts and by data. You take one step forward, you see how it works, and then you measure the next step. Also making headlines, President Trump's retweet of a post with the hashtag Fire Fauci after Dr. Fauci acknowledged more lives could have been saved if the country had been shut down earlier. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. Late Monday, when the president called Dr. Fauci to the podium during the briefing, Fauci said that was the wrong choice of words and said the president has taken his advice. President Trump later said he is not firing Dr. Fauci. Corey. Peter, thanks. 130 million people are under wind alerts from Florida to Maine after dozens of twisters killed at least 33 people in the South. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in the storm zone. The South facing a disaster nightmare. Watch it coming! Yep, I see it, I see it. More than 50 reported tornadoes since Sunday. Like a loud roaring sound and a lot, a lot of cracking sound. In Louisiana, Willie Grayson's family was watching an Easter service on TV. The dinner table was here. When the tornado struck. I'm getting the kids, telling them to get under the bed. I'm yelling for my wife. She's screaming, the roof coming off. She runs, trying to run to me. And then the whole roof flew up. This home ripped right off its own foundation, stopping drivers in their tracks after being tossed into the road. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Georgia. Now all of a sudden I heard that train noise. I get in the closet. Front end of the trailer was coming up. With you inside. With us both inside. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. In Mississippi, a tornado so powerful, radar captured debris thrown up to 60 miles away. The damage these storms leave behind forces an incredibly tough call. How to enforce stay-at-home orders for a virus when hundreds have no house? to go home to. We would typically go to a, a school gymnasium or something like that that we'd set up a shelter. So we're trying to get people into um, hotel rooms. In Alabama, those stay-at-home orders suspended. Images inside storm shelters capturing people doing whatever they can to social distance. Our thanks to, to Morgan Chesky for that report. Let's head on over to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Tracking those storms the last two days, thankfully moving on. J Janessa, good morning. Good morning. Just a very devastating situation that continues to really unfold for the South and Southeast, even the Mid-Atlantic yesterday. We're dealing with wind gusts in New York City up to 73 miles per hour. And so hopefully the storm system will continue to push offshore. But the severe weather threat, it is still enhanced for southern Georgia to northern Florida for today. Damaging wind gusts and isolated tornado possible. We're also watching the backside of the system. Cool air. I mean, this is April spring chill that's happening across the southern plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So temperatures below average, we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the Ohio Valley. Going to finally see a peak of sunshine for the northeast this afternoon. Enjoy. So watching the severe weather for Florida, then finally things clear out. Mm. Can't wait for that, right, Janessa? Thank you so much. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns for voters' health grow. In a statement, she says Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed at 20000 It sold to a veteran for 40000 Trolls World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making digital debut, becoming the highest grossing digital title in movie history, the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an on-demand release. A 93-year-old woman gets crafty during the pandemic. Olive Veronesi found herself all tapped out and held up a sign that said she needed more beer. <laughs> well, Coors Light answered the call, giving her 150 cans. Now this golden girl is indebted to Golden Colorado and chugging her way into our hearts. Talk about an American <laughs> treasure. That's how this you do it. fantastic. You <laughs> just got to ask for what you need for it, right? Oh, there you go. We're all here to help.
Well, the U.S. Treasury Department says 80 million Americans will get some much-needed help, get those relief checks this week. But that leaves millions more still waiting with money getting tighter. As Stephanie Rule reports, food banks now facing unprecedented crunches. Bumper-to-bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Terry Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. A lot of great advice, Stephanie. Thank you. Tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. It starts at 10.10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC and MSNBC. Global cases of coronavirus continue to grow. There are now almost 2 million infections worldwide. And as the cases surge, sadly, so do the number of deaths. In Europe, Italy has reached another grim milestone, while in Spain, they have appeared to reach their peak. Uh, for the latest on this global fight against COVID-19, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry, joining us live from London this morning. Hey, Cal, good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So it was on April 2nd when the world hit a million cases of coronavirus. We're now at 2 million. So just in 11 days, a million more cases. This, as countries across Europe have now been in lockdown for a month, and some are looking to ease restrictions. Here in the United Kingdom, we will probably see things stay the way they are. This country is going through the worst of it right now, and there's some concern that the death toll is actually being underreported, that we're only seeing uh, death tolls reported of people who have tested positive and died in hospital that leaves out a lot of people who may have died in rest homes or in their own homes. Now, in Spain, we are seeing some restrictions eased. Non-essential workers will be headed to work today, really, for the first time, yesterday being a holiday. In Italy, we are going to also see some essential stores open. That is key there. In France and India, however, we will see a continuation of the lockdown. India, in particular, 1.3 billion people there continue to be locked down, guys. Cal Perry with the very latest on the global fight against COVID-19. Cal, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We continue to track COVID-19 by region, and we're still seeing that uptick for the Northeast. But look at this. Last Sunday, the Sunday before that, we always see the uptick. And finally, we're seeing that downward trend. We'll wait at least two more days to really see if we're flattening the curve, but we're on the right track. Nice. Got to keep with that compliance, Janessa. Thank you. 
The agricultural industry has been hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Across the country, crops at their peak are now going to waste. NBC's Carrie Sanders explains why from a farm in Palm Beach County, Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. Ripe zucchini and squash dumped, rotting. Tractors plowing under a ready-to-pick crop of green beans. It's a harvest of sadness driven by coronavirus. On just this one farm, one million pounds of green beans already mulched back into the soil. It's the same story with sweet corn, cabbage, cucumbers, blueberries. Why? A large percentage of those were meant for restaurants and schools and, you know, ships and cruise lines and... And, you know, obviously that industry just shut down. Crops like these endless acres of sweet corn here. Grocery stores unable to absorb this immense added harvest, ripening all at once because stores are already stocked. And in this refrigerated warehouse, three million ears of sweet corn. Farmers say they're heartbroken because... This is all going to be thrown away. Some is donated, like the 4,000 ears of corn we saw given to a local fire department, but... Well, the supply chain is not there to cover the... Even if you wanted to give it away to people that weren't needy, it's not there. You know, it's just not. It's not just vegetables. In Wisconsin, dairy farmers dumping more than 3 million gallons of milk a day after schools closed. So far, the fourth generation Hinchley dairy avoiding those milk dumps. Still, it's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Hit especially hard the Harpke family in Dania Beach, Florida, a $250,000 a year boutique farm growing microgreens for high-end chefs whose restaurants are now closed. We need the restaurants. Yes, absolutely. Without them? Without them, we've got some serious things to figure out around here if we want to stay, stay, stay afloat and keep five people employed with us. All this while the Harpkeys are expecting their first child. Adding to the Harpke family challenge, Claire, who is pregnant, has had a recurrence of cancer. Meantime, farmers say none of this makes sense. They're destroying crops while at the same time, imports are still crossing the border from Mexico. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Pahokee, Florida. And thanks for waking up with us. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. We got our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now.
Coronavirus cases have now topped 2 million worldwide as testing ramps up, but optimism is also growing as social distancing is having an impact on flattening the curve. Governor Cuomo forms a seven-state joint task force to look at reopening the economies, but President Trump claims it's really his call to make. We'll go behind the decision-making impacting your lives. And uh, we're just now getting a real assessment of the damage caused by some wicked storms that spread from the deep south to the northeast. It is Tuesday, April 14th. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. Governors are coming together to discuss when and how to reopen their states. But during this pandemic, during a pandemic pre press briefing yesterday, President Trump says he has total authority over them. Here's what you need to know at this hour. It has been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today, the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000 as the number of confirmed cases creeps even higher towards 600,000. In New York City, they're in such dire need of medical supplies that officials are now getting creative. According to the Wall Street Journal, staffers with the mayor's office reached out to the New York Mets to get rain ponchos from them. Meantime, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. Company also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. A new change to Ticketmaster policies has created outrage with consumers. The company is no longer offering refunds on postponed or rescheduled shows. The platform is now only giving refunds for canceled events. John Krasinski surprises healthcare workers in Boston on his latest episode of the show, Some Good News. He spoke to staff at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center with the help from the legendary Big Poppy, David Ortiz. The Red Sox donated four tickets for life to employees. A group of New Yorkers are suing Grubhub, DoorDash, Postmates, and Uber Eats, accusing them of price gouging during the pandemic. The suit claims that these services jacked up the prices of orders, imposing fees of 10 to 40 percent. The accusers are seeking class action status. Companies have declined to respond. And Burger King is putting students to the test. The fast food chain is offering free Whoppers if students can answer a few math problems correctly. The offer is available through their app. College students are trying to recover their tuition money as well. Students at Drexel University and the University of Miami have filed class action lawsuits claiming they've paid for services they're no longer using. The universities have declined to comment. Students at NYU have also started a petition to get a partial reimbursement. And the state of Florida has deemed WWE SmackDown an essential business. Governor Ron DeSantis has given the WWE the green light to resume wrestling matches on live TV starting next week. Those events will run without fans. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. What to expect is anyone's guess, though, after last night's brief devolved into a fiery clash with the press. NBC's Alice Barr has more. President Trump on offense, responding to criticism. He didn't act quickly enough to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Everything we did was right. Reporting from the New York Times and other outlets documents repeated early warnings in January and February inside the Trump administration, weeks before the president finally called on Americans to stop the spread in mid-March. In response, he played a campaign-style video from the briefing room, attacking the media, touting compliments from governors, and again highlighting his late January travel ban from China. So I issued travel restrictions on that date, even though nobody died, and I got brutalized over it by the press. That ban bought the country time to prepare. The president pressed on how his administration used it. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. A lot. Top health official Dr. Anthony Fauci also clarifying his comments that earlier action could have saved lives, saying President Trump listened to his advice. The first and only time that I went in and said we should do mitigation strongly, the response was yes, we'll do it. After retweeting a comment with the hashtag Fire Fauci, President Trump saying they work well together. The president also saying he hopes to reopen the country ahead of schedule. He's been eyeing a May 1st target date, insisting it's his decision to make, though the Constitution leaves it to the states. The president of the United States calls the shots. The head of the Centers for Disease Control said each community will need a targeted approach. It's going to be a step-by-step -step gradual process. 
faced with what he calls his toughest decision yet. President Trump now weighing the potential human cost of reopening the U.S. economy. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging and clusters of cases where the numbers are still rising. Social distancing is making a difference, but in some regions it could get worse before it gets better. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. Yo, While in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20-year-old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's it's just shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Jane Winehouse and her husband, Michael, are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator, because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island... When Korean War veteran Her Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade Don't to his front face door. Face face. I'll shake your hands. I'll salute you, though. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Progress in L.A. and New York. All right, Miguel, thank you. Medical experts are racing around the clock to find a vaccine for coronavirus. But most say the key to jumpstarting the economy will depend on testing and tracking. And this morning, there are new developments on both fronts, including antibody testing, which could help people fight the virus. NBC's Gotti Schwartz explains. With much of America shut down, the promise of progress. New COVID-19 blood tests called antibody tests could help get some Americans back to work. Dr. Margaret Zhang just took one in New York. Having antibodies and knowing that I'm as immune as one could be to COVID right now makes me feel even more kind of inclined to serve. UCLA began using its own version of antibody testing, focusing on thousands of medical workers. How can we expect our health workforce to be protecting us if we're not doing everything that we can to protect them? The concept is simple. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, it's because of special antibodies in your immune system that have developed to fight it off, and those will likely protect you from future infection. In the case of medical workers, those with antibodies could become super soldiers in the fight against COVID-19. I think that healthcare workers who know that they have antibodies will be able to go into the to to their work more confident that they are not going to be getting themselves sick or then passing this virus on to to others around them. Other tests are being given to the general public in Los Angeles as well. 64-year-old Deborah Presley had her finger pricked and blood drawn as part of a USC study. Within minutes, she learned she had antibodies to fight off coronavirus. When you found out that you had the antibodies, what went through your mind? I'm a caregiver, and I go to different people's homes, and it's just such a relief because now that I can, now I can help other people. Now dozens of labs all across the country are working on their own antibody tests. Last week, the Trump administration said they are working to make antibody testing free and widely available. Starting with the next week or so, we'll be able to scale up the kind of antibody testing to give you a good feel for what the penetrance of the infection is. But you can start think about 
some aspect of getting back to normal without having tested everybody in the country, that's for sure. But the FDA commissioner also warning not every antibody test is accurate. No test is 100% perfect, but what we don't want are wildly inaccurate tests. Then there are the diagnostic coronavirus tests, but all told, still less than 1% of the U.S. population has been tested. Just a fraction of what experts say is needed to get a clear sense of how many people may be infected. For now, making complete contact tracing still out of reach. Something authorities say is vital for stopping the virus's spread. And our thanks to Gotti Schwartz for that report. The South is recovering after being hit by severe tornadoes. The violent weather began Easter Sunday in the Deep South and moved up the East Coast. More than 30 people were killed by the twisters and many more left homeless. NBC's Dan Shenneman has more. Destruction from the Deep South to the Mid-Atlantic. A storm system unleashed dozens of tornadoes. In Mississippi, buildings flattened, a truck flipped over like a toy. The governor reported damage in almost every region of the state. Tens of thousands of Mississippians lost power. We already know that hundreds of homes were destroyed or badly damaged. In Georgia, rubble is now scattered where homes once stood just a day earlier. That is the house my mama grew up in that I raised my kids in. Storms also hit the Carolinas. A tree fell in a home in Charlotte, North Carolina. Neighbors called for help. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. Uh, she was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. So we ended up having to call the ambulance, like knock on the door to make sure she's okay. The region must now go into recovery mode while it struggles to deal with a pandemic. I was dealing with one situation with the coronavirus and all that stuff, and now you have this, you know. This is right here in your face. It's right, right now. It's like you have to deal with it. A lot to deal with in a region ravaged by storms. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. And NBC's meteorologist Janessa Webb has been following all of that extreme weather for us. Let's check in with her now. Janessa, good morning. Good morning. These storms have finally pushed out of the area, but we had reports of over 700 wind damages and also combined with tornadoes in a two-day period starting on Easter Sunday. And unfortunately, that severe risk is pretty minor for South Georgia into Florida this afternoon, but it's still there. Temperatures are well above normal. So we're going to continue to deal with that severe weather until it pushes offshore. Now, on the back end of this system, though, we do have a colder air that is producing freeze watches and warnings across the central plains all the way into the southern plains as well. Temperatures are nearly 25 to 30 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So we'll continue to watch for Florida today where highs will continue to be well above normal. We're back in the mid 90s, but cooler air even for the northeast all the way into the central plains. So watching the severe weather, hopefully after this pushes offshore, we'll finally get a break. Guys, we can only hope. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. A disinfection station was installed in Brazil to help stop the spread of coronavirus. It was placed at the entrance of a train station in the city of Osasco. Tents are set up and a solution is sprayed into the air, covering people as they pass underneath. The mayor of Osasco said that the solution is recommended by the World Health Organization to protect against the virus. If you're looking for work, tech giant Amazon is ramping up its hiring yet again. The company has announced it's looking to hire some 75,000 more workers. This is in addition to the more than 100,000 positions the company filled across the country over the last month. Amazon says the hiring spree is to help meet a surge in demand tied to the coronavirus outbreak. A FedEx driver went out of his way to help ease concerns about delivery for a family whose daughter has an autoimmune disease. The driver noticed the sign that was hanging on the family's front door, so he wiped down the box and told the family the package had been sanitized. The mother posted a picture of the wiped down box on Twitter and had one word to describe the situation. Amazing. And the smiley face at the bottom there. Stay safe. <laughs> we love that. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank all of the hospital workers, the doctors, nurses, and staff at New York Presbyterian Hospital um, for fighting the good fight. Uh, your heroic efforts have not gone unnoticed. We love you. We thank you. Stay safe.
I keep Hi, these everyone. messages coming. Jennifer Lopez sending a message of gratitude there to the frontline medical heroes at New York Presbyterian in her hometown of New York City. A 50-year-old man has now recovered after surviving a harrowing battle with coronavirus. He spent three weeks on a ventilator but was finally able to go home on Easter Sunday. NBC's Steve Patterson has his inspiring story. This Easter Sunday, a California hospital resonating with waves of applause for 50-year-old Ramon Zuniga, who fought the coronavirus and won after spending 19 days on a ventilator. I seemed to exist, but I really wasn't sure if I existed. I didn't know if I had passed on or not. For over a month, ICU doctor Alex Hakim documented Ramon's journey and, in a way, his own. I don't know if I have the right words right now to express just how I feel. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And as for Ramon, he's grateful for the gift of life. I've managed to beat this, but all the credit goes to them. All the nurses, all the doctors. But you gave them hope. Hope. That's what doctors and nurses who saved Ramon will carry with them as they head back to the front lines. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Los Angeles. the last month we've always had this uptick on Mondays Sundays we kind of go down but look at this this is finally the consistency we were looking for for a three-day period of time and then also look by region the percentage almost down to one to two percent so we are seeing a slight growth in our deaths and that's really unfortunate but case by case we are on that downward curve so hopefully this is a consistent we were hoping to go for a five-day period of time so we're really going to be watching today wednesday and thursday very closely all right we'll thank right you back. thank you janessa We are back with a huge outpouring of support for a 25-year-old Minnesota man who's recovering after spending nearly two weeks on a ventilator in the ICU battling COVID-19. His Iowa hometown rallying to show they care. Reporter Boyd Hooper from CARE 11 in Minneapolis has the story. Fewer than 1,000 people live in Buffalo Center, Iowa. And on March 31st, all of them seem to be on the same road. United in support for Troy Ketwick and his family. It was scary. <laughs> There's no way around that. Rachel Rowling is Troy's fiance, unable to be by the side of her high school sweetheart, as the previously healthy 25-year-old with no underlying conditions spent 12 days on a ventilator at St. Paul's United Hospital with COVID-19. He was just showing your basic flu-like symptoms. And then that Monday following, he started to run a really high fever. With Troy heavily sedated, his family and Rachel were briefed two to three times a day by Troy's doctor and nurses. There's something Thing so difficult and just not being able to be present with your loved one, even if they're not awake, to have them know that you're there for support. No doubting the support in Troy's hometown. It looped past the nursing home where his grandma lives, then out to his parents in the country. There are no words to describe that. It's a very field of dreams moment. <laughs> a week after the drive-by, the moment got better. When did he come off the ventilator? Tuesday morning. Good day. Very good day. Rachel is hoping yeah. Troy will be back with her sometime this week, back preparing for their August wedding. He so appreciates all the love and all the prayers. Back on the road to recovery. The entire town participating. Yeah, love and support is something that everyone needs when they're trying to recover from something like that. And Troy has it all he could ever want, even at a distance. Yeah. In between uh, at-home workouts, athletes have been working on new hobbies to share with everyone on social media. Philadelphia Eagles kicker Jake Elliott showed off some of his talents. Catch that one. In a whole different sport. He's been sinking those in his house from that fake green. He used this pool table here. That is a nice man cave. The links wow. could be in Elliott's future when his time on the gridiron ends. I don't know if we're going to have an NFL on Sundays. I hope we do. But if we don't, I have a feeling we might be watching a lot of these uh, trick shot videos. Yeah, these Sunday. videos could suffice. <laughs> I'd like to know, just like the, the gentleman we featured yesterday, how many attempts did it take him to get mm, it right? <laughs> we'll never know that. The magic of editing. <laughs> All right. Have a safe Tuesday, everyone. Thanks for waking up with us on Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. As the 
the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country. Get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, and pluralistic, equal, and open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Vegas, Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we get to have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? As the worldwide pandemic passes the two million mark, President Trump says he has the last word on reopening the country. States may beg to differ when it comes to the facts. This morning, more encouraging patterns emerging in different parts of the U.S. with almost 600,000 COVID-19 cases reported so far. We will break it down for you with the very latest details. To the heartland where America's farmers are battling to deliver fresh produce, but finding it's a whole lot harder during quarantine. Plus, we'll look at the suddenly unemployed millions struggling to put food on the table and what's being done about it. Early today starts right now. Good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this coronavirus pandemic. There is hope that we are beginning to see a flattening of the curve, but the death toll continues to rise with the virus claiming the lives of more than 23,000 people. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. A food bank in San Antonio says they're feeding about 120,000 people per week instead of their usual 58,000. Scenes like this are playing out all across the country. Let's head over to West Palm Beach, where a group called Feeding South Florida has started a new weekly service. Organizers hope to distribute a week's worth of groceries to 1,000 families in need every Monday. The program started this week. They have so far been able Able to feed about 800 families. They've had to turn away hundreds more. Burger King is offering students a chance to win a free Whopper. All they have to do is 
make a purchase using their app and correctly answer a question to get that free burger. The fast food chain says it's trying to feed minds while schools are closed. And John Krasinski rewarded healthcare workers in Boston with some help from the legendary Big Boppy David Ortiz. <laughs> in the latest episode of Krasinski's online show, Some Good News, employees at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center found out that they are getting Red Sox tickets for life. Well, this global pandemic continues to cause so many historic moments. For the first time ever, the Supreme Court is going virtual. They will hear arguments on half of their remaining cases by phone. Audio of those sessions will be made available to the public. And guess who's also working remotely? Here you go, everyone on Sesame Street. Elmo is hosting a virtual play date tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern. He'll be joined by friends like Anne Hathaway and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Some people who will be returning to work are the wrestlers for the WWE. The company has now been deemed an essential business in Florida so they can resume taping for their audience-free shows in Orlando. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 they hired last month. In New York, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak is seeing signs of hope that the curve is flattening in the state. The encouraging news comes as New York marks more than 10,000 COVID-19 related deaths. But a decline in cases and hospitalizations has led Governor Cuomo to meet with other Northeast governors about plans to reopen. Here's NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. As powerful winds and heavy rain pound the nation's epicenter of the pandemic, a break in the ongoing storm. While the death toll has topped 10,000 in New York State, ICU admissions and intubations are dropping. The number of newly hospitalized patients is the lowest it's been in two weeks. The worst can be over, and it is over unless we do something reckless. Governor Andrew Cuomo is clashing publicly with Bill de Blasio over whether the New York City mayor has the authority to close schools through the remainder of the academic year. It is not shocking that sometimes there's just differences of perspective. Strong winds threatened this field hospital in Central Park and forced the closure of several testing facilities across the region. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. I was holding the iPad and I was holding her hand and I'm hysterical crying and I'm in all my gear so like my glasses are all foggy and um, I was just like oh my gosh like how am I going to handle doing this for multiple people? One of her patients died on Sunday. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there. Among the lives lost, William Sullivan, a beloved police detective in Yonkers. Anthony Cousy was known as one of the best sports photographers in New York City. For decades, Rakan Kim had been a mailman in the Bronx. We were just hoping for the best, but um, in the end, they said that he isn't going to make it past today. At this rate, COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. Now, the governors of six northeastern states have formed what is essentially a regional task force to discuss how best to reopen the economy here. Corey? Okay, Gabe, thank you. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today before hosting his task force briefing later this evening. The president is increasingly turning his focus on one goal, reopening the U.S. economy. Now, he has May 1st circled on his calendar, but even his own health experts warn that it must be gradual. NBC's Peter Alexander has more. President Trump eagerly eyeing what he's called a big bang to restart the economy as early as May 1st, expressing optimism. We're getting rid of the plague. It's a plague on our country like nobody's ever seen. Dr. Anthony Fauci envisioning, in his words, a rolling re-entry, possibly next month. It is not going to be a light switch that we say, OK, it is now June, July or whatever. Click the, the, the light switch goes back on. The CDC director cautions against moving too quickly. It's going to be a step-by-step a -step gradual process. It's got to be data-driven. Among the keys to safely getting back to business, according to public health experts, a major increase in tests to see who has the virus, wide use of an antibody test to determine who's already had it and may now have immunity, 
and contact tracing to isolate people who've interacted with someone who's infected. Vice President Mike Pence asking governors for help ramping up testing, with concerns testing machines still are not running anywhere near full capacity. Increasing in testing will, you know, is continuing on a daily basis, and it is going to need to be in place in order for us to effectively reopen. And after weeks saying it was up to governors to impose stay-at-home orders, President Trump is now insisting he has the sole power to decide how and when states reopen, tweeting, it is the decision of the president and for many good reasons. But most legal experts disagree, arguing the president does not have the authority to direct states to lift their emergency orders. The governors of seven northeastern states that represent more than half the nation's coronavirus cases are banding together to outline the steps they will take to ease restrictions. Three western states doing the same. This has to be informed by experts and by data. You take one step forward, you see how it works, and then you measure the next step. Also making headlines, President Trump's retweet of a post with the hashtag FireFauci after Dr. Fauci acknowledged more lives could have been saved if the country had been shut down earlier. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. Late Monday, when the president called Dr. Fauci to the podium during the briefing, Fauci said that was the wrong choice of words and said the president has taken his advice. President Trump later said he is not firing Dr. Fauci. Corey. Peter, thanks. 130 million people are under wind alerts from Florida to Maine after dozens of twisters killed at least 33 people in the South. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in the storm zone. The South facing a disaster nightmare. Watch it coming! Yep, I see it, I see it. More than 50 reported tornadoes since Sunday. Like a loud roaring sound and a lot, a lot of cracking sound. In Louisiana, Willie Grayson's family was watching an Easter service on TV. The dinner table was here. When the tornado struck. I'm getting the kids, telling them to get under the bed. I'm yelling for my wife. She's screaming, the roof coming off. She runs, trying to run to me. And then the hall roof flew up. This home ripped right off its own foundation, stopping drivers in their tracks after being tossed into the road. NBC's Blaine Alexander is in Georgia. Now all of a sudden I heard that train noise. I was getting the closet. Front end of the trailer was coming up. With you inside. With us both inside. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. In Mississippi, a tornado so powerful, radar captured debris thrown up to 60 miles away. The damage these storms leave behind forces an incredibly tough call. How to enforce stay at home orders for a virus when hundreds have no house? to go home to. We would typically go to a, a school gymnasium or something like that that we'd set up a shelter. So we're trying to get people into um, hotel rooms. In Alabama, those stay-at-home orders suspended. Images inside storm shelters capturing people doing whatever they can to social distance. Our thanks uh, to Morgan Chesky for that report. Let's head on over to NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Tracking those storms the last two days, thankfully moving on. J Janessa, good morning. Good morning. Just a very devastating situation that continues to really unfold for the South and Southeast, even the Mid-Atlantic yesterday. We we're dealing with wind gusts in New York City up to 73 miles per hour. And so hopefully the storm system will continue to push offshore. But the severe weather threat, it is still enhanced for southern Georgia to northern Florida for today. Damaging wind gusts and isolated tornado possible. We're also watching the backside of the system. Cool air. I mean, this is April spring chill that's happening across the southern plains. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So temperatures below average, we're about 10 to 15 degrees below average across the Ohio Valley. Going to finally see a peak of sunshine for the northeast this afternoon. Enjoy. So watching the severe weather for Florida, then finally things clear out. Mm. Can't wait for that, right, Janessa? Thank you so much. In today's quick hits, former First Lady Michelle Obama is pushing for mail-in voting as concerns for voters' health grow. In a statement, she says Americans shouldn't have to choose between making their voices heard and keeping themselves safe. Two restaurant owners struggling to stay afloat amid the pandemic decided to sell their most valuable item, a 25-year-old bottle of bourbon. It was listed at 20000 It sold to a veteran for 40000 Trolls World Tour, released by our parent company NBC Universal, had a history-making 
digital debut, becoming the highest grossing digital title in movie history, the biggest opening day and weekend grosses for an on-demand release. A 93-year-old woman gets crafty during the pandemic. Olive Veronesi found herself all tapped out and held up a sign that said she needed more beer. Well, Coors Light answered the call, giving her 150 cans. Now this golden girl is indebted to Golden Colorado and chugging her way into our hearts. Talk about an American treasure. That's how you do it. fantastic. You just got to ask for what you need for it, right? Now, there you go. We're all here to help. Well, the U.S. Treasury Department says 80 million Americans will get some much-needed help get those relief checks this week. But that leaves millions more still waiting with money getting tighter. As Stephanie Rule reports, food banks now facing unprecedented crunches. Bumper-to-bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Carrie Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. A lot of great advice. Stephanie, thank you. Tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. It starts at 10.10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on NBC and MSNBC. Global cases of coronavirus continue to grow. There are now almost 2 million infections worldwide. And as the cases surge, sadly, so do the number of deaths. In Europe, Italy has reached another grim milestone, while in Spain, they have appeared to reach their peak. Uh, For the latest on this global fight against COVID-19, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry, joining us live from London this morning. Hey, Cal, good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So it was on April 2nd when the world hit a million cases of coronavirus. We're now at 2 million. So just in 11 days, a million more cases. This, as countries across Europe have now been in lockdown for a month, and some are looking to ease restrictions here in the United Kingdom. We will probably see things stay the way they are. This country is going through the worst of it right now, and there's some concern that the death toll is actually being underreported, that we're only seeing uh, death tolls reported of people who have tested positive and died in hospital That leaves out a lot of people who may have died in rest homes or in their own homes. Now, in Spain, we are seeing some restrictions eased. Non-essential workers will be headed to work today, really, for the first time, yesterday being a holiday. In Italy, we are going to also see some essential stores open. That is key there. In France and India, however, we will see a continuation of the lockdown. India, in particular, 1.3 billion people there continue to be locked down, guys. 
Cal Perry with the very latest on the global fight against COVID-19. Cal, thank you. Good morning, everyone. We continue to track COVID-19 by region, and we're still seeing that uptick for the Northeast. But look at this. Last Sunday, the Sunday before that, we always see the uptick. And finally, we're seeing that downward trend. We'll wait at least two more days to really say if we're flattening the curve, but we're on the right track. Guys. Got to keep with that compliance, Janessa. Thank you. The agricultural industry has been hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Across the country, crops at their peak are now going to waste. NBC's Carrie Sanders explains why from a farm in Palm Beach County, Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. Ripe zucchini and squash dumped, rotting. Tractors plowing under a ready-to-pick crop of green beans. It's a harvest of sadness driven by coronavirus. On just this one farm, one million pounds of green beans already mulched back into the soil. It's the same story with sweet corn, cabbage, cucumbers, blueberries. Why? A large percentage of those were meant for restaurants and schools and, you know, ships and cruise lines and... And, you know, obviously that industry just shut down. Crops like these endless acres of sweet corn here. Grocery stores unable to absorb this immense added harvest, ripening all at once because stores are already stocked. And in this refrigerated warehouse, three million ears of sweet corn. Farmers say they're heartbroken because... This is all going to be thrown away. Some is donated, like the 4,000 ears of corn we saw given to a local fire department, but... Well, the supply chain is not there to cover the... Even if you wanted to give it away to people that weren't needy, it's not there. You know, it's just not. It's not just vegetables. In Wisconsin, dairy farmers dumping more than 3 million gallons of milk a day after schools closed. So far, the fourth generation Hinchley dairy avoiding those milk dumps. Still, it's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Hit especially hard the Harpke family in Dania Beach, Florida, a $250,000 a year boutique farm growing microgreens for high-end chefs whose restaurants are now closed. We need the restaurants. Yes, absolutely. Without them? Without them, we've got some serious things to figure out around here if we want to stay, stay, stay afloat and keep five people employed with us. All this while the Harpkeys are expecting their first child. Adding to the Harpke family challenge, Claire, who is pregnant, has had a recurrence of cancer. Meantime, farmers say none of this makes sense. They're destroying crops while at the same time, imports are still crossing the border from Mexico. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Pahokee, Florida. And thanks for waking up with us. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. We get to have our very own Today family getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern.
we've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes. Subscribe now. The death toll in the U.S. fast approaching 24,000, with the worldwide number of COVID-19 cases surpassing 2 million. But the governor of New York says the worst is over if we stick to social distancing. This morning, our exclusive look inside the ICU conducting trials on a potential coronavirus treatment with surprising results. Are they close to a breakthrough? My dad come around, came on around, and we both pushed that we lived the top of the house off of my mom as my son was trying to hold it and pull my mom out at the same time. Acts of heroism amid the despair of violent tornadoes taking the lives of almost three dozen people in the South. And art imitates life, how one precious commodity during the time of quarantine has reached a whole new status. Early today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. It is Tuesday morning and the debate continues over when and how America will begin to reopen amid this pandemic. It's been one month since President Trump declared the pandemic a national emergency. And today the death toll in this country has surpassed 23,000. The number of confirmed cases in the U.S. now creeping towards 600,000. State leaders in California, Oregon and Washington are working together on a plan to slowly lift restrictions. Governor Gavin Newsom called it a regional pact to recovery and We'll provide more details later today. Meantime, seven crew members on the hospital ship USNS Mercy have tested positive for COVID-19. They are now in isolation. The ship is docked in the port of Los Angeles. Officials say this doesn't affect their ability to treat patients. Meanwhile, Ford is partnering with 3M to make an air purifying respirator. The device will use parts from their F-150. The company is also making medical gowns from airbag material and is teaming up with GE to make ventilators. Cars snaked around the block to get supplies at a food bank in Phoenix. With so much of the country shut down, millions of people are struggling to put food on the table. St. Mary's Food Bank gives out 45,000 food boxes every month normally. That number almost doubled since the pandemic. And a champion on and off the court, Houston Rockets star Russell Westbrook is helping students by donating 650 laptops to families who can't afford them. Westbrook's Why Not Foundation teamed up with nonprofit CompuDot to help students in Houston during the pandemic. And the PGA has also created a relief fund for $5 million to help workers in the golf industry. The company has also pledged to match up to $2.5 million of donations. That relief fund will provide need-based grants. As we stay locked inside, wild animals are reclaiming national parks. More than ever before, Yosemite National Park employees are spotting coyotes, bears, and bobcats. The bear population has reportedly quadrupled in the area. Amazon is also looking to put more people to work. To meet the high demand, the company says they're hiring 75,000 more employees. That's on top of the 100,000 that they hired last month. President Trump will welcome recovered coronavirus patients to the White House today. That will be before his uh, hosting his task force briefing later on this evening. Now, what to expect is anyone's guess, especially after last night's briefing devolved into a fiery clash with the press. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us from D.C. with the latest. Tracy, the president railed on reports that he ignored the threat of the virus early on. Right. The president continues to defend how he dealt with this virus in the beginning, uh, saying at this briefing that he did everything right and that thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives were saved. He also talked about what to do going forward. As you know, he wants to reopen the economy sooner rather than later. The president said there will be guidance on that in a few days. And he claimed that he has total authority to do do so even though it was states who actually shut down business. The President of the United States has the authority to do 
what the president has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The president of the United States calls the shots. They can't do anything without the approval of the president of the United States. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. Even not all uh, Republicans are agreeing with that. This from Wyoming Rep. Liz Cheney. The federal government does not have absolute power. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, there are two groups of states, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast, uh, disagreeing with the president, all but one Democratic governor saying that they will come up with their own plans on when to reopen for business in their states based on what's happening with this virus. Testing continues to be a big concern with the president pushing to reopen for business as of May 1st. Again, he says he's going to issue some guidance on that after consulting with his task force in the next few days. Corey. Wow, just about two weeks away. Tracy, thank you. There have been some states that have shown progress at potentially flattening the curve. Social distancing is making a difference, but there are still concerns about new hotspots emerging, especially if restrictions are lifted too soon. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. The director for the CDC says the coronavirus epidemic in our nation could peak in days. Top doctors believe the deadly outbreak has stabilized, but warn of new hotspots and dangerous clusters. In South Dakota at Smithfield Foods, one of the largest pork plants in the U.S., hundreds of employees have the virus. We're testing people there more at a higher rate. After the deaths of dozens of grocery store workers who caught the virus, doctors maintain social distancing is saving lives. To keep a safe distance of six feet. In Georgia, drones are reminding residents to keep their distance. While in Philadelphia, a man was removed from a bus after arguing with the driver when he refused to wear a face covering. In Detroit, at Henry Ford Health System, roughly 1,000 employees have the virus. Near Los Angeles, the family of 20-year-old old Valeria Viveros, who worked at a nursing home, says she lost her life a week after getting sick. What can I say? It's, it's just it's shocking, you know? It's shocking. With a sailor who served aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt among those who have also now died after contracting the virus, nine states have more than 20,000 confirmed cases. But in hard-hit Illinois, positive signs of a slowing spread. Across the border in Missouri, this St. Louis family of five welcomed home after they were all infected. Thank you, thank you, thank you! Jane Winehouse and her husband Michael are now out of the ICU. It was extremely scary, especially for Jane on a ventilator, because I wasn't. So it was extremely scary. With our nation still in crisis, there are promising signs of better days ahead. This 93-year-old grandmother in Pittsburgh going viral with her playful request for beer. In Long Island, (laughs) when Korean War veteran Herb Berger couldn't join family and friends to celebrate his 90th birthday, local police brought a parade to his front door. And there's more positive news here in L.A. County, where the number of new cases is the lowest it's been in a month. But the stay-at-home order in this area stays in effect until May 15th. Philip? Glad to hear about some progress. Miguel, thank you. Thousands of families across the country are left without homes after violent storms sparked a string of tornadoes across the southeast. That severe weather began Easter Sunday in the deep south and moved up the east coast, killing over 30 people. The disaster adding more tragedy on top of the pandemic. NBC's Jay Gray has a closer look. Got a funnel cloud right here in front of me. A string of deadly tornadoes tearing a path from the deep south. Oh, my through the East Coast. It's a war zone, looks like. The battle with Mother Nature leaving more than 20 dead, dozens more wounded. Storms swallowing entire communities. Easter Sunday prayers quickly shifting to pleas for survival. Lord, I pray everybody okay. This is the Lord Jesus. In Charlotte, teams worked for 45 minutes. Our neighbor, she was, she was trapped. Uh, she was trapped. So we heard, we heard her screaming. Digging a resident from the debris. In Virginia, a stranded driver is pulled from the rising floodwaters. The wreckage stretches across multiple states, homes and businesses in ruins, vehicles tossed on their sides, power lines ripped down, 
more than a million left without electricity across the strike zone after reports of more than 40 twisters. Survivors now struggling to piece together what they can and still protect themselves from COVID-19. I mean, we all teaming up together to help each other. It is tough to social distance in a shelter, but those who rush to safety are doing what they can, now dealing with two threats, the virus and the violent weather. Jay Gray, NBC News. Let's get the latest on that weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Good morning, Janessa. Good morning. Just a kind of devastating situation that continues to really unfold across the south and southeast. The storm system pushing offshore, but in that two-day period starting on Easter Sunday, we saw over 700 reports of wind and tornado damages. So today, the threat, it still continues for southern Georgia to northern Florida as well. It is a small area, but Jacksonville, you're on our radar this afternoon with some damaging winds and a few ice tornadoes. Also behind that potent a strong cold front is a lot cooler air. Temperatures about 10 to 15 degrees below average. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at the day ahead. So our temperatures cooling off. You can see for central Texas back in the mid 50s, even for the northeast, a few winds still picking up for northern New England, but a pretty quiet day finally. So we're going to leave this severe weather behind, but man, we're still talking about snow for the southern plains. Gosh, severe weather now into snow. You know, just adding to the craziness that is these times. All right. Thank you, Janessa. Well, the Sesame Street friends are coming together virtually to bring some families something very special. Emma knows it can be hard to be away from your friends. So Emma's mommy and daddy are helping Emma set up a video play date. Yeah. Well, the nonprofit behind Sesame Street put together a simulcast as part of their initiative to support. It's happened. And even in the midst of this crisis, New Yorkers have been making things happen. You know, small things in the neighborhood to help people out, big things that could change lives and save lives as well. The spirit of ingenuity, the spirit of fight has been so clear over these last weeks in this city, and it's growing all the time. People are not not only are New, York, New Yorkers not giving up, New Yorkers never give up. New Yorkers are forging ahead to find new ways to fight back against the coronavirus. And look, this is who we are. This is a place where we believe in getting things done. And I have challenged uh, the members of my team to do things that were previously not doable, not thinkable, but now have to be in light of the crisis we're facing and all the problems we've had getting our federal government to respond, getting the, the markets all over the world to be reliable, all the challenges we've faced trying to get the supplies we need and the help we need have created a reality for us where we have to defend ourselves, we have to fight for ourselves, we have to create things here even if they were never created before. So that's who we are as a people, and that's what New Yorkers are showing once again, one of the greatest crises we've ever felt. Let me talk to you today about how we got to what I'm about to tell you about. Over these last years, we've seen in New York City more and more the growth of advanced manufacturing, the growth of biotech, the growth of the technology sector. Over these last years, more and more capacity growing in this city. And it's allowing us to do things that before would not have been imaginable. So let me start with the crucial, crucial supplies that we depend on to protect our healthcare workers and our first responders, the personal protective equipment. Uh, I've taken several trips out to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I've tried to show all of you the amazing work happening there. But what I first want to tell you about today is that this work is now being supercharged. The face shields, which are so crucial to keeping our heroes safe, started modestly. People in the Brooklyn Nar Navy Yard making the face shields by hand with the components they could get, a wartime factory for wartime conditions. 
I told you a few days ago on Sunday that we came to face shields, we really need them, but we only had enough to get through this week when you look at all the hospitals of our city. But now we are having a real breakthrough. The companies that came together have now been joined by more companies. Now we have eight companies in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and in Manhattan, all working together to create the maximum number of face shields for our heroes. Uh, they started very modestly, but now they can produce 240,000 per week. That will grow to 465,000 per week by Friday, April 24th. And then the goal soon thereafter will be to produce 620,000 face shields per week right here in New York City, made by New York City workers and New York City companies. That is enough to reach the crisis standard we're working under right now. What this means is we will be able to fulfill our entire need for face shields right here in New York City. Now, we're going to keep working to get more outside, obviously. We want a bigger supply. We want to make sure we're secure for the future. We want to someday move off that crisis standard and go higher to an even better standard. But for long as we're in the middle of this war, so long as we're fighting the coronavirus in the kind of crisis dynamics we are in now, for the first time with something as important as face shields, one of the major PPEs, we're going to be able to say we are self-sufficient. New York City will be self-sufficient. We will no longer be at the whim of either the, the federal government, the international markets. We won't have to import things from overseas. We will be self-sufficient. That's the first point. The second point, surgical gowns. Now, we need a huge number of these every week. This is an area where it's not possible yet to be self-sufficient, but where we're making huge, huge strides. Again, on Sunday, I told you this was an area I was deeply concerned about where we had enough to get through this week, but we couldn't tell you yet about next week. We're moving to get major supplies in from all over the country. So this is an area where we do see some relief coming. But again, we will be best off if the most possible surgical gowns are made right here in New York City. Five companies are now participating in this effort to protect our heroes. They're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, they're in Sunset Park, they're in the Garment Center in Manhattan, and in Long Island City, Queens. They're currently only making 30,000 per week, but by next week that will go up to 100,000. Soon thereafter, we want to get to 250,000 surgical gowns per week, and then we're looking to go even farther. So this is an area where we're going to make a lot of progress. These are particularly important to protecting those who are saving our lives. Another great example of New York City ingenuity and the speed with which New Yorkers can move. Both these items I just told you about, uh, face shields, surgical gowns, were never in recent memory made in New York City. These are brand new production lines created from scratch by companies here, by New York City workers in an atmosphere crisis, and they've surpassed any possible expectation we could have, and they're going farther. But look, as much as we've been so deeply concerned about the PPEs, and we're going to be concerned about them until this crisis is over because they mean protection for those who are saving our lives, the number one issue from day one has been testing. When we started fighting the coronavirus here in the city, we said we needed the federal help with testing. It never came. We have scoured the world looking for uh, test kits on the open market. Uh, it's been extraordinarily frustrating. We've had so many good people searching everywhere just to buy the test kits to get a reliable supply. It has not been possible. So over months now, the place we turned to for help, Washington, D.C., we never got a straight answer. We never got a consistent approach. And we wondered when would the day come that we could actually get the test kits we need so we could start on that road that I talked to you about a few days ago from this widespread transmission of the coronavirus to low-level transmission and eventually no transmission. To get there, you must have testing in large quantities. And we knew that as recently as yesterday, we did not know when and where we would get those test kits. Now, we've had one breakthrough on the open market and then another breakthrough right here in New York City, and I'm so excited to tell you about this. Our friends from Carmel, Indiana, I talked about them a few days ago. They donated 
test kits, a, a biotech firm there donated test kits to us. But now they have confirmed they can produce them regularly for New York City. So on top of their donation of 50,000 kits, which we're so appreciative for, Aria Diagnostics, Carmel, Indiana, is now going to be producing test kits for New York City. We will be purchasing them starting Monday, April 20th. It's coming Monday. We'll be purchasing 50,000 full test kits per week from Aria Diagnostics. I'm sure New Yorkers wouldn't have thought that the cavalry would come from Carmel, Indiana, but it has. This is going to be a big piece of the solution going forward. We're going to get a whole lot more, I want to be clear, because to really get to that point where there's no more transmission, we're going to need a huge number of test kits. But even being able to know we can rely on 50,000 a week from a supplier that we believe in, uh, that's going to be a major, major step forward for this city. I want to thank Mayor Jim Brainerd of Carmel, Indiana, who I've gotten to know over the last few years very well at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. He and I are on the leadership of that body, and he has been an extraordinary friend and ally and really stepped up for New York City. So, Mayor Brainerd, again, thank you. Thank you to everyone in Carmel. Thank you to ARIA Diagnostics. This is a big step. So, that's 50000 per week, but we're going to need a lot more. And remember, a test kit, and I talked about this a few days ago. I used the analogy of a cup of coffee with cream and sugar. You need the coffee beans, you need the water, you need the cream, you need the sugar, you need the coffee mug. Putting together the full test kit takes three basic components. The nasal swab, the liquid solution, that's what you keep the sample in. It's called the viral transport medium, and a tube with a screw top that keeps the sample secure and sanitary. You need all three of those things to perform a test for the coronavirus. And then, of course, you have to get that test to a lab that then processes it. So we're talking right now about just collecting the test itself from an individual. A whole other part of the equation is continuing to increase the capacity in labs to process these tests and give us the answer person by person, positive or negative. Again, we're going to have to do that on a mass scale going forward. But to get these three parts together so you can collect a test from someone, well, that's, you can't get the first base unless you have the actual test that you can collect from people. So needing those three pieces was crucial. Again, our efforts to get them consistently from Washington, D.C., no result. Our efforts to get them from the open market never could get a reliable partner until today with ARIA Diagnostics. So as we went through these last days uh, and saw New York City companies stepping up, our local government, particularly our Economic Development Corporation, bringing together partners from the private sector, figuring out how we could do surgical gowns, figuring out how we could do face shields, starting to figure out other equipment that we need to build, and we'll have announcements on that too, constantly figuring out new ways to support our hospitals and get them the supplies and equipment they need. More and more, what's happened is the members of our team here at City Hall, Economic Development Corporation, and companies, and even universities now, all talking about what can we produce here, how can we do it more and more, how can we do things that have never been done in New York City. So just a few days ago, People started saying, wait a minute, if we can make all these other things, could we say, no matter what's going on in the international market, no matter what's going on in Washington, could we actually make the test kits here? There's nothing like it in New York City being made right now, nothing even close, but could we make them here if we just threw in the kitchen sink and tried all the ingenuity that exists in this city? At first, of course, we didn't know what the answer would be. We had to pull together a lot of smart people to figure out could it be done? Could it be done quickly enough? Could it be done in the quantities that we needed? And we thought about what New Yorkers are facing. We thought about this crisis and what we have to get through. And we said, well, if people can make them around the world, why not us? Why couldn't we make them, even if we've never done it before? Companies all over the world could make some of these components. Why couldn't the most innovative city on earth figure out a way? So I'm here to announce to you that we have found a way. And 
Starting in a few weeks, we will be producing here in New York City 50,000 test kits per week with components put together right here with companies, universities, New York City workers right here building a brand new supply chain to feed this industry that will now develop in New York City. 50,000 tests per week to begin. And if we can go farther, we're going to build it up rapidly. It means commercial labs and academic institutions in this city working together to produce that liquid solution the right way. It means local manufacturers and 3D printers coming together to make the testing swabs and the tubes. Something as simple as those testing swabs, the entire international market has been struggling because those swabs have been less and less available. In fact, a lot of them are made in places that were deep in the middle of the COVID crisis themselves. So the whole international supply was disrupted. But now, through the ingenuity of New York City producers, figured a way to make them right here. Production will begin in a few weeks, at the beginning of May, 50,000 a week to begin. Add that to the 50,000 a week from ARIA Diagnostics. We'll have 100,000 full test kits per week that New York City can rely on, 400,000 per month, and that's just the beginning. So we will have to take that new capacity, ensure that there are labs that can handle all those tests and get us results in real time. And remember, we're going to need the personnel to administer the tests. We're going to need the PPEs to protect the personnel who administer the tests. There are a lot of pieces to this equation. And all the while, continuing as a city to make the progress we're making through social distancing and shelter in place. So even while we're building out this brand new capacity and it's going to help us to the next stage, we will not let our foot off the gas. We will not relent in the successful strategies that are now opening the door to getting out of this horrible crisis. But I want to keep cautioning. It takes all these pieces coming together. Now, the good news is, as we see some progress on the hospital front, and we're, we're far from out of the woods, but as we see some progress, that's going to give us a little more ability to free up some medical personnel for testing. As we see some progress getting more PPEs, that'll allow us to devote more PPEs to testing. But all these pieces have to come together, and we're still not in a situation where you can say it's going to be easy. It's not. But we need to find a way to keep building up the testing because it's one of the foundations of getting to that next phase. When you get to that next phase, when you get to low-level transmission, remember, then you're able to constantly test people, figure out who has the coronavirus, needs to be isolated, needs to be quarantined, get them the support they need, keep them away from other folks that they might infect. You have to know how to constantly trace anyone who has been infected, the people in their life who might have been exposed. You can get to them, test them, isolate them if they need it. It's a constant moving machine to ensure that the cases, each and every one individually are addressed and you go back to a containment strategy, which is where we were weeks ago when we had the very first cases here in New York City. That's where we want to get back to. But to do that, we need a whole lot of testing. For the first time, we're going to have a truly reliable, major supply of testing. And I'm so proud of my fellow New Yorkers. I'm so proud of the people in the companies who are helping us. So proud of the people in my administration who put together this plan. Uh, you know, a lot of folks would have said this was impossible. They're making it possible, and that's what New Yorkers do. Now, I want to be crystal clear. This does not let the federal government off the hook. So please, even though I'm telling you good news and something unprecedented and a real breakthrough, it does not take away the responsibility the federal government has. Not only do they have to deal with the fact that for months and months they didn't do what they needed that could have helped us stop this crisis from growing the way it has, but they still have to come through now because the amount of testing we're going to need, the amount of testing that's going to be needed all over the country is vast. But hopefully the example New York City is setting will be recognized in Washington that if we can do it here, a place that doesn't produce tests has figured out a way to do it, then why can't it be done all over this country? 
Why can't we build up a supply that could protect all of us? If the federal government can't figure it out, then get out of the way and let us at the local level get this done. But support us. Get us the components. Get us the help so that we can do this rapidly and protect ourselves. So I want to see how far we can go, how quickly we can go. 50,000 test kits produced in New York City per week starting in the beginning of May is just the beginning from my point of view. I want to see how far we can take this, and I want to challenge all New Yorkers who could contribute to this effort. Uh, I want to challenge the academic labs. I want to challenge the research labs. I want to challenge the manufacturers. I want to challenge the 3D printers, all the companies with 3D printing. The biotech companies, the pharmaceutical companies, the research universities, the chemical companies. If you're in New York City or you're in any part of the New York area or anywhere in the country and you want to help build this effort, we need you. We're going to need a lot of help to make this work. You can be a part of history. You can do something unprecedented. You can save lives through this effort. So everyone who can help, please, right away, communicate with us. Let us know you're willing. Let us know you're ready. Email us at testhelp at edc.nyc. Again, testhelp at edc.nyc. We need you. We'll be responding to people. As soon as the emails come in, we're going to be reaching out to people because this needs to move immediately. And anyone out there who could help us, I want to say thank you in advance because this is going to be a huge step forward. So, again, everything I just talked about is about taking us on that journey from where we are now, high level of transmission, widespread transmission of coronavirus, deep in this crisis, to low level transmission where we go to that containment strategy and we get to trace each case get people isolated, quarantined, support them, reduce the number of cases all the time, and then no transmission, the place we all want to get to, where the coronavirus is a rarity in this city and life goes back to normal. That's the journey we're on. The testing is crucial, but also making sure we use the right strategy. And again, the social distancing, the shelter in place, it is working, New York City. You're doing an amazing job. You, again, are the heroes because you're following these rules in an unprecedented manner, 8.6 million people together. We need to keep doing it. And I said every day we'll go over those three indicators that we announced yesterday to tell you where we stand. We'll all watch them together. We'll all know where we are. We've got to see consistent progress to be able to talk about any changes in those rules and restrictions that are working. So we're going to stick with them until we see really sustained progress. So going over the numbers today, the new numbers, again, you'll be able to see this online, uh, nyc.gov slash coronavirus. So when it comes to the daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected uh, coronavirus conditions, that number has gone down, I'm happy to say. Remember, these statistics have been verified. There's a two-day lag because of when the information comes in from the hospital. So this goes back to... April 12th, that's the latest confirmed information. But April 12th, two days ago, we saw a reduction from the day before. It went from 383 April 11th to 326 April 12th. That's the correct direction. That's a good thing. But now here's a situation where we don't have good news on this statistic. The daily number of people in ICUs across our health and hospital system, our 11 hospitals, for suspected COVID-19. That number from April 11th to April 12th actually went up from 835 to 850. Then the other measure, people, percentage of people tested who are positive for COVID-19. Citywide, that number again went up April 11th, 58.1%, April 12th, 59.6%. The public health labs tests, again, that number went up April 11th, 78.4%, to 84% on April 12th. So look, again, this is the real world, real talk. We had a really good day yesterday, progress, and all those indicators all went down together today. No such luck. Uh, it does not mean you should be discouraged. It's just a reminder, we're gonna fight our way out of this. It's not gonna happen overnight. There'll be good days and bad days. We gotta start some momentum here. You need to keep at it, we all need to keep at it with the social distancing, with the shelter in place, because it's working. Every day we have to win that battle to
to prove that we can reduce the spread of this virus, get those indicators to go down in unison over a longer period of time, and then we'll be in a position to talk about our next steps. But I think what's clear is people will be able to see what we're doing and what's working and be reminded there's going to be ups and downs, but sticking to the strategy is the best way forward. Okay, I'll summarize now with a few words in Spanish, and then we'll take uh, questions from our colleagues in the media. Somos una ciudad de personas que dan lo mejor de sí mismo. Y lo vemos de nuevo en nuestra lucha contra el coronavirus. Nuestras empresas están trabajando junta, juntas para crear materiales que necesitamos para ampliar nuestra capacidad de hacer el examen de coronavirus. Cada vez que a los neoyorquinos nos ponen contra la pared, respondemos al desafío. With that, we will turn to questions. And please let me know the name of the reporter in the outlet. Hi, all. Just a reminder that we have Commissioner Barbeau and James Patchett, President and CEO of the EDC, on the line. Uh, with that, I will start with Deborah Lee from Manhattan Times and Bronx Free Press. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Great. So this is good news, obviously, on the testing front. Um, can you speak specifically, uh, both Commissioner Pachet and a mayor, on what uh, efforts are being done to make sure that this first wave of new testing uh, capacity is going to go right to the front lines of these uh, hard-hit communities, the 88 zip codes that you spoke about uh, now for the past week. And then secondly, to the degree that you're looking to deploy a workforce that's going to respond to uh, the, this, uh, this new capacity, the personnel, the creation of PPE, what efforts are being made to make sure that these communities are also being engaged directly, that uh, beyond the Brooklyn Navy Yard, that you're also looking to call, recruit, uh, you know, really attract from these communities, again, that are also being hit with these unemployment numbers um, and, again, are being affected so disproportionately by the virus? Excellent questions. Um, I'll start, and if uh, the president of EDC, James Patchett, wants to add, he will jump in. Um, so first of all, yes, of course, one of the things that's so powerful about this new announcement is it's going to allow us, uh, in combination with everything else we need, uh, to focus on the communities that are being hardest hit and get them more testing, but also to build the framework for the bigger effort to do, again, as I said, that constant tracing, and the constant efforts to take us out of this period of widespread transmission and into uh, a better phase of low-level transmission. So the targeted piece in uh, the communities that are hardest hit is crucial for everyone having the ability to transfer our efforts to evolve our efforts to a containment strategy uh, is absolutely necessary. That's how we actually save lives the most, getting out of this period of the crisis and being able to apply testing anywhere and everywhere we need it as part of a containment strategy. So uh, in terms of the first part, uh, as you heard over the last few days, uh, we plan to get additional uh, test centers up later this week, but we have also was very clear that we needed to ensure the test kits, we needed to ensure there'd be the PPEs, then we needed to ensure there'd be the personnel. Every day changes. And Deborah Lee, it's, it, it, it's something that's hard to describe, but I, I've been trying to, that literally the supply dynamics change by days. We have good days and bad days. We have days where uh, supplies come in. Uh, we have days where we get more than expected. We have days where a company steps up or the federal government or the state government or FEMA come through with something. We have days that are bad days too, where uh, an order that we were promised from a company in this country or overseas suddenly evaporates or is delayed. Um, so to get the PPEs to the point that we know we can sustain testing is still a challenge, but we're fighting that fight all the time, and being able to make more of them here obviously is going to help. The part about personnel, too. We've got to see this 
crisis beat back enough to free up medical personnel who can be devoted to testing. Remember, a few days ago, really, when it looked like the hospitals were going to bear the brunt even worse, we were surging all available personnel with any medical training into the hospitals. We were getting ready to expand ICUs massively. And again, Deborah Lee, it's hard to think about like that. It feels like a, a day is like a week or a month nowadays because things change so rapidly. But literally just days ago, we were preparing for a vast conversion of our hospitals to ICUs and taking every available medical personnel in this entire area and surging them into hospitals, which would have taken away, of course, from the ability to be out testing in communities. We're getting some improvement in that situation. Uh, that is freeing up the potential of getting more personnel uh, who could be out doing the tests. You do need people with a certain amount of medical training to do these tests, but I'm a little more hopeful now. So. Uh, to finish the first point, this now improves our ability to do the grassroots testing. We certainly will make it a priority. We do need to add those other pieces to the puzzle. We obviously need to make sure there's also the lab capacity to process the tests. Every day we'll be working to perfect that equation. Every day we'll be giving updates on when and how grassroots testing is progressing and how much will be done at each site, which also will vary according to all these supply dynamics uh, and logistics. Our goal is to get as many tests done where they're needed the most, and that's what we'll keep driving towards. On the job front, I think it's a great point. A lot of the companies that we are working with, of course, the first thing they did was they brought back their own workers who really do represent working people all over this city. When I was at the Brooklyn Navy Yard a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, you could not have had a more beautiful picture of all of New York City, all people of all backgrounds in one place, working class people who had been out of work because those companies didn't make essential items. Then they converted to making face shields. They brought their whole workforce back. So that's going to be the kind of thing you'll see that will employ a lot of people who've been out of work, uh, particularly from uh, communities of color. But we can target further, to your point. And so I'll ask James Patchett and the team at EDC to ensure when we need to do more hiring, we focus on the communities that have been hardest hit. Uh, and I certainly want to remind everyone that there are also our jobs being made available now at H&H. &H. And again, we want people to take advantage of those jobs. We need the help. We need the labor. But we also need people uh, to get a paycheck. But yes, we will target those new hiring efforts as they emerge to the places that need them most. James, you want to add at all? Sure, I'll just add primarily on the second point. I think, you know, the mayor has visited the Brooklyn Navy Yard two times, but I don't want folks to over-index on that as the sole producer. Uh, we have uh, over 15 different firms across gowns and face shields that are producing across the city. That represents four boroughs, uh, so the Bronx, uh, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. And one of the, although Staten Island is not represented, one of the organizations we're working with is run by two Staten Islanders, although their organization is based in Brooklyn. So all five boroughs are well represented. Just to give you an example, um, one of our largest gown producers is an organization called Course of Trade, a not-for-profit organization based in Sunset Park who does training of seamstresses. Uh, and they are, are bringing back over 400 seamstresses from the Sunset Park and greater community uh, to, to construct these gowns. So it really is uh, across the city effort. And the great thing about a lot of these jobs is there are people, as the mayor said, who were put out of work and are now back to work doing this type of, of, of manual labor that is both uh, good paying as well as um, being available and accessible to a lot of different New Yorkers. Next, we have Andrew from NBC New York. Mayor, how are you? Good, Andrew. How you doing? Good. Uh, since you, you've spoken about New York and the ability to innovate and come up with creative ways to do things. I want to re-ask about why you have not come up with a way to close more of the streets, given that there are very few cars on the streets. Streets like uh, cities like Oakland and Minneapolis have closed block after block. And I know your answer before was that the NYPD wouldn't have the personnel for that. But do they really need the personnel for that? Could you not find ways to get people outdoors safely with more space? Well, yeah, we've um, I've heard the concerns and the questions from people in communities and also from the media. 
I asked the NYPD and Department of Transportation to analyze the Oakland plan, which is the one that was raised a few days ago. Uh, adamantly, the answer back was, we are just profoundly different than those other cities. Uh, in Oakland, as I understand it, they uh, said that streets were closed off, but they didn't put up any barricades. They didn't have any enforcement. They just depended on uh, drivers to not go on those streets uh, and everyone to look out and be careful. And that's you know noble, and, and hopefully that would happen uh, anytime, particularly in a crisis. But we are not comfortable um, saying that uh, we're going to just assume that people are going to be safe uh, because that's our good intention. We, you know, this is all about safety, Andrew. The whole concept right now, everything we're doing is about people's health and people's safety. That's where we're going to stay focused. And I do not believe we can do that safely. I do not believe that we can do it in a way that does not undermine enforcement of other things we need to do. So I heard it. I've been elected by the people to make decisions, including in a time of crisis. I have heard the concern. We've analyzed the concern. We've analyzed the possibility. The answer is I do not believe it will work, period. We'll continue to look at it if uh, situations change going forward. But right now, I am convinced that we need to take the NYPD and the other enforcement entities, keep them focused on where people have to be, the grocery stores, the supermarkets, the pharmacies, the parks, the um, subways, the buses, make sure those are being enforced properly. Uh, get the NYPD back to full strength. Uh, that's where our focus is, and protect lives. The last thing I want to do is have a situation where we end up endangering people uh, because we put a plan in place that we could not enforce properly. So that's where we stand now. We'll keep looking at it going forward. Next, we have Marsha from CBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? Good morning, Marsha. How are you? I'm good. Um, Mr. Mayor, there's been a raging debate about when and how to reopen the economy and businesses. I wonder who should be making the decision. Should it be the mayor of New York City, the governor of New York, or the president of the United States? And will you follow the decisions made by the governor and the president? Marsha, great question. Uh, Marsha, I think you'll appreciate we've known each other a long time. In this case, I'm going to declare myself a conservative. Um, the fact is we cannot jump too soon. This is all about safety and all about health. It's all we should be thinking about. That does not mean we don't need to restart the economy. We do, of course. People's livelihoods depend on it. We've got to, over time, get back to normal. But, Marsha, my profound concern is that if we do this the wrong way, if we do it prematurely, we will see a resurgence of this disease. And this disease is a ferocious one. It has put the entire nation, the entire world back on its heels. So we would be fools, I think, to ignore the warnings we have received, including in places that did act a little prematurely and ended up paying for it. My view is job one, health and safety job two, restarting the economy. You can't restart the economy effectively until you perfect the health and safety equation. If you do attempt uh, artificially early restart of the economy, you'll end up having to shut a lot of it down again because the coronavirus will reassert. That's the worst of all worlds. So my view is smart, cautious approach. Beat it back prove that we've beaten it back, get to that containment strategy, that uh, low-level transmission phase that I've talked about, secure that phase. That's when you can start to loosen up. Um, but don't, don't do it artificially. And in terms of who makes the decision, look, it's a federal system. Uh, the founding fathers are really clear about this. Of course the president has a crucial role to play, particularly in a time of national crisis. Of course the governor has a crucial role to play, particularly in a time of crisis in this state. Localities still play a crucial role in our federal system no matter what. That's how this country was built. So I'm going to defend the health and safety of New Yorkers. I believe in a lot of ways people will, all levels of government will find some consensus. That's my hope, especially because I think the disease will give us a lot of information, you know, literally, because if we do things right, we'll beat it back. If we do things wrong, unfortunately, the disease will prove its power to us. But in the end, my job is to protect the health and safety of New Yorkers, and I will do that no matter what. 
Next, we have Julia from The Post. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Hey, Julia. How you feel? Good. Um, I'm wondering if, um, a follow-up on Deborah Lee's question, who exactly will be prioritized? prioritize for testing because we know that you know 100,000 is is a great start but based on what the governor said we may need tens of millions of these tests um to get to the next phase and then i wonder if you have a cost of the tests from aria and if you can name any of the uh, companies and universities involved in new york city's homegrown testing effort okay good questions all around we'll get you what we can on aria i don't have it in front of me on the uh, institutions involved uh, absolutely anticipated that question. We are right now in conversation with a number of organizations to get this done. I uh, want to make sure they are comfortable uh, with their names coming out before we just start talking about them. And again, we're trying to recruit a lot more. So over the next few days, we will announce the different partners in this initiative. On the question of the testing priorities at the community level, uh, again, what I said was here is the uh, plan to get this done by the end of the week, at least to start in as many locations as possible, pending getting those PPEs and the personnel. Uh, the exact priorities we're going to announce shortly, Julia, it's obviously going to be a focus on the most vulnerable. So the exact uh, criteria we will announce, we've said what the locations will be. The test will be for people from those communities because those have been among the hardest hit. But the general criteria we've discussed previously, folks with pre-existing conditions, uh, folks who are older, and particularly those who have both, and that's the, the number one concern, folks who are over 50 and have pre-existing conditions. So we'll lay out the exact um, focal group, the exact priority group uh, for the grassroots testing. Uh, it's going to be limited to begin, so we want to make sure it gets to those who need it most, and we'll have more to say on that in the next few days. Next, we have Shant from the Daily News. Thank you, Mayor. I um, wanted to follow up on the regional working group a bit more. Um, have you spoken with Governor Cuomo since the regional group working group was announced? And uh, just what would you say is your role, either formally or informally, in that group? I have not spoken to him. I think it sounds like a good idea. Um, you know, I love the notion of everyone trying to solve these problems together. And again, the states have their role to play. Uh, here's the truth about cities and localities. Uh, we provide the services to the people. Uh, you know, the federal government does its role. The state government does its role. But in the end, this is where the rubber hits the road. So when it comes to protecting people, uh, it's our police force, it's our fire department. When it comes to the health of everyday New Yorkers, it's our health department, it's our public hospitals with health and hospitals. We've obviously been mounting the constant effort to get supplies to the hospitals that need them, to get help to people who need them. It's our EMS, obviously, that brings people to the hospital. Uh, and our EMS workers have been extraordinary and valiant in this effort, and by the way, uh, again, a thank you to FEMA, thank you to the federal government. Those uh, 250 ambulances, we've gotten 500 uh, EMTs and paramedics from around the country. I visited with them a few weeks ago. Uh, they've been amazing. They've helped us deal with this crisis, and uh, clearly, thank God, we see the number of 911 calls starting to go down. We have, by the way, more ambulances uh, and EMTs and paramedics coming in from around the country to augment further. I'm told by our OEM commissioner, Deanne Criswell, we have another 100 ambulances and 200 paramedics and EMTs coming in, I believe, next week uh, to add to those ranks further. So that's been crucial. So, Sean, that's just my reminder to everyone that what we do is actually directly serve people and directly protect them. So... Uh, if the governors of all those states have particular ways that, you know, I can work with them, our city can work with them, we want to for sure, but whatever they're doing together, and I'm glad they are working together, uh, my job is to protect New Yorkers every day with all the resources of this city government, and that's what I'll do. Next, we have Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask you, I know that the city eliminated the summer youth employment program in its uh, budget saving measures 
Um, and now there's been a push to save it. Uh, I was curious because I know last month before you canceled schools, one of the major factors you cited for not canceling was what would the youth do, you know, especially teens. So I'm curious if things improve, if there is, you know, widespread containment of the virus in the summer, would you consider bringing back uh, this program so teens and the youth can have something to do uh, in the summer? Thank you. Thank you, Katie. It's a great question. We thought a lot about this. Um, there's been a great expansion of the summer youth employment program in the course of my administration. Uh, the city council's made a major priority. We've worked with them. Um, it's, I think, more than doubled from uh, when we came into office. So, you know, it's, it's painful uh, to take away something like that. And it's not just that. It's the, the other summer programs that we have well beyond summer youth. Um, all of which are valuable. I talked about in the state of the city. We wanted to do even more of that kind of thing. But here's the truth. And again, I'm going to declare myself a conservative on this point. When I say conservative, I'm not talking about ideology. I'm talking about strategic conservatism in light of this crisis. I want to make sure we get the health piece right. I want to make sure we protect people's health. And we actually know we've beat back this virus, and we're actually in that new phase. We've talked about somewhere between May and June, we hope to have the proof that we've moved forward enough to be able to start to change some of the restrictions. But um, that's just the beginning. And even then, we have to watch like hawks to make sure that things don't go back in the wrong direction. Uh, the numbers today, you know, we really believe in these indicators. And as you saw, unfortunately, today they went in the wrong direction. So we don't yet know the trajectory. What I do know is the kind of planning that you would normally authorize and the spending you'd authorize for summer initiatives of all kinds would be happening right now. We can't do that. We cannot uh, spend a lot of money and put people through a lot of trouble for something there's no guarantee at all could possibly happen. And there's a real chance, and remember our health commissioner, Dr. Barbeau, talked about September as really the time that we think is realistic to think about getting back to normal. That's, we're confident at this moment we can reopen the schools in September. But we're not confident about June. We're not confident about July. We're not confident about August uh, that we could have people gathering together again in large numbers. And that's what summer youth is and all these other youth programs. So um, we're going to take this very slow and carefully uh, to make sure we get it right. In terms of your question, what what should young people do? It's tough. It's tough. I, look, I'm I'm a parent. I um, vividly remember when my kids were teenagers. It would have been really tough to say to them that you got a whole summer ahead and you still have to practice social distancing and you still have to stay in a lot. But that could well be the case. We're going to try and provide every conceivable kind of online programming we can. Um, we're going to try and be ready to, uh, in any way we can, help kids through it. DOE is preparing contingency plans for each and every scenario uh, for what might happen over the summer. So uh, the answer to your question is I don't see that scenario at this moment, and I'm always going to first focus on how do we guarantee the health and safety of New Yorkers and make sure we don't take our foot off the gas too soon. Next we have Gersh from Streets Blog. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, Gersh. How you doing? I'm great. Mr. Mayor, we can all appreciate the good news you shared today to fight this war, but let's look ahead for a second. Residents are saying they don't want to return to streets filled with traffic, skies polluted by car exhaust, hundreds of pedestrians and cyclists killed every year, the result of how we allocate public space to the automobile. So just as FDR, Churchill, and Stalin repeatedly met to discuss the future, even before they defeated Hitler, do you have someone in your administration, perhaps it's your talented transportation commissioner who we haven't seen during this crisis, who is planning for the car light future that residents will demand when this is all over? Well, Gersh, uh, even with some uh, editorializing there in the question, I don't agree with your entire frame, um, but I think your underlying question is a very good one. And the answer is yes, uh, real work is starting now to plan our future. So I want to affirm, I think, the point, the basic point you're making, which is that we are not looking to simply bring back the status quo that existed before the coronavirus. I think that would be a huge mistake. Now, Gersh, 
My first concern here is the health and safety of New Yorkers. So one, the planning has to recognize that we have to get it right on ending this crisis. And if you look around the world, coronavirus is not linear. It doesn't like just have an on off switch. We may be fighting it in different ways for an extended period of time. So I want to be careful that people not think um, we turn a corner and we're done necessarily. We have to be smart about that. But when you think about where we are going forward, when we think where we are now and how we have to move forward, the first thing I would say we need to do is fight inequality. This is what I came here to do. This is what New Yorkers, I think, fundamentally believe in. We're still a city racked by inequality. We must do so many things differently, and it starts with making sure that working people have better lives uh, and have the ability to really uh, take care of their families in a whole new way. And this is where I think the health care disparities have been pointed out here so painfully are a call to arms that when we come back, when we start our recovery, it has to be also about a redistribution. It has to be about fundamental changes in the direction of fairness and justice and equality. So I think the first question is about health and safety, is about economic justice. But then talking about how we address the future of the city in terms of sustainability, in terms of transportation, uh, unquestionably we need to make more changes. Um, I have a, a real feeling that this horrible, horrible crisis, uh, it, unprecedented, at the same time as it's so horrible unto itself, it's such a jolt, it's the worst healthcare crisis in a century, it's the worst economic crisis in 80 years, I think it's also um, preparing us for something ahead. And I wish it wasn't, I really do, but I think unfortunately it, it is preparing us for something which is the battles we'll have to face in the future in the fight against global warming. Uh, we all understand how dangerous that situation is. So it comes to your point, uh, to fight global warming, we have to, we have to get away from individual automobile use a lot more. We have to build a city that more and more will rely on mass transit. Uh, we have to double down on everything we've done with Vision Zero. I intend to uh, create a plan that will do all of that uh, because when we finish beating this enemy, we've got another enemy up ahead uh, that's fierce uh, and that is bearing down on us quickly and we're going to all have to work together to fight uh, and getting out of our cars to the maximum extent possible is part of that fight. So yes, you will see those plans for the future of the city. Next we have Yoa from the city. Hi, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain the rationale for requiring medical staff at the city's public hospitals to write a doctor's note when they get sick. Um, relatedly, the NYPD has been uh, releasing daily updates of how many officers get sick, how many are confirmed positive. If the situation at H&H &H is so bad that uh, you're requiring medical staff to prove they're not faking an illness, uh, why, why can't we get the same data for H&H? &H? Happy to get you that data, and I don't agree with your inference. Uh, the, I look at it the other way around. We need them. We need those uh, key healthcare workers right now. Uh, we just need a system that creates consistency and verifiability. In fact, in a crisis, you need it more than ever. So, yeah, we'll happily get out uh, statistics, but the intention here is one thing, to make sure we can save lives. We need to make sure every available healthcare worker is where we need them. We also need to make sure that anyone who is sick gets the support they need and is not at work, but is at home getting well. Next, we have Bridget from WNYC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the news about testing. It feels it feels a little bit hopeful today. It is. Um, it is. <laughs> I have a, a question on a different supply chain um, related to food security, um, particularly for our seniors. Uh, we are hearing from people who signed up for meal deliveries who are getting texts saying a delivery is coming and then nothing arrives. Um, first, what should a senior do you know, when they can't go out and they're not getting what they need? And I know you have Catherine Garcia in this role as the city's food czar. Does that mean she also has oversight of these supply chains, including 
you know, these types of meals that DIFTA is supposed to be delivering? Yes, Bridget. Um, every piece of the food equation, DIFTA has played a historically crucial role uh, feeding seniors at senior centers, uh, Meals on Wheels, that type of thing. HRA has played a crucial role uh, with food stamps and food pantries, soup kitchens. All of that and every other piece that can be brought to bear is under the umbrella of Catherine Garcia's leadership now as the foods are. Uh, we are going to present this week a uh, much more detailed plan on the work she is doing. Uh, there is a lot more ahead uh, the blunt truth is I'm very worried about the ability of New Yorkers uh, to get the food they need because so many of them are running out of money because they've been out of work. And so what I've said is we will not let any New Yorker go hungry. I want to emphasize this. We will not let any New Yorker go hungry. Any New Yorker needs food right this minute. Uh, we can get them food either at those 435 uh, uh, programs we have through DOE right this minute where any family can go get three meals a day, grab and go, as many family members as they have. Uh, all of the soup kitchens uh, and food pantries that we're supporting in the effort we announced with the city council, $25 million effort we just announced. Uh, all the other ways uh, that we get food out, including the direct deliveries to seniors and vulnerable folks, which have been growing all the time. So we'll have much more to say on that this week. But to your question about if you will, quality control, make sure that anyone who signs up gets them right away. Uh, I have been really clear with everyone that it needs to be immediate turnaround, and we can't miss because people are depending on this. There was a situation at Independence Plaza. I'm glad several of you raised it last week. You were right. Uh, I apologize to the folks at Independence Plaza. It should never have happened. And I've told our team we have to tighten up that that, that can never happen again. If there's individual instances, we need to know about them immediately. So any journalist or anybody uh, who hears of a situation where someone signed up for the food and didn't get it, uh, our team here at City Hall needs to know that so we can get Catherine and her team to fix it. And the fix can be very quick. There's constant deliveries being made all over the city now. We'll give you those details. I think you'll be struck by how much is happening. So you know, quickly making sure that if a delivery was missed, it is uh, quickly fixed and gets the food to the person in need. We can do that. But we need to know where the problems are, and if it's just individual or something more systemic that we need to fix. So please, uh, Bridget, if you'd share that information with our colleagues at City Hall. And again, we'll have a, a bigger outline for you of everything happening this week. Next, we have Juliet from 1010 Winds. Yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good to talk to you. Good morning, Juliet. How you doing? Hi, fine. Thank you. So my question is this. Now that you have this capacity to do a lot more testing, do, do you think there will come a time when every New Yorker should or needs to be tested? And I'm asking because there are concerns that, that there are people that are asymptomatic that may not know that they are carriers. So what happens? How would people know if they've had it with mild symptoms or they're carrying it or they're, they have an immunity? How would that work? And how would you go about doing that? Great, great question, Juliet. I'm going to start as the layman. Dr. Barbeau will jump in, but I'm going to, she's been teaching me, so I'm probably going to uh, immediately summarize some of what she would say. Look, again, we're fighting an enemy that we never even heard of six months ago. I mean, let's be clear about this. The coronavirus did not exist in human beings to the best of human knowledge, you know, half a year ago. And there's literally no one in the world who understands it enough. The entire international medical community is still trying to understand it. I have talked to you know, every health expert I could find from Dr. Fauci on down, and, and what you keep hearing is that honest hesitancy about what they know and what they don't know. So this gets to your question. First of all, you know, we don't even know for sure if someone has had it, they cannot get it again in the near term. We think you can't get it again. And this goes to the antibody testing, which is its own topic. Um, we think that would tell you something valuable, but it's not 100% clear if it is the final word. Um, the same on the other side with the, uh, the main uh, coronavirus testing, the PCR testing, it tells you at that moment if you have it or not. It doesn't tell you if you're going to have it tomorrow. 
So some we're obviously are getting people who are negative one day and a couple of days later they're positive. Um, that whole point about asymptomatic transmission, which is still not sufficiently clear. Um, you could even have someone somewhere on the pathway to infection, but it doesn't necessarily show up in the tests. I'll let Dr. Barbeau speak to all of this. But the point is we're dealing with imperfect knowledge of the disease and imperfect tools to fight it, but they still give us something. So to your question, I think what I would say is the first thing we need is testing for everyone who needs it. So obviously we have struggled to just have the testing for patients who are really sick, for healthcare workers, for first responders. That situation is getting better. And now especially that we'll be able to have our own supply. Then, of course, we want to target communities that are hardest hit and the most vulnerable individuals specifically, not just everyone, but the most vulnerable specific individuals in those communities. But when you go to that next phase, you need testing all the time to make sure that you know exactly who can work, who can't, who should be contained and isolated or, or uh, quarantined, who shouldn't, who's coming out of quarantine. It's like a constant assembly line, if you will, where you're constantly having to test lots of people to know exactly where they are and make sure they get the support they need. Uh, I don't know, and I, I don't believe in the many, many conversations we've had here at City Hall with all the health experts. I don't believe I've heard the idea of every single person, 8.6 million people needing to be tested, but I don't rule that out either. Uh, I, I'm thinking of this in stages where the greatest concern is to have the testing to actually keep track of the people who need testing and, and have that kind of dynamic situation where anyone needs isolation or quarantine, we can get it to them. Anyone who's ready to come out of it, we can confirm they're ready to come out of it, that kind of thing. Dr. Barbeau, take it from there. Thank you, sir. Um, and so I'll build on what you have just laid out. And I want to just sort of back up a little bit to remind folks about what I've said in the past regarding testing. The reason to test is because we want to be able to then use that information for decision making. The second thing is that the importance of testing depends on where in the curve you are and then what decisions it'll help inform. So right now, when we have widespread community transmission, what we have said to individuals, to all of our fellow New Yorkers, is assume that if you've got these symptoms, you have COVID because it's so widespread. And whether or not you get tested is sort of secondary because we want to make sure that people stay home. We want to make sure that people pay attention to their symptoms if they are getting worse we want you to reach out to 911. That being said, as we start seeing a decrease in the number of new people being infected with COVID, that's where having more testing available really makes a difference because it then helps us identify who are those individuals that have COVID and how can we then move more quickly to slowing the spread of COVID by ensuring that not only do we make sure that these folks stay home and isolate, but anybody who's come in contact with them also then self-isolates. And so right now, I think it's premature to think about the value of every single New Yorker being tested. I think it's a combination of ensuring that as we've been saying all along, the, the folks who are at greatest risk for poor health outcomes as a result of COVID-19 get tested, meaning the intersection of age and underlying illnesses, as well as individuals who may be in particular communities where we see ongoing high levels of transmission so that as a city, we can start cutting off those chains of transmission. Thank you. Next, we have Aaron from Politico. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, wondering, have you asked for authority? We reported that um, your administration was considering uh, borrowing for the operating budget because of the budget crunch that you're in currently. Um, have you asked yet for the authority to do that, or do you, uh, sorry, have it, or begun that process in any way? 
Thank you for the question, Aaron. Um, it's something we have to think about. Obviously, we'll be presenting the executive budget soon. And uh, we've had to go through a really tough uh, process around uh, cuts to the budget and savings and PEG program. But um, we're going to have to look at everything uh, to figure out how we get through this. There's a lot of uncertainty ahead. Uh, revenue we're seeing everywhere going down very painfully. More and more expenses. Look, protecting the health and safety of New Yorkers, that's the priority. We'll throw everything we got at, but it is obviously costing a lot of money. Uh, the state budget situation is real bad. So there's a tough, tough time ahead. So we're going to look at all options, but uh, I'll have more to say when we do the budget presentation. Uh, and we'll talk about if and when we're going to seek uh, any formal authority to do that. Next, we have Kathleen from Patch, and we'll take one more after that. Hey, Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes, Kathleen. Oh, great. So I'm following up on a question from my colleague on Sunday. Maya asked whether... Um, about your blanket policy across city agencies to protect essential workers with pre-existing conditions. She wondered if you had a follow-up on that and what's been instituted. Yeah, it's a great, great, great question. Thank you. And I have, and I appreciate the question. It turned out, uh, it was a very good question because it did point out that different agencies had somewhat different standards, all pretty much pointing in the same direction, but somewhat different standards. We'll be issuing guidance this week for a uniform standard for all city agencies. And basically, it will be that um, the first consideration is to protect those with really uh, serious health challenges. And we want to be clear uh, that anyone whose particular health reality would put them at serious risk, we want to keep them home. Some of them can work from home, some of them can't. But whatever the case, the number one thing is to protect our city workforce. If someone, by coming out of their home and going to work, even if they're doing essential work, if it would endanger their health, if they have the kind of serious specific conditions where it would endanger their health, we don't want them to take that chance. Uh, so we'll clarify that. Um, thankfully, there are other folks who you know, are not in the same kind of risk category. Of course, anyone who can work from home, we want working from home. But there's other people who would not be running the same kind of risks. That's a different story. But we're going to send out guidance defining that if you have those serious risks, we do not want to put you in harm's way. And we will, of course, continue on the payroll, keep anyone like that on the payroll. So that guidance will be coming out soon, and it will be made public. Last question for today, Alejandra from AM New York. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes, Alejandra. Um, my question has to do with um, the announcement from the DOE yesterday that at least 50 staffers um, have passed away due to coronavirus. And I'm just curious to see when you were first made aware that it was at least 50 and how much of a role did that news play in your decision to keep um, New York City public schools closed um, last a few days ago? Thank you, Alejandra. I had been hearing, honestly, day by day, the updates. Um, so long before it reached such a painful number, you know, I was hearing each day when we lost any member of a school community. And that definitely uh, is something that I had in mind and the chancellor had in mind. The chancellor talked about this when we announced that we keep the schools closed, that um, school communities are hurting right now. There's, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of trauma. It's something we're going to have to address now, and it's something we're going to have to address very deeply and, you know, intensely in September. You're, you're going to have kids coming back who have lost people in their families, in their neighborhoods, and even, of course, in their own school. And that's going to be really, really difficult. We've not faced something quite like this in a long, long time in this city, and it's going to be very, very painful. And pretty much every neighborhood and every school will be affected in some way. So, yeah, that is a painful, awful number that we've lost so many people who were devoted to um, uplifting our kids and absolutely weighed on not only the decision that Chancellor and I had to make, it weighed on our hearts. Um, you know, my life, public life has been very, very focused on education and Richard's whole life has been focused on education and it's horrible. But I do think it puts a point on the fact that it just is not safe uh, to bring back our schools until we are absolutely certain that we have moved out of this crisis. You know, we're talking about places where you bring together a lot of people and the, the safety 
and health of our kids, our parents, our families, our educators. That's what we should be focusing on and making every decision we make. And it certainly uh, was paramount in why the chancellor and I decided to keep our schools closed for this school year. So everyone, um, I'll conclude by saying, yes, we had a big breakthrough today. Uh, really exciting news. And again, I, I've said many times, the heroes are the New Yorkers in this fight, starting with our doctors and nurses and healthcare workers and our first responders, everyday New Yorkers, who the whole nation, the whole world is watching uh, as you do heroic work. Uh, and the heroes are all of you uh, who every day, no matter how tough it is in the, the biggest city in the country, you're practicing the social distancing, you're, you're doing shelter in place, it's making a big impact. But now we have a new set of heroes. The folks in all these companies, all these innovative, creative people, including the folks on our government team, who said, you know what, it doesn't matter, it's never been done before. We're gonna do it here in New York City. We're gonna make something happen. We're gonna make something out of nothing. People said there's nothing here to work with, we're gonna still find a way. And they've actually figured out now how to make us uh, self-sufficient uh, in face shields, how to make a big step forward in those surgical gowns that protect our healthcare workers and most notably, most powerfully, how to create our own test kits, uh, how to make up for all the mistakes that we've seen from our federal government uh, by taking matters into our own hands more and more and starting to produce test kits on a mass scale here in New York City. It's very powerful, it's very exciting, it's gonna help us save lives, and it's a tribute to all New Yorkers. Thank you, everybody. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo believes the worst is likely over in his state, the nation's white hot center of the outbreak. He's also launched an initiative with six other governors to coordinate efforts and develop strategies for reopening aspects of the regional economy. And Governor Cuomo is joining us now. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Hunter. Good so, to be with you. Good to be with you. You talked about some good news here in New York. You said we reached a plateau. The death toll has flattened. The number of intubated patients is on the decline. So a lot of people may be saying, well, phew, this thing is over. Is it over? It is not over. All we've, all we've done, which is, which is a significant step, we have shown that we can stop the spread of the virus, right? We were looking at those lines that were continuing to go up and there was a big question, can you stop the spread of this beast? And we have done that. You closed everything down and it worked. And the quote unquote plateau is a flattening of the increase. It's not a decline, it's just a flattening of the increase. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to remember, Hoda, we did this by our behavior. This was not natural. All the projections were much worse than what actually happened because our behavior worked. If we stop doing what we're doing, you will see those numbers go up again, period. Let's talk about reopening the economy. I think everyone wants that to happen, but the question is when is it gonna happen? How is it gonna happen? And who says it's gonna happen? Well, yesterday the president at his news conference, and this is his quote, he said he has the power. He says when someone is president of the United States, the authority is total. He said it was total. And he said the governors know that. Do you know that? Nope. Uh, I don't know what the president is talking about, uh, frankly. Uh, we have a constitution. The constitution is based on balance of powers. Uh, you have to remember it's the states that created the federal government, right? It's the colonies that created the federal government, not the other way around. And we don't have a king. We have a president. And that was a big decision. We ran away from having a king, and George Washington was president, not King Washington. So the president doesn't have total authority. The Constitution is there. Tenth Amendment is there. Number of cases over the years. It's very clear. States have uh, power by the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and the president is just wrong on that point. Okay, so um, if, he, if the president says, let's open New York, and you say you don't think it's a good idea, what happens then? Look, if he pushed it to that absurd point, uh, then we would have a problem. If he thinks he's going to force this state or any state, for that matter, to do something that is reckless or irresponsible, that could endanger human life, literally. Because if we don't reopen correctly, you will see those virus numbers go up again, and more people will die. Let's talk and about... And we paid a heck of a price to get the... 
Yeah, let's talk about reopening correctly, because I think that this is a, a big deal. You're teaming up with six other governors from the Northeast. But I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about reopening a city or a state. And it seems like the only way you can do that is if you have testing to find out who's safe enough or who's well enough to go back to work. And the idea of widespread testing doesn't even seem like a possibility. So how do you even start? Yeah. You, uh, you put your finger right on it. Uh, first of all, nobody's done this before. It has to be phased. It has to be balanced. It's a public health strategy and an economic reactivation strategy. And the key to me is testing. Uh, and people have to know that they are safe and that safe, the testing actually works to uh, make people feel safe. And we don't have that capacity now. And the states can't do it on their own. We have to develop that widespread testing capacity. The way on the first go around, we had to develop additional hospital capacity. Uh, testing is going to be key. And we are not there yet. But that has to be developed. And do you have, a Governor, any kind of a time frame about what we're looking at? I mean, Savannah was just asking an expert about businesses opening, going to ball games. Um, I was just thinking about concerts on our plaza in the summer. We always have summer concerts on the plaza. Do you have any idea of a time frame of when all of that may start to look like normal again? Hoda, I don't. And I think if anybody tells you they do, uh, they don't understand the issue ahead of us. This is all uncharted territory. You have to feel the way it goes. You have to start to reopen with a plan, an informed plan that actually improves on uh, the situation and learns the lessons. But then you have to watch those number, the number of uh, infections. You tell me how New Yorkers or Americans behave today, I'll tell you the infection rate in three days. It's, it's that cause and effect. Uh, and as we reopen and everybody wants to get out of their home and everybody wants to get back to work, uh, if we don't do it gradually and controlled, you'll see the viruses go up. And that would be a terrible shame. And then we'd have to start all over again. All right. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stage. Carson joins us from home to explain. Hey, Carson. What's up, buddy? Hey, guys. Well, listen, if you're like me right about now, you are starving for some sports, some good news. NBC Sports Network is going to be airing nearly 100 hours of classic Olympic programming each night for the rest of the month of April. And we're going to start with the 2016 Rio Games. And here's a little taste of what you can see tonight. Oh, Puts it on her feet. It's a gold medal. Got it. <laughs> It almost looked like it's she was soaring there. The crowd deafening here. The, the mighty Michael Phelps. The champion is leading. He's had a very big campaign. Pereira is throwing everything at him, but Phelps is increasing the lead, increasing the stroke rate. There has never been a better swimmer. The most decorated swimmer is miles ahead. Wow. Michael Phelps. Now Miles that's got to get you guys excited, right? That's that's exactly what we need. You saw Michael Phelps, Simone Biles winning there, um, and also the uh, men's 200 meter individual medley. You can see all of this tonight on the NBC Sports Network, and you can relive those moments with the gymnastics event finals and also all of Michael Phelps' Rio races. You remember Katie Ledecky won four gold oh, medals, yeah. also yeah. in Rio. Um, Usain Bolt picked up four, so. In these times when we're home, it's going to be exciting for the NBC Sports Networks to have some some Rio Olympics. And, and for all the other sports yeah. deprived folks, Carson Daly, yeah. you probably caught it over the weekend. Like they reshowed the Masters during March Madness. They were reshowing like the best of college basketball games from you know a decade ago yeah. as well. Yeah, I was watching some of the old uh, Masters. They were showing Tiger winning and um, you know the famous chip shot from behind. Uh, Sixteen. They showed that CBS doing a great job of getting that programming out there to watch. Also, I've been watching just old, like, you know, Islanders hockey games and, and just sort of pretending that it was live. It's right. exciting just to have a sporting event on your TV, just something to root for. Uh, but the Olympics coming back, you know, we'll start with Rio here on NBC and then maybe get into some of the London games and uh, from 2012 and yeah. also Beijing. So, so well, it's, it's good news. I like it. It is good news. President Trump now declaring that he is the sole power who gets to determine when and how states reopen, even as governors in some of the hardest hit states make plans of their own. When somebody's the president of the United States, 
the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. And the governors know that. In fact, the Constitution gives that power to the states. And experts say the president does not have the authority to direct governors, mayors, or other local officials to lift their emergency orders. Overnight, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo challenging the president's claim. To say I have total authority over the country because I'm the president, it's absolute. That is a king. We didn't have a king. The tension punctuating a White House briefing where President Trump was combative and at times angry. I haven't asked anybody. Because I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. The president also playing a White House produced campaign style video in an effort to defend his handling of the crisis that's come under increased scrutiny. Everything we did was right. President Trump highlighting his January ban on travel from China. One case in the whole United States, one case. I'm supposed to shut down the government, the biggest, the biggest uh, economy in the history of the world. Shut it down. We have one case. And sparring with reporters who challenged the federal response beyond that January ban. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. We did a lot. Look, look. You know you're a fake. Over the weekend, Dr. Anthony Fauci argued more lives could have been saved here if the government acted sooner. I mean, obviously, if we had right from the very beginning shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. On Monday, the president calling Fauci to the podium, where the nation's top infectious disease doctor clarified his comments about pushback within the administration. And that was the wrong choice of words. A day after retweeting a post that included the hashtag fire Fauci, the president praising the doctor. Today I walk in, I hear I'm going to fire him. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. Today, the president is scheduled to meet here with people who have recovered from COVID-19. And as for the economy, he says when it reopens, in his words, I think we're going to boom. But many of his allies and economists agree no matter what President Trump says, the real recovery will not happen until Americans begin feeling safe returning to their own lives. The death toll has now topped 10,000 in New York State, but ICU admissions and intubations are way down. The clearest sign yet, the curve is flattening. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Now, the governors of New York and six other northeastern states that represent more than half of the nation's coronavirus cases are partnering to discuss the best way to safely ease restrictions and restart the region's economy. The group of governors includes six Democrats and one Republican. We cannot act on our own. Even if we give ourselves an A+, that won't be enough. This is incredibly important that we coordinate. Three western states, including California, are doing the same. In New York City, 21 public school teachers have died from the virus. And COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. But there are some encouraging signs. The number of newly hospitalized patients in New York is at its lowest point in weeks, but that doesn't mean doctors and nurses aren't still stressed. Every patient is getting multiple medications. Some are getting blood transfusions. Dr. Melanie Malloy works at Mount Sinai in Brooklyn. It's hard to think that some of your patients that you diagnosed today might not be here tomorrow when you come back for your shift or, you know, Um, all of it. I don't know. (laughs) I'm just tired. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. (laughs) That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there with these patients. Now, to be clear, we do not yet know when all of this might be might reopen. But Governor Cuomo says that the multi-state group of governors might begin working on the plans as early as today. As elected officials grapple with how and when to restart this economy, what exactly could it look like? Neil Kashkari is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He helped run the bailout program at the Treasury Department during the 2008 Great Recession. Mr. Kashkari, good morning to you. It's good to see you. 
Good morning. Good to see you as well. You said on a Sunday show this weekend that you look at this kind of on an 18-month timeline, that you think that economic strategy should really be over 18 months because that's the outside estimate of when we could get a vaccine. What exactly does that mean? Because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, 18 months, I can't sustain this for 18 months. I understand. But when we look around the world, other countries that have successfully flattened the curve with economic controls, it seems as though when they relax the controls, there's a tendency for these flare-ups to happen again because so many people have the disease, but they're not showing symptoms. And so until you really extinguish it with either a treatment or a vaccine, there's always that risk of flare-up. And so we have to be very careful and think over the long term. To me, it's not about the next couple of weeks or the next month even. It's about how do we get to that destination of a vaccine or a therapy. But to be clear, I mean, you're not suggesting that everybody stay at home and businesses stay essentially as they are for the next 18 months, or are you? Well, not as, not as they are, but I think we need to be very smart about this. So I'll give you an example. Some businesses are much more important than others. Think about optometrists are largely closed. I could see if we flatten the curve, optometry offices opening so you can go get your eyes checked. Mm. There are not a lot of people crowded into an eye store at a given time. Contrast that with a movie theater. Is it going to make sense to have 100 people in a crowded movie theater until we have a vaccine? Probably not. I don't think we're going to go back to the way life was like in January or February for the next year or next 18 months. I think we're going to have to be much more targeted as we try to reopen the economy. What do you think? I, I know you're in the economic sector, not the public health sector, but from your analysis, what do you think needs to happen before you can start talking about letting people go back to society, even if it is in a piecemeal fashion? For example, do we have to have widespread antibody test, a blood test that would tell you if you've had the virus and if you are presumptively immune? Well, I think that that would be great. And we should be pursuing all of those uh, widespread testing as well as vaccines and therapies. But I've also talked to health experts who think that we are months, if not years away from having being able to test millions of people on a given day. So I don't know where the breakthrough is going to come from. I think the governors are being very smart in trying to flatten the curve. But we're going to have to slowly reopen things and then very carefully see if we're getting flare ups again. We might be in a case of relaxing things. It flares back up. We have to lock things down again and keep doing that for the foreseeable future until we get an effective treatment or a vaccine. You know, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was on this show recently, and he talked about how prior to this crisis, you know, the economy was in fundamentally a strong position, this long uh, expansion after the Great Recession, uninterrupted job growth. And so the notion was once this public health crisis passes, we should be able to return to a strong economy. Do you believe that? to be the case? I think that's true. But again, if this reopening, I wish it were just a light switch. If there was some therapy that emerged a couple months from now and we all had confidence we could go back to work and not be taking risks, then we could turn things around very quickly. But I think the more that the health experts are learning and learning from what's happening around the world, it seems as though it's going to be more of a gradual return to normal. And the more gradual it is, unfortunately, the slower recovery and the longer it takes to get back to normal. And, I, you know, I, it's kind of a deeper question, philosophical question, but it's an economic one, too. You know, what has changed fundamentally that may not ever go back to be the same? I think about small businesses in my neighborhood. I wonder if they'll be back no matter how much help the government gives them. I wonder if people are going to want to go to big sporting events. I wonder if businesses are going to say, yeah, we should have a convention. Have you thought about how this economy may have changed forever just by virtue of this experience? Absolutely. And, that, and what you're saying is exactly right. We know after the Great Depression, people carry the scars with that experience with them for many, many years. Ultimately, who's going to determine how the economy recovers, it's all of us. It's how comfortable we are having our families going to that restaurant or going to the movie theater or going to that sporting event. And I think the longer this goes on and the more people that are affected by it, the longer that recovery is going to be just because we have to regain confidence ourselves. We do indeed. Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari, thank you for your work. We appreciate it and your time this morning. Thank you. To New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo believes the worst is likely over in his state, the nation's white hot center of the outbreak. He's also launched an initiative with six other governors to coordinate efforts and develop strategies for reopening aspects of the regional economy. And Governor Cuomo is joining us now. Good morning, Governor. 
Good morning, Hunter. Good so, to be with you. Good to be with you. You talked about some good news here in New York. You said we reached a plateau. The death toll has flattened. The number of intubated patients is on the decline. So a lot of people may be saying, well, phew, this thing is over. Is it over? It is not over. All we've, all we've done, which is, which is a significant step, we have shown that we can stop the spread of the virus, right? We were looking at those lines that were continuing to go up, and there was a big question, can you stop the spread of this beast? And we have done that. You closed everything down, and it worked. And the quote-unquote plateau is a flattening of the increase. It's not a decline. It's just a flattening of the increase. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to remember, Hoda, we did this by our behavior. This was not natural. All the projections were much worse than what actually happened because our behavior worked. If we stop doing what we're doing, you will see those numbers go up again, period. Let's talk about reopening the economy. I think everyone wants that to happen. But the question is, when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And who says it's going to happen? Well, yesterday, the president at his news conference, and this is his quote, he said he has the power. He says when someone is president of the United States, the authority is total. He said it was total. And he said the governors know that. Do you know that? Nope. Uh, I don't know what the president is talking about, uh, frankly. Uh, we have a constitution. The constitution is based on balance of powers. Uh, you have to remember it's the states that created the federal government, right? It's the colonies that created the federal government, not the other way around. And we don't have a king. We have a president. And that was a big decision. We ran away from having a king, and George Washington was president, not King Washington. So the president doesn't have total authority. The Constitution is there. Tenth Amendment is there. Number of cases over the years. It's very clear. States have uh, power by the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and the president is just wrong on that point. Okay, so um, if, he, if the president says, let's open New York, and you say you don't think it's a good idea, what happens then? Look, if he pushed it to that absurd point, uh, then we would have a problem. If he thinks he's going to force this state or any state, for that matter, to do something that is reckless or irresponsible, that could endanger human life, literally. Because if we don't reopen correctly, you will see those virus numbers go up again and more people will die. Let's talk and about... And we paid a heck of a price to get the... Yeah, let's talk about reopening correctly, because I think that this is a, a big deal. You're teaming up with six other governors from the Northeast. But I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about reopening a city or a state. And it seems like the only way you can do that is if you have testing to find out who's safe enough or who's well enough to go back to work. And the idea of widespread testing doesn't even seem like a possibility. So how do you even start? Yeah. You, uh, you put your finger right on it. Uh, first of all, nobody's done this before. It has to be phased. It has to be balanced. It's a public health strategy and an economic reactivation strategy. And the key to me is testing. Uh, and people have to know that they are safe and that safe, the testing actually works to uh, make people feel safe. And we don't have that capacity now. And the states can't do it on their own. We have to develop that widespread testing capacity. The way on the first go around, we had to develop additional hospital capacity. Uh, testing is going to be key. And we are not there yet. But that has to be developed. And do you have, a Governor, any kind of a time frame about what we're looking at? I mean, Savannah was just asking an expert about businesses opening, going to ball games. Um, I was just thinking about concerts on our plaza in the summer. We always have summer concerts on the plaza. Do you have any idea of a time frame of when all of that may start to look like normal again? Hoda, I don't. And I think if anybody tells you they do, uh, they don't understand the issue ahead of us. This is all uncharted territory. You have to feel the way it goes. You have to start to reopen with a plan, an informed plan that actually improves on uh, the situation and learns the lessons. But then you have to watch those number, the number of uh, infections. You tell me how New Yorkers or Americans behave today, I'll tell you the infection rate in three days. It's, it's that cause and effect. 
Uh, and as we reopen and everybody wants to get out of their home and everybody wants to get back to work, uh, if we don't do it gradually and controlled, you'll see the viruses go up and that would be a terrible shame. And then we'd have to start all over again. All right. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. In an age where 9 out of 10 smartphones in America are either an iPhone or an Android, Apple and Google are now in a unique position, developing a new way to help track the health crisis called contact tracing. The two tech titans are reworking their operating systems, turning Bluetooth into a tool for measuring proximity, so you may know if you've been exposed to the virus. Apple and Google are really the only two companies in the world that can make this kind of Bluetooth tracking possible. How does it work? Two people come into close contact, six feet or less, for a sustained and unspecified period. Their phones send out keys or beacons that help identify the users anonymously. When they go their separate ways, and later one person tests positive for COVID-19, that patient uploads his or her confirmation, and all of the keys connected with that phone are alerted. You may have differences Kevin Esveld has been working on privacy-first contact tracing at MIT. His app, Safe Paths, will work with the new system. What are the most important things that need to be in place if it's going to be privacy-centric? To me, the single most important aspect is that it has to be distributed. It has to be decentralized. There needs to be no single location that has the information on who came in contact with whom, because that can be too easily abused by a government in particular. Apple and Google line out their privacy protections clearly. Explicit user consent is required. They don't collect personally identifiable information or user location data. And the list of people you've come into contact with never leaves your phone. But privacy concerns still remain a pivot point. A lot of people don't like it from the standpoint of uh, constitutional rights. The San Francisco-based Electronic Frontier Foundation examines the intersection between technology and privacy. The biggest thing I'm worried about is that whatever we put into place right now would stick around after the crisis has ended. Countries like China, South Korea and Israel have also used contact tracing effectively, though experts say without the same attention to personal privacy, placing even more scrutiny on the novel efforts here. If built correctly, this could be a very powerful defense against all pandemics, because this is not just about COVID-19. COVID-19 is terrible. It's a tragedy. Historical pandemics have been worse. Fascinating, Sam. Two questions, though. When, when will this contact tracing program be available, and what's the end game? Yeah, Craig, so the first rollout is going to be about a month from now, mid-May. You will have to update your operating system to do that. As far as the end game is concerned, both Apple and Google say this is not a silver bullet, but should be used in conjunction with testing and preventive measures, all the things we're talking about right now collectively because we don't know much about the virus in terms of its transmission. There's still details that need to be learned, but they're hoping that this will help. Wow. So for me and my wife, Gabby, let me send it back to you guys. Hey, where is Sam. Your, where is your wife? Bring your wife back. <laughs> we want to say thanks to her, too. Where's Debbie? Oh, she needs to come back, Gabby. Yes! She's a meteorologist, by the way, I should add. If Adam oh. and Dylan ever need any help, here's your lady right here. Hey. Hi, Debbie. Uh, hi. <laughs> the Thank weather looks props. good in Miami. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. In China, where the coronavirus began, fears that a second wave could be beginning, with cases imported back into the country. The Chinese setting up mobile laboratories and imposing tough new restrictions in a remote Chinese region on the border with Russia. A 28-day quarantine for anyone arriving and 14 days for people living in places where a new case has been detected. We do need to do many tests, this Chinese Communist Party official says. Russia had apparently avoided Europe's coronavirus crisis, but cases are escalating. Moscow and St. Petersburg in lockdown, and President Putin saying the military could be deployed. The situation is changing daily, he told ministers. Unfortunately, it's not changing for the better. Coronavirus reappearing in places and people that had won the battle. South Korea reporting a small number of infections, just over 100 cases, in patients who had recovered. Scientists fear not reinfections, but that the virus has reactivated. Its unpredictability means nervous weeks in places like Spain, Italy and Austria, where restrictions are slowly lifting. The way down is much slower than the way up. That means control measures must be lifted slowly and with control. 
The French president extending the lockdown there for another month. The epidemic is not under control, he told his country. The US aircraft carrier, USS Harry S. Truman, extending its time at sea to avoid the virus, Navy officials said, and maintain capability. While back in Asia, calls for unity at a summit of Southeast Asian leaders, separated by video, and a warning against complacency. If any of us fails, one leader said, the rest will follow. And despite that call for unity, Savannah, what we are seeing around the world really is a patchwork of approaches and challenges, and that is likely to be the new normal until there's a vaccine. It's not only ravaging our community, but people who have pre-existing conditions, which I think people didn't hear that. And so if you are taking medication for your diabetes, if you're taking medication because of hypertension, if you need an asthma, an inhaler for asthma, mm -hmm. if you have any kind of lung disorder, which I am still concerned about myself, Hoda, from pneumonia, because I ne my lungs never really fully cleared. So the moment I heard pre-existing conditions, I'm like, lock the door. Nobody <laughs> else coming in here. Hi, everybody. Oprah Winfrey taking a deep dive into the deadly and disproportionate impact coronavirus is having on black America in the latest installment of her Oprah Talks COVID-19 series. The critical message, no one is safe. Something she discussed in a previous episode with British actor Idris Elba. And I just felt compelled to um, tell people that this is very real. I was struck by listening to Idris Elba make a plea to people because he was diagnosed with it, pleading, saying this, there's a rumor going around that this is something that doesn't affect us in the African Well, you know, American Hoda, that's the first time I had heard about the rumor. Obviously, he was dispelling the rumor, but I didn't even take the rumor seriously. This was three weeks ago because I thought, who's going to believe that? Well, who's you know who else said the same thing? It. Magic Johnson, he was saying the same thing. He's yes. like, listen. This is serious. Like I was, I was struck by their heartfelt pleas, like begging yeah. people to take it seriously. Yeah, not only is it serious, but people that you don't know, but probably will know, are losing their loved ones. There was a bus driver from Detroit named Jason yes. Hargrove. Yes. And he was literally talking on his phone, saying, people, stop getting Thank on my bus serious. and coughing. To those who watching, I'm just letting you know this, 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 this is real, and y'all need to take this serious. He ended up dying, and I. It struck me that I was. I was thinking about all the African Americans who are in the service industry, who are doing jobs that they are coming in contact with people. Did you find in your special that that was also one of the contributing factors? Well, we as a people, as African Americans, have jobs that require us to be at work. For so many African Americans, there isn't this ability to telecommute. Testing, I mean, by uh, many accounts has been woefully inadequate, but in the African American community in particular, there are not many testing stations for people that well, have access we, to. We, we need, to, one of the things we're talking about in the special is, is, is the need for more testing stations, obviously. But most importantly, I think it's important for African American we to understand for ourselves that this is so serious. It's mm -hmm. taking us out. So is there anything that can be done, Oprah, from, from this point on? I mean, you're pleading, it sounds like you're trying to educate. You want people to well, know what's going on. But certainly, we certainly understand that the responsibilities and dynamics of some people's lives, particularly African-American and brown people, mm -hmm do not allow you to be able to stay at home. And so therefore they need masks. You need masks in these grocery stores. All these people, all these grocery store workers who are out there without the mask, that is at this point, that is, that should not be. For now, everybody needs to look out for themselves and for their neighbors. Her, her heart's in that, and she's also putting her checkbook in that too. She donated $10 million to help Americans suffering. 
And uh, she told me that what she's doing with that money, you guys, is she's giving it to communities where she has a connection, yeah. like Nashville or Milwaukee or Chicago, because she wants to help those kind of communities. But you can hear it in her voice, right? Oh, yeah. I and, mean, she, and when she was talking about the rumors going around, yeah. like you yeah. remember early in the pandemic, Facebook yeah. especially, um, I had friends who had sent me these articles about how Africans, African Americans were not as susceptible yeah. to getting COVID-19. And it was, and people believed it yeah. for a long time. But it's... You know, her, her point about uh, people of color in this country not having the luxury of staying home right. because so many are hourly employees. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a salient point that I think has gotten lost in a lot of, a and lot of she, this. She talks to regular folks. She talks to doctors. She talks to people in the spiritual community. So she really is going to do a wide-ranging special tonight. It was great. Well, I'm glad she's using mm -hmm. her voice because her voice is powerful. Sure. And I think people will listen. I hope the message gets out. And again, Oprah talks COVID-19, the deadly impact on black America. It's available now. It's free on Apple TV. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard. We bleed. We sweat. We cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. With much of America shut down, tonight the promise of progress. New COVID-19 blood test called antibody tests could help get some Americans back to work. Dr. Margaret Zhang just took one in New York. Having antibodies and knowing that I'm as immune as one could be to COVID right now makes me feel even more kind of inclined to serve. UCLA began using its own version of antibody testing, focusing on thousands of medical workers. How can we expect our health workforce to be protecting us if we're not doing everything that we can to protect them? The concept is simple. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, it's because of special antibodies in your immune system that have developed to fight it off, and those will likely protect you from future infection. 
In the case of medical workers, those with antibodies could become super soldiers in the fight against COVID-19. I think that healthcare workers who know that they have antibodies will be able to go into the to to their work more confident that they are not going to be getting themselves sick or then passing this virus on to to others around them. Other tests are being given to the general public in Los Angeles as well. 64-year-old Deborah Presley had her finger pricked and blood drawn as part of a USC study. Within minutes, she learned she had antibodies to fight off coronavirus. When you found out that you had the antibodies, what went through your mind? I'm a caregiver and I go to different people's homes and it's just such a relief because now that I can, now I can help other people. Now dozens of labs all across the country are working on their own antibody tests. Last week, the Trump administration said they are working to make antibody testing free and widely available. Starting with the next week or so, we'll be able to scale up the kind of antibody testing to give you a good feel for what the penetrance of the infection is. But you can start think about some aspect of getting back to normal without having tested everybody in the country, that's for sure. But the FDA commissioner also warning not every antibody test is accurate. No test is 100% perfect, but what we don't want are wildly inaccurate tests. Then there are the diagnostic coronavirus tests, but all told, still less than 1% of the U.S. population has been tested. Just a fraction of what experts say is needed to get a clear sense of how many people may be infected. For now, making complete contact tracing still out of reach. Something authorities say is vital for stopping the virus's spread. And Lester, tonight, even Apple and Google unveiling new plans for a voluntary app that would basically alert you if you've come into contact with a known carrier. Both companies stressing tonight that privacy is their top concern. Finally, he survived his harrowing battle with coronavirus. Now a heartwarming celebration. Here's Steve Patterson. This Easter Sunday, a California hospital resonating with waves of applause for 50-year-old Ramon Zuniga, who fought the coronavirus and won after spending 19 days on a ventilator. I seemed to exist, but I really wasn't sure if I existed. I didn't know if I had passed on or not. For over a month, ICU doctor Alex Hakim documented Ramon's journey and, in a way, his own. I don't know if I have the right words right now to express just how I feel. I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And as for Ramon, he's grateful for the gift of life. I've managed to beat this, but all the credit goes to them. All the nurses, all the doctors. But you gave them hope. Hope. That's what doctors and nurses who saved Ramon will carry with them as they head back to the front lines. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Los Angeles. Carson joins us from home to explain. Hey, Carson. What's up, buddy? Hey, guys. Well, listen, if you're like me right about now, you are starving for some sports, some good news. NBC Sports Network is going to be airing nearly 100 hours of classic Olympic programming each night for the rest of the month of April. We're going to start with the 2016 Rio Games, and here's a little taste of what you can see tonight. Puts it on her feet. It's a gold medal. Got it. <laughs> it almost looked like she the was soaring there. For the crowd deafening here. The, the mighty Michael Phelps. The champion is leading. He's had a very big campaign. Pereira is throwing everything at him, but Phelps is increasing the lead, increasing the stroke rate. There has never been a better swimmer. The most decorated swimmer is miles ahead. Wow. Michael Phelps. Now miles that's got to get ahead. you guys excited, right? That's that's exactly what we need. You saw Michael Phelps, Simone Biles winning there. Um, and also the uh, men's 200 meter individual medley. You can see all of this tonight on the NBC Sports Network. And you can relive those moments with the gymnastics event finals and also all of Michael Phelps' Rio races. You remember Katie Ledecky won four gold medals oh, yeah. also yeah. in Rio. Um, Usain Bolt picked up four. So in these times when we're home, it's going to be exciting for the NBC Sports Networks to have some some Rio Olympics. And, and for all the other sports yeah. deprived folks, Carson Daly, yeah. you probably caught it over the weekend. Like they reshowed the Masters during March Madness. They were reshowing like the best of college basketball games from you know a decade ago yeah. as well. Yeah, I was watching some of the old uh, Masters. They were showing Tiger winning and um, you know the famous chip shot from behind. Uh, 16, they showed that CBS doing a great job of getting that programming out there to watch. Also, I've been watching just old, like, you know, 
Islanders hockey games and, and just sort of pretending that it was live. It's right. exciting just to have a sporting event on your TV, just something to root for. Uh, but the Olympics coming back, you know, we'll start with Rio here on NBC and then maybe get into some of the London games and uh, from 2012 and yeah. also Beijing. So, so well, it's, it's good news. I like it. It is good news. On the ICU floor at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, a drug trial for a potential lifesaver. This is um, remdesivir versus placebo for one of our patients. Doctors prescribing remdesivir delivered in IV form to patients sick with COVID-19. The Emory trial is one of the largest in the world. Infectious disease expert Dr. Anish Mehta is the chief investigator. What we're searching for are medications that will help people get over the infection more rapidly and allow their immune systems to really kick in and knock the virus out of their body. Remdesivir was originally tested to treat Ebola patients, but early results suggest it could be far more effective in treating COVID-19. It's a double-blind NIH study, meaning patients and doctors don't know who gets a placebo. What we have seen is lots of patients recovering. Whether that's because they're getting a study drug or a placebo, we don't know. In Washington state, ICU doctors did give remdesivir to Chris Kane as he struggled to breathe. I mean, within 48 hours, I was feeling a lot better. We're just so thankful. And then I, yeah, to get him on this, to get him on this <laughs> drug so quickly was just an absolute godsend. Now, researchers could be just two to three weeks away from a major breakthrough, determining whether remdesivir should be the go-to treatment in hospitals. Meanwhile, doctors are increasingly cautious about an unproven treatment touted by President Trump, hydroxychloroquine combined with an antibiotic. Researchers in Brazil canceled a small chloroquine study after some patients developed cardiac arrhythmias and even died. But back at Emory, some COVID patients are insisting on getting what they heard President Trump talk up. And they say, I don't want an experimental drug. I want the drug on the news. If approved, drug maker Gilead says it could have enough remdesivir to treat 140,000 people immediately and half a million by October. Bumper to bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Kerry Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scared. 
One of the biggest challenges in this crisis, a shortage of the critical protective gear for frontline healthcare workers. Want to avoid pinching? What's your name? But a month ago at the dining room table, Lori and Kevin Hamama got an idea, a potentially game-changing, life-saving idea. So can you take big, big, deep breaths? Lori, a family doctor in Ohio, was worried. The N95 masks in her hospital were in short supply. I had a meeting that day and just mentioned, I'm afraid we're going to run out of N95s. I think I said, I don't know if I'm going to have a mask. That's when Lori's husband, Kevin, an engineer, asked a simple question. I said, why don't you just clean them up? And Lori said, well, what do you mean? Kevin works for Battelle, a nonprofit research institute that routinely tests for dangerous pathogens and remembered a study they did five years ago showing medical masks could actually be cleaned and reused in an emergency. We hit the ground running Friday night. I think we were drawing schematics of what something <laughs> could look like. <laughs> it means you sat down with a paper and started drawing Absolutely. this thing yeah. <laughs> I was describing what the ICU looked like, where the air flows were. I mean, we, were, we got into it right away. <laughs> By the way, you're obviously the perfect couple for each other. <laughs> <laughs> the following week, testing on masks began. How long did it take to get this FDA approval? I think it was a total of 14 days where we had the green light from the FDA. Now, I don't know how often you guys work with the federal government, but that's that's blazingly fast. Yeah, I, yeah. I could, yeah. Here's how the technology works. A hydrogen peroxide vapor decontaminates the N95 masks. It takes about two and a half hours and the masks can be cleaned and then reused 20 times. Each one can handle about 80,000 masks a day. That's a game changer for hospitals, yeah. isn't it? I mean, that's an entire hospital's worth over a few days. The decontamination systems are already being used in Ohio, Washington, and New York, and launched in Boston over the weekend. We can't get this technology up and running fast enough. With more scheduled to be delivered around the country. Do you guys sit there and just think, wow, we we're so lucky that I had you, you had me, we had that moment? Yeah, I still don't think it's fully sunk in yet. It's overwhelming to think that it started with an after-dinner conversation, drawing it out on a piece of paper and, and seeing if it was even feasible. A nurse in Ohio wrote to Lori to thank her, and she said she walked into her break room at the ICU and saw boxes of clean masks, and it felt like Christmas Day. And it's about to be Christmas Day in a lot of places in this country. Overnight, the Department of Defense said it was commissioning 60 of these machines worth $415 million on top of already pledging to pay for operational costs for the machines and other hospitals for an additional $400 million. They're going to be all around the country by early May. Back to you guys. Stephanie, wow. wow. Thank you so much. I love that yeah. story. I was out on Long Island last yeah. week where they're actually using uh, yeah. one of the systems, and they've said it's a game changer wow. already. Wow. Already. The nurse is seeing a fresh mask <laughs> and saying it's like Christmas. I mean, it just tells you everything you need to know. Good. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. ...is everything because of the first point, which is we are now keeping down that rate of infection. And if you start acting differently, you will see a corresponding increase in that rate of infection. And the worst scenario would be if we did all of this, we got that number down, everybody went to extra extraordinary means, and then we go to reopen, and we reopen too fast, or we reopen and there's unanticipated consequences, and we see that number go up again. Uh, while well, you're being hypercautious. Oh, really? Go look at other countries that went through exactly this, started to reopen, and then they saw the uh, infection rate go back up again. So let's at least learn from past mistakes. We've laid out a way to reopen, coming up with a comprehensive plan. First, that is regional in nature. We have seven states that we're working with. The virus doesn't understand state boundaries, uh, doesn't understand that it needs a passport. You know, it defies all of our norms. So how do you put the best minds together? 
in a seven state area, come up with a regional strategy because the virus can get on Amtrak, the virus can get on a plane, the virus can get in a car and drive up 95. We're all connected. And in truth, since nobody knows where they're going and nobody's done this before, let's think together and let's plan together. Uh, if we can't come up with a common plan, let's see if we can come up with a plan that's not contradictory. Let's see if we can get to a place where what Connecticut does, New Jersey does, is not counter to what we're doing here in New York. And that's the point of the seven states working together. Also, the point is it doesn't work unless you coordinate the reactivation of all the systems. I did this graphic because no one got when I went like this yesterday, and I said the gears have to mesh. This is what I was saying. I could see, Nick, that you did not get what this meant. So that's a clarifier for you, personally, from yesterday. Uh, we also have to be clear on who is responsible for each element of the opening. The President said last night that he has total authority for uh, determining how and when states reopen. That is not an accurate statement, in my opinion. Uh, now that we know that government actually matters and government is relevant and that government has to be smart because what government does is determining how this goes. It's literally determining, uh, in many ways, life and death. We have to be smart about it. The federal-state relationship is central to our democracy. Uh, this has been a topic discussed since our founding fathers first decided to embark on this entire venture, right? Uh, this is basic federalism, the role of the states and the role of the federal government. Uh, and uh, it is important that we get this right. Our founding fathers understood, and we have to remember today, that the balance between the state and the federal, that magnificent balance that is articulated in the Constitution, is the essence of our democracy. We don't have a king in this country. Uh, we didn't want a king, so we have a Constitution and uh, we elect the president. The states, the colonies, formed the federal government. The federal government did not form the states. It's the colonies that ceded certain responsibility to a federal government. All other power remains with the states. It's basic to our Constitution and that federal-state relationship. Hamilton, who uh, in many ways was representative of this discussion of the balance of power. State governments possess inherent advantages which will ever give them an influence and ascendancy, ascendancy, a beautiful word, over the national government and will forever preclude the possibility of federal encroachments on the states. That their liberties indeed can be subverted by the federal head is repugnant to every rule of political calculation. Strong language, but that was the premise. Uh, so there are laws and there are facts, even in this wild political environment. What do we do? We do what we do, because we are New York tough, but tough is more complex than many people think it is. Within that word tough is smart, and united, and disciplined, and loving. They are not, uh, they're not inconsistent to be tough and to be loving. Let me make a personal point, not necessarily a factual point. The president did his briefing last night, uh, and the president was clearly unhappy. Uh, the president did a number of tweets this morning where he's clearly unhappy, did a tweet about mutiny on the bounty and governors are mutineers. I didn't follow the exact meaning of the tweet, but the basic uh, essence of the tweet was uh, that he was not happy with governors 
and that this was a mutiny. Uh, the president is clearly spoiling for a fight on this issue. The worst thing we can do in all of this is start with political division and start with partisanship. Uh, the best thing we have done throughout this past 44 days is we've worked together and we haven't raised political flags. Even in this hyper-partisan environment, even though it's an election year, even though the politics is so intense, we said not here, not in this. This is too important for anyone to play politics. It was a no politics zone, right? This is just about doing the right thing, working together. Uh, and that's important, and we have to stay there. We're all in a little bit of a reflective mood. I'm in a reflective mood. Uh, and everything we do here is so important, and every day is so important. And I was thinking after the president made his comments and looking at some of the remarks and looking at the tweets, reminded me of a poster I saw, saw when I was in grade school, St. Gerard Magella, Queens, New York, Catholic school. Red blazer, gray pants, white shirt, little uh, clip on tie, the tie with the hook. Remember the hook tie that you had to put the hook on? And then it looked like you had a real tie, which I never understood because the hook was harder to do. You had to hook and then you had to adjust the band, which was harder than just teaching a kid how to just tie the tie. It would have been easier. But I was in grade school and there was that poster uh, that came from a Sandberg poem, I think. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. And I was looking at the poster and I didn't really get it because I, even then I was very literal. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. So I'm looking at the poster and a priest came up behind me and said, what's wrong, Andrew? I said, I don't understand that. Suppose they gave a war and nobody came. How could that happen? Then you wouldn't have a war. He said, well, that's the point. The point is what, happened if, what would happen if people just refused to engage? They just refused to fight. And I still didn't get it because, and he said, you know, sometimes it's better to walk away from a fight than engage it. Sometimes it takes more strength, frankly, to walk away from a fight than engage it. The president will have no fight with me. I will not engage in it. I've sat here every day for 44 years asking New Yorkers to remember that this is not about me, it's about we. I understand you're personally inconvenienced. I understand you're frustrated and stressed and anxious and you're feeling pain. Think about we. Think about get, get past yourself and think about society and think about your family and think about interconnection and act responsibly for everyone else. This is no time for politics and it is no time to fight. Uh, I put my hand out in total partnership and cooperation with the president. If he wants a fight, he's not going to get it from me, period. This is going to take us working together. We have a real challenge ahead. Just because that those numbers are flattening, it's no time to relax. We're not out of the woods. In this reopening, we could lose all the progress we made in one week if we do it wrong. Uh, and we have a number of challenges ahead. We have to figure out how to do this. How do you have a public health strategy that works with an economic reactivation strategy? Nobody has done this before. How do you start to increase the number of essential workers? How do you learn the lessons of the past? How do you start to do the massive testing that we're going to have to do here? and that we don't have the capacity to do today. The capacity does not exist. The private sector companies that do testing, we can only get about 60,000 tests per month. That's not enough. We're going to do the antibody testing, but that's not enough either. Uh, how do we do this 
put together this whole testing system and do it in a matter of weeks? It is a real question. How do we use technology? Apple and uh, other companies are working on using technology to do tracking. How do we do that? And how do we do it fast? And how do we take all our strength and our collective strength and take this nation's collective strength and figure out how to do those challenges? 50 years ago this week, Apollo 13 gets damaged 220,000 miles from Earth. Somehow they figure out how to get a spaceship back 220,000 miles 50 years ago. That's America. Okay, figure out how to do testing. Figure out how to use technology to do tracing. That's what we have to work on. Uh, and we have to do that together. We have to do, as a government, what our people have done, right? Sometimes political leaders can learn best from following people who are normally ahead of the politicians. Look at how people have been selfless and put their own agenda aside for the common good. Can't their leaders be as smart as they are? The answer has to be yes. Uh, so I look forward to working with the president in partnership and cooperation, but he has no fight here. I won't let it happen. Uh, and look, unless he, he suggested that uh, we do something that would be reckless and endanger the health or welfare of the people of the state, then I would have no choice. Uh, but shy of that, I put my hand out to say, let's do this together. Questions? Governor, come, 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 but screaming first matters. Governor, Go ahead, you're talking right now about making peace with Donald Trump, with the president, and yet you went on television four times this morning and were asked about it and opined about it repeatedly. You called him a king. You said that his press briefings were like a comedy sketch. Why didn't you just say no comment if you're trying to make peace with him? No, the first point is he does not have total authority. I mean, I'm a governor of a state. Uh, the statement that the, he has total authority over the states and the nation cannot go uncorrected. I mean, it's just a factual statement that is factually wrong. Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. There's a whole body of case law. Uh, I mean, there are many things you can debate in the Constitution because they're ambiguous. This is not one of those things that is ambiguous. So that, that statement cannot stand. And it's not only violative of the Constitution, it's violative to the very concept of democracy. I mean, this was the first battle. Do we want a king or do we want a president? And we opted for a president. So that statement cannot stand, period. Before had hominem attacks, you know, calling him a king, saying that he's, it's like a comedy sketch, saying No, that's there. not how it is. His proclamation is that he would be king. That's what a king is. A king has total authority. That statement cannot stand. The whole mutiny on the bounty, the governors are mutineers, whatever that means, uh, and whatever the rest of the theory was. Uh, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to get into that uh, fight. Look, I bent over backwards. He took a, said a nasty comment about what it was, but he's right. Uh, I worked very hard to be in partnership with the federal government this past month. Uh, I worked very hard to stay away from politics. Uh, and he is right. I did call and say I need federal assistance. I did call and say I need uh, possible overflow beds. That uh, he is right that he did move uh, very quickly to get us Javits and the USNS Comfort. And I said that repeatedly. And I praised him for his actions. And he was right there too. 
the federal government has a very important role. I was a cabinet secretary. I did it for eight years. I know how key the federal government is. Frankly, I know how powerful they actually could be in being of assistance. And I don't even think they uh, were as powerful as they could be. And the federal government has tremendous, tremendous capacity that we need now. So yes, he's right on all of that. He's right that we asked for cooperation and assistance. And he's right that he delivered. And I've said that all along. But this mutineers and uh, it can't exist. I don't have anything specific to talk to him about today. Uh, there's no action item uh, for us to talk about. I have no, it'd be my pleasure to speak with him, but we don't have anything that is, uh, do we have anything pending? No, I did speak to the White House this morning about a uh, hospital matter, uh, but other than that, we don't have anything immediate. No, we haven't had that conversation. And look, it, this is a shift in federal position, which is also fine, by the way. We're entering a new phase, the quote unquote reopening phase. On the first phase, which was the close down phase, the president took a different tact. The president did not close down the economy. He did do the travel ban with China. And he was right on the travel ban with China. The close down of the economy was left to the governors. And I closed down New York. Uh, Governor Pritzker closed down Illinois. Governor Lamont closed down Connecticut. Did it different times, different ways. But he, he uh, left that responsibility, the closing down of the economy, to the governors. You get to the reopening of the economy. Well, the governors closed it down. Wouldn't the governors reopen it? The president says, no, I, I have a different model that I'm envisioning. That's OK, too. But it's a shift. But it's OK. But then what is that model? And let's talk about who does what, which is the intelligent conversation we have to have. How do we do this testing? How does that come up to scale? I can't do it. How do we do this technology? And I understand he's right. It raises constitutional questions. And do you really want that cell phone in your pocket to be a tracking device, right? Uh, OK, so let's talk through how we do that. How do we disinfect a public transit system? Uh, that has to be understood. How do we have masks for every New Yorker? How do we do that? How do we get? Uh, 10, 20 million masks, so we have that added protection. How do we get gloves? Uh, how do we make sure, God forbid, there's a second wave where there's another uptick, that we have the medical equipment we need after we just went through this horrendous hurry up exercise? By the way, where's the funding for states to help do this? I'm broke, <laughs> you know? There's no fancy way to say that. We have a $10 billion deficit. Well, the state should do this and do this and do this and do this. I don't have two nickels to rub together. And the past federal legislation didn't give us anything. The only thing it gave the states was some Medicaid money. It doesn't give us anything to do any of this. They talked about it in the next uh, package of legislation, if there is one. But that's the intelligent conversation to have. Well, now, Will he, will he have this conversation with you? Yeah, I, I have always had an open line of communication with him. I mean, there have been times in the past when uh, he hasn't been happy with me and I haven't been uh, uh, throw, throwing bouquets to him, but we've always communicated and I'm sure we'll communicate now. But I just want to make my position clear. I am not going to fight with him. 
I don't want, this is no time for any division with, between the federal government and the state governments. And, and the governors who I work with, Democrats, we, Republican governor in Massachusetts, it's not a political conspiracy. Uh, governor Baker is a Republican. This is not about Democratic or Republican. It's just not. This is about New York, 10,000 lives lost. These were not 10,000 Democrats or 10,000 Republicans. These were 10,000 people, period. Forget the darn politics. Everyone's tired with it. Why is it just saying releasing the names of nursing homes and how many COVID cases and fatalities are specific homes, like Ohio and Connecticut's doing? Legal experts says, say that there's no HIPAA issue here. Okay, do you want to speak to that, Dr. Jim? We put out the nursing home death data by county yesterday, and as you could see, some of them had one case. What we're worried about is personal privacy protection working with the Department of Health. There's more than, uh, there's about 600 nursing homes in the state. This goes for hospitals as well. There's some very small hospitals where they report out one or two deaths a day. We just want to go through the data and make sure we're not releasing any potential personal information. And as soon as that's done, that will be made available for people. Okay. So that's why we put the aggregate numbers out by county. That's what we're going through. We're getting reports of specific outbreaks at different nursing homes, so it's hard to tell. But you know, what are, where are, are there any nursing homes in particular that the state's seeing a huge problem? We're, we're seeing issues like I talked about yesterday in hospitalizations in different parts of the state. We look at, we look at total beds being used, we look at deaths, we look at all of that. In certain downstate parts of the region, um, New York City, in the outer boroughs, and Nassau County, we have seen increased cases. But that has gone across the board, whether it be hospitalizations or nursing homes as well. So that's now part of the county data that you do see. Ms. Holden. Yeah, earlier you said that there's been 60,000 cases that you guys have the capacity to do a month. But, so one, is that true, 60,000 a month? But then Mayor de Blasio said that they're going to start being able to do 100,000 tests a week. 50 homegrown, 50,000 homegrown efforts, 50,000 purchased from an Indiana company. So how does that coordinate with state efforts? And again, is that 60,000 capacity correct? The uh, signed on the dotted line, what's happening with the testing companies is the same thing that happened with medical equipment, PPE and ventilators. There are just a handful of companies that produce the private tests. And they're all private tests, by the way. A handful of companies that do it, and now every state is going to those companies to buy the tests. I've spoken to the head of the, uh, several companies myself. And they have a limited production, and now they have to allocate it to 50 states. And we're again in a bidding war competition with other states. I would say to the federal government, you take that piece. Don't replicate the 50 state pandemonium. You want to talk about an increased federal role. Let FEMA do the testing. FEMA should have, in my opinion, done all the purchasing of the medical equipment and they should have allocated it. Why am I now competing for private testing capacity and private testing machines with Illinois and California? I want to get out of the uh, eBay competition business for vital medical equipment and now vital testing. I would say to the president, you take it. God bless you. Because you have different bids and different promises from companies to different governments all across the country. Like I bought 17,000 ventilators, and then I didn't get, uh, we only got about 3,000, 2,500. The same thing's going to happen with the testing. But how come the, the city can get 50,000 made away? Well, week, that's what, can't. well, they're told that from a company. Do I believe we're going to see those numbers actually produced? No, because I think the same thing is going to happen that we just went through for the past month where those companies are going to get oversubscribed, they're then going to bid up the price, and it's going to go to the highest bidder. We learned this lesson. I saw this movie. I just lived it for the past month. It cost taxpayers tremendous amounts of money. Private companies got very rich. 
you want to talk about going to a new phase with a different model, let's inform it from the past model. Tell FEMA, you buy all the tests for the country, allocate them by need. This is where the cases are. New York, your X percent of the cases. Illinois, your Y percent of the cases. Massachusetts, your Z percent of the cases. The federal government is going to buy them, and then the federal government is going to allocate them. Not this, you know, let's, let's give each government or level of government functions that they perform best. And one of the really painful lessons was all this crazy competing by states and cities for medical equipment. We're going to, we're going to do that again? That makes no sense. Governor, the efficacy of the serological tests and what's the plan if those can't get scaled up in the way that you think is needed to reopen? The what economy? is the ac accuracy so would you say? Some, it varies. There are many different tests there. We're looking at the tests that have, you know, over 95 percent accuracy. We are working to scale this up both by our public lab, which is our state lab, the private sector uh, labs that are out there. We're looking at those as well as the hospitals, which have labs as well. Address the false positive issue because if someone goes back to work but they don't actually have the antibodies like the test says, and then that creates its own problem. Well, we are looking at that. For example, our state lab, the test that we've developed is basically six standard deviations out, which basically means that you're really way up there over the 99% uh, accuracy, if not higher. Uh, but you are right. Can I just follow up? You are right. There are different private sector tests with different accuracy rates. And that's one of the other complications. Go buy tests. Or whose test, which test, what level of accuracy. Uh, and that, I think, it's something we have to figure out one way or the other. But I would say that's something the federal government should take. So what's the capacity on that at this point? How many antibody tests can you do? You mentioned a couple of thousand, right? So right? the state, we are, will be by next week at 2,000. Um, tests that we will be able to do uh, per week at, at that um, right at that point. Um, uh, ne sorry, uh, 2,000 tests uh, per day uh, next week. Yes, that still seems like a long way to go in a but, state but, of 19 million people. Though, right, right, but that's that part. But we are also working with some of the private sector companies to be able to get in the tens of thousands of tests, as well as the hospitals. Several hospitals have developed tests. There are different ways to do these tests. You could do it as a blood test. Uh, we are looking at uh, a, a finger stick test as well. Um, where you just do a little blood spot, uh, and there's technology uh, for that as well. Yeah, but just to follow up on that for a second. It, it, look, you could have a whole symposium on testing. There are two types of tests, the antibody test and the diagnostic test. The antibody test, state health department has a test, and you're right, it's their limited capacity. Let's say they can do, you said 2,000 a day. So let's say 14,000 a week. What is 14,000 a week going to do for you? And by the way, the whole anti, what can the antibody population really be in the scope of things, right? Antibody population, people who had the illness and have recovered. Okay, that's important to know, and we're very aggressive on antibody testing, but how many people are gonna test positive, right? What percent of the population at this point do you think had the coronavirus? What could a number be? 20%, 10%. Okay, you want to find that 10%, 20%, but then that's not enough to restart and get back to normalcy. That diagnostic test is going to be key. And now, think of the volume on that diagnostic test. We're 19 million people. How many diagnostic tests do you want to buy for 19 million people? And then multiply that by the nation. Look at the need. And I'm telling you, you literally have a handful of private sector companies that do this now. Well, how do you scale that up? I don't know. How did you get a rocket ship 220,000 miles back from the moon 50 years ago? But if you could figure that out, you can figure this out. Uh, and if the federal government wants to know a valuable role, this is going to be a key element to all of this. You basically talked about testing everybody for coronavirus in the entire state as a prerequisite to getting the No, 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 no. No, you would never get there. If you, if you said that was the prerequisite, you'd be closed to ad infinitum. 
but you want testing capacity as a tool where businesses can use it as a tool. You want temperature taking, right? You open up a business, they're going to say, I want to take everybody's temperature as they walk in the door. All right, how do you take the temperature of uh, 500 people walking into a, a business, you know? Uh, just think of all the things you have to do, and then divide it between the federal government and the state government. We have to clean all the buses and all the trains. We want to clean all the park benches. We want to have a disinfectant solution where we have a cleaning protocol that we've never had before. We want the technology to do the tracing once we find the person who is positive, and we can retrace them through the technology. How do we balance that with individual liberties? There's a a lot to do here. And let's, the states cannot do this on their own. I'm not shy about capacity. I'm very proud of what we do in the state government. When I tell you I can't do something, it's the first time you've heard me say that since I've been governor. But I'm telling you, we can't do this. Joseph. Um. Earlier, when this entire thing started 40 some odd days ago, you said that COVID in a nursing home is like fire through dry grass. It was one of the first areas where there was a complete lockdown. People couldn't come in and out. So why is it that we're seeing hundreds of people dying in nursing homes from COVID? Like, was there lax uh, inspection? You can't, because or? you cannot stop it, Josepha. You cannot stop it. Look, we have no visitors going to a nursing home. You want to hear, uh, talk about a harsh policy. No visitors, it must be close to a month. You're in a nursing home, you can't get visitors. The staff has to be checked when they come in uh, every day. But by the way, taking somebody's temperature, that's not a foolproof mechanism. And any one of those staff members could be walking in with a spark in their pocket. To, to torture the uh, metaphor. And that population is so vulnerable, it just takes one staff member who didn't have a temperature, but did have the virus to walk in, and now you're gonna have a serious problem. Governor, you wanna comment on that? The point that the government just raised is at the crux of all this, that there are individuals with multi-organ system, many other problems, heart problems, diabetes, asthma, respiratory problems, their immune system is just not as good or as robust, and so they get sick with whether it's this or the flu, uh, and they end up in the hospital. Many of the patients that you had mentioned that sick and die, a lot of those, they were transferred to the hospital, but at 95 years of age with multiple medical problems, uh, it's, a, it's a tough battle for them. And look, Joseph, what you've learned is, you've learned your strength and your weakness, right? You've learned that you can control the virus, and that's a powerful lesson, because we weren't always sure that we could, right? but you've also learned your weakness. You cannot hermetically seal society. You can't hermetically seal a nursing home. You can't put it in a bubble uh, and say, I can protect these vulnerable people. You can't, you can't. Isolation, no visitors, every staff member has to be checked. Uh, an ember, one ember, finds its way in, and then it is fire through dry grass. Governor, in the city of Rochester yesterday. Go ahead, Nick. Governor, in the city of Rochester. I want to try to get everybody who wants to ask a question to do it. I also need visual aids. Um, but in the city of Rochester yesterday, there was a 100-person vigil um, after a shooting there, and it was apparently okayed by the mayor. Is it appropriate to hold large gatherings like that one? Uh, videos online show that people were not likely social distancing during well, look, I don't know the specifics, and I don't want to comment on the specifics, uh, but we spent a lot of time not only uh, saying there should be no large gatherings, we even said no large gatherings during religious holidays, uh, which a lot of people were unhappy about. But look, that was the first, you know, at least learn the lesson, right? Learn the lesson of New Rochelle. New Rochelle, New, uh, New Rochelle, Westchester. Oh, that's New York City. No, it's not. It's not a dense urban environment. It's in a suburban community. And that was one person in religious gatherings. 
That could happen anywhere in the country at any given time. So we learned that lesson, and we've been advocating that. I mean, I, I couldn't be more clear on it. Did you work with Who didn't ask it? Um, we'll do this, and we'll do, we'll do go ahead. Are your advisors uh, already discussing legal options should the conversations with the White House break down to that point? And what could it mean for the reopening process and the coalition with the other states if that challenge had to survive several layers of appeal and potentially drag on for months? Yeah. Uh, it takes two to tango. Uh, it takes two to get into a uh, fight. It takes two people to get into a litigation. I am not interested in fighting with the president. Uh, and I can't be more clear in that. I'm not going to allow anything bad to happen to the people I represent, right? Uh, I see my job very clearly. I get hired by the people of the state of New York to fight for them and to protect them. Uh, I'm trained as a lawyer slash advocate, uh, grew up at the kitchen table with Mario Cuomo, a natural born lawyer slash advocate. Uh, I will fight with all my might to protect New Yorkers, but I don't think it comes to that. I do not want to fight with the president. Uh, he is wrong on the law. I don't think this is a legal issue. This is no time. You don't even have the luxury for the argument. And there's too much to do for everyone. There's just too much to do. Uh, I can't do it. He can't do it. Uh, I'm not even sure how quickly we can do it together. So what's the fight about? Go ahead. That was actually exactly my question. But have you talked to the AG about Come up that? with a new question, fast. <laughs> have you talked to the AG about that at all? About no. Got to be a better question than that. Go ahead. Would, would there be an argument of like state sovereignty? I, I guess that would be the that, argument. Yeah, Constitution. Constitution. I'd call Alexander Hamilton. Did you <laughs> Thank you, guys. Issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask, how do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. I just got laid off of my job due to the whole um, coronavirus pandemic. I haven't worked in over three weeks. And I really just have no idea what's going to happen next. No one does.
I was just coming like to clock in to work, like they send me to HR, like they say they, they took my ID, like um, like they say when they have business, they're gonna call me. But I asked them like, um, when they're gonna call me, like they, they don't um, give me any option. Like they say, I have to apply again. Just think about it, I'm two months pregnant. So I don't even know if I gonna get my job, my job back don't know if I'm going to run out of money before I can start working again and that's um, been pretty stressful just so much uncertainty to you know have to live with while also having a lot of free time to think about it <laughs> Um, I have a history in uh, television news, communications, social media, sales, but right now I'm applying at uh, Costco, the grocery store, Amazon, anywhere where maybe you get a check. I mean, I told my son you're never too good to take a job that pays, uh, and right now we don't know how long we're going to need to do that for. We have about 23 employees. I had to tell them one by one, you know, we're laying them off. And, uh, a lot of them, you know, they, they become your family because... We see them every day. They've been with us, a lot of them, for many years. Their livelihood depends on the restaurant. Um, the good thing is, I guess, that the firm I worked for, they want to bring us all back. The only thing is they just don't know when. Could be several weeks, could be several months. They couldn't, you know, after all this blows over, they may not bring us back. I, I have rent I have to pay for, family to provide for. I have to make sure that my kids are able to eat. And I'm just one of the few people that work at JFK Airport that, you know, this is affected. This, just thousands of workers. Like I have rent, I have food to buy, and I have medical expenses, and that's just the bare necessities. Um, I've been having some coronavirus symptoms, and a thousand dollars is not going to be enough for my rent. Uh, I was fired last Thursday, so a week ago tomorrow, I've been trying to file unemployment continuously um, to no avail. The landlord keeps sending emails about the rent, so they're freaking out. Everybody in my building is now unemployed. Uh, I've had to file for unemployment, um, and I have a large uh, medical bill looming. I'm an amputee. Um, in my right leg and I got a new prosthetic recently and um, on a personal note I think a lot of us are thinking about what it's going to be like when we do go back. But I think a lot of Americans are starting to realize that they reality is they're very close to poverty um, maybe even a couple of acts of generosity away from hitting rock bottom and losing everything and we're denying people minimum wage uh, increase and now the people who we were denying are the only ones showing up to work unless you're a medical care provider. One domino falls and I've got a mortgage, rent, debt, older parents, partner, food security, loans, car, tolls, coast guard renewals, all selfish things that I gotta grapple with. Like when I start my job, what will be the point of health benefits if I can't even get seen? All I, all we've got are a thousand questions and we can't afford to postpone the answers. You know, there's not that many dairy farmers out there left. So when, when you go tell somebody, hey, I'm a dairy farmer, they're like, oh, I don't know if I ever met one of those. <laughs> Something I always want to do is be a dairy farmer, so. I've been on a dairy farm for 30 years. I grew up in it. You know, every morning, every night, you're you're putting your hands on them. I mean, I guess that's just, you know, it's hard to, I don't know, it's just hard to believe it's over. It's a bad time to be an American dairy farmer. Since 1970, the U.S. has lost more than 90% of its dairy farms. The small farms have been replaced by fewer, larger farms. 
and a national milk surplus makes it harder for the remaining small dairy farms to turn a profit. After nearly 70 years in operation, Curtis Coombs' family dairy farm in rural Kentucky is about to shut down. He's one of more than 100 dairy farmers who lost a contract with Dean Foods and the company's processing plant in Louisville, Kentucky. Dean Foods is closing the plant because Walmart, its primary customer, has decided to cut out the middleman. Walmart streamlined its milk operation by building its own processing facility and buying milk directly from large suppliers. Now Walmart no longer requires Dean's services or its farmers. I guess, well, today's a big deal because it, it's the last, the last day we'll milk cows that the milk will be shipped out. Probably about three weeks ago, we made the decision to get out. What are you going to do today? You know, our biggest problem is our land's not paid for. So we've got to figure out some way to make enough money to make farm payments. And, you know, while we weren't making a whole lot of money with the dairy cows, we weren't making the payments. I'm gonna sell eighty thousand dollar soap. No matter where this place goes, we have to remind each other that we're we're still we still have our relationship and we still have our kids. We still have our family. It was real rough mentally, more than physically. Feed man called me one day and said, well, how are you doing? I said, physically, I'm fine. I said, mentally, I'm gonna shoot somebody. He said, I know how you feel. Yeah, dairy farming is important to us. I guess we've made it a way of life or it's, or it's, it's been our life. We work hard to make a living here and, and we've done pretty good for well over 60 years. And I guess I'm, I'm pretty sure we keep on making a living on the farm somehow or another. Dad rented some land in the 50s and moved here in 52 and rented this farm. There was five of us kids that was, that was born and raised here. And um, so I guess it, it, it became our life. The Coombs family learned they had lost their contract with Dean Foods back in March. Since then, they fought to keep the family business alive. But after selling off some of their cows, getting rejected by a co-op, and with no other nearby milk processing facility to sell to, they chose to shut down. <laughs> the problem with selling all of our girls is that they were born here. Some of them have different quirks about them. Some of them are crazy as calves, and then they mellow out as mama cows. My hair is something that they really enjoy because they think it's hay, so they'll come and, and like start grabbing at my hair. So I have to watch out for that, for the ones who really like, you know, like to come up and hang out. You know, I mean, there was cows in the herd that I could, I can tell you who her father was, I can tell you who her mother was. I can remember when she was born, I can remember her grandmother. You know, you just remember those lines, you remember those families, and you know, not only do you see how your line progresses and how you get better at breeding them and how they get to be better cows, but you just also remember them as a cow and their quirks and cow we called Kay. She always laid in the very back corner. You could always, if you wanted to find her, you knew exactly where to find her. After losing their exclusive contract with Dean Foods, the Coombs family is left unable to sell their milk to anyone, anywhere. So now they're forced to sell the last of their dairy cows to slaughter. Monday, 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 Monday,
I mean, I'm a fixer, so <laughs> how do I fix this problem? I mean, this is my husband's dream. I mean, it's a great place to raise a family, but his dream's gone. So it was a hard pill to swallow. Curtis was raised as a dairy farmer. And I had a man come up here one day and pick me up. He was going to a meeting. Curtis was 10 years old. <coughs> and uh, he said, you're raising a dairy farmer. I said, yeah. I said, raise him just like I was raised. He said, my wife won't let me raise my son that way. He says, they lived off the farm about two miles down the road. He says, she don't want him to grow up not having any money. And I had two neighbors out here told me the same thing. And they was right, they can't make a whole lot of money. If he's satisfied going broke milking cows, then we're happy. I had, a, I had a really good friend in college. Her dad would always say that every generation is one generation removed from the farm. You know, I guess in the back of your mind, you know, you know they'll always be able to grow up on a farm. You know, they won't get to know what it's like to get up in the morning and milk with their dad. President Trump now declaring that he is the sole power who gets to determine when and how states reopen, even as governors in some of the hardest hit states make plans of their own. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. And the governors know that. In fact, the Constitution gives that power to the states. And experts say the president does not have the authority to direct governors, mayors, or other local officials to lift their emergency orders. Overnight, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo challenging the president's claim. To say I have total authority over the country because I'm the president, it's absolute. That is a king. We didn't have a king. The tension punctuating a White House briefing where President Trump was combative and at times angry. I haven't asked anybody. Because I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. The president also playing a White House produced campaign style video in an effort to defend his handling of the crisis that's come under increased scrutiny. Everything we did was right. President Trump highlighting his January ban on travel from China. One case in the whole United States, one case, I'm supposed to shut down the government, the biggest, the biggest uh, economy in the history of the world. Shut it down. We have one case. And sparring with reporters who challenged the federal response beyond that January ban. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. We did a lot. Look, look. You know you're a fake. Over the weekend, Dr. Anthony Fauci argued more lives could have been saved here if the government acted sooner. I mean, obviously, if we had right from the very beginning shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. 
On Monday, the president calling Fauci to the podium, where the nation's top infectious disease doctor clarified his comments about pushback within the administration. And that was the wrong choice of words. A day after retweeting a post that included the hashtag fire Fauci, the president praising the doctor. Today I walk in, I hear I'm going to fire him. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. Today, the president is scheduled to meet here with people who have recovered from COVID-19. And as for the economy, he says when it reopens, in his words, I think we're going to boom. But many of his allies and economists agree, no matter what President Trump says, the real recovery will not happen until Americans begin feeling safe returning to their own lives. The death toll has now topped 10,000 in New York State, but ICU admissions and intubations are way down. The clearest sign yet, the curve is flattening. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Now, the governors of New York and six other northeastern states that represent more than half of the nation's coronavirus cases are partnering to discuss the best way to safely ease restrictions and restart the region's economy. The group of governors includes six Democrats and one Republican. We cannot act on our own. Even if we give ourselves an A+, plus, that won't be enough. This is incredibly important that we coordinate. Three western states, including California, are doing the same. In New York City, 21 public school teachers have died from the virus. And COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. But there are some encouraging signs. The number of newly hospitalized patients in New York is at its lowest point in weeks, but that doesn't mean doctors and nurses aren't still stressed. Every patient is getting multiple medications. Some are getting blood transfusions. Dr. Melanie Malloy works at Mount Sinai in Brooklyn. It's hard to think that some of your patients that you diagnosed today might not be here tomorrow when you come back for your shift or, you know, um, all of it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just tired. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there with these patients. Now, to be clear, we do not yet know when all of this might be might reopen, but Governor Cuomo says that the multi-state group of governors might begin working on the plans as early as today. As elected officials grapple with how and when to restart this economy, what exactly could it look like? Neil Kashkari is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He helped run the bailout program at the Treasury Department during the 2008 Great Recession. Mr. Kashkari, good morning to you. It's good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you as well. You said on a Sunday show this weekend that you look at this kind of on an 18-month timeline, that you think that economic strategy should really be over 18 months because that's the outside estimate of when we could get a vaccine. What exactly does that mean? Because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, 18 months, I can't sustain this for 18 months. I understand. But when we look around the world, other countries that have successfully flattened the curve with economic controls, it seems as though when they relax the controls, there's a tendency for these flare-ups to happen again because so many people have the disease, but they're not showing symptoms. And so until you really extinguish it with either a treatment or a vaccine, there's always that risk of flare-up. And so we have to be very careful and think over the long term. To me, it's not about the next couple of weeks or the next month even. It's about how do we get to that destination of a vaccine or a therapy. But to be clear, I mean, you're not suggesting that everybody stay at home and businesses stay essentially as they are for the next 18 months, or are you? Well, not as, not as they are, but I think we need to be very smart about this. So I'll give you an example. Some businesses are much more important than others. Think about optometrists are largely closed. I could see if we flatten the curve, optometry offices opening so you can go get your eyes checked. Mm. There are not a lot of people crowded into an eye store at a given time. Contrast that with a movie theater. Is it going to make sense to have 100 people in a crowded movie theater until we have a vaccine? Probably not. I don't think we're going to go back to 
the way life was like in January or February for the next year or next 18 months. I think we're going to have to be much more targeted as we try to reopen the economy. What do you think? I, I know you're in the economic sector, not the public health sector, but from your analysis, what do you think needs to happen before you can start talking about letting people go back to society, even if it is in a piecemeal fashion? For example, do we have to have widespread antibody test, a blood test that would tell you if you've had the virus and if you are presumptively immune? Well, I think that that would be great. And we should be pursuing all of those uh, widespread testing as well as vaccines and therapies. But I've also talked to health experts who think that we are months, if not years away from having being able to test millions of people on a given day. So I don't know where the breakthrough is going to come from. I think the governors are being very smart in trying to flatten the curve. But we're going to have to slowly reopen things and then very carefully see if we're getting flare ups again. We might be in a case of relaxing things. It flares back up. We have to lock things down again and keep doing that for the foreseeable future until we get an effective treatment or a vaccine. You know, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was on this show recently, and he talked about how prior to this crisis, you know, the economy was in fundamentally a strong position, this long uh, expansion after the Great Recession, uninterrupted job growth. And so the notion was once this public health crisis passes, we should be able to return to a strong economy. Do you believe that? to be the case? I think that's true. But again, if this reopening, I wish it were just a light switch. If there was some therapy that emerged a couple months from now and we all had confidence we could go back to work and not be taking risks, then we could turn things around very quickly. But I think the more that the health experts are learning and learning from what's happening around the world, it seems as though it's going to be more of a gradual return to normal. And the more gradual it is, unfortunately, the slower recovery and the longer it takes to get back to normal. And, I, you know, I, it's kind of a deeper question, philosophical question, but it's an economic one, too. You know, what has changed fundamentally that may not ever go back to be the same? I think about small businesses in my neighborhood. I wonder if they'll be back no matter how much help the government gives them. I wonder if people are going to want to go to big sporting events. I wonder if businesses are going to say, yeah, we should have a convention. Have you thought about how this economy may have changed forever just by virtue of this experience? Absolutely. And and what you're saying is exactly right. We know after the Great Depression, People carry the scars with that experience with them for many, many years. Ultimately, who's going to determine how the economy recovers? It's all of us. It's how comfortable we are having our families going to that restaurant or going to the movie theater or going to that sporting event. And I think the longer this goes on and the more people that are affected by it, the longer that recovery is going to be just because we have to regain confidence ourselves. We do indeed. Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari, thank you for your work. We appreciate it and your time this morning. Thank you. To New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo believes the worst is likely over in his state, the nation's white hot center of the outbreak. He's also launched an initiative with six other governors to coordinate efforts and develop strategies for reopening aspects of the regional economy. And Governor Cuomo is joining us now. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Hunter. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. You talked about some good news here in New York. You said we reached a plateau. The death toll has flattened. The number of intubated patients is on the decline. So a lot of people may be saying, well, phew, this thing is over. Is it over? It is not over. All we've all we've done, which is which is a significant step. We have shown that we can stop the spread of the virus, right? We were looking at those lines that were continuing to go up, and there was a big question, can you stop the spread of this beast? And we have done that. You closed everything down, and it worked. And the quote-unquote plateau is a flattening of the increase. It's not a decline. It's just a flattening of the increase. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to remember, Hoda, we did this by our behavior. This was not natural. All the projections were much worse than what actually happened because our behavior worked. If we stop doing what we're doing, you will see those numbers go up again, period. Let's talk about reopening the economy. I think everyone wants that to happen. But the question is, when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And who says it's going to happen? Well, yesterday, the president at his news conference, and this is his quote, he said he has the power. He says when someone is president of the United States, the authority is total. He said it was total. And he said the governors know that. Do you know that? Nope. Uh, 
I don't know what the president is talking about, uh, frankly. Uh, we have a constitution. The constitution is based on balance of powers. Uh, you have to remember it's the states that created the federal government, right? It's the colonies that created the federal government, not the other way around. And we don't have a king. We have a president. And that was a big decision. We ran away from having a king, and George Washington was president, not King Washington. So the president doesn't have total authority. The Constitution is there. Tenth Amendment is there. Number of cases over the years. It's very clear. States have uh, power by the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and the president is just wrong on that point. Okay, so um, if, he, if the president says, let's open New York, and you say you don't think it's a good idea, what happens then? Look, if he pushed it to that absurd point, uh, then we would have a problem. If he thinks he's going to force this state or any state, for that matter, to do something that is reckless or irresponsible, that could endanger human life, literally. Because if we don't reopen correctly, you will see those virus numbers go up again and more people will die. Let's talk and about... And we paid a heck of a price to get the... Yeah, let's talk about reopening correctly, because I think that this is a, a big deal. You're teaming up with six other governors from the Northeast. But, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about reopening a city or a state, and it seems like the only way you can do that is if you have testing to find out who's safe enough or who's well enough to go back to work. And the idea of widespread testing doesn't even seem like a possibility. So how do you even start? Yeah. You, uh, you put your finger right on it. Uh, first of all, nobody's done this before. It has to be phased. It has to be balanced. It's a public health strategy and an economic reactivation strategy. And the key to me is testing. Uh, and people have to know that they are safe and that safe, the testing actually works to uh, make people feel safe. And we don't have that capacity now. And the states can't do it on their own. We have to develop that widespread testing capacity. The way on the first go around, we had to develop additional hospital capacity. Uh, testing is going to be key. Mm -hmm. And we are not there yet. But that has to be developed. And do you have, a Governor, any kind of a time frame about what we're looking at? I mean, Savannah was just asking an expert about businesses opening, going to ball games. Um, I was just thinking about concerts on our plaza in the summer. We always have summer concerts on the plaza. Do you have any idea of a time frame of when all of that may start to look like normal again? Hoda, I don't. And I think if anybody tells you they do, uh, they don't understand the issue ahead of us. This is all uncharted territory. You have to feel the way it goes. You have to start to reopen with a plan, an informed plan that actually improves on uh, the situation and learns the lessons. But then you have to watch those number, the number of uh, infections. You tell me how New Yorkers or Americans behave today, I'll tell you the infection rate in three days. It's, it's that cause and effect. Uh, and as we reopen and everybody wants to get out of their home and everybody wants to get back to work, uh, if we don't do it gradually and controlled, you'll see the viruses go up. And that would be a terrible shame. And then we'd have to start all over again. All right. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. In an age where nine out of 10 smartphones in America are either an iPhone or an Android, Apple and Google are now in a unique position, developing a new way to help track the health crisis called contact tracing. The two tech titans are reworking their operating systems, turning Bluetooth into a tool for measuring proximity, so you may know if you've been exposed to the virus. Apple and Google are really the only two companies in the world that can make this kind of Bluetooth tracking possible. How does it work? Two people come into close contact, six feet or less, for a sustained and unspecified period. Their phones send out keys or beacons that help identify the users anonymously. When they go their separate ways, and later one person tests positive for COVID-19, that patient uploads his or her confirmation, and all of the keys connected with that phone are alerted. You may have differences Kevin Esveld has been working on privacy-first contact tracing at MIT. His app, Safe Paths, will work with the new system. What are the most important things that need to be in place if it's going to be privacy-centric? To me, the single most important aspect is that it has to be distributed. It has to be decentralized. There needs to be no single location that has the information on who came in contact with whom. 
because that can be too easily abused by a government in particular. Apple and Google line out their privacy protections clearly. Explicit user consent is required. They don't collect personally identifiable information or user location data. And the list of people you've come into contact with never leaves your phone. But privacy concerns still remain a pivot point. A lot of people don't like it from the standpoint of uh, constitutional rights. The San Francisco-based Electronic Frontier Foundation examines the intersection between technology and privacy. The biggest thing I'm worried about is that whatever we put into place right now would stick around after the crisis has ended. Countries like China, South Korea and Israel have also used contact tracing effectively, though experts say without the same attention to personal privacy, placing even more scrutiny on the novel efforts here. If built correctly, this could be a very powerful defense against all pandemics. Because this is not just about COVID-19. COVID-19 is terrible. It's a tragedy. Historical pandemics have been worse. Fascinating, Sam. Two questions, though. When, when will this contact tracing program be available? And what's the end game? Yeah, Craig, so the first rollout is going to be about a month from now, mid-May. You will have to update your operating system to do that. As far as the end game is concerned, both Apple and Google say this is not a silver bullet, but should be used in conjunction with testing and preventive measures. All the things we're talking about right now collectively, because we don't know much about the virus in terms of its transmission. There's still details that need to be learned, but they're hoping that this will help. Uh -huh. So for me and my wife, Gabby, let me send it back to you guys. Hey, where is Sam. You, where's your wife? Bring your wife back. <laughs> we want to say thanks to her, too. Where's Debbie? Uh, she needs to come back, Gabby. Yes. She's a meteorologist, by the way, I should add. If Adam oh. or Dylan ever need any help, here's your lady right here. Hey. Hi, Debbie. Uh, hi. Well, the Thank weather you, looks Brooks. good in Miami. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. In China, where the coronavirus began, fears that a second wave could be beginning with cases imported back into the country. The Chinese setting up mobile laboratories and imposing tough new restrictions in a remote Chinese region on the border with Russia. A 28-day quarantine for anyone arriving and 14 days for people living in places where a new case has been detected. We do need to do many tests, this Chinese Communist Party official says. Russia had apparently avoided Europe's coronavirus crisis, but cases are escalating. Moscow and St. Petersburg in lockdown, and President Putin saying the military could be deployed. The situation is changing daily, he told ministers. Unfortunately, it's not changing for the better. Coronavirus reappearing in places and people that had won the battle. South Korea reporting a small number of infections, just over 100 cases, in patients who had recovered. Scientists fear not reinfections, but that the virus has reactivated. Its unpredictability means nervous weeks in places like Spain, Italy and Austria, where restrictions are slowly lifting. The way down is much slower than the way up. That means control measures must be lifted slowly and with control. The French president extending the lockdown there for another month. The epidemic is not under control, he told his country. The U.S. aircraft carrier, USS Harry S. Truman, extending its time at sea to avoid the virus, Navy officials said, and maintain capability. While back in Asia, calls for unity at a summit of Southeast Asian leaders, separated by video, and a warning against complacency. If any of us fails, one leader said, the rest will follow. And despite that call for unity, Savannah, what we are seeing around the world really is a patchwork of approaches and challenges, and that is likely to be the new normal until there's a vaccine. It's not only ravaging our community, but people who have pre-existing conditions, which I think people didn't hear that. And so if you are taking medication for your diabetes, if you're taking medication because of hypertension, if you need an asthma, an inhaler for asthma, mm -hmm. if you have any kind of lung disorder, which I am still concerned about myself, Hoda, from pneumonia, because I ne my lungs never really fully cleared. So the moment I heard pre-existing conditions, I'm like, lock the door. Nobody <laughs> else coming in here. Hi, everybody. 
Oprah Winfrey taking a deep dive into the deadly and disproportionate impact coronavirus is having on black America in the latest installment of her Oprah Talks COVID-19 series. The critical message, no one is safe. Something she discussed in a previous episode with British actor Idris Elba. And I just felt compelled to um, tell people that this is very real. I was struck by listening to Idris Elba make a plea to people because he was diagnosed with it, pleading, saying this. There's a rumor going around that this is something that doesn't affect us in the African. Well, you know, Coda, that's the first time I had heard about the rumor. Obviously, he was dispelling the rumor, but I didn't even take the rumor seriously. This was three weeks ago because I thought, who's going to believe that? Well, who's you know who else said the same thing? It. Magic Johnson. He was saying the same thing. He's yes. like, listen. This is serious. Like I was, I was struck by their heartfelt pleas, like begging yeah. people to take it seriously. Yeah, not only is it serious, but people that you don't know, but probably will know, are losing their loved ones. There was a bus driver from Detroit named Jason yes. Hargrove. Yes. And he was literally talking on his phone, saying, people, stop getting it on my bus serious. and coughing. To those who watching, I'm just letting you know this, 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 this is real, and y'all need to take this serious. He ended up dying, and I it struck me that I was I was thinking about all the African Americans who are in the service industry, who are doing jobs that they are coming in contact with people. Did you find in your special that that was also one of the contributing factors? Well, we as a people, as African Americans, have jobs that require us to be at work. For so many African Americans, there isn't this ability to telecommute. Testing, I mean, by uh, many accounts has been woefully inadequate, but in the African American community in particular, there are not many testing stations for people that well, have access we, to. We, we need, to, one of the things we're talking about in the special is, is, is the need for more testing stations, obviously. But most importantly, I think it's important for African American we to understand for ourselves that this is so serious. It's mm -hmm. taking us out. So is there anything that can be done, Oprah, from, from this point on? I mean, you're pleading, it sounds like you're trying to educate. You want people to well, know what's going on. But certainly, we certainly understand that the responsibilities and dynamics of some people's lives, particularly African-American and brown people, mm -hmm do not allow you to be able to stay at home. And so therefore they need masks. You need masks mm -hmm. in these grocery stores. All these people, all these grocery store workers who are out there without the mask, that is at this point, that is, that should not be. For now, everybody needs to look out for themselves and for their neighbors. Her, her heart's in that, and she's also putting her checkbook in that too. She donated $10 million to help Americans suffering. And uh, she told me that what she's doing with that money, you guys, is she's giving it to communities where she has a connection, yeah. like Nashville or Milwaukee or Chicago, because she wants to help those kind of communities. But you can hear it in her voice, right? Oh, yeah. I and, mean, she, and when she was talking about the rumors going around, yeah. like you yeah. remember early in the pandemic, Facebook yeah. especially, um, I had friends who had sent me these articles about how Africans, African Americans were not as susceptible yeah. to getting COVID-19. And it was, and people believed it yeah. for a long time. But it's... You know, her, her point about uh, people of color in this country not having the luxury of staying home right. because so many are hourly employees. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a salient point that I think has gotten lost in a lot of, a lot and of she, this. She talks to regular folks. She talks to doctors. She talks to people in the spiritual community. So she really is going to do a wide-ranging special tonight. It was great. Well, I'm glad she's using mm -hmm. her voice because her voice is powerful. Sure. And I think people will listen. I hope the message gets out. And again, Oprah Talks, COVID-19, the deadly impact on black America. It's available now. It's free on Apple TV. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. here for them. We are the community. It's 
definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, from Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. One St. Louis family is talking about their experience. Five, count them, five of them tested positive for COVID-19. Jane Winehouse, a grandmother and teacher, she fell ill first. She had to be placed on a ventilator. Her husband, Michael, ended up in the ICU. Then their two sons and a daughter-in-law also tested positive. All of them say they had no underlying health conditions. And now they want to warn others, but also... Spread some hope this morning. They join me now, Jason, Jane, Michael, and Ryan Winehouse, the Winehouse family. Uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for your time. And, and Jane, let, let me start with you. You're the matriarch of this family. Um, you, you fall ill. You end up in ICU. You're, you're on a ventilator, as I understand it, for eight days. And I'm looking at you this morning. You look great. How do you feel? I feel great. And I feel so grateful to be here to do this interview, to share my story of hope with whoever is out there listening. What were your initial symptoms, Jane, if, if you don't mind me asking? I did not have a bad cough. I did not have very many symptoms other than I felt depleted. I felt like there were a stack of books on top of me and I couldn't get them off of me. That truly, no, I don't think I had fever. I really had very few symptoms. How, how did you find out that the rest of your family had also tested positive? Well, I didn't find out till I woke up from being on the ventilator and found out that they were all positive. And that was the worst hearing, you know, my boys had very high fevers. The day I was in the emergency room, my oldest son, Jason, was in the emergency room. We both had pneumonias. My husband had pneumonia. I've never had pneumonia before, but it was this virus that just took a hold of us and, and just got yeah. us down. But, but you're up now. And, and Michael, oh, hey. Michael, Michael, I understand that when Jane was actually in ICU, obviously she, she couldn't have visitors, but, but you managed to, to see your wife. How? Well, I saw her first when I was wheeled into the ICU 
passed her room and saw her on the ventilator, which when you see your most loved one on the ventilator, it was really scary, but kept a positive attitude. She's a fighter. I knew she would make it. Jason, you tested positive, uh, but your wife and, and two small children, thankfully, are healthy. You've, you've been separated from them. You've, you've been quarantined from them. How, how hard is that? How are you handling that? Well, I'm back uh, with them now, but it, it was tough. I, 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 the last thing I wanted to do was uh, share those symptoms and, and pass the disease on to them. So uh, I stayed quarantined for about two weeks, and thankfully, none of them ever had um, any symptoms at all. Ryan, you and your wife tested positive, but, but you were able to recover at home. And, and this morning, you say it was the doctors and the nurses who really helped you pull through. Absolutely. You know, with the doctors, the nurses, the therapists, all the staff at Missouri Baptist were just out of this world fantastic. And uh, while we'll never be able to pay them back, we'll forever be grateful for everything they've done from uh, just the constant updates that they provided our family and um, obviously the care that they provided. They, they had the same goal as we did, and that was to get our, uh, our parents home uh, happy and healthy. And Jane, um, you're a teacher. And yeah. I, I understand that when you got out, that school of yours threw quite the parade. Uh, tell me about that and tell me how much that meant to you. Oh, my God. It is a parade that for two hours will be in my heart forever. I'm telling you, these cars came with kids out their sunroofs or moonroofs yelling, Miss Jane, you're here. Miss Jane, hello. Miss Jane, I miss you. I love you. It was so feel good, I cannot even begin to tell you. Well, it's it's a remarkable story. Uh, thank yeah. you for coming by this morning to, to share it with us. I understand that parade lasted for nearly two hours. So that speaks volumes about how much that community loves the Winehouse family. Uh, thank you. And, and continued recovery, Winehouses. Thank you. Thank you. The, the one thing I, I want to point out, it's, it's, it's an incredibly exhausting time. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative or positive way. It's just, it's a lot. In the past two weeks, I've probably seen as much death as I've seen in the past three years. Um, it's bad. It, it's really, it's really sad. I feel like over the past month or so, a lot of us have been through so much. Um, we've virtually had to, you know, change our lives around. Uh, everything's been flipped upside down. Uh, and we've had to change our routines, which which can be pretty tough. Um, we've had to stay at home, socially distance. Uh, and for some of us, uh, washing our hands has been a real change in routine as well. This is me checking into a hotel room for the next 14 days um, in order to minimize the risk to my husband and children from me being exposed at work. I have my, my cooler that my husband uh, packed me some meals that I can heat up here and I brought my iPad so that I can FaceTime my kids. With the expected peak in California, um, expected any time now this coming week, uh, we determined it was just a better idea for our family right now that I stay in the housing. Our emergency department has turned into an ICU. But essentially half the hospital has turned into an ICU. What normally goes into like a you know a small area of the hospital comparatively to the rest of the hospital is now essentially the entire hospital. We just finished rounding on all of our patients in the COVID-19 intensive care unit. I can tell you they're sick. Uh, many of them are not doing well, but some are turning around. And that's incredibly reassuring. The uh, big difference that we're feeling is that we're not just caring for the patients, but we're all just needing to check in on each other. And every single staff member, from, from respiratory therapist to nurse to doctor, we're just always making sure that we're doing okay. So in a time like this, it's just great to see that humanity is put first. Yes, please, please just remember that the more people go out and do their own thing and ignore the stay at home, the safe at home, the orders to help all of us flatten the curve, the longer you go out there, the longer I have to stay in here, the longer I have to be away from my family. 
the longer all of us have to deal with a completely changed world. So please, every time you get ready to walk out the door, think about those of us that can't walk in ours and think if it's really necessary. As much of American life has come to a halt, the American dairy cow has not. But with demand dwindling, dairy farmers have been led to dump their milk. It's such a waste and it's such a, a, a trauma for the dairy farmer that has worked so hard. Ohio farmer Dan Bassey fears the financial losses will be too much for many fellow farmers to sustain. We fear that we'll be losing more dairy farmers without nearby assistance in the coming year. Restaurants, ice cream shops, and schools have closed. 30% of the national supply of dairy products goes to food service. That is dairy farmer Steve Maddox. He has 3,000 dairy cows in Riverdale, California. We first met Maddox in 2018. You've got to harvest every day, and you've got to do something with it. Farmers like him had already faced drops in dairy prices by roughly 40% over the last several years because of overproduction and an increase in milk alternatives. But now, a crash in the market in just the last week. The fear of the unknown has crashed the price uh, by almost a third of where it was at. And so that's a little uh, distressful. Sisters Sydney Brooks and Zoe Nelson are sixth-generation family dairy farmers and sell 100% of their milk to a local Wisconsin cheese company. You can't shut down cows. You can't turn them off like a faucet. But now, with a drop in the demand for cheese... To see it literally going down the drain is it's devastating. Uncertainty at a time in which the future of the American dairy industry already faces serious questions. So they're looking at substantial losses today which is why the dairy farmer, after years of struggles, is so upside down in terms of his balance sheet. Farmers going into debt, many into bankruptcy. Last year alone, nearly 1,000 dairy farmers halted production. For the 42,000 dairy farms that remain, it's about making it to the summer and past the coronavirus. Out on America's roads tonight, truckers like James Rogers, who's hauling critical supplies, soap and disinfectant from Illinois to Salt Lake City. So this is this is critical stuff you're, you're hauling. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Every load that has come out of Procter & Gamble has been deemed. Uh, I don't know if it came from the government is deeming it or it's the actual or it's actual Procter & Gamble. But everything we are hauling right now has big tags on it that says critical load. I know you are an Army veteran, served in Afghanistan and, and Korea. Um, you, you know, once again, you're being you're being called on to support your your country. How does that feel? It feels good. Um, I mean, this that's the reason I got back into the trucking industry. An Army veteran of the war in Afghanistan now answering a new call to serve. I love serving in the military. I absolutely loved it 100 percent. So. I quickly started gravitating to the trucking industry because to me, it was a direct parallel. I mean, as truck drivers, we're out here, we supply everything. You know, we are, you know, they call us guardians of the highway. We've been called cowboy, the last, you know, the last cowboys. To me, we're just, we're the soldiers. When the country called, when all this happened, when it all kicked off, we as drivers, we were there. This is home on the road right here. With his dog, Sergeant, by his side, you know, James really driving crazy. over 1,300 miles in less than 48 hours. While he's sleeping, it's going to be uh, spaghetti for me. With so many places closed, James now eats and sleeps in his truck. Check this out. This is how bad it's getting for us. Staying healthy is constantly on his mind. Problem is, is there's nothing out here for us truck drivers to get. We ha we can't find gloves, we can't find masks, we can't find Lysol. We're having to kind of make shift and adapt to it. And how's your family doing with you on the road? They're very supportive. I'm I'm very I'm very grateful for the family and the support system I do have. Um, obviously, they're worried for me, and I'm worried too. Um, as the longer this drags on, you know, we talk about it nightly when we do talk. Is, is one of our biggest concerns is the more that I'm exposed and the more that things keep coming about, the asymptomatic people can actually, you know, communicate it, can, you know, can spread it. 
when does my period end? When does my quarantine or any of these other drivers end to where we can safely go home to our families? You know, the last thing I told my wife was, I'm not coming home until it's over because I do have a small child at home. I have a grandchild at home. I don't want to bring it home to my wife. When we go to the store and we see the shelves empty of this product or that product, you know, we get anxious. Uh, what's your message to the American people? My message to the people is we're, we're moving as fast as we can, but we're trying to be safe about it. Like truckers across America, he's ready to go the distance. A man on a new mission. This is what personally I'm built for, and I'd have it no other way. I mean, when the country calls, I'm there. Coronavirus. It's everywhere, both literally and figuratively. We're locked inside trying to flatten the curve while every newspaper, radio program, and TV news broadcast is saturated. Coronavirus pandemic. Coronavirus crisis. Coronavirus pandemic. We've heard a lot about where in China the virus came from, a lot about how it spread, and a bit about how the virus originated. There's some evidence it went from a bat to a pangolin before infecting a human. While such transmission might seem unlikely, it turns out infectious diseases are finding more footholds around the world. And much of that is our fault. We've had wave after wave of um, invasive um, new infections, as well as a rise in the ones that are already endemic and exist here now. It's probably no coincidence, um, especially as we, as humans, encroach upon natural habitats. We are coming into contact with species that normally we would not encounter. While some might claim we couldn't have predicted coronavirus. But it's an unforeseen problem, not a problem. Came out of nowhere. It turns out we kind of could. Scientists have been warning us about pandemics for years. And not just corona. Infectious diseases of all stripes could be on the rise. In the next uh, tens of years, I do anticipate seeing more outbreaks of vector borne and zoonotic diseases in particular. This is Think Again with me, Andrew Stern, where I take you every step of the way as I dig into compelling, complex, or controversial topics that make us wonder, do we need to think again? So normally I'd be talking to you from a studio in 30 Rock before jumping on a plane or a train to go interview someone somewhere else. But as you can see, like most of America, I'm sheltering in place in a 700 square foot Brooklyn apartment. Anyway, about six weeks ago, when the coronavirus story just began to resonate in America, I became interested in where diseases like this come from, and are there any trends predicting their rise? One of our interns showed me a study from the scientific journal Nature, which concluded Ebola outbreaks were noticeably worse in areas that had recently been deforested, which raised a larger question for me. Are humans to blame for making disease outbreak worse? especially when it comes to viruses like Ebola or COVID-19 that have the capability to become pandemics. So I reached out to Dr. Amy Vitor, an expert in vector-borne disease, who has studied deforestation's impact on disease transmission for decades. She FaceTimed me from a hospital in Gainesville, Florida, where she was working on the front lines of the coronavirus response. The thing that got me started in all this was really looking at how deforestation of the Amazon influenced malaria uh, in particular. And there we found a very strong association between malaria breeding sites for the malaria vector, um, Anopheles, and um, the degree of deforestation that we're finding there. It's worth noting there's two types of infectious disease impacted by deforestation. Vector-borne disease, which is what Dr. Vitor is talking about here. Vector-borne means the disease is carried by a blood-feeding organism, like mosquitoes or ticks. The other, which she'll get into in a bit, is zoonotic disease, which happens when a disease makes a jump between animals and humans, like Ebola, SARS, and COVID-19. How strong of a link did you find between deforestation and the rise in infectious disease in those areas? What we saw it was very clear. Um, in forested areas that were pristine, we saw none of the vector, essentially. But when we took that same method to villages that were deforested, there we saw a many, many-fold increase in the number of these mosquitoes breeding in the water and biting humans as well. Humans cut down forests for any number of reasons. Logging, mining, converting land to farms. When we settle on land that recently was a forest, 
or put our livestock there, it puts us and our food supply in closer and consistent contact with animals we wouldn't normally encounter. You have primarily focused, or at least originally focused, on deforestation in the Amazon. Are we seeing a similar pattern in other areas of the world that have been deforested with both mosquitoes and other vectors? So, for example, the Nipah virus outbreak that occurred in the late 1990s um, entailed essentially an outbreak of an encephalitis that um, affected especially um, workers in pig farms and pig abattoirs. And um, those people were getting quite sick and falling ill and dying. And also the pigs were sick. It turned out to be a virus that was known to be carried in flying foxes. Because of droughts and slash and burn agriculture, um, there was a haze that hung over all that rainforest, basically reducing the amount of fruit available for those flying foxes. So that caused them to migrate up north to Malaysia and Singapore, causing that outbreak there. When humans cut down forests, water settles into shallow pools, which is ideal for mosquito breeding. When you get an area uh, after deforestation, essentially, you have trees that then are, they are strewn to the ground. Uh, the logs block the, the streams and the rivers, and that in itself causes blockage and um, accumulation of water. When people then build farms or villages on that now cleared land, they're suddenly in close contact with more mosquitoes, as well as potentially diseased animals whose habitat we just cut down. Because mosquitoes aren't the only vector spreading diseases because of deforestation. For example, the Northeast U.S. has seen an explosion of Lyme disease. A big reason is the rapid expansion of the suburbs there. More people are in contact with deer and the disease-carrying ticks that feed on the deer. To put it in context, between 2004 and 2016, U.S. cases of disease caused by ticks, mosquitoes, and fleas tripled. Recent epidemics like Zika and West Nile virus have both been linked to deforestation and habitat changes caused by humans. The same seems to be true for the zoonotic diseases that make the jump from animals to humans, like we think COVID-19 did. Like I said in the beginning of the video, Ebola outbreaks are strongly correlated with recent deforestation in Central and West Africa. Which brings me back to the original question. Are humans to blame for the uptick in infectious disease we seem to be seeing? And will it get worse going forward? The more research I read, the stronger that link seemed to be, which could make for a pretty uncertain future. Certainly we're going places where we never used to go before. We're um, changing habitat at a rapid rate. And so those changes seem to be highly associated with, with both the mosquitoes, the ticks, as well as vertebrates that tend to thrive under these conditions. So yes, a variety of infectious diseases, I think, will continue to increase over the years because of the pressures that we are exerting on, on our immediate and expanded environment. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America.
As you can imagine, it is a real time of uncertainty, especially for parents and students who found their lives upended with school closures, shifts to remote learning, and of course, concerns about grades and college applications. So we decided to get an overview of all these key changes and steps parents and teachers and students can be making. And with that, we're going to be joined now by the former admissions officer of Barnard College and Columbia University, also co-founder of Expert Admissions, Barry Norman. Barry, welcome. Thank you. Let's start with elementary school kids who've grown up, you know, using phones and iPads. Uh, but you say as they switch over to using these iPads and, and mobile devices for learning, parents shouldn't try to duplicate exactly their school day. The goal is basically to keep an educational environment, to keep them engaged and to have a routine, yes, but not one that's so rigid and strict. So we're looking at basically one to three hours a day, depending on the age of the child and what's assigned at school. And then we move on to middle school, uh, you know, and, and high schoolers. And a lot of these schools are now adopting pass-fail grades. What kind of impact will that have going forward once we hopefully move into going back into normal school sessions? I would say that if you can do well and you're being offered the opportunity to take a grade, that it's a good idea to do so. But let's assume your school has gone pass fail. Colleges can handle this pretty well. They have a holistic review process. They're definitely going to focus more on the grades that existed before. Okay, let's talk about juniors who are you know getting ready for SATs, ACTs. Those are being postponed or, or, or dramatically different. What happens now? This is the single biggest source of stress for students I've found, this, this testing postponement and the, the unknowns. Many students have been preparing for months for these exams. They've mentally been preparing for years, and then the test was suddenly postponed. Right now, we're scheduled for June, but students need to be prepared that June will likely be canceled. So we're looking at late summer, early fall. The best thing that students can do is to create a plan that works for them, sort of a mix of a pause and preparation. You don't want to be studying endlessly between now and the fall. Now, what about college admissions? You know, kids looking at 2021. What, when you talk with colleges, what, what are they doing? How are they planning for this? I think the the biggest change that we're seeing is so many colleges that are announcing every single day we get new announcements of colleges that will be test optional for next year, places we wouldn't expect to have made those announcements. What students and families should remember is that test optional does not mean that they don't care about tests or that it wouldn't behoove you to submit test scores if they're in range, but simply that given the circumstances, they're going to have flexibility. Kids are still hearing from schools about where they're going to be going. How is that going to be impacted now? Current seniors are impacted in a unique way. They were in the midst of the process, now have gotten decisions, don't have the opportunity, however, to go visit or revisit to make up their minds. I would caution families that while campuses are closed, colleges are not. So they're offering a number of virtual opportunities from information sessions to virtual tours even the opportunity to sit in virtually on a class. So all of the things pretty much that were available before, now available in a virtual experience. They're more active on Instagram too, which high school students are happy to hear. Barry, before we close, if we look at this, I mean, there've been a lot of negatives, but as you look at this, if there's a positive takeaway to this, what, what do you say that is? I think this is actually a tremendous learning opportunity for students to figure out who they are and what is really important to them. This was a hard question to get at before for students. This has caused everybody, regardless of their age, to think pretty deeply. And how about all us parents who, you know, are already stressed out about their kids and school and grades? What do you say to the parents? This is the time to be creative, and this is the time to kind of think outside of the box, but we're going to get back to where we were before. Some great words to end on. Barry Norman, thank you so much. And we will be right back as the third hour of today continues. A letter carrier in England has become something of a hero in his small town after he came up with a pretty ingenious way to lift his customer spirits without breaking any of the social distancing rules during lockdown. 
My name is John Michael Matten, and I'm from Bolden, which is in the northeast of England. And you're a mailman? Postman, yes, mailman. A, a postman. Why are you dressed like a pilot? It's today's outfit. Matson decided to ditch his normal red Royal Mail uniform in favor of fun costumes while he was delivering his letters. It has been an instant hit. So far, he's been a cheerleader, Little Bo Peep, a knight, even Waldo. <laughs> it's so nice to see something that's just genuinely delightful at a time when so many of us are like, ah. what made you want to do this? I've been doing this round for about two years now. Okay. Um, so I've, get, I've got to know a lot of the customers on a sort of personal level, you know. And when the, the lockdown started and the, the coronavirus really took a hold, I noticed everybody was feeling a little bit uncertain, you know. I, I noticed the change in everybody's mood and, and how unhappy and fearful some people were. So I just had to do something to, to help cheer them up a little bit. For many families on lockdown, the mailman, or postman, may be the only person that they still see every day. John is on a mission to make them smile. He's showing what true community spirit is all about. I would like to see more mailmen doing it. Even in America, you know, I'd like to see. You'd like to see this be an international trend of mailmen bringing, and women, bringing not just the mail, but some good cheer. Exactly, exactly. I can't be the only person doing this. I, I need help. <laughs> the reaction to John's simple act of kindness has been overwhelming, and he says he plans to keep it up every single day until lockdown is lifted. I think it's interesting when you see like people's profiles being like, just looking for a quarantine buddy. That kind of reminds me that we're all human and we just want connection. We've opened up to each other in ways that I haven't opened up to someone that I've dated for months and months and months. What started out is like, oh, maybe we'll meet in two weeks is now, oh, maybe it'll be a month or two. So I'm finding that it's building those more authentic relationships, even though we're separate. You look at the standard process, so we'll call it the pre coronavirus pandemic process. In the U.S., on average, you would message back and forth between three and six months before you even talk to the person or meet them in, in person. Now, with virtual dating, there's no excuse, right? It is, let's talk tonight or let's talk tomorrow because I know you're not busy. You know I'm not busy. During this time, there's a lot of physical isolation, but we don't think it has to mean, you know, social uh, disconnect. We've seen over the past, you know, couple of weeks, uh, huge changes for, for the scale of what we're talking about. 20% more conversations on a global scale. It's hard to get your head around how big the deal that is. It's an enormous change. And then 25% longer conversations. We were meant to meet in person exactly three weeks ago. And I think about a week after that didn't happen, we decided to have our first video call. And it was actually really nice. I was really nervous. Um, it wasn't planned in advance. It was like, hey, do you want a video chat right now? Which I think was better because I didn't have time to like worry about what we were going to talk about or what I looked like or anything like that. We kind of made known that it was awkward and weird and how like we weren't going to even really ever see each other. We Skyped and brought our own alcohol and drank and talked. I've um, gotten takeout from similar restaurants with guys. So I really like Indian. You really like Indian. Let's both get takeout Indian. You really can only get to know each other right now. Like there's absolutely no option of meeting up. If anyone's truly interested in you, they have to get to know you and talk to you. And I think that's actually really fascinating. President Trump now declaring that he is the sole power who gets to determine when and how states reopen, even as governors in some of the hardest hit states make plans of their own. When somebody's the president of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. And the governors know that. In fact, the Constitution gives that power to the states. And experts say the president does not have the authority to direct governors, mayors, or other local officials to lift their emergency orders. Overnight, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo challenging the president's claim. To say I have total authority over the country because I'm the president, it's absolute. That is a king. We didn't have a king. The tension punctuating a White House briefing where President Trump was combative and at times angry. I haven't asked anybody. Because I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. The president also playing a White House-produced campaign-style video in an effort to defend his handling of the crisis that's come under increased scrutiny. Everything we did was right. 
President Trump highlighting his January ban on travel from China. One case in the whole United States, one case, I'm supposed to shut down the government, the biggest, the biggest uh, economy in the history of the world. Shut it down. We have one case. And sparring with reporters who challenged the federal response beyond that January ban. January 30th. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought A lot. You? A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. We did a lot. Look, look. You know you're a fake. Over the weekend, Dr. Anthony Fauci argued more lives could have been saved here if the government acted sooner. I mean, obviously, if we had right from the very beginning shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. On Monday, the president calling Fauci to the podium, where the nation's top infectious disease doctor clarified his comments about pushback within the administration. And that was the wrong choice of words. A day after retweeting a post that included the hashtag fire Fauci, the president praising the doctor. Today I walk in, I hear I'm going to fire him. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. Today, the president is scheduled to meet here with people who have recovered from COVID-19. And as for the economy, he says when it reopens, in his words, I think we're going to boom. But many of his allies and economists agree no matter what President Trump says, the real recovery will not happen until Americans begin feeling safe returning to their own lives. The death toll has now topped 10,000 in New York State, but ICU admissions and intubations are way down. The clearest sign yet, the curve is flattening. The worst can be over, and it is over, unless we do something reckless. Now, the governors of New York and six other northeastern states that represent more than half of the nation's coronavirus cases are partnering to discuss the best way to safely ease restrictions and restart the region's economy. The group of governors includes six Democrats and one Republican. We cannot act on our own. Even if we give ourselves an A+, plus, that won't be enough. This is incredibly important that we coordinate. Three western states, including California, are doing the same. In New York City, 21 public school teachers have died from the virus. And COVID-19 is killing as many New Yorkers in three days as the seasonal flu typically does in an entire year. But there are some encouraging signs. The number of newly hospitalized patients in New York is at its lowest point in weeks, but that doesn't mean doctors and nurses aren't still stressed. Every patient is getting multiple medications. Some are getting blood transfusions. Dr. Melanie Malloy works at Mount Sinai in Brooklyn. It's hard to think that some of your patients that you diagnosed today might not be here tomorrow when you come back for your shift or, you know, um, all of it. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just tired. Ariana Dumas is an ICU nurse at North Shore University Hospital who brings iPads to her sickest patients to help them connect with their loved ones. Just holding his hand, playing the video, and crying. <laughs> That's like kind of the perfect scene of what it looks like when we're in there with these patients. Now, to be clear, we do not yet know when all of this might be might reopen, but Governor Cuomo says that the multi-state group of governors might begin working on the plans as early as today. As elected officials grapple with how and when to restart this economy, what exactly could it look like? Neil Kashkari is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. He helped run the bailout program at the Treasury Department during the 2008 Great Recession. Mr. Kashkari, good morning to you. It's good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you as well. You said on a Sunday show this weekend that you look at this kind of on an 18-month timeline, that you think that economic strategy should be, really be over 18 months because that's the outside estimate as, of when we could get a vaccine. What exactly does that mean? Because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, 18 months, I can't sustain this for 18 months. I understand. But when we look around the world, other countries that have successfully flattened the curve with economic controls, it seems as though when they relax the controls, there's a tendency for these flare-ups to happen again because so many people have the disease, but they're not showing symptoms. And so until you really extinguish it with either a treatment or a vaccine, 
there's always that risk of flare-up. And so we have to be very careful and think over the long term. To me, it's not about the next couple of weeks or the next month even. It's about how do we get to that destination of a vaccine or a therapy. But to be clear, I mean, you're not suggesting that everybody stay at home and businesses stay essentially as they are for the next 18 months. Or are you? Well, not as, not as they are, but I think we need to be very smart about this. So I'll give you an example. Some businesses are much more important than others. Think about optometrists are largely closed. I could see, if we flatten the curve, optometry offices opening so you can go get your eyes checked. Mm. There are not a lot of people crowded into an eye store at a given time. Contrast that with a movie theater. Is it going to make sense to have 100 people in a crowded movie theater until we have a vaccine? Probably not. I don't think we're going to go back to the way life was like in January or February for the next year or next 18 months. I think we're going to have to be much more targeted as we try to reopen the economy. What do you think? I I know you're in the economic sector, not the public health sector, but from your analysis, what do you think needs to happen before you can start talking about letting people go back to society, even if it is in a piecemeal fashion? For example, do we have to have widespread antibody test, a blood test that would tell you if you've had the virus and if you are presumptively immune? Well, I think that that would be great. And we should be pursuing all of those uh, widespread testing as well as vaccines and therapies. But I've also talked to health experts who think that we are months, if not years away from having being able to test millions of people on a given day. So I don't know where the breakthrough is going to come from. I think the governors are being very smart in trying to flatten the curve. But we're going to have to slowly reopen things and then very carefully see if we're getting flare ups again. We might be in a case of relaxing things. It flares back up. We have to lock things down again and keep doing that for the foreseeable future until we get an effective treatment or a vaccine. You know, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was on this show recently, and he talked about how prior to this crisis, you know, the economy was in fundamentally a strong position, this long uh, expansion after the Great Recession, uninterrupted job growth. And so the notion was once this public health crisis passes, we should be able to return to a strong economy. Do you believe that? to be the case? I think that's true. But again, if this reopening, I wish it were just a light switch. If there was some therapy that emerged a couple months from now and we all had confidence we could go back to work and not be taking risks, then we could turn things around very quickly. But I think the more that the health experts are learning and learning from what's happening around the world, it seems as though it's going to be more of a gradual return to normal. And the more gradual it is, unfortunately, the slower recovery and the longer it takes to get back to normal. And, I, you know, I, it's kind of a deeper question, philosophical question, but it's an economic one, too. You know, what has changed fundamentally that may not ever go back to be the same? I think about small businesses in my neighborhood. I wonder if they'll be back no matter how much help the government gives them. I wonder if people are going to want to go to big sporting events. I wonder if businesses are going to say, yeah, we should have a convention. Have you thought about how this economy may have changed forever just by virtue of this experience? Absolutely. And and what you're saying is exactly right. We know after the Great Depression, people carried the scars with that experience with them for many, many years. Ultimately, who's going to determine how the economy recovers? It's all of us. It's how comfortable we are having our families going to that restaurant or going to the movie theater or going to that sporting event. And I think the longer this goes on and the more people that are affected by it, the longer that recovery is going to be just because we have to regain confidence ourselves. We do indeed. Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari, thank you for your work. We appreciate it and your time this morning. Thank you. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo believes the worst is likely over in his state, the nation's white hot center of the outbreak. He's also launched an initiative with six other governors to coordinate efforts and develop strategies for reopening aspects of the regional economy. And Governor Cuomo is joining us now. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Howard. Good to be with you. Good to be with you. You talked about some good news here in New York. You said we reached a plateau. The death toll has flattened. The number of intubated patients is on the decline. So a lot of people may be saying, well, phew, this thing is over. Is it over? It is not over. All we've all we've done, which is which is a significant step. We have shown that we can stop the spread of the virus, right? We were looking at those lines that were continuing to go up, and there was a big question, can you stop the spread of this beast? And we have done that. You closed everything down, and it worked. 
and the quote-unquote plateau is a flattening of the increase. It's not a decline. It's just a flattening of the increase. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to remember, Hoda, we did this by our behavior. This was not natural. All the projections were much worse than what actually happened because our behavior worked. If we stop doing what we're doing, you will see those numbers go up again. Period. Let's talk about reopening the economy. I think everyone wants that to happen. But the question is, when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? And who says it's going to happen? Well, yesterday, the president at his news conference, and this is his quote, he said he has the power. He says when someone is president of the United States, the authority is total. He said it was total. And he said the governors know that. Do you know that? Nope. Uh, I don't know what the president is talking about, uh, frankly. Uh, We have a constitution. The constitution is based on balance of powers. Uh, You have to remember it's the states that created the federal government, right? It's the colonies that created the federal government, not the other way around. And we don't have a king. We have a president. And that was a big decision. We ran away from having a king, and George Washington was president, not King Washington. So the president doesn't have total authority. The Constitution is there. Tenth Amendment is there. Number of cases over the years. It's very clear. States have uh, power by the Tenth Amendment. Uh, and the president is just wrong on that point. Okay, so um, if, he, if the president says, let's open New York, and you say you don't think it's a good idea, what happens then? Look, if he pushed it to that absurd point, uh, then we would have a problem. If he thinks he's going to force this state or any state, for that matter, to do something that is reckless or irresponsible, that could endanger human life, literally. Because if we don't reopen correctly, you will see those virus numbers go up again and more people will die. Let's talk about... And we paid a heck of a price to get the... Yeah, let's talk about reopening correctly, because I think that this is a, a big deal. You're teaming up with six other governors from the Northeast. But I mean, I'm sitting here thinking about reopening a city or a state. And it seems like the only way you can do that is if you have testing to find out who's safe enough or who's well enough to go back to work. And the idea of widespread testing doesn't even seem like a possibility. So how do you even start? Yeah. You, uh, you put your finger right on it. Uh, first of all, nobody's done this before. It has to be phased. It has to be balanced. It's a public health strategy and an economic reactivation strategy. And the key to me is testing. Uh, and people have to know that they are safe and that safe, the testing actually works to uh, make people feel safe. And we don't have that capacity now. And the states can't do it on their own. We have to develop that widespread testing capacity. The way on the first go around, we had to develop additional hospital capacity. Uh, Testing is going to be key. And we are not there yet. But that has to be developed. And do you have, uh, Governor, any kind of a time frame about what we're looking at? I mean, Savannah was just asking an expert about businesses opening, going to ball games. Um, I was just thinking about concerts on our plaza in the summer. We always have summer concerts on the plaza. Do you have any idea of a time frame of when all of that may start to look like normal again? Hoda, I don't. And I think if anybody tells you they do, uh, they don't understand the issue ahead of us. This is all uncharted territory. You have to feel the way it goes. You have to start to reopen with a plan, an informed plan that actually improves on uh, the situation and learns the lessons. But then you have to watch those number, the number of uh, infections. You tell me how New Yorkers or Americans behave today, I'll tell you the infection rate in three days. It's, it's that cause and effect. Uh, And as we reopen and everybody wants to get out of their home and everybody wants to get back to work, uh, if we don't do it gradually and controlled, you'll see the viruses go up. And that would be a terrible shame. And then we'd have to start all over again. All right. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, thank you for your time. We appreciate you. In an age where nine out of 10 smartphones in America are either an iPhone or an Android, Apple and Google are now in a unique position, developing a new way to help track the health crisis called contact tracing. The two tech titans are reworking their operating systems, turning Bluetooth into a tool for measuring proximity, 
so you may know if you've been exposed to the virus. Apple and Google are really the only two companies in the world that can make this kind of Bluetooth tracking possible. How does it work? Two people come into close contact, six feet or less, for a sustained and unspecified period. Their phones send out keys or beacons that help identify the users anonymously. When they go their separate ways, and later one person tests positive for COVID-19, that patient uploads his or her confirmation, and all of the keys connected with that phone are alerted. We may have differences Kevin Esveld has been working on privacy-first contact tracing at MIT. His app, Safe Paths, will work with the new system. What are the most important things that need to be in place if it's going to be privacy-centric? To me, the single most important aspect is that it has to be distributed. It has to be decentralized. There needs to be no single location that has the information on who came in contact with whom, because that can be too easily abused by a government in particular. Apple and Google line out their privacy protections clearly. Explicit user consent is required. They don't collect personally identifiable information or user location data. And the list of people you've come into contact with never leaves your phone. But privacy concerns still remain a pivot point. A lot of people don't like it from the standpoint of uh, constitutional rights. The San Francisco-based Electronic Frontier Foundation examines the intersection between technology and privacy. The biggest thing I'm worried about is that whatever we put into place right now would stick around after the crisis has ended. Countries like China, South Korea and Israel have also used contact tracing effectively, though experts say without the same attention to personal privacy placing even more scrutiny on the novel efforts here. If built correctly, this could be a very powerful defense against all pandemics, because this is not just about COVID-19. COVID-19 is terrible. It's a tragedy. Historical pandemics have been worse. Fascinating, Sam. Two questions, though. When, when will this contact tracing program be available? And what's the end game? Yeah, Craig, so the first rollout is going to be about a month from now, mid-May. You will have to update your operating system to do that. As far as the end game is concerned, both Apple and Google say this is not a silver bullet, but should be used in conjunction with testing and preventive measures, all the things we're talking about right now collectively, because we don't know much about the virus in terms of its transmission. There's still details that need to be learned, but they're hoping that this will help. Huh? So for me and my wife, Gabby, let me send it back to you guys. Hey, Where is Sam. Your, where's your wife? Bring your wife back. We want to say thanks to her, too. Where's Debbie? Oh, she needs to come back, Gabby. Yes. She's a meteorologist, by the way, I should add. If Adam oh. or Dylan ever need any help, here's your lady right here. Hey. Hi, Debbie. Uh, hi. <laughs> the weather looks props. good in Miami. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. In China, where the coronavirus began, fears that a second wave could be beginning with cases imported back into the country. The Chinese setting up mobile laboratories and imposing tough new restrictions in a remote Chinese region on the border with Russia. A 28-day quarantine for anyone arriving and 14 days for people living in places where a new case has been detected. We do need to do many tests, this Chinese Communist Party official says. Russia had apparently avoided Europe's coronavirus crisis, but cases are escalating. Moscow and St. Petersburg in lockdown, and uh, President uh, Putin uh, saying uh, the military could be deployed. The situation is changing daily, he told ministers. Unfortunately, it's not changing for the better. Coronavirus reappearing in places and people that had won the battle. South Korea reporting a small number of infections, just over 100 cases, in patients who had recovered. Scientists fear not reinfections, but that the virus has reactivated. Its unpredictability means nervous weeks in places like Spain, Italy and Austria, where restrictions are slowly lifting. The way down is much slower than the way up. That means control measures must be lifted slowly and with control. The French president extending the lockdown there for another month. The epidemic is not under control, he told his country. The U.S. aircraft carrier, USS Harry S. Truman, extending its time at sea to avoid the virus, Navy officials said, and maintain capability. While back in Asia, calls for unity at a summit of Southeast Asian leaders, separated by video, and a warning against complacency. If any of us fails, one leader said, the rest will follow. 
And despite that call for unity, Savannah, what we are seeing around the world really is a patchwork of approaches and challenges. And that is likely to be the new normal until there's a vaccine. It's not only ravaging our community, but people who have pre-existing conditions, which I think people didn't hear that. And so if you are taking medication for your diabetes, if you're taking medication because of hypertension, if you need an asthma, an inhaler for asthma, mm -hmm. if you have any kind of lung disorder, which I am still concerned about myself, Hoda, from pneumonia, because I ne my lungs never really fully cleared. So the moment I heard pre-existing conditions, I'm like, lock the door. Nobody <laughs> else coming in here. Hi, everybody. Oprah Winfrey taking a deep dive into the deadly and disproportionate impact coronavirus is having on black America in the latest installment of her Oprah Talks COVID-19 series. The critical message, no one is safe. Something she discussed in a previous episode with British actor Idris Elba. And I just felt compelled to um, tell people that this is very real. I was struck by listening to Idris Elba make a plea to people because he was diagnosed with it, pleading, saying this, there's a rumor going around that this is something that doesn't affect us in the African American Well, you know, Hoda, that's the first time I had heard about the rumor. Obviously, he was dispelling the rumor, but I didn't even take the rumor seriously. This was three weeks ago because I thought, who's going to believe that? Who's well, you know who else said the same thing? It. Magic Johnson, he was saying the same thing. He's yes. like, listen. This is serious. Like I was, I was struck by their heartfelt pleas, like begging yeah. people to take it seriously. Yeah, not only is it serious, but people that you don't know, but probably will know, are losing their loved ones. There was a bus driver from Detroit named Jason yes. Hargrove. Yes. And he was literally talking on his phone, saying, people, stop Thank getting on my bus and coughing. To those who watching, I'm just letting you know this, 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 this is real, and y'all need to take this serious. He ended up dying, and I. It struck me that I was. I was thinking about all the African Americans who are in the service industry, who are doing jobs that they are coming in contact with people. Did you find in your special that that was also one of the contributing factors? Well, we as a people, as African Americans, have jobs that require us to be at work. For so many African-Americans, there isn't this ability to telecommute. Testing, I mean, by uh, many accounts has been woefully inadequate, but in the African-American community in particular, there are not many testing stations for people that have well, access we, to. We, we need, to, one of the things we're talking about in the special is, is, is the need for more testing stations, obviously. But most importantly, I think it's important for African-American we to understand for ourselves that this is so serious. It's mm -hmm. taking us out. So is there anything that can be done, Oprah, from, from this point on? I mean, you're pleading. It sounds like you're trying to educate. You want people to well, know what's going on. But certainly, we certainly understand that the responsibilities and dynamics of some people's lives, particularly African-American and brown people, mm -hmm do not allow you to be able to stay at home. And so therefore they need masks. You need masks mm -hmm. in these grocery stores. All these people, all these grocery store workers who are out there without the mask, that is at this point, that is, that should not be. For now, everybody needs to look out for themselves and for their neighbors. Her, her heart's in that, and she's also putting her checkbook in that too. She donated $10 million to help Americans suffering. And uh, she told me that what she's doing with that money, you guys, is she's giving it to communities where she has a connection, yeah. like Nashville or Milwaukee or Chicago, because she wants to help those kind of communities. But you can hear it in her voice, right? Oh, yeah. I and, mean, she, and when she was talking about the rumors going around, yeah. like you yeah. remember early in the pandemic, Facebook yeah. especially, um, I had friends who had sent me these articles about how African Americans were not as susceptible yeah. to getting COVID-19. And it was, and people believed it yeah. for a long time. But it's... 
you know, her, her point about uh, people of color in this country not having the luxury of staying home right. because so many are hourly employees. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a salient point that I think has gotten lost in a lot of, a lot and of she, this. She talks to regular folks. She talks to doctors. She talks to people in the spiritual community. So she really is going to do a wide ranging special tonight. It's great. Well, I'm glad she's using mm -hmm. her voice because her voice is powerful. Sure. And I think people will listen. I hope the message gets out. And again, Oprah talks COVID-19, the deadly impact on black America. It's available now. It's free on Apple TV. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard. We bleed. We sweat. We cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. With much of America shut down, tonight the promise of progress. New COVID-19 blood tests called antibody tests could help get some Americans back to work. Dr. Margaret Zhang just took one in New York. Having antibodies and knowing that I'm as immune as one could be to COVID right now makes me feel even more kind of inclined to serve. UCLA began using its own version of antibody testing, focusing on thousands of medical workers. How can we expect our health workforce to be protecting us if we're not doing everything that we can to protect them? The concept is simple. If you've had COVID-19 and recovered, it's because of special antibodies in your immune system that have developed to fight it off, and those will likely protect you from future infection. In the case of medical workers, those with antibodies could become super soldiers in the fight against COVID-19. I think that healthcare workers who know that they have antibodies will be able to go into the to, to their work more confident that they're not going to be getting themselves sick or then passing this virus on to, to others around them. Other tests are being given to the general public in Los Angeles as well. 
64-year-old Deborah Presley had her finger pricked and blood drawn as part of a USC study. Within minutes, she learned she had antibodies to fight off coronavirus. When you found out that you had the antibodies, what went through your mind? I'm a caregiver and I go to different people's homes and it's just such a relief because now that I can, now I can help other people. Now dozens of labs all across the country are working on their own antibody tests. Last week, the Trump administration said they are working to make antibody testing free and widely available. Starting with the next week or so, we'll be able to scale up the kind of antibody testing to give you a good feel for what the penetrance of the infection is. But you can start think about some aspect of getting back to normal without having tested everybody in the country, that's for sure. But the FDA commissioner also warning not every antibody test is accurate. No test is 100% perfect, but what we don't want are wildly inaccurate tests. Then there are the diagnostic coronavirus tests, but all told, still less than 1% of the U.S. population has been tested. Just a fraction of what experts say is needed to get a clear sense of how many people may be infected. For now, making complete contact tracing still out of reach. Something authorities say is vital for stopping the virus's spread. And Lester, tonight, even Apple and Google unveiling new plans for a voluntary app that would basically alert you if you've come into contact with a known carrier. Both companies stressing tonight that privacy is their top concern. Carson joins us from home to explain. Hey, Carson. What's up, buddy? Hey, guys. Well, listen, if you're like me right about now, you are starving for some sports, some good news. NBC Sports Network is going to be airing nearly 100 hours of classic Olympic programming each night for the rest of the month of April. We're going to start with the 2016 Rio Games, and here's a little taste of what you can see tonight. Puts it on her feet. It's a gold medal. Got it. (laughs) It almost looked like she was soaring there. The crowd deafening here. The, the cha- mighty Michael Phelps. The champion is leading. He's had a very big campaign. Pereira is throwing everything at him, but Phelps is increasing the lead, increasing the stroke rate. There has never been a better swimmer. The most decorated swimmer is miles ahead. Wow. Michael Phelps. Now miles that's got to get ahead. you guys excited, right? That's. That's exactly what we need. You saw Michael Phelps, Simone Biles winning there. Um, and also the uh, men's 200-meter individual medley. You can see all of this tonight on the NBC Sports Network. And you can relive those moments with the gymnastics event finals and also all of Michael Phelps' Rio races. You remember Katie Ledecky won four gold oh, medals yeah. also yeah. in Rio. Um, Usain Bolt picked up four. So in these times when we're home, it's going to be exciting for the NBC Sports Networks to have some some Rio Olympics. And, and for all the other sports-deprived yeah. folks, Carson Daly, yeah. you probably caught it over the weekend. Like, they re-showed the Masters during March Madness. They were re-showing, like, the best of college basketball games from, you know, a decade ago yeah. as well. Yeah, I was watching some of the old uh, Masters. They were showing Tiger winning and, um, you know, the famous chip shot from behind. Uh, 16, they showed that. CBS doing a great job of getting that programming out there to watch. Also, I've been watching just old, like, you know, Islanders hockey games and and just sort of pretending that it was live. It's exciting just to have a sporting event on your TV, just something to root for. Uh, But the Olympics coming back, you know, we'll start with Rio here on NBC and then maybe get into some of the London games and uh, from 2012 and also Beijing. So so it's it's good news. I like it. It is good news. On the ICU floor at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, a drug trial for a potential lifesaver. This is um, remdesivir versus placebo for one of our patients. Doctors prescribing remdesivir delivered in IV form to patients sick with COVID-19. The Emory trial is one of the largest in the world. Infectious disease expert Dr. Anish Mehta is the chief investigator. What we're searching for are medications that will help people get over the infection more rapidly and allow their immune systems to really kick in and knock the virus out of their body. Remdesivir was originally tested to treat Ebola patients, but early results suggest it could be far more effective in treating COVID-19. It's a double-blind NIH study, meaning patients and doctors don't know who gets a placebo. What we have seen is lots of patients recovering. Whether that's because they're getting a study drug or a placebo, we don't know. In Washington state, ICU doctors did give remdesivir to Chris Kane as he struggled to breathe. I mean, within 48 hours, I was feeling a lot better. 
we're just so thankful. And then I, yeah, to get him on this, to get him on this <laughs> drug so quickly was just an absolute godsend. Now, researchers could be just two to three weeks away from a major breakthrough, determining whether remdesivir should be the go-to treatment in hospitals. Meanwhile, doctors are increasingly cautious about an unproven treatment touted by President Trump. Hydroxychloroquine combined with an antibiotic. Researchers in Brazil canceled a small chloroquine study after some patients developed cardiac arrhythmias and even died. But back at Emory, some COVID patients are insisting on getting what they heard President Trump talk up. And they say, I don't want an experimental drug. I want the drug on the news. If approved, drug maker Gilead says it could have enough remdesivir to treat 140,000 people immediately and half a million by October. Bumper to bumper traffic for miles waiting to get into food banks. Keep it going. As millions of suddenly unemployed Americans now struggle to get food on the table. We have to do this to survive. I'm just a single parent, there's nobody but me. Thousands of relief centers from Pittsburgh to St. Louis and Honolulu. <laughs> Staffed by volunteers, traffic cops, even the National Guard. I had a lady here yesterday with four little kids in the car, and she says, I'm a waitress and I don't have any food. But people aren't just there for food. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. In Texas, 6,000 cars waited to get into this San Antonio center, many camping out overnight. When they see that box of food coming into the car, some of them smile and some of them cry. We're seeing them from all income levels because when somebody gets laid off and the income stops coming in, even if they may have a fancy car or fancy house, they're going to be hungry. Though demand is up, inventories have plummeted. It's devastating. It's something that none of us could have ever predicted. Farmers across America have no way to ship their food to the places that need it most. Carrie Sanders is in Florida. Food banks report they're overwhelmed with demand, while farmers in Florida in the middle of their harvest say they are heartbroken because the logistics just don't exist to get the fresh corn, green beans, and other vegetables to those who need it. Instead, it's all being plowed under. But for many families in need, help is on the way. Stimulus checks are now being distributed for anyone making less than $99,000 a year. You get the full $1,200 if your salary is under $75,000 and an additional $500 for every child. For those who file taxes using direct deposit, the money should hit your account soon. For 80 million Americans, it'll be this week. Paper checks are expected to start getting mailed in May. If you didn't have to file taxes, you can enter your bank information at irs.gov. The government also plans to launch a new online tool allowing you to track your payment status. While the government is rushing to get these payments out and even discussing another possible stimulus package, there are many Americans worried about mounting bills. So for the time being, take advantage of relief programs out there and call your lenders to find out more. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scared. One of the biggest challenges in this crisis, a shortage of the critical protective gear for frontline healthcare workers. I want to avoid pinching. What's your name? But a month ago at the dining room table, Lori and Kevin Hamama got an idea, a potentially game-changing, life-saving idea. So can you take big, big, deep breaths? Lori, a family doctor in Ohio, was worried. The N95 masks in her hospital were in short supply. I had a meeting that day and just mentioned, I'm afraid we're gonna run out of N95s. I think I said, I don't know if I'm gonna have a mask. That's when Lori's husband, Kevin, an engineer, asked a simple question. I said, why don't you just clean them up? And Lori said, well, what do you mean? Kevin works for Battelle, a nonprofit research institute that routinely tests for dangerous pathogens. And remembered a study they did five years ago showing medical masks could actually be cleaned and reused in an emergency. We hit the ground running Friday night. I think we were drawing schematics of what something <laughs> could look like. <laughs> it means you sat down with a paper and started Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I was describing what the ICU looked like, where the airflows were. I mean, we were, we got into it right away. <laughs> By the way, you're obviously the perfect couple for each other. <laughs> the following week, testing on masks began. How long did it take to get this FDA approval? I think it was a total of 14 days where we had the green light from the FDA. Now, I don't know how often you guys work with the federal government, but that's, that's blazingly fast. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I could, yeah. Here's how the technology works. 
A hydrogen peroxide vapor decontaminates the N95 masks. It takes about two and a half hours and the masks can be cleaned and then reused 20 times. Each one can handle about 80,000 masks a day. That's a game changer for hospitals, yeah. isn't it? I mean, that's an entire hospital's worth over a few days. The decontamination systems are already being used in Ohio, Washington, and New York and launched in Boston over the weekend. We can't get this technology up and running fast enough. With more scheduled to be delivered around the country. Do you guys sit there and just think, wow, we we're so lucky that I had you, you had me, we had that moment? Yeah, I still don't think it's fully sunk in yet. It's overwhelming to think that it started with an after-dinner conversation, drawing it out on a piece of paper and, and seeing if it was even feasible. A nurse in Ohio wrote to Lori to thank her, and she said she walked into her break room at the ICU and saw boxes of clean masks, and it felt like Christmas Day. And it's about to be Christmas Day in a lot of places in this country. Overnight, the Department of Defense said it was commissioning 60 of these machines worth $415 million on top of already pledging to pay for operational costs for the machines in other hospitals for an additional $400 million. They're going to be all around the country by early May. Back to you guys. Stephanie, wow. wow. Thank you so much. I love that yeah. story. I was out on Long Island last yeah. week where they're actually using uh, yeah. one yeah. of the systems, and they've said it's a game changer wow. already. Wow. Uh, already. The nurse is seeing a fresh mask <laughs> and saying it's like Christmas. I mean, it just tells you everything you need to know. Good. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. If it's digging in on the issues, let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask, how do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You know, there's not that many dairy farmers out there left. So when, when you go tell somebody, hey, I'm a dairy farmer, they're like, oh, I don't know if I ever met one of those. <laughs> Something I'd always want to do is be a dairy farmer, so. I've been on a dairy farm for 30 years. I grew up in it. You know, every morning, every night, you're you're putting your hands on them. I mean, I guess that's just, you know, it's hard to, I don't know, it's just hard to believe it's over. It's a bad time to be an American dairy farmer. 
Since 1970, the U.S. has lost more than 90% of its dairy farms. The small farms have been replaced by fewer, larger farms. And a national milk surplus makes it harder for the remaining small dairy farms to turn a profit. After nearly 70 years in operation, Curtis Coombs' family dairy farm in rural Kentucky is about to shut down. He's one of more than 100 dairy farmers who lost a contract with Dean Foods and the company's processing plant in Louisville, Kentucky. Dean Foods is closing the plant because Walmart, its primary customer, has decided to cut out the middleman. Walmart streamlined its milk operation by building its own processing facility and buying milk directly from large suppliers. Now Walmart no longer requires Dean's services or its farmers. I guess, well, today's a big deal because it, it's the last, the last day we'll milk cows that the milk will be shipped out. Probably about three weeks ago, we made the decision to get out. What are you going to do today? You know, our biggest problem is our land's not paid for. So we've got to figure out some way to make enough money to make farm payments. And, you know, while we weren't making a whole lot of money with the dairy cows, we weren't making the payments. So. <laughs> I'm gonna sell eighty thousand dollar soap. <laughs> no matter where this place goes, we have to remind each other that we're we're still we still have our relationship and we still have our kids. We still have our family. It was real rough mentally, more than physically. Feed man called me one day and said, well, how are you doing? I said, physically, I'm fine. I said, mentally, I'm gonna shoot somebody. He said, I know how you feel. Yeah, dairy farming important to us. I guess we've made it a way of life or it's, or it's, it's been our life. We work hard to make a living here and, and we've done pretty good for well over 60 years. And I guess I'm, I'm pretty sure we keep on making a living on the farm somehow or another. Dad rented some land in the 50s and moved here in 52 and rented this farm. There was five of us kids that was, that was born and raised here. And um, so I guess it, it, it became our life. The Coombs family learned they had lost their contract with Dean Foods back in March. Since then, they fought to keep the family business alive. But after selling off some of their cows, getting rejected by a co-op, and with no other nearby milk processing facility to sell to, they chose to shut down. <laughs> the problem with selling all of our girls is that they were born here. Some of them have different quirks about them. Some of them are crazy as calves, and then they mellow out as mama cows. My hair is something that they really enjoy because they think it's hay, so they'll come and, and like start grabbing at my hair. So I have to watch out for that, for the ones who really like, you know, like to come up and hang out. You know, I mean, there was cows in the herd that I could, I can tell you who her father was, I can tell you who her mother was. I can remember when she was born, I can remember her grandmother. You know, you just remember those lines, you remember those families, and you know, not only do you see how your line progresses and how you get better at breeding them and how they get to be better cows, but you just also remember them as a cow and their quirks and cow we called Kay. She always lay in the very back corner. You could always, if you wanted to find her, you knew exactly where to find her. After losing their exclusive contract with Dean Foods, the Coombs family is left unable to sell their milk to anyone, anywhere. Hey! 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 
So now they're forced to sell the last of their dairy cows to slaughter. fixer so <laughs> how do I fix this problem I mean this is my husband's dream I mean it's a great place to raise a family but his dream's gone so it was a hard pill to swallow Curtis was raised as a dairy farmer. And I had a man come up here one day and pick me up. was going to a meeting. Curtis was 10 years old. <coughs> and uh, he said, you're raising a dairy farmer. I said, yeah. I said, raise him just like I was raised. He said, my wife won't let me raise my son that way. He says, they lived off the farm about two miles down the road. He says, she don't want him to grow up not having any money. And I had two neighbors out here told me the same thing. And they was right, they can't make a whole lot of money. If he's satisfied going broke milking cows, then we're happy. I had, a, I had a really good friend in college. Her dad would always say that every generation is one generation removed from the farm. You know, I guess in the back of your mind, you know, you know they'll always be able to grow up on a farm. You know, they won't get to know what it's like to get up in the morning and milk with their dad. Michelle and I have been amazed at the incredible bravery of our medical professionals who are putting their lives on the line to save others. The public servants and health officials battling this disease. The workers taking risks every day to keep our economy running. And everyone who's making their own sacrifice at home with their families, all for the greater good. But if there's one thing we've learned as a country from moments of great crisis, it's that the spirit of looking out for one another can't be restricted to our homes or our workplaces or our neighborhoods or our houses of worship. It also has to be reflected in our national government. The kind of leadership that's guided by knowledge and experience, honesty and humility, empathy and grace. That kind of leadership doesn't just belong in our state capitals and mayor's offices. It belongs in the White House. And that's why I'm so proud to endorse Joe Biden for President of the United States. Choosing Joe to be my Vice President was one of the best decisions I ever made, and he became a close friend. And I believe Joe has all the qualities we need in a President right now. He's someone whose own life has taught him how to persevere, how to bounce back when you've been knocked down. When Joe talks with parents who've lost their jobs, we hear the son of a man who once knew the pain of having to tell his children that he'd lost his. When Joe talks about opportunity for our kids, we hear the young father who took the train home each night so he could tuck his children into bed. And we hear the influence of Jill, a lifelong teacher. 
When Joe talks to families who've lost a hero, we hear another parent of an American veteran, a kindred spirit, somebody whose faith has endured the hardest loss there is. That's Joe. Through all his trials, he's never once forgotten the values or the moral fiber that his parents passed on to him and that made him who he is. That's what steals his faith in God, in America, and in all of us. That steal made him an incredible partner when I needed one the most. Joe was there as we rebuilt from the Great Recession and rescued the American auto industry. He was the one asking what every policy would do for the middle class and everyone striving to get into the middle class. That's why I asked him to implement the Recovery Act, which saved millions of jobs and got people back on their feet. Because Joe gets stuff done. Joe helped me manage H1N1 and prevent the Ebola epidemic from becoming the type of pandemic we're seeing now. He helped me restore America's standing and leadership in the world on the other threats of our time, like nuclear proliferation and climate change. Joe has the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. And I know he'll surround himself with good people, experts, scientists, military officials who actually know how to run the government and care about doing a good job running the government and know how to work with our allies and who will always put the American people's interests above their own. Now, Joe will be a better candidate for having run the gauntlet of primaries and caucuses alongside one of the most impressive democratic fields ever. Each of our candidates were talented and decent with a track record of accomplishment, smart ideas, and serious visions for the future. And that's certainly true of the candidate who made it farther than any other, Bernie Sanders. Bernie's an American original, a man who has devoted his life to giving voice to working people's hopes, dreams, and frustrations. He and I haven't always agreed on everything, but we've always shared a conviction that we have to make America a fairer, more just, more equitable society. We both know that nothing is more powerful than millions of voices calling for change. And the ideas he's championed, the energy and enthusiasm he inspired, especially in young people, will be critical in moving America in a direction of progress and hope. Because for the second time in 12 years, we'll have the incredible task of rebuilding our economy. And to meet the moment, the Democratic Party will have to be bold. You know, I could not be prouder of the incredible progress that we made together during my presidency. But if I were running today, I wouldn't run the same race or have the same platform as I did in 2008. The world is different. There's too much unfinished business for us to just look backwards. We have to look to the future. Bernie understands that, and Joe understands that. It's one of the reasons that Joe already has what is the most progressive platform of any major party nominee in history. Because even before the pandemic turned the world upside down, it was already clear that we needed real structural change. The vast inequalities created by the new economy are easier to see now but they existed long before this pandemic hit. Health professionals, teachers, delivery drivers, grocery clerks, cleaners, the people who truly make our economy run, they've always been essential. And for years, too many of the people who do the essential work of this country have been underpaid, financially stressed, and given too little support. And that applies to the next generation of Americans. Young people graduating into unprecedented unemployment. They're going to need economic policies that give them faith in the future and give them relief from crushing student loan debt. So we need to do more than just tinker around the edges with tax credits or underfunded programs. We have to go further to give everybody a great education, a lasting career, and a stable retirement. We have to protect the gains we made with the Affordable Care Act, but it's also time to go further. We should make plans affordable for everyone, provide everyone with a public option, expand Medicare, 
and finish the job so that healthcare isn't just a right, but a reality for everybody. We have to return the U.S. to the Paris Agreement and lead the world in reducing the pollution that causes climate change. But science tells us we have to go much further, that it's time for us to accelerate progress on bold new green initiatives that make our economy a clean energy innovator, save us money, and secure our children's future. Of course, Democrats may not always agree on every detail of the best way to bring about each and every one of these changes. But we do agree that they're needed. And that only happens if we win this election. Because one thing everybody has learned by now is that the Republicans occupying the White House and running the U.S. Senate are not interested in progress. They're interested in power. They've shown themselves willing to kick millions off their health insurance and eliminate pre-existing condition protections for millions more, even in the middle of this public health crisis, even as they're willing to spend a trillion dollars on tax cuts for the wealthy. They've given polluters unlimited power to poison our air and our water and denied the science of climate change, just as they denied the science of pandemics. Repeatedly, they've disregarded American principles of rule of law and voting rights and transparency, basic norms that previous administrations observed regardless of party, principles that are the bedrock of our democracy. So our country's future hangs on this election, and it won't be easy. The other side has a massive war chest. The other side has a propaganda network with little regard for the truth. On the other hand, pandemics have a way of cutting through a lot of noise and spin to remind us of what is real and what is important. This crisis has reminded us that government matters. It's reminded us that good government matters, that facts and science matter, that the rule of law matters, that having leaders who are informed and honest and seek to bring people together rather than drive them apart, those kind of leaders matter. In other words, elections matter. Right now, we need Americans of goodwill to unite in a great awakening against a politics that too often has been characterized by corruption, carelessness, self-dealing, disinformation, ignorance, and just plain meanness. And to change that, we need Americans of all political stripes to get involved in our politics and our public life like never before. For those of us who believe in building a more just, more generous, more democratic America, where everybody has a fair shot at opportunity, for those of us who believe in a government that cares about the many and not just the few, for those of us who love this country and are willing to do our part to make sure it lives up to its highest ideals, now's the time to fight for what we believe in. So join us. Join Joe. Go to JoeBiden.com right now. Make a plan for how you are going to get involved. Keep taking care of yourself and your families and each other. Keep believing in the possibilities of a better world. And I will see you on the campaign trail as soon as I can. Thanks.
If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Emptiness of huge motorways is difficult to get used to, but it is quite something. Through spring mist, we headed south, heading towards Naples. We glimpsed Vesuvius in the distance, a volcano that centuries ago brought its own destruction every bit as deadly as COVID-19. The citizens of Pompeii didn't heed the warnings back then. Have the people of Naples today? Is it possible that some hope for everyone in every country could lie here in one hospital, where we're told not a single member of staff has been infected, and they still haven't? The lag between the epidemic sweeping through northern Italy and overwhelming the healthcare system before progressing to the south gave this hospital precious time to prepare. Cotunio is the exception in the south. It was already the most advanced hospital. Its testing facilities are world class. But even here, they're taking no risks. They may be working away from the patients, but they are in full protective gear. The vials are full of COVID-19 virus. Put bluntly, it's distilled nastiness. Mistakes here could be deadly. In this lab, they're trying to figure out just how immune you are once you've had COVID-19. So what we don't know is if you can be infected and then get it a second time and yeah. a third time. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. So, if you've got it, you can take it again. Is it not? In this moment, is uh, in in this no moment possible. moment, is not possible. It's not clear yet. Right. Okay. We that don't would know be, either. That would be a big concern. In the very time, you will not take the malady. After a short term, surely you don't take again the the, the coronavirus. Okay. We don't know on the long time. Oh, no. long time. What is really striking here is the rules of separating infected environments and clean areas are followed by everyone. Across the world, as the pandemic spreads, we're seeing the number of infected and dying jump every day. Health workers are right on the front line and they're succumbing to the illness every day. Perhaps, though, it doesn't have to be inevitable. It isn't here. The precautions are meticulously observed. Hey. 
Normally, we do this removal of potentially infected clothes, it's called doffing, as a team. We do it in an area we choose. For Coutinho, they do it for you. The point is, they aren't just doing it for me. They're doing it for themselves and everyone outside. Nobody should get infected, they believe. But of course, they have the kit. They don't just hope. What happened in Italy was a wake-up call to the world. It scared us all, but perhaps now it can bring us hope as well. sing as much as they used to in Rome anymore. But as the dark days brighten, they are sending that message of hope. But the sky is always bluer, they're singing. And one day it will be. Everywhere. The, the one thing I, I want to point out, it's, it's, it's an incredibly exhausting time. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative or positive way. It's just, it's a lot. In the past two weeks, I've probably seen as much death as I've seen in the past three years. Um, it's bad. It, it's, really, it's really sad. I feel like over the past month or so, a lot of us have been through so much. Um, we've virtually had to you know, change our lives around. Uh, everything's been flipped upside down. Uh, and we've had to change our routines, which, which can be pretty tough. Um, we've had to stay at home, socially distance. Uh, and for some of us, uh, washing our hands has been a real change in routine as well. This is me checking into a hotel room for the next 14 days um, in order to minimize the risk to my husband and children from me being exposed at work. I have my, my cooler that my husband uh, packed me some meals that I can heat up here. And I brought my iPad so that I can FaceTime my kids. With the expected peak in California, um, expected any time now this coming week, uh, we determined it was just a better idea for our family right now that I stay in the housing. Our emergency department is turned into an ICU. But essentially, half the hospital is turned into an ICU. What normally goes into like a you know a small area of the hospital, comparatively to the rest of the hospital, is now essentially the entire hospital. We just finished rounding on all of our patients in the COVID-19 intensive care unit. I can tell you they're sick. Uh, many of them are not doing well, but some are turning around. And that's incredibly reassuring. The uh, big difference that we're feeling is that we're not just caring for the patients, but we're all just needing to check in on each other. And every single staff member, from, from respiratory therapist to nurse to doctor, we're just always making sure that we're doing okay. So in a time like this, it's just great to see that humanity is put first. Yes, please. Please just remember that the more people go out and do their own thing and ignore the stay at home, the safe at home, the orders to help all of us flatten the curve, the longer you go out there, the longer I have to stay in here, the longer I have to be away from my family, the longer all of us have to deal with a completely changed world. So please, every time you get ready to walk out the door, think about those of us that can't walk in ours and think if it's really necessary. As much of American life has come to a halt, the American dairy cow has not. But with demand dwindling, dairy farmers have been led to dump their milk. It's such a waste and it's such a, a trauma for the dairy farmer that has worked so hard. Ohio farmer Dan Bassey fears the financial losses will be too much for many fellow farmers to sustain. We fear that we'll be losing more dairy farmers without nearby assistance in the coming year. 
Restaurants, ice cream shops, and schools have closed. 30% of the national supply of dairy products goes to food service. That is dairy farmer Steve Maddox. He has 3,000 dairy cows in Riverdale, California. We first met Maddox in 2018. You've got to harvest every day, and you've got to do something with it. Farmers like him had already faced drops in dairy prices by roughly 40% over the last several years because of overproduction and an increase in milk alternatives. But now, a crash in the market in just the last week. The fear of the unknown has crashed the price uh, by almost a third of where it was at. And so that's a little uh, distressful. Sisters Sydney Brooks and Zoe Nelson are sixth-generation family dairy farmers and sell 100% of their milk to a local Wisconsin cheese company. You can't shut down cows. You can't turn them off like a faucet. But now, with a drop in the demand for cheese... To see it literally going down the drain is it's devastating. Uncertainty at a time in which the future of the American dairy industry already faces serious questions. So they're looking at substantial losses today which is why the dairy farmer, after years of struggles, is so upside down in terms of his balance sheet. Farmers going into debt, many into bankruptcy. Last year alone, nearly 1,000 dairy farmers halted production. For the 42,000 dairy farms that remain, it's about making it to the summer and pass the coronavirus. Out on America's roads tonight, truckers like James Rogers, who's hauling critical supplies, soap and disinfectant from Illinois to Salt Lake City. This is this is critical stuff you're, you're hauling. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Every load that has come out of Procter & Gamble has been deemed. Uh, I don't know if it came from the government is deeming it or it's the actual or it's actual Procter & Gamble. But everything we are hauling right now has big tags on it that says critical load. I know you are an Army veteran, served in Afghanistan and, and Korea. Um, you, you know, once again, you're being you're being called on to support your your country. How does that feel? It feels good. Um, I mean, this that's the reason I got back into the trucking industry. An Army veteran of the war in Afghanistan now answering a new call to serve. I loved serving in the military. I absolutely loved it 100 percent. So. I quickly started gravitating to the trucking industry because to me, it was a direct parallel. I mean, as truck drivers, we're out here, we supply everything. You know, we are, you know, they call us guardians of the highway. We've been called cowboy, the last, you know, the last cowboys. To me, we're just, we're the soldiers. When the country called, when all this happened, when it all kicked off, we as drivers, we were there. This is home on the road right here. With his dog, Sergeant, by his side, James driving over 1,300 miles in less than 48 hours. While he's sleeping, it's going to be uh, spaghetti for me. With so many places closed, James now eats and sleeps in his truck. Check this out. This is how bad it's getting for us. Staying healthy is constantly on his mind. Problem is, is there's nothing out here for us truck drivers to get. We, we can't find gloves, we can't find masks, we can't find Lysol. We're having to kind of make shift and adapt to it. And how's your family doing with you on the road? They're very supportive. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for the family and the support system I do have. Um, obviously, they're worried for me, and I'm worried too. Um, as the longer this drags on, you know, we talk about it nightly when we do talk. Is, is one of our biggest concerns is the more that I'm exposed and the more that things keep coming about, that asymptomatic people can actually, tr you know, communicate it, can, tra you know, can spread it. When does my period end? When does my quarantine or any of these other drivers end to where we can safely go home to our families? You know, the last thing I told my wife was, I'm not coming home until it's over, because I do have a small child at home. I have a grandchild at home. I don't want to bring it home to my wife. When we go to the store and we see the shelves empty of this product or that product, you know, we get anxious. Uh, what's your message to the American people? My message to the people is we're, we're moving as fast as we can, but we're trying to be safe about it. Like truckers across America, he's ready to go the distance. A man on a new mission. This is what personally I'm built for, and I'd have it no other way. I mean, when the country calls, I'm there. 
letter carrier in England has become something of a hero in his small town after he came up with a pretty ingenious way to lift his customers' spirits without breaking any of the social distancing rules during lockdown. My name is John Michael Matten, and I'm from Bolden, which is in the northeast of England. And you're a mailman? Postman, yes, mailman. A, a postman. Why are you dressed like a pilot? It's today's outfit. Matson decided to ditch his normal red Royal Mail uniform in favor of fun costumes while he was delivering his letters. It has been an instant hit. So far, he's been a cheerleader, Little Bo Peep, a knight, even Waldo. <laughs> it's so nice to see something that's just genuinely delightful at a time when so many of us are like, Arr! what made you want to do this? I've been doing this round for about two years now. Okay. Um, so what I've, get, I've got to know a lot of the customers on a sort of personal level, you know, and when the, the lockdown started and the, the coronavirus really took a hold, I noticed everybody was feeling a little bit uncertain, you know, I, I noticed the change in everybody's mood and, and how unhappy and fearful some people were, so I just had to do something to, to help cheer them up a little bit. For many families on lockdown, the mailman, or postman, may be the only person that they still see every day. John is on a mission to make them smile. He's showing what true community spirit is all about. I, I would like to see more mailmen doing it. Even in America, you know, I'd like to see. You'd like to see this be an international trend of mailmen bringing, and women, bringing not just the mail, but some good cheer. Exactly, exactly. I can't be the only person doing this. I, I need help. <laughs> The reaction to John's simple act of kindness has been overwhelming, and he says he plans to keep it up every single day until lockdown is lifted. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now on this Tuesday. Let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. She is following the latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what's the latest today? Hey, Allison. So lots of headlines. But first, President Barack Obama has endorsed his former VP Joe Biden for president. In a video message, Obama also offered this message of support to everyone dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Please know that you're not alone, because now's the time for all of us to help where we can and to be there for each other as neighbors, as co-workers and as fellow citizens. And let's get to some top line numbers. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases worldwide is inching closer and closer to the 2 million mark, with the United States now shouldering the highest number of those cases of any other country. The number of coronavirus case deaths in uh, the number of coronavirus deaths in New York state, excuse me, climbed to more than 10,800. That's according to Governor Andrew Cuomo today. President Trump has been adamant he has the authority to open up the country again, while East and West Coast states formed regional packs to coordinate the reopening of their economies. The president told reporters today he was going to make a decision soon and had, quote, tremendous support from governors. But Governor Cuomo today also had this warning. We will have a constitutional crisis like you haven't seen in decades, hmm. where states tell the federal government we're not going to follow your order. From NBC's Stella Kim, South Korea is sending COVID-19 test kits around 750,000 to the United States as the death toll from the virus continues to rise. And some, some states say they are still in short supply. This influx comes just as New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that New York will soon be be begin producing 50,000 of its own test kits every week. That's from NBC's Janelle Griffith. This increased supply will add to the 50,000 test kits already supplied to the city every week by Aria Diagnostics. That's a company based in Indiana. Mayor de Blasio also added, however, that the city's new production capacity, quote, does not let the federal government off the hook. And some news on the economy also today to round out our headlines from CNBC's Sylvia Amaro. The International Monetary Fund is saying that the global economy will likely suffer the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. The IMF now expects the global economy to contract by 3 percent in 2020. And just for context, back in January, it had previously predicted the global economy would be would expand by 3.3 percent. So a big difference there, of course, largely in part due to the pandemic. And those are the latest headlines. Allison will be back later with more.
All right, Alexa, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. And you can visit our live blog. That's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus anytime for the very latest updates. Former President Barack Obama endorsed Joe Biden earlier today after keeping a low profile during the Democratic primary. In a sign of the times, Obama announced his support for his former VP on social media, of course, first touching on the coronavirus pandemic. Joe gets stuff done. Joe helped me manage H1N1 and prevent the Ebola epidemic from becoming the type of pandemic we're seeing now. He helped me restore America's standing and leadership in the world on the other threats of our time, like nuclear proliferation and climate change. Joe has the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. And I know he'll surround himself with good people, experts, scientists, military officials who actually know how to run the government and care about doing a good job running the government and know how to work with our allies and who will always put the American people's interests above their own. NBC News White House correspondent Kristen Welker joins me now, home camera to home camera. And Kristen, it was no short video, ran about 12 minutes long. Your major takeaways from President Obama's message. Allison, it is great to see you from my home camera to yours. Couple of big takeaways <laughs> here. This was expected, but this was a full-throated endorsement of his former vice president. We knew it was coming. There was a lot of scrutiny about why President Barack Obama didn't insert himself sooner into this race. Well, if you talk to those who are close to the former president, they say it is critical that Democratic voters were able to choose their own candidate, that Obama didn't want to put his finger on the scales at all, in part because he didn't want to alienate other parts of the electorate who might not be behind Joe Biden right now. So what you saw in that endorsement, Allison, not only that full-throated sort of saying, I support Joe Biden, I'm going to stand with him, I'm going to campaign with him, but you also saw Mr. Obama reach out to Bernie Sanders supporters. And that is going to be really critical Mm -hmm. because the party believes that's part of what went wrong in 2016, that they did do a good enough job, Hillary Clinton, former President Obama, of reaching out to and winning over those Sanders supporters. And it's not just Sanders supporters, it's Elizabeth Warren supporters as well. So all of that is going to be critical. And then you have cursed, heard a not so subtle swipe at the current commander in chief, Mr. Obama, not mentioning President Trump by name, but he did say this, Allison, quote, one thing everybody has learned by now is that the Republicans occupying the White House are running the U.S. Senate, are not interested in progress they're interested in power. He tried to pit Biden against Trump, essentially casting him as a leader who would lead from science, from facts, and then to try to make the counterpoint that he believes that is not the way that President Trump is leading through this crisis. And make no mistake about it, Allison, as you pointed out, his endorsement started by talking about the coronavirus crisis. He is going to make the argument on the campaign trail, if he does in fact get to go out on the campaign trail, that this is a critical moment and it requires leadership and that his former vice president is the right person to lead the country through this very difficult moment, Allison. Kristen, you talked about why President Obama perhaps waited uh, to endorse uh, his former VP. Do we know why, though, he picked uh, today specifically why on this Tuesday this was the day that he decided to back Joe? It's a really good question. We know that former President Obama has been engaged for quite some time now in a lot of the discussions that are going on behind the scenes. So that means he's been in very close contact with Bernie Sanders and his campaign. He's been in close contact with Joe Biden. And there was a real sense that it was important for Senator Sanders to come out and to endorse Biden first. There was a choreography to these endorsements that we have seen this week. There is no mistake that Mr. Obama endorsed Biden one day after Sanders did, but he really felt as though it was necessary for Sanders to endorse first. But think about what we saw back in 2016. It took Sanders over a month to endorse Hillary Clinton. In this instance, only a few days. Why? Well, if you talk to those who are close to both men, they say that Sanders and Biden have a very 
very different relationship than Sanders had with Hillary Clinton, that the two are actually close. And so this is going to be a different type of passing of the baton, if you will, that Bernie Sanders is planning to uh, campaign for former Vice President Joe Biden in a very vigorous, full-throated way, and that that's part of the rollout that we saw this week. So you had the Sanders endorsement followed by former President Obama. They felt as though that was the strongest way to make the case to the party that it's time to come together, Allison. Kristen, great background there. Thank you so much. I know a lot of people were curious about why this all happened Thank on a you. Tuesday. Uh, so thanks for filling us in and hope you and your family are staying safe. Hope you and your family are safe too, Allison. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Cuomo says New York is flattening the coronavirus curve with hospitalizations trending down, but the death toll in the state's still rising. It's now well past 10,000. Preliminary data in New York City shows this pandemic is disproportionately hurting minority communities. The city is opening five new testing areas to try to combat that racial disparity. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joins me now from one of those testing sites. It's in Brooklyn. Ron, figures data showing us that the virus is killing black and Latino people in New York City at twice the rate of white people. How will these new testing sites help the most vulnerable? Well, the short answer is that the sites are in the neighborhood, so they're accessible. They're right where people are. And in mm -hmm. addition to what the city's doing, the state has also set up a number of testing sites like the one behind me. One concern that a number of community leaders have pointed out to me, though, is that it's a drive up center. You have to have a car. And this is a neighborhood, a community where overwhelmingly people don't have transportation to get here. So people have been walking up on occasion and they've frankly been turned away. Uh, you also need an appointment here. And so people are trying to become familiar with the process of how you do this and how you can get a test. But the bottom line is that they're trying to bring the health care system to communities where there hasn't been a lot of health care, where people don't have insurance, where people don't have doctors, where people don't have the means to to take care of themselves better and where there are underlying illnesses like asthma, heart disease, lung disease, uh, obesity that in fact make the coronavirus worse if in fact you get it. So that's basically the approach. Take the health care to mm -hmm. the people who need it most and, and give them access to it. Allison. Ron, I know earlier you spoke with the state representative about testing availability. We want to play a bit of that. Do you overall, do you think there is enough testing happening and availability? I don't think there's enough testing and availability. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, most people here have been exposed. And the right way to do this is to test everybody. Mayor de Blasio says the city will manufacture its own testing kits. What kind of impact will broader testing have on the city? The mayor announced that the city is going to make its own testing kits. He also announced a deal with a biotech firm in Indiana that's going to provide the city with 50,000 tests per week. Now, and he also went on, a, went on to, just, to continue to criticize the federal government for not stepping in and providing testing that's been requested from the start of this whole crisis. He also said that trying to do this by shopping the international supply markets has been just frustrating and hasn't gotten it done. You know, the whole idea behind testing is that you'll be able to tell who has the illness and who doesn't, who can go back to work and who cannot, presumably as well. It's, it's information, information's power, and of course that's just the diagnostic test. The other test that we're trying to, that's trying to get here in New York City is this test for plasma, this, uh, this test for antibodies that will determine who, put, who has survived the illness essentially. Uh, who has recovered from the illness and who potentially can be a something of a donor to people who are ill with their plasma and antibodies to help them recover. That's a short time away, we're told. But of course, the leaders here in New York want to get these things up to scale. They want to see thousands and thousands, if not millions and millions of these tests happening. And um, that seems to be one big area of disconnect between Washington and New York in that when asked about testing, the president often says, well, we've tested more people than anybody else, so on and so forth. But I think here the feeling is that may be true, but we still have a really long way to go in terms of the amount of testing that the local leaders here think should happen 
before people will not only go back to work, but feel confident enough to go back to work or send their kids to school or whatever. And so we're not really anywhere near where the amount of testing should be, according to most local officials here, uh, the mayor, the governor, and others, who are, who are much more cautious in talking about reopening than what we're hearing down in Washington. Allison? Ron, New York City is also launching a $10 million ad campaign to slow the spread of the virus in hard-hit areas. What's that campaign focusing on? What do we know about it? Again, it's another example of how the city, the state, are trying to get into the communities that have been hardest hit by the virus. As I understand it, the, the campaign is going to happen in multiple languages, as many as 12 or 50 different languages. And I think there's going to be a big social media component to it. While talking to some of the local officials here during the day, they emphasize that they're trying to get the word out through social media to people in the community that this testing center and other health care services are available. There's, there's a disconnect between the community and, and the health care that's available to them for, for myriads of reasons, everything from distrust to, to immigrant communities where people live in the shadows and don't want to become very public and very visible. They're, they're leery of, of other problems that they may encounter. So the public service campaign is designed to try and break through some of that because, as you heard the state representative say, she thinks that just about everybody in areas like this have been exposed to the virus in some way or another. Um, we've heard that from the beginning of this whole crisis about a month ago. It's a very dense community. People live in multi-generational houses. People, uh, you know, working class people who have to go out and work and work in other people's homes and work close by. It, it's, it's very dense in the streets, not here, but, but it's generally a very dense place. And, and that's what's ignited the problem. So the public service campaign, the opening up of more test sites like this one, uh, are all designed to try and bring health care and bring the message to these communities that have been so badly and disproportionately hit. Allison? Ron Allen, thank you so much for being with us. Please stay safe out there. Doctors in Atlanta are prescribing an experimental treatment for coronavirus patients. It's an antiviral drug called remdesivir, and it was first given to Ebola patients. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is here with us now. And Tom, what can you tell us about this particular trial? So uh, this is a, a drug that is showing real promise. Now, to be clear, this is not a vaccine. This is a treatment, a therapeutic for somebody who already is sick. And doctors at Emory University in the ICU are now prescribing remdesivir. It's part of an NIH study involving more than 400 people around the world, mostly in the United States, but also in Europe and Asia. And they want to find out if they are seeing significant results within the first 30 days. And the good news is they are. They're seeing very good results. And as a result, within the next few weeks, this could be prescribed as a frontline go-to treatment for hospitals in the United States. This is an NIH double-blind study. What does that mean? This is the gold standard for studies. It means that both the patient and the doctor do not know if the patient is getting a placebo or the real thing. But the results so far, according to the doctors we've talked to, seem to be very positive, and they're hopeful that this will be rolled out as a frontline uh, therapeutic uh, in the coming weeks. Now, if they do, in fact, get approval in the coming weeks, then they would try partnering remdesivir with another drug to see if they can make it even more effective, and so that would be, become the next drug trial. But remdesivir was originally an Ebola drug, and so they know, having already done the background for Ebola, they know it's safe. They know that these side effects are really pretty minimal. So the question then becomes, well, how effective is it for treating uh, COVID-19? We talked to one of the patients who was not in the NIH study, but a patient at a Washington State Hospital who was in very serious condition. He was struggling to breathe. He was in the ICU. They gave him remdesivir really on an emergency, compassionate use basis. And within 48 hours, he was bouncing back, uh, and dramatically so. And, and his wife says, listen, we, we are firm believers that uh, this drug is really what saved his life. So according to Gilead, which is the company that makes the drug, they have now had okay. 1,600 people use the drug. Now, we don't know what, le what uh, rate of efficacy, how, how many of those people had a successful outcomes, 
But the bottom line is they've had now 16 or 1,700 people use the drug. It's now in the NIH study, and they believe that it's showing promise. And so we could have this now as a frontline drug within the next couple of weeks. And if it is approved, Allison, and this is critical, Gilead says they have one and a half mm -hmm. million doses or doses for one and a half million people to go. Uh, very, no, sorry, let me scratch that. Let me say it again. They have enough for 140,000 people to go uh, immediately, and then they, they would have half a million uh, by October. In other words, enough for half a million by October. So they are very encouraged by this. Researchers so far are cautiously optimistic. Can I take a minute and tell you this is not uh, hydroxychloroquine? And you know the president has talked a lot about chloroquine, and he believes that this could be yes. something that would be very effective for people to take chloroquine. There have not been any formal FDA or NIH studies on chloroquine. There was a Brazilian study just done, and they canceled the study early because they were finding some of their patients were developing irregular heart arrhythmias as well as heart attacks and dying. So they canceled the study on chloroquine in Brazil. It is being used. It's being tried in some New York hospitals. It's being tried in South Dakota. But there is not a formal FDA or NIH study on this. And so we really don't have a good feeling for how safe or effective it is other than the warning signs right now out of Brazil. And in fact, researchers at Emory said they've been concerned about heart arrhythmias with chloroquine. So that is a separate therapy, a separate drug from remdesivir, which is showing promise. Allison? Tom, great to hear uh, that they are so optimistic about remdesivir and that if it is, in fact, uh, you know, a possibility that we could see it in a matter of weeks. Uh, wonderful news that there could be a potential treatment on the horizon. Tom Costello, thank you so much. You bet. Louisiana is a coronavirus hotspot here in the U.S. There are okay, more than 21,000 cases confirmed in the state. Yesterday, the governor closed schools through the rest of the year. And on top of all of that, Louisiana is now dealing with the aftermath of some devastating storms that rolled through over the weekend. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Catherine O'Neill joins me now from Baton Rouge. And Dr. O'Neill, if you could just describe for us, what is it like right now at your hospital? Thanks, Allison. It's an interesting time at the hospital. We did see a decrease in cases admitted to the hospital over the weekend. We do see that most holidays that even the sickest of the sick choose to stay home over a holiday weekend. And we saw those cases increase again on Sunday night. What we found is that uh, this leveling that we think we're seeing is not the happy end of the curve that, that you see when you put a picture of a, of a curve up. And in fact, the leveling almost seems like we're just at a plateau. So the hospital continues to get busier. We are starting to see some people get better and try to get home, but our nursing homes are, are limited in who they can take. So the hospital's full. Um, our nursing staff have been doing this for a while now, and, and you're starting to see some fatigue set in. Uh, we are, we're not seeing a decline. We're seeing more of a leveling. We're also seeing, concerningly, uh, an increase in our number of non-COVID positive patients who are sick from not getting the great best care in the last 30 days. So people who needed surgery, people with diabetes, people who have osteomyelitis, people who have been on long-term infusions, those people are coming into the hospital because they need care and they need it now. Um, and so that's also filling up our hospital beds. Just to ask you a little bit more uh, about the curve. Uh, we know over the weekend, Louisiana uh, as a whole saw its smallest increase in coronavirus cases yet. I know you were describing what you have been seeing at your hospital. Do you think that the curve in the state, though, is starting to flatten? We don't feel that um, as much as we would like. As I said, we, we saw this huge okay. peak yeah. in cases and, and a sustained number of cases the week before Easter. And then over the Easter weekend, we did see less patients, but it doesn't feel like those patients are, are truly, that less people are getting yeah. sick. It does feel like there's a little bit of, of just a, a sustained force out there that's slowly coming in. Okay. Uh, we know Louisiana has the fourth highest rate of new HIV infections in the country. Mm -hmm. Is that population at a particularly high risk of getting COVID-19? And, and how should that be addressed? We haven't seen our HIV population here in Louisiana have a disproportionate number of cases that have been admitted. Uh, 
I do attribute that to our early detection system that we put in years ago that's, that's mm -hmm. helped our case rate decrease. And also those patients get into care very quickly. And on medication and doing well, I think that they're surrounded by their healthcare team and that's protected them in New Orleans. Our colleagues in New Orleans have also said that they're not seeing our HIV population being disproportionately affected, which is phenomenal. I think that um, what we do see, and I think that you mentioned it earlier in your conversation about New York, that we're still seeing a disproportionate number of people from our areas that don't have great health care. And so when you look around our ICU, um, we are seeing that those same effects here in Louisiana, people who don't have great access to care, people who don't have great access to nutrition, people on, who live in the poverty line and below the poverty line, those are the people who we're seeing disproportionately admitted to the hospital. What do you think the state can do to help those folks? Uh, you know, Ron Allen, uh, one of our reporters, was telling us here in New York uh, they're trying to do testing, but he said, unfortunately, uh, it was drive through testing, and a lot of people in these areas don't have cars, and so it's not as helpful as they would hope it would be. Are there things that you say, you know, in Louisiana, we could really use this, this, and this, and it would help those communities that are being hit the hardest? We have access to care in those communities. The government here in Louisiana has kept a lot of outreach clinics in those communities for a long time. What we don't have is enough testing, and that's for every community in Louisiana. We don't have great access to outpatient test kits, and until we do, I can't test people anywhere in the city, much less in my areas that I'm most concerned about. Uh, one last question for you. We know the Florida Surgeon General said that social distancing might be necessary until we have a vaccine. We have heard a vaccine could be a year, uh, 18 months away at best. What is your take on that? You know, Allison, I think we're going to be social distancing for a really, really long time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to keep schools closed until a vaccine comes. We're not going to be able to keep our businesses closed until a vaccine comes. So instead, we're going to have to be incredibly responsible citizens as we open back up. And social distancing is a huge part of that. Our life won't look the same, but we will have to start back and do some of the things that we need to do to educate our children, to provide health care to all of those people, which is, I guess, my biggest concern this week is how are we making sure that we're providing adequate health care to everyone else that doesn't have coronavirus and then getting our economy back up and going? We all want to do that. We just want to do it really safely. Such unbelievable challenges. Dr. O'Neill, I know so many people said, goodness, I, I never, this is something I never thought I'd see, a situation I never thought I'd be dealing with. I can only imagine you are experiencing that a hundredfold in your hospital. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and thanks for taking a little bit of your time to come and talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it, Allison. Have a good day. Stay safe. You too. And a quick programming note for you tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. That's tonight at 10 p.m. And you can watch it right here on NBC News Now. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Testing, testing, testing. Experts say that is the key to reopening the country, and it includes rapid coronavirus tests, antibody tests, and contact tracing. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz joins me now. And Gotti, could you go through these different types of tests one by one and sort of explain what they do and why they're essential in getting our country back up and running? Yeah, sure, Allison. Well, the one that everybody's talking about right now in California, there's a lot of excitement over, is the antibody test. It's all about these antibodies uh, that could possibly make you immune to COVID-19. In fact, this blood drive down here in Los Angeles, right now the Red Cross is specifically looking for people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have those antibodies to give plasma so that that plasma can be studied to see if it works in treating people with COVID-19 uh, among the people that have maybe the worst uh, case scenarios. Uh, but how do you find those antibodies? That requires testing. And California is hoping to ramp up wide-scale COVID-19 antibody testing. Uh, those tests are extremely easy. Anytime you see on uh, the screen somebody that is pricking their finger and putting that blood uh, into something that looks almost like a pregnancy test, uh, that is an antibody test. And then minutes later, uh, those tests are very very quickly at processing the results, you find out if your immune system has already encountered COVID-19 and built up the specific antibodies to fight it. Uh, when it comes to the other tests, the nasal tests, those take a, a little bit longer to process those results. We've seen the backlog in, in processing those results, and they only tell you if you have COVID-19 at that moment. They don't really tell you uh, if you have antibodies and you've had it in the past. So it's really, uh, if you have the virus in your body at that moment, uh, that test will show up uh, positive. So far, USC, Stanford, and uh, UCLA has been testing uh, pretty big chunks of the population, uh, but nowhere near what needs to be tested uh, for uh, things to go back to normal. We're only talking about maybe five, 6,000 people in uh, California. USC and Stanford testing the general population as a whole, looking for asymptomatic carriers, while UCLA is studying specifically healthcare workers, hoping to build almost super soldiers uh, that can know that they are immune from COVID-19 when they go into work and give them a little bit of peace of mind. Uh, but again, the big increase in testing that we've been hearing uh, across the board uh, has to happen uh, soon before things can go back to normal. It, it, it's, it's really difficult to see how many people may be immune and could effectively go out to work w without the results from those tests. Uh, we've also just heard from Governor Gavin Newsom. He was putting together a list of musts, really, before things can uh, resume and business can reopen here in California. Uh, the things he was talking about, testing and tracing, isolation of the cases uh, that, uh, that are out there and surveillance. Also protecting vulnerable populations and finding uh, and, and finding out where those populations are. So whether that's immune compromised uh, people or people that might live in retirement homes and, and finally making sure people keep wearing their masks. That's something that we're most likely going to see for the foreseeable future. Yeah. He was also talking about before we reopen business, we almost need to reimagine the way businesses work. So uh, that may mean uh, more telecommuting figuring out the way people sit in bars, figuring out uh, how many people are allowed in things like restaurants. So it's going to be a gradual return to normalcy, uh, nothing that is going to be like a light switch on things going back to normal right away. And we are still quite a ways away from that. Allison? Gotti, one quick question before you go. Do they have a sense of how accurate these tests are so far? Because I think people would love it if they could uh, you know, get a test and know if they're immune. But you want to be sure, of course, that they're accurate. 
Well, it, it all depends on where you're getting that test. Right now, it's only academic uh, studies mm -hmm. that seem to be doing the, the bulk of the testing, especially here in California. And, and so it's USC, Stanford, and uh, UCLA. And, and their uh, blood tests are, are going to be extremely accurate, and, and they're going to be double, triple checked. However, we've seen this type of testing before in South Korea. And in South Korea, there have been some false positives, false negatives, uh, the kinds of things that, that raise some concerns. Concerns. Those are something uh, that the FDA has been examining. So before we see that wide, wide scale testing uh, here in the United States where everybody may be able to go get an antibody test, we're going to have to see a rigorous uh, a study on those tests. And it's going to have to go through a, a lot of different uh, loops here in the United States before they, they are uh, made available to the general public. All right, Gotti Schwartz in L.A., thanks so much for being with us and for the update. Appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me. Apple and Google out with more details on their plans to make contact tracing available through smartphone technology. But there are some privacy concerns here. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins me now. And Sam, could you walk us through what this technology does and what the privacy or the main privacy issues are? Allison, good afternoon. It's pretty apparent that both Google and Apple are trying to allay people's fears right now and demonstrate the fact that there's nothing to be concerned about when it comes to privacy. They say that this system will not function unless they make sure that there is no compromising of privacy. So let's get into a couple of those elements. One of them is an explicit ex consent agreement, which means that you can't just all of a sudden have it pop up onto your phone. You have to opt in for it. The other thing is it's Bluetooth technology, which is the same kind of thing you use on your phone when you're trying to find your wireless speakers or headphones or to connect to your car. In this case, instead of looking for those things, your phone is looking for other people. Now, it's not GPS information, Allison, so there's not going to be a direct pinning down of where you are at all times or a database of your movements and locations. That was one point these companies really tried to, to get across is that you don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Let's get into how this works, though. So I update my operating system on my phone. With the latest version of either an iPhone or an Android, it's going to be compatible for both. They call that interoperability. I do that, and then all of a sudden, my phone is going to be giving off what they call these chirps or beacons, which are unique keys associated with just me. If I come into contact with someone else who has also uploaded this latest operating system, and we get close enough, Allison, where it's a few feet apart, and it's a sustained period of time, that information will exchange. So fast forward now. They go in their direction, I go in my direction, and I find out later that that person tested positive for COVID-19. They have a choice. They would then go onto their phone to their local health agency app, which is going to be working in concert with this, and upload that information. Assuming that they do, all of the other keys that have been associating with or communicating with that phone get an alert. And at that point, Allison, let's say I'm one of those people, if I get an alert, I then need to go to my medical professional or hospital or doctor and talk to them about what's best for me this does not guarantee you're not going to contract the coronavirus. It's not a silver bullet or anything like that. It is meant to try and track to the best of our capabilities who's coming into contact with who anonymously, Apple and Google says, and try to figure out a way to stop breaking the transmission of this virus. Sam, it is fascinating technology. Uh, what are privacy and security experts saying, though? Are they concerned about uh, some of those privacy issues that, that you addressed a little while ago? So what's good about that is the fact that it's decentralized. Nothing is stored on, your, on a grand mm -hmm. server. It's all on your phone by and large. But anytime you're talking about a security system of this magnitude and scale, or I should say a tracking system of this magnitude and scale, there are going to be concerns about bad actors getting involved and what they may or may not be able to do with information, even if it is really hard to access. We spoke to the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, which basically examines the intersection between privacy, technology, and security. Here's what Jenny Gephardt had to tell us. But there are still some concerns, kind of at a deeper technical level, about use of those keys that will be kind of standing in it rather than, you know, your name or identifying information. There's more questions about what kind of attack someone could use, whether that's, you know, someone who wants to watch the world burn and wants to go trolling or a government entity or any kind of other bad faith attacker. There's questions about how someone could reverse engineer those keys to figure out who you are. So I think it still needs more scrutiny from the security community. Yeah, anytime you hear the word reverse engineer or words reverse engineer, that probably makes people get a little bit nervous. 
But Apple and Google were very adamant about the fact that there is no central storage point for all of this data. So people who, if they're trying to collect the individual data points, the keys, your anonymized information, it's going to be done on a very micro level, not at a large aggregated server. That's what they're telling people right now to try to make sure they're not too worried about uh, what could happen to their information. Sam, do we have a timeline yet for when this will be available? We do. There are two phases right now, Allison. Phase one and phase two. Phase one is going okay. to be about a month from now, the middle of May. Google and Apple say you're going to be able to upgrade your operating system at that point. You would still need to get an app in addition to that. That would be your local health agency app or some mm -hmm. variation thereof. They're going to be customizing them. Um, that would all work in concert. Then at some point down the road, several months perhaps down the road, they're going to be building this directly into the platform itself. So you wouldn't necessarily need to get the app. You could just upgrade your phone, the operating system on your phone, and you would automatically have it. But again, Allison, I can't stress this enough. You have to give consent before you'd be part of this program. A lot of people pleased to hear that, I think, Sam. People don't want to be giving uh, their information away or participating in something unwillingly. Uh, Sam Brock, thanks so much. Great to have you with us. Thank you. The coronavirus relief bill promised free COVID-19 testing, but some Americans are getting hit with hefty fees after visiting clinics and emergency rooms to get tested. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman takes a look. I don't think $536 is free. Um, I don't know. I'm a grad student, and that's literally two weeks worth of my paycheck. Two weeks of pay for a coronavirus test, the one that's supposed to be free anywhere in America, by law, passed by Congress last month as our economy was shutting down. Even earlier, many states had ordered free testing, and some large insurance companies had pledged no costs. But in West Virginia, Anna Davis Abel got a bill anyway. She filmed herself going through a drive through testing site. Oh my God, they just pulled my braid out through my nostril. But it's done. I am now tested for COVID-19. When the bill came, it wasn't for the COVID-19 test itself, but for a whole battery of other tests for things like the flu and adenovirus. With tests in short supply, her doctor had to rule out other things first before she could get a COVID-19 test. The long and the short of it is, the only reason that you had these tests done was because your doctor was concerned that you might have coronavirus and they had to do these tests first in order to get you a coronavirus test, and yet still you got billed more than 500 bucks for it. Yes, if I had not met my deductible or if I had been paying out of pocket, it would have been $2,000. Aetna's parent company, CVS Health, had pledged to waive copays for all diagnostic testing related to COVID-19. But Anna's doctor told her those initial tests couldn't be billed under the COVID-19 billing code. After NBC News contacted Aetna, the insurer followed up to say it was waiving Anna's costs retroactively. An Aetna spokesman saying that hers was an unusual instance and that our commitment to waiving member costs for testing and treatment related to COVID-19 has not changed. Most people we spoke to did not get charged for a COVID-19 test. And if you've ever been in a U.S. hospital, you know that medical billing is extremely complicated. So maybe those surprise bills that some Americans are getting aren't that surprising. It is now the law that uh, insurance is supposed to cover that test 100%. And then if you're uninsured, there are different pathways to get to a free test, although you're going to have to sign up for something. But what happens, though, if you go in because you're having symptoms or concerns you need a coronavirus test? They evaluate you for things like the flu, and they determine you don't need a coronavirus test. Right. So then you might get charged for the visit. The law is kind of narrowly written. So they test me for the coronavirus. After that, I started feeling quite a bit better while I was waiting on the results. But in the event, two weeks later, I get a bill in the mail for $857. Uh, for lab work. The actual test was $1,143, and my insurance discount got it down to $857. And I had not met my deductible, so I owed $857. My first thought was, ah, they've made a mistake. No mistake. Just like Anna, Ricky got hit with a bill for an upper respiratory panel his doctor ordered before giving him the COVID-19 test. Blue Cross Blue Shield had pledged to cover full testing costs for COVID-19. But a spokesman tells me members can still be charged for other tests their doctor orders. Blue Cross says it's prepared to make changes as necessary to ensure cost isn't a barrier. My immediate response was anger. By the time Melanie Yazzie came down with symptoms, New Mexico had already ordered testing free 
free. Uh, so I drove to the other side of town and I waited for three hours and then I got tested and I drove off and came back home. And I actually got the bill before I got the results <laughs> of my test. Almost 200 bucks. In Yazzie's case, it seems the billing office sent her the bill that should have gone to her insurance company. They're supposedly working it out. I still have no idea uh, if my insurance paid for this $199 or if the state paid for it or how this is being offered for free. And the most important question, uh, what happened with your test? Hopefully it was negative. It was negative. <laughs> yeah, it was negative. I received results maybe five days later, um, and I, I breathed a sigh of relief. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Nurses and doctors are making personal sacrifices day in and day out to care for patients with coronavirus. Dr. Melanie Malloy is one of them. She's an emergency medical physician at hard-hit Mount Sinai in Brooklyn. Here's what her days have been like. I'm on my way to work. I uh, have just had a very nice and cathartic dance party in my car, which is a good transition to work from home. Yeah. Had a little bit of a stressful morning with my children, trying to get them set up for homeschool. I am a widow, so I don't have a partner to help me with them, and I don't want them to, to send them to my in-laws or my parents because they're getting older and some of them have health conditions that might put them a little bit more at risk. I have a great 
babysitter who helps me a lot, but sometimes it's a little bit hard to get everything going, make sure everything's calm and still keep my own calm. I'm going to get mask, face shield, just everything that I need to be safe on my shift. I walked in and they said everybody's intubated and it looks like it's true actually. Most of our beds are taken up by intubated patients. Now I'm going to try to go to the tent. Um, patients get registered here. Good morning. Um, here is our fantastic staff. And then we have separate areas for people getting treatment. I'm waiting for my next patient to be placed in a room. Okay, he's in his early 20s. He's here for nausea and vomiting. Um, you know, before this whole thing, we used to have a differential diagnosis of 21-year-old male with nausea and vomiting. What that could be, is it, you know, appendicitis or gastritis, pancreatitis or something like that. But now everybody everywhere is a suspect for COVID. I just needed to get out of the ED for a little bit. Sometimes you just got to step out for a second. I just wanted to give you guys like, a little look at the ICU. We have every patient in here on a ventilator. I wanted to point out how we have our IV set up so that uh, our nurses can get some protection by only using medications and hanging things outside the room instead of having to go in every time they need to change something on the pole. Uh, everybody has coronavirus, but some people also have heart attacks at the same time. Um, this happens and it makes things even harder. Well, my day's over. Well, my hospital day is over. It's just, it's hard. It's hard to think that some of your patients that you diagnosed today might not be here tomorrow when you come back for your shift. So it's almost 10 o'clock at night and um, on my way home, I got a FaceTime from my youngest child, who's four, who's still awake. Um, she really was upset because she didn't want to go to bed without seeing me. I was hoping that she would be asleep because I'm tired and I just want to just relax a little bit and go to sleep. Um, you know, I'm sure right now I'm just, I'm struggling and I'm like, oh, I have to go inside and, and parent. But at the end of the day, you know, that's my favorite job. As hospitals try to plan for a potential shortage of ventilators, companies and academic institutions are coming up with some pretty creative solutions. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns has the story. Medical facilities have spent recent weeks scrambling to get what they need. But these challenges have also inspired innovation, from distilleries making hand sanitizer to engineers 3D printing masks. And then there are the ventilators. These life-saving machines help severely ill patients breathe, and some hospitals are worried they don't have enough. We, we aren't really set up to, to handle such a pandemic where we need many, many more uh, ICU beds. Dr. Thomas Milner with typically the ventilator. works on so medical an ICU bed more. But right now, all of his energy is going to this. It's an alternative type of ventilator made from low-cost, widely available materials. Well, the idea was to use what's called an ambubag. These ambubags are widely available in, in all hospitals all around the world. If we could just replace the human operator with a machine, a, a, a sort of a mechanical arm, and displace it away from the patient, then we might have a solution. Right, so what we did is uh, we used, we thought, well, what's widely available? Well, windshield wiper motors are very widely available. That's right, ventilators made from car parts. Now, our cost right now is between $500 and $700 is, is what it would cost to, to, to make it and, and deliver it. A normal, a normal ventilator will cost you know, $20,000, $30,000. The team is conducting animal testing this week and says these could be deployed for human care as soon as late April. And they're not alone. There are now many companies and institutions getting creative. But how do doctors feel about using these options? With what you know about the realities on the ground, could, could something like this be used and used effectively? 
Some patients need simple intervention from a ventilator, oxygen, with some pressure and flow. Others will not be able to use those types of ventilators. Um, but I think they would have a role if the resources are pushed. The hope is it won't actually come to that. I don't think anyone would want to use these, but if the need comes up, then everyone would like them to be there if, if they're needed. Can you yes. can you speak to what, what it means that, that you know so many people are, are having to come up with these alternative solutions? It shows we're not really ready for the, for the crisis. But recently, models have painted a more hopeful picture. Most institutions are having enough ventilators at this point in time. The emphasis on social distancing has started to bring the curve down a little bit. That's helped. I think the sharing of resources has helped. A concern a lot of us have is that you know this flattening of the curve that's occurring now, what's going to happen a few months from now? Is there going to be a second wave? Food and diaper banks across the country are seeing an unprecedented rise in demand. Their supplies are already stretched thin, and they're not sure when things will get better. NBC News reporter Sarah Doloff has the story. Rush hour reshaped by coronavirus. In Pittsburgh, bumper to bumper traffic for miles, not to get to work, but to get food. I just got laid off. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. 5,000 carloads served by the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank in recent weeks. Drop-ins at the organization's warehouse up 500 percent. In all honesty, and this is uh, not an easy thing as a food banker to say, we know that in this particular crisis that the demand is greater than even our organization can meet. Scenes playing out coast to coast as millions of American families find themselves unexpectedly unemployed and suddenly food insecure. In New York City, soup kitchen lines doubling. Volunteers in L.A. can't fill bags fast enough. And in St. Louis, traffic cops brought in to direct cars waiting not just for meals, but also diapers. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. The St. Louis Diaper Bank usually distributes 200,000 diapers per month. This April, it'll be a half million. You know, we maybe have enough to get through the next week, but then we're going to have to start to get creative about how, how we're going to access those diapers. The pandemic putting unprecedented pressure on American families and the organizations that serve them. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. Nearly 3,000 grocery workers have been directly impacted by coronavirus. 1,500 have tested positive and at least 30 people have died. That's according to the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. It's the nation's largest food and retail union. NBC News tech and business correspondent Jolene Kent is with me now. And Joe, who specifically is most at risk here and what makes these workers so vulnerable? Allison, we're talking about grocery workers on the front lines, working, packing your groceries, restocking the shelves. So many of them now are saying that they really are not adequately protected. And as we've reported before, there's not enough protective equipment out there. But now there's been some new survey data from the union that you just mentioned. 85% of people don't feel like as they work at a grocery store that there's enough social distancing happening on the ground. 62% saying, we're being blamed as workers for the shortages, for the panic buying that's happening out there. So right now, Kroger, the largest grocery chain, is now partnering with the union, and they're now calling on elected officials to come forward and designate grocery workers as first responders. And so that would make them eligible for that critical PPE. Now, just for context, it wouldn't put them ahead of the medical workers who need it, right? But it would give them that much needed priority to better protect them on the job. Joe, are there other things they're looking for, or, or is that really top of the list, getting uh, protective gear and just knowing that when they're there that they're, you know, at least have some sort of protection from what they might be dealing with? Yeah, gear is always front of mind for a lot of the workers I've been talking to, but they also are calling for hazard pay. So many workers feel like they're undercompensated. And if you look at the way that compensation works at grocery stores in particular, oftentimes it's minimum wage or just a little bit above that. So they feel like they're on the front lines doing this work, being out there when so many others are able to stay at home. They're serving the public, right? And so that hazard pay has become a growing call. And not just for grocery workers. This is also a call that's come from delivery workers. 
workers and warehouse workers uh, from all of the places where you're getting stuff online. Yeah. And Joe, I mean, just to remind people, we've seen countless stories uh, across our networks of, you know, grocery store workers being impacted, these folks uh, being affected while they're just trying to do their jobs. And these are not the highest paid folks at many of these companies. Uh, in some cases, they're making minimum wage and putting their lives in danger. Yeah, that's right. And so there is that fact. And then you couple it with the loosening of some CDC guidelines. Last week, the CDC said that if you are an essential worker, which many grocery workers are designated as such by their state, right. that you can return to work within 14 days, not after 14 days, if you're deemed essential and your absence would create a crisis. So the union that represents these millions of grocery workers also saying, look, that is unfair to grocery workers who are even more exposed than the average person. And so that's created some tension as well. But this ongoing demand that you see at the grocery stores is unlikely to end anytime soon with so many states and cities still under these stay-at-home orders. And so grocery workers are really coming forward now. They're taking the brave step of speaking out because they really do think they feel that there needs to be change on a more permanent basis. And they believe that they can help hopefully create some of that. But the frustration is real. The fear is very raw right now. And certainly a lot of pressure on these workers as they try to sustain their health as well as their living. Oh, Joe, I, you know, you just can't imagine what they're going through. Every time you see video of the grocery store, you send a loved one out to go there. We're all just so yeah. thankful for the work those folks are doing, making sure we can still yes. feed our families. Uh, I, I hope they see some of the change that they need mm -hmm. for sure. Thanks, Joe. Absolutely. The market's a little bit more optimistic about the coronavirus outlook today. The Dow up more than 500 points. MSNBC host David Gura joins me now. And David, what is driving the optimism on the markets today? Yeah, you've got investors looking at what we're hearing from public health experts, from government ex experts about where the virus is at this point, seeing a sort of steadying, I think you could say, uh, in some places around the country where we're not seeing as many hospitalizations as we were seeing. Um, the death rate isn't what it was just a few days ago. So some optimism there. It's also the beginning of earnings season. Companies are beginning to report their earnings for uh, the last quarter. Obviously, we're looking at those through a particular lens now, now that this virus is spread around, around the world. But it's giving us some indication of how companies are compensating or preparing to weather this. Uh, as we know, this is going to stretch on for quite a while, Allison. Yeah, David, we did see some big earnings today. Johnson & Johnson, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo. How are those looking so far? And what are they telling us about the coronavirus impact? Yeah, let's tick through those three in particular. And I'll start with Johnson & Johnson. That, of course, is a healthcare company, makes all kinds of stuff. And um, they actually reported good profits in, in the last quarter. What's interesting, when you look at that at a granular level, uh, where people were buying their products, it was happening at the consumer level. A lot of people going out, getting Tylenol and other medications as they worried about COVID-19, worried about getting this virus, worried about preventing that from, from, from becoming an issue within, within their homes. Where you saw a decline from the company's earnings report today uh, was on materials that you would use, that, that healthcare workers would use for elective surgeries. Um, so you're seeing kind of a divide there within mm. that company's product base that tells you a lot about the healthcare industry uh, as a whole. Uh, its consumer side doing fairly well. Uh, the stuff that it produces for elective surgeries, things that you would elect to do under normal circumstances, not so great. So let, let's put that aside now and look at Wells and look at J.P. Morgan, these two big banks. And we've certainly heard a lot about them in these recent weeks that people have begun to apply for these small business administration loans, have been applying for payroll protection as sure. well. Those banks are doing all of that. Uh, what we learned today is they've set aside a whole lot of money to prepare uh, for losses to the tune of many billions of dollars um, just as a buffer. And both of these banks acknowledging in their statements today that that might not be enough money uh, yet. They're worried about people defaulting on loans. They're worried about people defaulting on credit card payments. Uh, so they're preparing for things to, to get a lot worse here. But as we've been discussing over these last few days, um, in doing that, they're also tightening their lending. They're making it a little more difficult for folks to get credit cards, uh, to get loans. Um, they're taking a deep breath here as we, we enter this new territory to sort of figure out how big a hit this is going to take on their companies. And certainly, when you, when you look at sectors that were affected today, there were declines in financials, declines in energy as well, as there's still concern about the oil sector, uh, that having to do a lot here on the banking side with, with what we saw reported today from Wells and J.P. Morgan Allison. 
David, speaking of the big banks, we know Goldman Sachs has been releasing uh, several forecasts on the economic impact of this pandemic, trying to get a handle on how bad it's going to look. Today, Goldman economists said this downtime, downturn rather, will be four times worse than the housing crisis. That is pretty scary. What else are they predicting there? Yeah, that firm has a very strong research department. Jan Hatzius heads, and he wrote this big note today on on global GDP and sort of his forecast for uh, the global economy. You're right. He mentions just a, a real deep dive in, in GDP going forward here uh, globally. He spent a lot of time talking about the labor market as well, and he acknowledged that there are some reasons to be optimistic about that, uh, that you have these new unemployment benefits that were passed by the U.S. Congress, and you have this hope, this optimism that folks who were laid off as a result of this virus early on will maintain some connection to those now past employers. And when things uh, get better, they might be able to get hired at a pretty quick rate. So there's that, talking about the labor market picture, also not into the fact that we've seen some indications that manufacturing in specific, in that sector, uh, car manufacturing companies, for instance, saying they could scale up their production a bit more from where they're at now uh, in these coming days, that engendering some optimism in these Goldman economists. And then they kind of indicated what they're looking for here in the coming days as well. We're going to get some new data from China on the 17th of April. Um, if China rebounds from this better than, than is widely expected, that could be a great thing for the U.S. economy. Uh, and one more thing to note there from that report from Goldman is just how much they've praised the policy effort that we've seen so far here in the United States and indeed globally here in the U.S. You have a lot of fiscal policy, a lot of monetary policy. Uh, Jan Hatzius at Goldman Sachs and his colleagues saying this is a time for governments to do as much as they can to make up, Allison, for what we've seen, the losses that we've seen uh, thus far. It's left this kind of yawning vacuum. Uh, and there's a lot of room for governments, for countries that are in fairly good shape, that have good fiscal policy, monetary policy capabilities to do as much as they can here uh, to sort of fortify the economy as best they can. David, we know it is going to be a long road ahead, but hey, we will take a 500 plus day on the markets uh, in times like this. We'll take it any time, but uh, in times like this, here at least go. we have a little positive today. We'll see if that continues tomorrow. Thanks, David. Thank you, Allison. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now on this Tuesday. Let's head over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is following the latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what's the latest today? Hey, Allison. So lots of headlines. But first, President Barack Obama has endorsed his former VP Joe Biden for president. In a video message, Obama also offered this message of support to everyone dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Please know that you're not alone, because now's the time for all of us to help where we can and to be there for each other as neighbors, as co-workers and as fellow citizens. And let's get to some top line numbers. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases worldwide is inching closer and closer to the two million mark, with the United States now shouldering the highest number of those cases of any other country. The number of coronavirus case deaths in uh, the number of coronavirus deaths in New York state, excuse me, climbed to more than 10,800. That's according to Governor Andrew Cuomo today. President Trump has been adamant he has the authority to open up the country again, while East and West Coast states formed regional packs to coordinate the reopening of their economies. The president told reporters today he was going to make a decision soon and had, quote, tremendous support from governors. But Governor Cuomo today also had this warning. We will have a constitutional crisis like you haven't seen in decades, hmm. where states tell the federal government we're not going to follow your order. From NBC's Stella Kim, South Korea is sending COVID-19 test kits around 750,000 to the United States as the death toll from the virus continues to rise. And some, some states say they are still in short supply. This influx comes just as New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio announced that New York will soon be be begin producing 50,000 of its own test kits every week. That's from NBC's Janelle Griffith. This increased supply will add to the 50,000 test kits already supplied to the city every week by Aria Diagnostics. That's a company based in Indiana. Mayor de Blasio also added, however, that the city's new production capacity, quote, does not let the federal government off the hook. 
And some news on the economy also today to round out our headlines from CNBC's Sylvia Amaro. The International Monetary Fund is saying that the global economy will likely suffer the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. The IMF now expects the global economy to contract by 3 percent in 2020. And just for context, back in January, it had previously predicted the global economy would be would expand by 3.3 percent. So a big difference there, of course, largely in part due to the pandemic. And those are the latest headlines. Allison will be back later later with more. All right, Alexa, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. And you can visit our live blog. That's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus anytime for the very latest updates. Former President Barack Obama endorsed Joe Biden earlier today after keeping a low profile during the Democratic primary. In a sign of the times, Obama announced his support for his former VP on social media, of course, first touching on the coronavirus pandemic. Joe gets stuff done. Joe helped me manage H1N1 and prevent the Ebola epidemic from becoming the type of pandemic we're seeing now. He helped me restore America's standing and leadership in the world on the other threats of our time, like nuclear proliferation and climate change. Joe has the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. And I know he'll surround himself with good people, experts, scientists, military officials who actually know how to run the government and care about doing a good job running the government and know how to work with our allies and who will always put the American people's interests above their own. NBC News White House correspondent Kristen Welker joins me now, home camera to home camera. And Kristen, it was no short video, ran about 12 minutes long. Your major takeaways from President Obama's message. Allison, it is great to see you from my home camera to yours. Couple of big takeaways <laughs> here. This was expected, but this was a full-throated endorsement of his former vice president. We knew it was coming. There was a lot of scrutiny about why President Barack Obama didn't insert himself sooner into this race. Well, if you talk to those who are close to the former president, they say it is critical that Democratic voters were able to choose their own candidate, that Obama didn't want to put his finger on the scales at all, in part because he didn't want to alienate other parts of the electorate who might not be behind Joe Biden right now. So what you saw in that endorsement, Allison, not only that full throated uh, sort of saying, I support Joe Biden, I'm going to stand with him, I'm going to campaign with him. But you also saw Mr. Obama reach out to Bernie Sanders supporters. And that is going to be really critical mm -hmm. because the party believes that's part of what went wrong in 2016, that they did didn't do a good enough job, Hillary Clinton, former President Obama, of reaching out to and winning over those Sanders supporters. And it's not just Sanders supporters, it's Elizabeth Warren supporters as well. So all of that is going to be critical. And then you have cursed, heard a not so subtle swipe at the current commander in chief, Mr. Obama, not mentioning President Trump by name, but he did say this, Allison, quote, one thing everybody has learned by now is that the Republicans occupying the White House are running the U.S. Senate, are not interested in progress they're interested in power. He tried to pit Biden against Trump, essentially casting him as a leader who would lead from science, from facts, and then to try to make the counterpoint that he believes that is not the way that President Trump is leading through this crisis. And make no mistake about it, Allison, as you pointed out, his endorsement started by talking about the coronavirus crisis. He is going to make the argument on the campaign trail, if he does in fact get to go out on the campaign trail, that that this is a critical moment and it requires leadership and that his former vice president is the right person to lead the country through this very difficult moment, Allison. Kristen, you talked about why President Obama perhaps waited uh, to endorse uh, his former VP. Do we know why, though, he picked uh, today specifically why on this Tuesday this was the day that he decided to back Joe? It's a really good question. We know that former President Obama has been engaged for quite some time now in a lot of the discussions that are going on behind the scenes. So that means he's been in very close contact with Bernie Sanders and his campaign. He's been in close contact with Joe Biden. And there was a real sense that it was important for Senator Sanders to come out and to endorse 
Biden first. There was a choreography to these endorsements that we have seen this week. There is no mistake that Mr. Obama endorsed Biden one day after Sanders did, but he really felt as though it was necessary for Sanders to endorse first. But think about what we saw back in 2016. It took Sanders over a month to endorse Hillary Clinton. In this instance, only a few days. Why? Well, if you talk to those who are close to both men, they say that Sanders and Biden have a very different relationship than Sanders had with Hillary Clinton, that the two are actually close. And so this is going to be a different type of passing of the baton, if you will, that Bernie Sanders is planning to uh, campaign for former Vice President Joe Biden in a very vigorous, full-throated way, and that that's part of the rollout that we saw this week. So you had the Sanders endorsement followed by former President Obama. They felt as though that was the strongest way to make the case to the party that it's time to come together, Allison. Kristen, great background there. Thank you so much. I know a lot of people were curious about why this all happened Thank on a you. Tuesday. Uh, so thanks for filling us in and hope you and your family are staying safe. Hope you and your family are safe too, Allison. It's always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Governor Cuomo says New York is flattening the coronavirus curve with hospitalizations trending down, but the death toll in the state's still rising. It's now well past 10,000. Preliminary data in New York City shows this pandemic is disproportionately hurting minority communities. The city is opening five new testing areas to try to combat that racial disparity. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen joins me now from one of those testing sites. It's in Brooklyn. Ron, figures data showing us that the virus is killing black and Latino people in New York City at twice the rate of white people. How will these new testing sites help the most vulnerable? Well, the short answer is that the sites are in the neighborhood, so they're accessible. They're right where people are. And in mm -hmm. addition to what the city's doing, the state has also set up a number of testing sites like the one behind me. One concern that a number of community leaders have pointed out to me, though, is that it's a drive up center. You have to have a car. And this is a neighborhood, a community where overwhelmingly people don't have transportation to get here. So people have been walking up on occasion and they've frankly been turned away. Uh, you also need an appointment here. And so people are trying to become familiar with the process and how you do this and how you can get a test. But the bottom line is that they're trying to bring the health care system to communities where there hasn't been a lot of health care, where people don't have insurance, where people don't have doctors, where people don't have the means to, to take care of themselves better, and where there are underlying illnesses like asthma, heart disease, lung disease, uh, obesity, that in fact make the coronavirus worse if in fact you get it. So that's basically the approach. Take the health care to mm -hmm. the people who need it most and, and give them access to it. Allison? Ron, I know earlier you spoke with the state representative about testing availability. We want to play a bit of that. Do you overall, do you think there is enough testing happening at, at availability? I don't think there's enough testing and availability. I mean, the fact of the matter is um, most people here have been exposed. And the right way to do this is to test everybody. Mayor de Blasio says the city will manufacture its own testing kits. What kind of impact will broader testing have on the city? Well, the mayor announced that the city is going to make its own testing kits. He also announced a deal with a biotech firm in Indiana that's going to provide the city with 50,000 tests per week. Now, and he also went on, a, went on to, just, to continue to criticize the federal government for not stepping in and providing testing that's been requested from the start of this whole crisis. He also said that trying to do this by shopping the international supply markets has been just frustrating and hasn't gotten it done. You know, the whole idea behind testing is that you'll be able to tell who has the illness and who doesn't, who can go back to work and who cannot, presumably as well. It's, it's information, information's power, and of course that's just the diagnostic test. The other test that we're trying to, that's trying to get here in New York City is this test for plasma, this, uh, this test for antibodies that will determine who, put, who has survived the illness essentially, uh, who has recovered from the illness, and who potentially can be a, something of a donor to people who are ill with their plasma and antibodies to help them recover. That's a short time away, we're told, but of course, 
the leaders here in New York want to get these things up to scale. They want to see thousands and thousands, if not millions and millions of these tests happening. And um, that seems to be one big area of disconnect between Washington and New York in that when asked about testing, the president often says, well, we've tested more people than anybody else, so on and so forth. But I think here the feeling is that may be true, but we still have a really long way to go in terms of the amount of testing that the local leaders here think should happen before people will not only go back to work, but feel confident enough to go back to work or send their kids to school or whatever. And so we're not really anywhere near where the amount of testing should be, according to most local officials here, uh, the mayor, the governor, and others, who are, who are much more cautious in talking about reopening than what we're hearing down in Washington. Allison? Ron, New York City is also launching a $10 million ad campaign to slow the spread of the virus in hard-hit areas. What's that campaign focusing on? What do we know about it? Again, it's another example of how the, the, the city, the state are trying to get into the communities that have been hardest hit by the virus. As I understand it, the, the campaign is going to happen in multiple languages, as many as 12 or 50 different languages. And I think there's going to be a big social media component to it. While talking to some of the local officials here during the day, they emphasize that they're trying to get the word out through social media to people in the community that this testing center and other health care services are available. There's, there's a disconnect between the community and, and the health care that's available to them for, for myriads of reasons, everything from distrust to, to immigrant communities where people live in the shadows and don't want to become very public and very visible. They're, they're leery of, of other problems that they may encounter. So the public service campaign is designed to try and break through some of that because, as you heard the state representative say, she thinks that just about everybody in areas like this have been exposed to the virus in some way or another. Um, we've heard that from the beginning of this whole crisis about a month ago. It's a very dense community. People live in multi-generational houses. People, uh, you know, working class people who have to go out and work and work in other people's homes and work close by. It, it's, it's very dense in the streets, not here, but, but it's generally a very dense place. And, and that's what's ignited the problem. So the public service campaign, the opening up of more test sites like this one, uh, are all designed to try and bring health care and bring the message to these communities that have been so badly and disproportionately hit. Allison? Ron Allen, thank you so much for being with us. Please stay safe out there. Doctors in Atlanta are prescribing an experimental treatment for coronavirus patients. It's an antiviral drug called remdesivir, and it was first given to Ebola patients. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello is here with us now. And Tom, what can you tell us about this particular trial? So uh, this is a, a drug that is showing real promise. Now, to be clear, this is not a vaccine. This is a treatment, a therapeutic for somebody who already is sick. And doctors at Emory University in the ICU are now prescribing remdesivir. It's part of an NIH study involving more than 400 people around the world, mostly in the United States, but also in Europe and Asia. And they want to find out if they are seeing significant results within the first 30 days. And the good news is they are. They're seeing very good results. And as a result, within the next few weeks, this could be prescribed as a frontline go-to treatment for hospitals in the United States. This is an NIH double blind study. What does that mean? This is the gold standard for studies. It means that both the patient and the doctor do not know if the patient is getting a placebo or the real thing. But the results so far, according to the doctors we've talked to, seem to be very positive. And they're hopeful that this will be rolled out as a frontline uh, therapeutic uh, in the coming weeks. Now, if they do, in fact, get approval in the coming weeks, then they would try partnering remdesivir with another drug to see if they can make it even more effective. And so that would be, become the next drug trial. But remdesivir was originally an Ebola drug. And so they know, having already done the background for Ebola, they know it's safe. They know that these side effects are really pretty minimal. So the question then becomes, well, how effective is it for treating uh, COVID-19? We talked to one of the patients who was not in the NIH study, but a patient at a Washington State Hospital who was in very serious condition. He was struggling to breathe. He was in the ICU. They gave him remdesivir really on an emergency, compassionate use basis. 
And within 48 hours, he was bouncing back, uh, and dramatically so. And and his wife says, listen, we, we are firm believers that uh, this drug is really what saved his life. So according to Gilead, which is the company that makes the drug, they have now had okay. 1,600 people use the drug. Now, we don't know what le- what uh, rate of efficacy, how, how many of those people had a successful outcomes. But the bottom line is they've had now 16 or 1,700 people use the drug. It's now in the NIH study, and, and they believe that it's showing promise. And so we could have this now as a frontline drug within the next couple of weeks. And if it is approved, Allison, and this is critical, Gilead says they have one and a half mm-hmm. million doses or doses for one and a half million people to go. Uh, very no, sorry, let me scratch that. Let me say it again. They have enough for 140,000 people to go uh, immediately, and then they they would have half a million uh, by October. In other words, enough for half a million by October. So they are very encouraged by this. Researchers so far are cautiously optimistic. Can I take a minute and tell you this is not. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. And you know, the president has talked a lot about chloroquine, and he believes that this could be something that would be very effective for people to take chloroquine. There have not been any formal FDA or NIH studies on chloroquine. There was a Brazilian study just done, and they canceled the study early because they were finding some of their patients were developing irregular heart arrhythmias, as well as heart attacks and dying. So they canceled the study on chloroquine in Brazil. It is being used. It's being tried in some New York hospitals. It's being tried in South Dakota. But there is not a formal FDA or NIH study on this. And so we really don't have a good feeling for how safe or effective it is, other than the warning signs right now out of Brazil. And in fact, researchers at Emory said they've been concerned about heart arrhythmias with chloroquine. So that is a separate therapy, a separate drug from remdesivir which is showing promise. Allison? Tom, great to hear uh, that they are so optimistic about remdesivir and that if it is, in fact, uh, you know, a possibility that we could see it in a matter of weeks, uh, wonderful news that there could be a potential treatment on the horizon. Tom Costello, thank you so much. Louisiana is a coronavirus hotspot here in the U.S. There are more than 21,000 cases confirmed in the state. Yesterday, the governor closed schools through the rest of the year. And on top of all of that, Louisiana is now dealing with the aftermath of some devastating storms that rolled through over the weekend. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Catherine O'Neill joins me now from Baton Rouge. And Dr. O'Neill, if you could just describe for us, what is it like right now at your hospital? Thanks, Allison. It's an interesting time at the hospital. We did see a decrease in cases admitted to the hospital over the weekend. We do see that most holidays that even the sickest of the sick choose to stay home over a holiday weekend. And we saw those cases increase again on Sunday night. What we found is that uh, this leveling that we think we're seeing is not the happy end of the curve that that you see when you put a picture of a of a curve up. And in fact, the leveling almost seems like we're just at a plateau. So the hospital continues to get busier we are starting to see some people get better and try to get home, but our nursing homes are, are limited in who they can take. So the hospital's full. Um, our nursing staff have been doing this for a while now, and, and you're starting to see some fatigue set in. Uh, we are, we're not seeing a decline. We're seeing more of a leveling. We're also seeing, concerningly, uh, an increase in our number of non-COVID positive patients who are sick from not getting the great best care in the last 30 days. So people who needed surgery, People with diabetes, people who have osteomyelitis, people who have been on long-term infusions, those people are coming into the hospital because they need care and they need it now. Um, And so that's also filling up our hospital beds. Just to ask you a little bit more uh, about the curve, Uh, we know over the weekend, Louisiana uh, as a whole saw its smallest increase in coronavirus cases yet. I know you were describing what you have been seeing at your hospital. Do you think that the curve in the state, though, is starting to flatten? We don't feel that um, as much as we would like. As I said, we we saw this huge peak in cases and and a sustained number of cases the week before Easter. And then over the Easter weekend, we did see less patients, but it doesn't feel like those patients are are truly, that less people are getting sick. It does feel like there's a little bit of of just a, a sustained force out there that's slowly coming in. 
Okay. Uh, we know Louisiana has the fourth highest rate of new HIV infections in the country. Mm -hmm. Is that population at a particularly high risk of getting COVID-19? And, and how should that be addressed? We haven't seen our HIV population here in Louisiana have a disproportionate number of cases that have been admitted. Uh, I do attribute that to our early detection system that we put in years ago that's, that's mm -hmm. helped our case rate decrease. And also those patients get into care very quickly. And on medication and doing well, I think that they're surrounded by their healthcare team and that's protected them in New Orleans. Our colleagues in New Orleans have also said that they're not seeing our HIV population being disproportionately affected, which is phenomenal. I think that um, what we do see, and I think that you mentioned it earlier in your conversation about New York, that we're still seeing a disproportionate number of people from our areas that don't have great health care. And so when you look around our ICU, um, we are seeing that those same effects here in Louisiana, people who don't have great access to care, people who don't have great access to nutrition, people on, who live in the poverty line and below the poverty line, those are the people who we're seeing disproportionately admitted to the hospital. What do you think the state can do to help those folks? Uh, you know, Ron Allen, uh, one of our reporters, was telling us here in New York uh, they're trying to do testing, but he said, unfortunately, uh, it was drive through testing, and a lot of people in these areas don't have cars, and so it's not as helpful as they would hope it would be. Are there things that you say, you know, in Louisiana, we could really use this, this, and this, and it would help those communities that are being hit the hardest? We have access to care in those communities. The government here in Louisiana has kept a lot of outreach clinics in those communities for a long time. What we don't have is enough testing, and that's for every community in Louisiana. We don't have great access to outpatient test kits, and until we do, I can't test people anywhere in the city, much less in my areas that I'm most concerned about. Uh, one last question for you. We know the Florida Surgeon General said that social distancing might be necessary until we have a vaccine. We have heard a vaccine could be a year, uh, 18 months away at best. What is your take on that? You know, Allison, I think we're going to be social distancing for a really, really long time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to keep schools closed until a vaccine comes. We're not going to be able to keep our businesses closed until a vaccine comes. So instead, we're going to have to be incredibly responsible citizens as we open back up. And social distancing is a huge part of that. Our life won't look the same, but we will have to start back and do some of the things that we need to do to educate our children, to provide health care to all of those people, which is I guess my biggest concern this week is how are we making sure that we're providing adequate health care to everyone else that doesn't have coronavirus and then getting our economy back up and going? We all want to do that. We just want to do it really safely. Such unbelievable challenges. Dr. O'Neill, I know so many people said, goodness, I, I never, this is something I never thought I'd see, a situation I never thought I'd be dealing with. I can only imagine you are experiencing that a hundredfold in your hospital. Thank you for the work that you're doing, and thanks for taking a little bit of your time to come and talk with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate it, Allison. Have a good day. Stay safe. You too. And a quick programming note for you tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team for a live primetime special on the coronavirus pandemic. That's tonight at 10 p.m. And you can watch it right here on NBC News Now. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard. We bleed. We sweat. We cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Testing, testing, testing. Experts say that is the key to reopening the country, and it includes rapid coronavirus tests, antibody tests, and contact tracing. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz joins me now. And Gotti, could you go through these different types of tests one by one and sort of explain what they do and why they're essential in getting our country back up and running? Yeah, sure, Allison. Well, the one that everybody's talking about right now in California, there's a lot of excitement over, is the antibody test. It's all about these antibodies uh, that could possibly make you immune to COVID-19. In fact, this blood drive down here in Los Angeles, right now the Red Cross is specifically looking for people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have those antibodies to give plasma so that that plasma can be studied to see if it works in treating people with COVID-19 uh, among the people that have maybe the worst uh, case scenarios. Uh, but how do you find those antibodies? That requires testing. And California is hoping to ramp up wide-scale COVID-19 antibody testing. Uh, those tests are extremely easy. Anytime you see on uh, the screen somebody that is pricking their finger and putting that blood uh, into something that looks almost like a pregnancy test, uh, that is an antibody test. And then minutes later, uh, those tests are very quickly at processing the results. You find out if your immune system has already encountered COVID-19 and built up the specific antibodies to fight it. Uh, when it comes to the other tests, the nasal tests, those take a, a little bit longer to process those results. We've seen the backlog in, in processing those results, and they only tell you if you have COVID-19 at that moment. They don't really tell you uh, if you have antibodies and you've had it in the past. So it's really, uh, if you have the virus in your body at that moment, uh, that test will show up uh, positive. So far, USC, Stanford, and uh, UCLA has been testing uh, pretty big chunks of the population, uh, but nowhere near what needs to be tested uh, for uh, things to go back to normal. We're only talking about maybe five, 6,000 people in uh, California. USC and Stanford testing the general population as a whole, looking for asymptomatic carriers, while UCLA is studying specifically healthcare workers, hoping to build almost super soldiers uh, that can know that they are immune from COVID-19 when they go into work and give them a little bit of peace of mind. Uh, but again, the big increase in testing that we've been hearing uh, across the board uh, has to happen uh, soon before things can go back to normal. 
it, it, it's it's really difficult to see how many people may be immune and could effectively go out to work w- without the results from those tests. Uh, we've also just heard from Governor Gavin Newsom. He was putting together a list of musts, really, before things can uh, resume and business can reopen here in California. Uh, the things he was talking about, testing and tracing, isolation of the cases uh, that, uh, that are out there and surveillance. Also protecting vulnerable populations and finding uh, and, and finding out where those populations are. So whether that's immune compromised uh, people or people that might live in retirement homes. And, and finally, making sure people keep wearing their masks. That's something that we're most likely going to see for the foreseeable future. And he was also talking about before we reopen business, we almost need to reimagine the way businesses work. So that may mean uh, tell more telecommuting figuring out the way people sit in bars, figuring out uh, how many people are allowed in things like restaurants. So it's going to be a gradual return to normalcy, uh, nothing that is going to be like a light switch on things going back to normal right away. And we are still quite a ways away from that. Allison? Got it. One quick question before you go. Do they have a sense of how accurate these tests are so far? Because I think people would love it if they could uh, you know, get a test and know if they're immune. But you want to be sure, of course, that they're accurate. Well, it, it all depends on where you're getting that test. Right now, it's only academic uh, studies mm-hmm. that seem to be doing the, the bulk of the testing, especially here in California. And, and so it's USC, Stanford, and uh, UCLA. And, and their uh, blood tests are, are going to be extremely accurate, and, and they're going to be double, triple checked. However, we've seen this type of testing before in South Korea. And in South Korea, there have been some false positives, false negatives, uh, the kinds of things that, that raise some concerns. Concerns. Those are something uh, that the FDA has been examining. So before we see that wild, wide scale testing uh, here in the United States where everybody may be able to go get an antibody test, we're going to have to see a rigorous uh, a study on those tests. And it's going to have to go through a, a lot of different uh, loops here in the United States before they, they are uh, made available to the general public. All right, Gotti Schwartz in L.A., thanks so much for being with us and for the update. Appreciate it. Apple and Google out with more details on their plans to make contact tracing available through smartphone technology. But there are some privacy concerns here. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins me now. And Sam, could you walk us through what this technology does and what the privacy or the main privacy issues are? Allison, good afternoon. It's pretty apparent that both Google and Apple are trying to allay people's fears right now and demonstrate the fact that there's nothing to be concerned about when it comes to privacy. They say that this system will not function unless they make sure that there is no compromising of privacy. So let's get into a couple of those elements. One of them is an explicit ex- consent agreement, which means that you can't just all of a sudden have it pop up onto your phone. You have to opt in for it. The other thing is it's Bluetooth technology, which is the same kind of thing you use on your phone when you're trying to find your wireless speakers or headphones or to connect to your car. In this case, instead of looking for those things, your phone is looking for other people. Now, it's not GPS information, Allison, so there's not going to be a direct pinning down of where you are at all times or a database of your movements and locations. That was one point these companies really tried to to get across, is that you don't need to worry about that. Mm -hmm. Let's get into how this works, though. So I update my operating system on my phone. With the latest version of either an iPhone or an Android, it's going to be compatible for both. They call that interoperability. I do that, and then all of a sudden, my phone is going to be giving off what they call these chirps or beacons, which are unique keys associated with just me. If I come into contact with someone else who has also uploaded this latest operating system, and we get close enough, Allison, where it's a few feet apart, and it's a sustained period of time, that information will exchange. So fast forward now. They go in their direction, I go in my direction, and I find out later that that person tested positive for COVID-19. They have a choice. They would then go onto their phone to their local health agency app, which is going to be working in concert with this, and upload that information. Assuming that they do, all of the other keys that have been associating with or communicating with that phone get an alert. And at that point, Allison, let's say I'm one of those people, if I get an alert, I then need to go to my medical professional or hospital or doctor and talk to them about what's best for me This does not guarantee you're not going to contract the coronavirus. It's not a silver bullet or anything like that. It is meant to try and track to the best of our capabilities who's coming into contact with who anonymously, Apple and Google says, and try to figure out a way to stop breaking the transmission of this virus. 
Sam, it is fascinating technology. Uh, what are privacy and security experts saying, though? Are they concerned about uh, some of those privacy issues that, that you addressed a little while ago? So what's good about that is the fact that it's decentralized. Nothing is stored on, your, on a grand mm -hmm. server. It's all on your phone by and large. But anytime you're talking about a security system of this magnitude and scale, or I should say a tracking system of this magnitude and scale, there are going to be concerns about bad actors getting involved in what they may or may not be able to do with information, even if it is really hard to access. We spoke to the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco, which basically examines the intersection between privacy, technology, and security. Here's what Jenny Gephardt had to tell us. But there are still some concerns kind of at a deeper technical level about use of those keys that will be kind of standing in and rather than, you know, your name or identifying information. There's more questions about what kind of attack someone could use, whether that's, you know, someone who wants to watch the world burn and wants to go trolling or a government entity or any kind of other bad faith attacker. There's questions about how someone could reverse engineer those keys to figure out who you are. So I think it still needs more scrutiny from the security community. Anytime you hear the word reverse engineer or words reverse engineer, that probably makes people get a little bit nervous. But Apple and Google are very adamant about the fact that there is no central storage point for all of this data. So people who, if they're trying to collect the individual data points, the keys, your anonymized information, it's going to be done on a very micro level, not at a large aggregated server. That's what they're telling people right now to try to make sure they're not too worried about uh, what could happen to their information. Sam, do we have a timeline yet for when this will be available? We do. There are two phases right now, Allison. Phase one and phase two. Phase one is going okay. to be about a month from now, the middle of May. Google and Apple say you're going to be able to upgrade your operating system at that point. You would still need to get an app in addition to that. That would be your local health agency app or some mm -hmm. variation thereof. They're going to be customizing them. Um, that would all work in concert. Then at some point down the road, several months perhaps down the road, they're going to be building this directly into the platform itself. So you wouldn't necessarily need to get the app. You could just upgrade your phone, the operating system on your phone, and you would automatically have it. But again, Allison, I can't stress this enough. You have to give consent before you'd be part of this program. A lot of people pleased to hear that, I think, Sam. People don't want to be giving uh, their information away or participating in something unwillingly. Uh, Sam Brock, thanks so much. Great to have you with us. The coronavirus relief bill promised free COVID-19 testing, but some Americans are getting hit with hefty fees after visiting clinics and emergency rooms to get tested. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman takes a look. I don't think $536 is free. Um, I don't know. I'm a grad student, and that's literally two weeks worth of my paycheck. Two weeks of pay for a coronavirus test, the one that's supposed to be free anywhere in America, by law, passed by Congress last month as our economy was shutting down. Even earlier, many states had ordered free testing, and some large insurance companies had pledged no costs. But in West Virginia, Anna Davis Abel got a bill anyway. She filmed herself going through a drive through testing site. Oh my God, they just pulled my braid out through my nostril, but it's done. I am now tested for COVID-19. When the bill came, it wasn't for the COVID-19 test itself, but for a whole battery of other tests for things like the flu and adenovirus. With tests in short supply, her doctor had to rule out other things first before she could get a COVID-19 test. The long and the short of it is, the only reason that you had these tests done was because your doctor was concerned that you might have coronavirus and they had to do these tests first in order to get you a coronavirus test, and yet still you got billed more than 500 bucks for it. Yes, if I had not met my deductible or if I'd been paying out of pocket, it would have been $2,000. Aetna's parent company, CVS Health, had pledged to waive copays for all diagnostic testing related to COVID-19. But Anna's doctor told her those initial tests couldn't be billed under the COVID-19 billing code. After NBC News contacted Aetna, the insurer followed up to say it was waiving Anna's costs retroactively. An Aetna spokesman saying that hers was an unusual instance and that our commitment to waiving member costs for testing and treatment related to COVID-19 has not changed. Most people we spoke to did not get charged for a COVID-19 test. And if you've ever been in a U.S. hospital, you know that medical billing is extremely complicated. So maybe those surprise bills that some Americans are getting aren't that surprising. It is now the law that uh, insurance is supposed to cover that test 100 percent. And then if 
you're uninsured, there are different pathways to get to a free test, although you're going to have to sign up for something. But what happens, though, if you go in because you're having symptoms or concerns you need a coronavirus test? They evaluate you for things like the flu, and they determine you don't need a coronavirus test. Right. So then you might get charged for the visit. The law is kind of narrowly written. So they test me for the coronavirus. After that, I started feeling quite a bit better while I was waiting on the results. But anyhow, then two weeks later, I get a bill in the mail for $857. Uh, for lab work. The actual test was $1,143, and my insurance discount got it down to $857. And I had not met my deductible, so I owed $857. My first thought was, ah, they've made a mistake. No mistake. Just like Anna, Ricky got hit with a bill for an upper respiratory panel his doctor ordered before giving him the COVID-19 test. Blue Cross Blue Shield had pledged to cover full testing costs for COVID-19. But a spokesman tells me members can still be charged for other tests their doctor orders. Blue Cross says it's prepared to make changes as necessary to ensure cost isn't a barrier. My immediate response was anger. By the time Melanie Yazzie came down with symptoms, New Mexico had already ordered testing free. Uh, So I drove to the other side of town and I waited for three hours and then I got tested and I drove off and came back home. And I actually got the bill before I got the results (laughs) of my test. Almost 200 bucks. In Yazzie's case, it seems the billing office sent her the bill that should have gone to her insurance company. They're supposedly working it out. I still have no idea uh, if my insurance paid for this 199 or if the state paid for it or how this is being offered for free. And the most important question, uh, what happened with your test? Hopefully it was negative. It was negative. <laughs> yeah, it was negative. I received results maybe five days later. Um And I I breathe a sigh of relief. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Diaper banks across the country are seeing an unprecedented rise in demand. Their supplies are already stretched thin, and they're not sure when things will get better. NBC News reporter Sarah Doloff has the story. Rush hour reshaped by coronavirus. In Pittsburgh, bumper-to-bumper traffic for miles, not to get to work, but to get food. I just got laid off. I'm just a single parent. There's nobody but me. 5,000 carloads served by the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank in recent weeks. Drop-ins at the organization's warehouse up 500 percent. 
in all honesty, and this is uh, not an easy thing as a food banker to say, we know that in this particular crisis, that the demand is greater than even our organization can meet. Scenes playing out coast to coast as millions of American families find themselves unexpectedly unemployed and suddenly food insecure. In New York City, soup kitchen lines doubling. Volunteers in L.A. can't fill bags fast enough. And in St. Louis, traffic cops brought in to direct cars waiting not just for meals, but also diapers. Almost every parent, right, who has to come and ask for diapers, you can feel this and see this just like visceral fear and worry. The St. Louis Diaper Bank usually distributes 200,000 diapers per month. This April, it'll be a half million. You know, we maybe have enough to get through the next week, but then we're going to have to start to get creative about how how we're going to access those diapers. The pandemic putting unprecedented pressure on American families and the organizations that serve them. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. Nearly 3,000 grocery workers have been directly impacted by coronavirus. 1,500 have tested positive and at least 30 people have died. That's according to the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. It's the nation's largest food and retail union. NBC News tech and business correspondent Joe Ling Kent is with me now. And Joe, who specifically is most at risk here and what makes these workers so vulnerable? Allison, we're talking about grocery workers on the front lines, working, packing your groceries, restocking the shelves. So many of them now are saying that they really are not adequately protected. And as we've reported before, there's not enough protective equipment out there. But now there's been some new survey data from the union that you just mentioned. 85% of people don't feel like as they work at a grocery store that there's enough social distancing happening on the ground. 62% saying, we're being blamed as workers for the shortages, for the panic buying that's happening out there. So right now, Kroger, the largest grocery chain, is now partnering with the union, and they're now calling on elected officials to come forward and designate grocery workers as first responders. And so that would make them eligible for that critical PPE. Now, just for context, it wouldn't put them ahead of the medical workers who need it, right? But it would give them that much-needed priority to better protect them on the job. Joe, are there other things they're looking for, or or is that really top of the list, getting uh, protective gear and just knowing that when they're there that they're, you know, uh, at least have some sort of protection from what they might be dealing with? Yeah, gear is always front of mind for a lot of the workers I've been talking to, but they also are calling for hazard pay. So many workers feel like they're undercompensated. And if you look at the way that compensation works at grocery stores in particular, oftentimes it's minimum wage or just a little bit above that. So they feel like they're on the front lines doing this work, being out there when so many others are able to stay at home. They're serving the public, right? And so that hazard pay has become a growing call and not just for grocery workers. This is also a call that's come from delivery workers workers and warehouse workers uh, from all of the places where you're getting stuff online. Yeah. And Joe, I mean, just to remind people, we've seen countless stories uh, across our networks of, you know, grocery store workers being impacted, these folks uh, being affected while they're just trying to do their jobs. And these are not the highest paid folks at many of these companies. Uh, In some cases, they're making minimum wage and putting their lives in danger. Yeah, that's right. And so there is that fact. And then you couple it with the loosening of some CDC guidelines. Last week, the CDC said that if you are an essential worker, which many grocery workers are designated as such by their state, that you can return to work within 14 days, not after 14 days, if you're deemed essential and your absence would create a crisis. So the union that represents these millions of grocery workers also saying, look, that is unfair to grocery workers who are even more exposed than the average person. And so that's created some tension as well. But this ongoing demand that you see at the grocery stores is unlikely to end anytime soon with so many states and cities still under these stay-at-home orders. And so grocery workers are really coming forward now. They're taking the brave step of speaking out because they really do think they feel that there needs to be change on a more permanent basis. And they believe that they can help hopefully create some of that. But the frustration is real. The fear is very raw right now. And certainly a lot of pressure on these workers as they try to sustain their health as well as their living. 
Oh, Joe, I, you know, you just can't imagine what they're going through. Every time you see a video of the grocery store, you send a loved one out to go there. We're all just so yeah. thankful for the work those folks are doing, making sure we can still yes. feed our families. Uh, I, I hope they see some of the change that they need mm-hmm. for sure. The market's a little bit more optimistic about the coronavirus outlook today. The Dow up more than 500 points. MSNBC host David Gura joins me now. And David, what is driving the optimism on the markets today? Yeah, you've got investors looking at what we're hearing from public health experts, from government ex- experts about where the virus is at this point, seeing a sort of steadying, I think you could say, uh, in some places around the country where we're not seeing as many hospitalizations as we were seeing. Um, the death rate isn't what it was just a few days ago. So some optimism there. It's also the beginning of earnings season. Companies are beginning to report their earnings for uh, the last quarter. Obviously, we're looking at those through a particular lens now, now that this virus is spread around around the world. But it's giving us some indication of how companies are compensating or preparing to weather this. Uh, as we know, this is going to stretch on for quite a while, Allison. Yeah, David, we did see some big earnings today. Johnson & Johnson, J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo. How are those looking so far? And what are they telling us about the coronavirus impact? Yeah, let's tick through those three in particular. And I'll start with Johnson & Johnson. That, of course, is a healthcare company, makes all kinds of stuff. And um, they actually reported good profits in, in the last quarter. What's interesting, when you look at that at a granular level, uh, where people were buying their products, it was happening at the consumer level. A lot of people going out, getting Tylenol and other medications as they worried about COVID-19, worried about getting this virus, worried about preventing that from, from, from becoming an issue within, within their homes. Where you saw a decline from the company's earnings report today uh, was on materials that you would use, that, that healthcare workers would use for elective surgeries. Um, so you're seeing kind of a divide there within that company's product base that tells you a lot about the healthcare industry uh, as a whole. Uh, its consumer side doing fairly well. Uh, the stuff that it produces for elective surgeries, things that you would elect to do under normal circumstances, not so great. So let, let's put that aside now and look at Wells and look at J.P. Morgan, these two big banks. And we've certainly heard a lot about them in these recent weeks that people have begun to apply for these small business administration loans, have been applying for payroll protection as sure. well. Those banks are doing all of that. Uh, what we learned today is they've set aside a whole lot of money to prepare uh, for losses to the tune of many billions of dollars um, just as a buffer. And both of these banks acknowledging in their statements today that that might not be enough money uh, yet. They're worried about people defaulting on loans. They're worried about people defaulting on credit card payments. Uh, so they're preparing for things to, to get a lot worse here. But as we've been discussing over these last few days, um, in doing that, they're also tightening their lending. They're making it a little more difficult for folks to get credit cards, uh, to get loans. Um, they're taking a deep breath here as we, we enter this new territory to sort of figure out how big a hit this is going to take on their companies. And certainly when you when you look at sectors that were affected today, there were declines in financials, declines in energy as well as there's still concern about the oil sector, uh, that having to do a lot here on the banking side with, with what we saw reported today from Wells and J.P. Morgan Allison. David, speaking of the big banks, we know Goldman Sachs has been releasing uh, several forecasts on the economic impact of this pandemic, trying to get a handle on how bad it's going to look. Today, Goldman Economist said this downtime, downturn rather, will be four times worse than the housing crisis. That is pretty scary. What else are they predicting there? Yeah, that firm has a very strong research department. Jan Hatzius heads and he wrote this big note today on, on global GDP and sort of his forecast for uh, the global economy. You're right. He mentions just a, a real deep dive in, in GDP going forward here uh, globally. He spent a lot of time talking about the labor market as well. And he acknowledged that there are some reasons to be optimistic about that, uh, that you have these new unemployment benefits that were passed by the U.S. Congress. And you have this hope, this optimism that folks who were laid off as a result of this virus early on will maintain some connection to those now past employers. And when things uh, get better, they might be able to get hired at a pretty quick rate. So there's that. Talking about the labor market picture, also nodding to the fact that we've seen some indications that manufacturing in specific in that sector, uh, car manufacturing companies, for instance, saying they could scale up their production a bit more from where they're at now uh, in these coming days, that engendering some optimism in, in these Goldman uh, economists. And then they kind of indicated what they're looking for here in the coming days as well. We're going to get some new data from China on the 17th of April. Um, if China rebounds from this better than, than is widely expected, that could be a great thing for the U.S. economy. Uh, and one more thing to note there from that report from Goldman is just how much they've praised the policy effort that we've seen so far here in the United States and indeed globally. Here in the U.S., you have a lot of fiscal policy, a lot of monetary policy. Uh, Jan Hatzius at Goldman Sachs and his colleagues saying this is a time for governments to do as much as they can to make up, Allison, for what we've seen, the losses that we've seen uh, thus far. It's left this kind of yawning vacuum. Uh, and there's a lot of room for governments, for countries that are in fairly good shape, that have good fiscal policy, monetary policy capabilities 
to do as much as they can here uh, to sort of fortify the economy as best they can. David, we know it is going to be a long road ahead, but hey, we will take a 500 plus day on the markets uh, in times like this. We'll take it any time, but uh, in times like this, Here at least go. we have a little positive today. We'll see if that continues tomorrow. Thanks, David. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Mars. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's head on over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is following the latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, how about an update? Hey, Allison. So first, the headliner for today, former President Barack Obama endorsing his VP, uh, Joe Biden, for president, saying he believes Biden has the character and experience to, quote, guide us through one of our darkest times. And California Governor Gavin Newsom laid out a plan just earlier today, prerequisites of sorts for hope opening up his state. Newsom said he wanted to follow science, not politics, and laid out six criteria. Those include everything from testing and contact tracing to the ability for businesses, schools, and child care facilities to support physical distancing. Newsom also said residents should expect a, quote, new normal as the state eases restrictions, like having your temperature checked before entering restaurants or avoiding mass gatherings until there's a vaccine. Now from NBC's Shannon Pettipies, President Trump met with COVID-19 survivors today and spoke about reopening the economy as states across the country continue to grapple with a rising number of coronavirus cases. The president yesterday emphasizing his, quote, total authority to lift restrictions, but now offering a different tone. I'm going to be making a decision pretty quickly, and it's being done in conjunction with governors. We have tremendous support from governors, and uh, what I do is going to be done in conjunction with governors. Meanwhile, Dr. Anthony Fauci, the government's top infectious disease expert, is cautioning against the premature reopening of the country. Fauci said the United States doesn't yet have the testing or tracing capacity it needs. Here's what he told the Associated Press in an interview. And I'll guarantee you, once you start pulling back, there will be infections. It's how you deal with the infection that's going to count. And from CNBC's Leslie Joseph and Lauren Hirsch, U.S. airline companies and the Treasury Department have reached an agreement in principle on billions of dollars in assistance as the coronavirus pandemic hammers the industry. A number of United States airlines applied for April uh, for payroll grants that are part of the $2 trillion spending bill passed by Congress last month. Those grants require airlines not to furlough or cut pay for employees until sep September 30th. More details to come on that agreement, uh, I'm sure. But for now, those are the headlines. And Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. And you can, of course, visit our live blog. That's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus for the latest updates anytime. New York City sharply revised its COVID-19 death toll, adding 3,700 probable victims. The total number of deaths in the city now well above 10,000. NBC News correspondent Tom Winter joins me now. And Tom, that is a huge revision. What do you know about it? Yeah, it's it's not so much a, a revision, Allison, per se, as it's an addition. So, you know, as we've reported and, and you and I have discussed over the last week or two, there were a number of people that were uh, dying in the city of COVID-19 or believed to be uh, from COVID-19, I should say, mm -hmm. um, that were not making it to the hospitals. And if they weren't making it to a hospital, then the chances were uh, they weren't being tested. Uh, so what the Office of Chief Medical Examiner and the Department of Health said is, look, we're going to review these deaths because we've got people dying at nursing homes. We've got people dying of, of, uh, of cardiac arrest, but they also had a fever and cough uh, when we sent the ambulance to them. So those cases are probably going to be coronavirus related. And so we need to start to be able to account for that. So we have a full uh, a kind of a full detailing of the scope and extent of the deaths um, from COVID-19. So today, uh, according to a health department document reviewed by NBC News, uh, there's over 3,700 probable coronavirus deaths. Now, uh, the city defines that is essentially the person had the symptoms um, and that on their death certificate, it says coronavirus related. Uh, but they say uh, there, there are no tests that have been done uh, either prior to the person dying or post-mortem tests that have been done uh, to definitively conclude uh, that each one of those deaths uh, is coronavirus related. You know, on top of that, over the past several weeks, there's been uh, 8,800 other deaths in the city. And of course, that would be normal for a city of New York size. Uh, 
um, and, and given just, you know, age and trauma and other incidents and accidents and, mm -hmm. and other sorts of diseases. So uh, they do have a pretty good handle on uh, how many of these people that they say are probable cases uh, really did exhibit those symptoms. So um, that's the latest that we know, and we're waiting for, you know, even further clarification and for more work to be done on the statistics. Uh, but either way, Allison, it takes us over a grim milestone of 10,000 deaths. Tom, you've been reporting daily for us on the situation uh, with the NYPD and the FDNY. Uh, you caught up with an FDNY paramedic about what it's been like during this pandemic. Uh, here's some of what he told you. I'm walking into a house and I'm seeing three or four family members who are all sick. And it's just me and my partner, you know, and I know that the next ambulance can be 10 or 15 minutes away because we're all so strapped. You know, everybody's busy. And so I have to now assess everybody to see who is the sickest and who I'm going to treat first and then work my way down. So we always go to the one who is breathing the hardest, who needs the most care immediately. And then, you know, we'll, we have to then choose who we can take, how many people we can take. Do they need to go to the hospital? Can they stay home? That paramedic is a survivor of the virus himself. What else did he tell you about the toll that it's having on our first responders? Yeah, I think a couple of things, Allison. It was really difficult to hear. First off, his hair is much shorter than it usually is. And that's because he says he recently shaved it. He wanted to have a, a shorter haircut to limit the opportunity for the virus uh, to be kind of stay in their hair when they come home. And on top of that, it makes it much easier for him to put on his N95 mask. So uh, there's real physical changes that these paramedics have to bring to the job. As you said, he did, uh, uh, he did go out sick with all the symptoms uh, that are typical of coronavirus, didn't have the opportunity to be tested. Uh, but what was interesting to me and what was uh, indicative of, I think, of the long-term mental toll, uh, Allison, was that he indicated to me that he was taking additional shifts because he didn't want to be home by himself. So in other words, he goes home from one of these very difficult days, he calls it mentally and physically exhausting, uh, gets home at the end of the day, and instead of being by himself, because, you know, he can't blow off steam. You know, you and I have talked about this before. He can't blow off steam. He can't go visit friends. He, he can't go see family members. He can't maybe uh, go out to eat uh, uh, and just spend some time, um, you know, breaking down the day. It's either work or sit at home and have these thoughts about what he's just had to work with. So he goes to, as he calls it, his second family, Division One, Station 4 of the FDNY EMS to pull more shifts uh, to do his part and also keep his mind off of uh, what he's just seen as he's going back out to see more of these very difficult coronavirus cases. Just unbelievable, uh, the sacrifice he's making and what he's doing uh, for the city. What is the city in turn doing to protect these folks who are, are working so hard to keep our people safe? Well, I think th there's a couple of uh, new bright spots on that front, Allison, which is, of course, great. One, uh, PPE seems to be in decent supply for now. A and I know there's probably some EMTs and paramedics that are going to uh, disagree with that characterization from uh, from the fire department. But the bottom line is, based on the regulations that have been put on the fire department, uh, they have enough supply and they're they're giving them enough to be able to be well within those guidelines. So uh, that's kind of how that's explained. Um, and it's important to remember that some of these PPE decisions that are made by both the FDNY and the NYPD are, in fact, not made by those agencies at all. They're made by uh, regulatory authorities uh, that oversee them or uh, the New York City Department of Health. That's number one. So uh, there is more PPE available. Uh, that's a good sign and something you and I have obviously talked about before. Uh, the second thing is uh, there's going to be more testing. So the FDNY is working with uh, some of the uh, uh, private hospitals as well as the New York City public hospitals uh, to set up testing on a, an appointment basis so that they know you know, we talked about last week how at it, it, any given time, 3,000 members of the FDNY, including firefighters, including EMTs, one out of every four of them, uh, were off the job sick. They want to be able to test those that have been sick so they know with certainty who has had this, assume who might be able to return to work once they're healthy and then be able to go out and treat these patients uh, with maybe a little bit uh, less of a concern on their minds uh, that they're going to get coronavirus because they have definitively gone through it. So that's kind of the next step that's going to be really helpful for them as they try to get back to health 
have their strong numbers uh, to continue to treat people who are uh, in tough shape. Allison, you know, they're still responding to over 200 cardiac calls a day, which is an increase of three to four times over the normal. And uh, approximately 75% of those people uh, end up dying on the call. They're in such bad health. Uh, that's uh, seven to nine times the normal amount of people that die uh, on those type of uh, calls. So they're still dealing with an awful lot. Tom, you brought up testing there. We know Mayor Bill de Blasio is pretty frustrated with the feds today, saying the city is going to start producing its own test kits. What do you know about that plan? Uh, what we know about that plan is that they've they've arranged with a uh, a company to be able to buy 50,000 test kits, and they're also going to start manufacturing the same amount here in New York City and Brooklyn. Uh, what that's going to help is with the testing that we just discussed. And on top of that, um, the city really feels like if, if they're going to reopen, they have to have the ability, particularly as we head into allergy season, uh, you know, folks are going to ha- start to have some of the same uh, symptoms uh, just dealing with the normal allergies as they would with coronavirus. They want to be able to test people and say, OK, who's actually got this? Um, are we seeing any clusters? Is there any sort of spread that we need to be concerned about as the economy, as they try to reopen the economy and get things going? Now, the mayor's already said schools closed for the year. uh, But as the mayor has said and the governor just flat out said today, hey, I'm broke. Uh, New York State is broke. They do need to get some economic activity coming back as long as they can manage the amount of people that uh, may be hospitalized and and may catch this virus. So the testing is a key component of that. If they can ramp up to 50,000 tests um, on, on a on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, uh, which is where they hope they get to, that would be a huge improvement uh, for being able to test people here in New York City, Allison. Tom, a question for you about the governor. Cuomo responded today to President Trump's claim that he has total authority to reopen the country. Here's part of what the governor said today. I put my hand out in total partnership and cooperation with the president. If he wants to fight, he's not going to get it from me, period. This is going to take us working together. We have a real challenge ahead. Just because those numbers are flattening, it's no time to relax. We're not out of the woods. In this reopening, we could lose all the progress we made in one week if we do it wrong. Know about how the governor's planning right now to eventually reopen the state? Right. So we've learned a little bit since yesterday, Allison, and, and the new news uh, today uh, is that he's going to continue to focus and work with governors in other states, adding Massachusetts now uh, to the list of states that he hopes to coordinate with. So basically, you have uh, seven states in this part of the country uh, that are all you know close together. If, if somebody's watching us in Texas, uh, I, you know, if you drive three hours west from Houston in Texas, you're barely in the middle of Texas. <laughs> you're not even close. Uh, if you drive three hours <laughs> west of New York City or three hours east of New York City, you've probably crossed uh, two states at least in, in the meantime, depending upon which way you've gone. So uh, when you look at that, exactly. um, you have to have this type of coordination in this area. And that's something that they're looking to do. They have some specific markers. Uh, New York City, the mayor talking about extensively, and, and now there's data on the city's health department website uh, kind of graphing the metrics of where they think they want to be as far as new cases, uh, as far as hospitalization load. You know, these these coronavirus patients, uh, Allison, spend a lot of time in the hospital uh, to try to get better, and they want to make sure they have that capacity. Absolutely. Tom, you've been uh, updating us on the very latest from uh, New York and the surrounding area for days now. We are grateful for it every day. Really appreciate your reporting. Of course. Thank you. Washington state is joining Oregon and California in a Western states pack, an effort to safely reopen their economies once COVID-19 is better contained. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the details. Allison, three big West Coast states announced they're working together on a common COVID-19 strategy. California, Washington, Oregon, all coordinating a potential response, eventually hoping to get to that point where they can open their economies together in phases and tackle this virus together. Today, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, uh, outlining California's take on that strategy. Earlier, I was speaking to the mayor of 
Seattle, Jenny Durkin, and she was very clear. She said that at this point, they've had some successes, but they're not there yet. They're not ready to reopen the economy here in Washington. Yes, they've succeeded in flattening the curve. They may be even on the downside of that curve, but much more work needs to be done. People need to stay home in order to stay safe. They're doubling down on that strategy for now. She said re reopening the economy at this point would risk another spike greater than the spike they saw before, a potentially devastating blow, she said, to the health care system here in Washington. She wants to see that infection rate get down close to zero and then take a gradual approach going sector by sector. She said, for example, construction is something that could be done at a social distance. She's looking at that. Potentially that would get uh, uh, be reopened first along with some other industries. She said other industries such as restaurants, tourism, she said that will be more tricky considering the safe social distancing practices and regulations that would be required. All of those discussions happening now, but she wants people to continue to stay at home. Allison. President Obama finally stepped off the political sidelines today, endorsing Joe Biden for president in this Twitter video. Joe gets stuff done. Joe helped me manage H1N1 and prevent the Ebola epidemic from becoming the type of pandemic we're seeing now. He helped me restore America's standing and leadership in the world on the other threats of our time, like nuclear proliferation and climate change. Joe has the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. And I know he'll surround himself with good people, experts, scientists, military officials, who actually know how to run the government and care about doing a good job running the government and know how to work with our allies and who will always put the American people's interests above their own. Biden thanked President Obama, tweeting, quote, this endorsement means the world to Jill and me. We're going to build on the progress we made together, and there is no one I'd rather have standing by my side. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli is following the Biden campaign. Of course, he joins me now. And Mike, how big of a deal is this? What does this endorsement mean for Joe Biden? Well, Allison, the way to think about this is the Obama endorsement is sort of the last piece of the puzzle, or at least one of the last pieces uh, for Joe Biden at what is sort of phase one of this campaign. The whole goal is to, at the end of a long primary process, uh, to unite the party behind him so that they can head into the general election together. And o Obama, of course, is a singular figure who can probably help Joe Biden do that best. You heard him in a rather long video, in fact, uh, hit a number of key points, He, as he just played, what, talking about how Joe Biden has the character and the experience to lead the country in what Obama described as one of our darkest hours uh, as a country, of course, with the coronavirus. He also had a lot of praise for Bernie Sanders. We've been talking about the choreography uh, mm -hmm. of the Sanders exit from the race, the endorsement yesterday, and now Obama coming in with his endorsement. Obama saying that while he didn't always agree with Bernie Sanders on certain issues, that they've always um, been you know, real partners in fighting for a more just and fair society. And he didn't mention her by name, but you did hear Obama also talk about the need for big structural change in this country. That's a nod towards Elizabeth Warren. Uh, one of her important messages throughout the campaign was about the need uh, for structural change. And so Warren is one of the last people we expect to hear from in terms of an endorsement uh, of Joe Biden. And we should expect that uh, in the next few days. Uh, but Obama is really the biggest figure here and allows the Biden campaign to now begin to broaden their focus uh, to independent voters and even to potentially trying to attract Republicans in the general election. You mentioned the fact that President Obama was sure to include Bernie Sanders in his message today. Uh, could his endorsement really help sway those supporters to back Biden? Well, I, you know, as you know, Allison, I covered uh, the Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012. Uh, a lot of that time was spent on the Biden plane, but also with uh, then President Obama as well. And what do we think about in terms of what were Biden's strengths and weaknesses in this campaign? Well, one of the biggest weaknesses, of course, was young voters. That's where Bernie Sanders was strongest. Yeah. We also remember that Obama, of course, had a huge following uh, uh, with young voters. So that's probably the single biggest demographic thing that uh, Barack Obama's endorsement can help uh, in terms of winning the Sanders coalition mm -hmm. over. We also have heard from the Sanders campaign, or at least his former campaign, 
uh, about the conversations that are still ongoing between the four Sanders advisors, Biden advisors, about other things in terms of policy that Biden can continue to do to move in a, in a more progressive direction on key areas to the Sanders campaign and especially to younger voters. So uh, Obama, though, is going to certainly help uh, in terms of th that demographic, probably most uh, more than any other. A two-parter for you, Mike. Uh, there have been some longstanding questions about why President Obama didn't endorse Biden earlier on, and now some questions about why was today the day that Obama decided, OK, this is the day that I'm going to speak up. What do you know on both of those fronts? So Joe Biden announced he was running for president a year ago, uh, right around this time, in fact. And the first question he got from a reporter as a candidate for president is, why is Obama not endorsing <laughs> you yet? Uh, and his answer on that day was the same answer he gave every day he was asked that question for the rest of the campaign, because yeah. he did get it a lot, which was, I asked Obama not to endorse me. Uh, he, he said that I need to show Democrats I, I can win this on my own merits. And when you talk to Obama advisors, you hear much the same thing, that when Obama was a candidate in 2008, he actually felt that the long and tough, at times, primary that he ran against Hillary Clinton made him a better candidate in the general election. So he thought, even if Joe Biden wasn't running, Obama was likely not to endorse any of the candidates uh, in that race. And the other part, of course, is what we're now seeing, which is why today? Obama was part of conversations over the last several weeks, in fact, uh, with Bernie Sanders, with Joe Biden, and with their campaigns about how to do what we talked about at the start here, which is bring the party together. And so Obama always felt that his role, the best thing he could do for the Democratic Party was to let the primary process play itself out. And then whoever was the winner, he could be that person who comes in and, and helps bring the party together at the end. Uh, the only other person who could probably do that is Michelle Obama. So we can expect to see her probably mm -hmm. in the coming uh, days as well. Uh, probably maybe something with Dr. Jill Biden. In fact, they were very close friends and partners in the White House for eight years as well. Um, but that's really what the timing was about right now. It's a day a lot of people were waiting for, Mike, and, and you mentioned that partnership of Michelle Obama and Jill Biden. I think a lot of folks will be looking to see when that happens as well. Mike Memley, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Allison. The coronavirus is having a potentially devastating impact on the U.S. food supply. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins me now from Atlanta. And Blaine, you're looking at the meat industry in particular. What is going on there? Yeah, so Allison, we should make it very clear that this, we're talking about COVID-19 cases spreading inside of meat packing plants across the country. So there's certainly some concern about what that could mean when it comes to productivity and ultimately what it could look like when it comes to grocery store shelves and the stock there. So if you're to listen to the warning that's come from one of the uh, CEOs of one of the biggest pork suppliers in the country, this could have a very large impact. Smithfield Foods had to close down its plant in South Dakota. Now, this company is responsible for as much just 5% of the country's pork supply. But after having a number of COVID-19 cases spread there, they are announcing that they are shutting down that plant indefinitely. In fact, we've just learned within the past hour or so that the CDC is sending a team in to try and investigate, try and figure out exactly what's happening there. But let me read you this very ominous statement from the Smithfield Food CEO. Here's what he said. He said, the closure of the facility and other similar closures around the country is pushing our country perilously close to the end in terms of the meat supply. He's warning that eventually you could start to see a rather large impact on grocery store shelves, Allison. Some scary news there. Blaine, I know you also spoke with workers at a food plant in Georgia. What are they telling you about the working conditions where they are? Yeah, so there have been a number of places around the country that we've heard stories from, certainly the one in uh, the Smithfield plant there in South Dakota. We know that a Colorado plant is shutting down a beef facility because of the spread of COVID there. And then here in Georgia, down in South Georgia, in Camilla, Georgia, a Tyson Foods uh, plant is closed down temporarily over the weekend after four employees died from COVID-19. Now, I spoke with several employees who worked wow. there. They did not want to go on camera. They were concerned about losing their jobs. But they said that, quite frankly, they're terrified to go to work. They described standing shoulder to shoulder on the line. Uh, one worker told me that she feels like she's risking her life, putting herself and her family at risk because they're so close and they don't know who's sick. So we've been reporting on this uh, specific plant since last week, Allison. We talked with Tyson Foods. They told us 
that they have made some changes. In fact, they sent us a photograph that shows plastic partitions kind of dividing the workers on the line. And again, they closed down that facility for 48 hours so that they could deep clean it. That's something that they've done before. But the union rep for that area and for a number of other plants says that is not enough. Here's a little bit of our conversation. Take a look. How many workers at those plants have been reaching out to you with concerns? Every facility. They're fearful of taking this home to their family. Some companies have put measures in place. Are those measures enough? I don't think they are. If we can protect workers from when they walk in the door and when they walk out, that company has done what they need to do. So that was Edgar Fields. He represents not only workers at that Camilla, Georgia plant, Allison, but at plants around the southeast. And I asked him, what exactly do they want to see? What types of measures? And he says what he wants to see specifically in those poultry plants is for them to slow down the line. That would allow workers to more properly distance. Now, he said, of course, he admitted that would take a hit on productivity. But he said that the alternative to that is having more and more workers continue to get sick, sick. And some workers like the ones that he's spoken to and the ones that talked to me who were just too terrified to go to work uh, in the first place, Allison. Oh, really a a terrifying situation for them. We can understand why they're nervous about going to work. Blaine, uh, thank you for reporting on what's going on in the meat industry. Important stuff to know. Who, if anyone, is immune to the coronavirus? A study in Michigan is trying to figure that out. The Beaumont Health Hospital System is testing blood samples from its 38,000 employees for antibodies. Beaumont Health Director of Infectious Diseases Research, Dr. Matthew Sims, is joining me now. And Dr. Sims, could you tell us a little bit more about this study? Sure. Um, We've been planning this study for about three weeks now. We have obtained uh, equipment that will allow us, when we're at full blast, to run about 10,000 samples a day. Um, And we are offering this study right now to our employees, uh, of which we have 38,000, as well as other uh, private practice physicians who are affiliated and working in our hospitals, and they are NPs and PAs. And the idea is to look at our entire health system to see who uh, may have already been infected with the virus, and who may have antibodies, Mm -hmm. and then try to figure out, if you have antibodies, does that mean you're immune to reinfection and thus safe to go back to work? For viewers of ours who are thinking, my goodness, I have heard a lot about these antibody tests lately, but I don't exactly understand what that is and why it might be so helpful in combating the coronavirus. Could you explain a little bit more about what exactly an antibody test is, if this is new language for people? Sure. Um, Antibodies are what the body makes to fight off infection. So when you get a viral infection, Uh, Your body makes an antibody to fight it off, and then it makes a second type of antibody to give you long-term resistance or immunity to that infection. This is the way vaccines work. They trigger you to make an antibody. Um, And that's why um, when you have certain viruses, they give you lifelong immunity, like chickenpox. Once you've had chickenpox, you shouldn't get chickenpox Mm. again. Other things, you know, like tetanus, you need to get a booster every so often to keep it active. Um, we don't know yet with coronavirus, do you make, how many people make the antibody when they're exposed? And then if they have the antibody, will it keep the virus away? And if so, how long will it last? And these are the things that this study is trying to answer. So if you have antibody, we're going to follow people who have antibody and who don't have antibody forward to see whether or not any of them get infected with coronavirus. And if we find that only people who don't have antibody get infected, and the people who do have antibody, none of them get infected, that tells us that the antibody protects them. And then we're also going to follow them forward to see how long do those antibodies last. Because, like I said, for chickenpox, they last forever. But for the common cold versions of the coronavirus, they tend to go away in a few months. For something like SARS, a more serious coronavirus, it seemed to last for about two or three years. Now, this one we may find less like SARS, but if the virus is circulating in the community, you may get what's called natural boosting, which helps keep it around. Um, And that's something we see with a lot of other uh, viral infections. I know this is just at the study phase right now, but when do you expect that an antibody test like this might be available for everyone? Sure. So um, 
we have the system. We're going to be running the study first. We want to find out what these antibodies mean. As, when, when, as I said, the system can run, when we're at full capacity, 10,000 tests a day. Um, each person takes two tests. Um, so we can run 5,000 people a day uh, with the systems that we have installed. Um, once we're done with the primary part of the study, we're going to start opening it up in other ways. Now, exactly how we phase that in, that's to be decided. We're talking about potentially helping other healthcare systems figure out, are there people at risk? We're talking about, um, you know, maybe first, uh, um, you know, the first line uh, people, the police officers, the uh, paramedics. Um, we're talking about just opening it up to let uh, doctors order the tests for their patients. We haven't decided exactly what the most appropriate way to open it up is, but in the not too distant future, we do plan to open it up. Again, exactly how much and uh, how fast um, and for who, that's yet to be decided. Dr. Sims, it is fascinating work that you're doing, and I know a lot of people are hoping that these antibody tests uh, can help us to become safer uh, and to learn more, uh, uh, you know, about our immunity so that we can get people back out into the world uh, in a safe way uh, as this pandemic uh, starts to come under control. So thanks so much for telling us about it. I know a lot of our viewers have had a lot of questions. Thank you. Sure. Happy to help, and thank you very much for having me. And a quick programming note for you tonight, join Savannah Guthrie, Hoda Kotb, and the NBC News team. They'll be doing a live, time, a live primetime special, rather, on the coronavirus pandemic. That is tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific, right here on NBC News Now. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News. We're here for them. We are the community. It's definitely good to hear. You always want to hear that the wages are going up. We work hard, we bleed, we sweat, we cry when it comes to these cars. Without this pill, we die. He's doing the best he can for the country, and they're getting in the way. We're going to build the wall. We have no choice. This is an emergency. There are zero hours left to take action. Because we're incarcerated doesn't mean that we should lose our right to vote. This is the perfect time to graduate. There's like a lot of shooting happening. These are thoughtful voters who, more than anything, want these candidates to cut to the chase. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? 
NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. State and local governments have taken the lead on the coronavirus response. Many of them issued stay-at-home orders before the federal government released its national guidance. But now President Trump says he has total authority over when those restrictions will be lifted. The president of the United States has the authority to do what the president has the authority to do, which is very powerful. They can't do anything without the approval of the president of the United States. But uh, the authority of the president of the United States having to do with the subject we're talking about is total. We're going to write up papers on this. It's not going to be necessary because the governors need us one way or the other. NBC News political reporter and friendly fact checker Jane Tim joins us now for a fact check and maybe even a little civics lesson, too. Uh, Jane, I'd like to start by playing a clip of New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. He responded to the president today. The president said last night that he has total authority for uh, determining how and when states reopen. That is not an accurate statement. The federal state relationship is central to our democracy. Uh, this is basic federalism, the role of the states and the role of the federal government. So, Jane, who's right here? Who knew federalism would be such an exciting topic this week? But Governor Cuomo is what he said <laughs> is, is, is what is a fact. He called it his opinion in his press conference, but uh, he is the one who controls whether New Yorkers are asked to stay home. He is the one who set the fines. The governor is and the local authorities are the ones that can say, you must stay at home and we're going to charge you if you violate these orders. The president doesn't have the ability to change anything about New York's order or any other state for that matter. And it's the governors who, who were forced into this position, in part because the president was really uh, slow by many people's take to, to, to make these orders and put in these guidelines. And in the beginning, they sort of encouraged social distancing. A stay-at-home order was pretty slow. And most legal scholars do not think that the president could enforce people staying home, enforce this kind of inactivity. And we call legal scholars, my colleague Pete Williams and I, to say, you know, can the president do this? Is this governors of the state. And they said, you know, it's if it's not in the Constitution and Congress hasn't given them the law, the president can't do it. We're under national stay at home guidelines here until April 30th, but those are just guidelines. And they start with the phrase, listen to and follow the directions of your state and local authorities. Just to be very clear here, if the president wants to reopen the economy before the states do, could he overturn those state orders? Absolutely not. He could probably do things like open airports that maybe, uh, but even those are still open. So the president really can't uh, undo what governors have done. He can he has a lot of sway. He has a lot of influence. If you've ever watched the president talk while the stock ticker is going, you know that what he says matters, but it doesn't change an order that is being enforced by local authorities. All right, Jane, we've all had a lot of questions these days, particularly on uh, what's fact, what's fiction. Thank you so much for clearing that up for us today. Great to see you. Thanks, Allison. Doctors in Brazil are working around the clock to stop the spread of COVID-19, but many of them are saying that their own president is undermining their efforts. NBC News correspondent Willem Marx joins me now. And Willem, you've been speaking with doctors in Brazil who are treating these sick patients. How are they describing conditions inside their hospitals? Hey, Alison. Yeah, I've been talking to lung specialists, emergency room doctors, intensive care specialists over the last week or so right across the country in some of the big cities and some of the smaller towns in Brazil. And a lot of them have said they feel under a huge amount of pressure. They're expecting a massive surge in patients. They've already seen the largest number of deaths there in Brazil of all of Latin America. In terms of the intensive care units, that's what we've been focused on around the world. Some of them saying they're two or three times busier than they used to. They don't necessarily have enough ventilation machines and they're having to make decisions already, like we've seen in countries like Italy, about who is best suited to get onto ventilation and when. The challenge as well also around protective equipment and, of course, access to testing. So a lot of the doctors concerned about the current situation. Doctors are saying that the public uh, is getting mixed messages from Brazil's president. What is he saying to them? 
So he's a man that is a noted skeptic when it comes to science. He's someone that's not a big fan of the concept of climate change, for instance. So we've seen the impact that's had on the Amazon rainforest, for one thing. And over the last couple of months, he's been incredibly skeptical about this coronavirus pandemic. He originally, back in early March, described it as grippagenia, a mild flu. Some of the doctors I spoke to described that speech as catastrophic because what it did was undermine the guidance from his own government's health ministry about staying at home, about quarantining people, about self-isolation. He, over the last few weeks, has been seen out and about on the street, going to grab a coffee from a local bakery, taking selfies with his supporters. And it meant that over the course of this weekend, Human Rights Watch came out with a report blasting him for sabotaging the country's efforts to try and end the scourge of COVID-19. I had a chance to, to catch up with the country director for Human Rights Watch in Brazil, Maria Laura Carino, and I asked her whether she thought the image of a, a leader, a president like Jair Bolsonaro, walking around the street, catching you know, people's hands, grabbing a coffee, would have a difficult and dangerous consequences for his country's already fragile health care. Here's, here's what she said. When a leader, the leader of uh, Brazil, doesn't comply with all the recommendations, uh, it makes people believe that they can also do the same. And that uh, especially his more radical followers, uh, which have questioned all the, even what the media has been saying uh, in, in relation to what people should be doing to avoid that the crisis become much uh, bigger than it is right now. So it, he sets a very, very um, contradicting and dangerous example for all Brazilians around the country. And of course, it's not just the example he's setting, which is encouraging people like his supporters to go back to work, to travel around the country, to get out on the street and keep their businesses operating. It's also what he said. And so people inside his own government, including his own health minister, have clashed with President Bolsonaro. He's had huge public spats with a number of state governors. It's a very similar system to the US, where you have a president and then separate states with a huge amount of discretionary powers available to them. A lot of the states in Brazil tried to close things down, institute lockdown measures before the president himself pushed for them. And the consequences in parts of the country where those lockdowns started later are becoming more and more evident as the cases of infected people and the death toll continues rising. Doctors are saying there that Brazil's health care system is just overwhelmed. What changes, what would they actually like to see from the government? Well, there's a lot of history involved in this. Around 80% of the country is a public health care system, 20% is private. A lot of the doctors I said to say, in some ways, it's too late. There's been underinvestment in the health care system mm -hmm. for decades, partly due to corruption, partly due to mismanagement, partly due to you know, political decision making about where to spend money. But right now, they'd like to see a lot more personal protective equipment available to them. They'd like to see the possibility of patients being taken into ICUs in other cities besides the overwhelmed ones like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And they'd really like to see the president make a strong example himself, not have these public disagreements and show people what it means to self-isolate, to make sure the quarantine, the lockdown there in Brazil continues to have an impact. Well, Marx, thanks so much. The coronavirus lockdown is easing in parts of Europe. Austria is allowing some shops to reopen in Italy. Some people are now allowed outside and open air markets are expected to return as well. Spain also permitting some people to go back to work. Sky News national correspondent Alex Rossi has the latest from Barcelona. The lockdown in Spain is slowly being eased. In Madrid, some non-essential workers trudged onto the metro system where they were met by police handing out face masks. The government is allowing people from some sectors like construction, industry and telecommunications back to work. But the stay-at-home orders for most remain in place. The situation we had over the last uh, nine days was much stricter than uh, it were any other country in, in, in Europe. 
And we believe that uh, we should not confront economy and, and health. The coronavirus and the crisis is going to have an enormous uh, hit on the economy. Uh, if there is no activity, there is no taxes, there is no income. The number of deaths every day is still in the hundreds, but over the last week, the grim figures have started to fall. At the emergency response hub in Madrid, they're still dealing with a daily flood of coronavirus calls. I've been working here for 15 years and there's nothing like this. Well, maybe on a plane, plane crash, like uh, 10 years ago, but it just like a puntual moment for one day, two days, but never nothing like this. Across Europe, similar questions are being asked about how to recover from this devastating illness. In Paris, the Eiffel Tower is without visitors. The city is silent. President Emmanuel Macron says the strict measures will hold until at least next month. A partir du 11 mai, from the 11th of May, we will gradually reopen creches, schools, colleges and high schools. This is a priority for me because the current situation is widening inequality. Too many children, especially in working class neighbourhoods and in our countryside, are deprived of school without having access to digital technology and cannot be helped in the same way by parents. The surrealness of the crisis is difficult to comprehend. In Barcelona, iconic sites are deserted and the Ramblas, which is always swollen with throngs of tourists, is empty. This debate about lives versus livelihoods will continue for weeks to come as scientific experts and the government try to balance the public health impact against the damage to the economy. In fact, the reality is that life here, like elsewhere in Europe, is unlikely to normalise for many months. And that means police checkpoints to control movements until most likely a vaccine is found. With an overwhelming demand for medical supplies around the world, countries are turning to China for help. But Europe says some of this imported protective equipment doesn't meet its manufacturing standards. NBC News correspondent Janice Mackey Frere explains. With the virus still spreading across the world, countries have been looking to China to source medical PPE, surgical masks, ventilators, and other pieces of equipment that are essential for healthcare workers. Factories anywhere in the world just can't keep up with demand right now. This is a crucial need for protective gear. Politics have often interfered with access to supplies, and now bureaucracy here in China is making it even harder. Chinese exports of masks and respirators are now hitting long delays after complaints from Europe about quality. You see, with the spike in global demand, companies here went into manufacturing overdrive. You had Foxconn that usually makes iPhones and BYD, an electric car maker, now churning out millions of masks per day. Masks became a part of aid shipments to places like New York. Now, a lot of companies sprung up and it became a bit of a free-for-all, and not all companies were manufacturing to standards. European officials say they found thousands of pieces of PPE that were defective. So, customs regulators here last week ordered a new certification process for all medical supplies for export from China. So that immediately barred a lot of factories that had switched their production from something else. Then, regulators said that every shipment for export was going to be inspected. So now this double regulation here is causing long delays for countries that need these supplies. The U.S. FDA just recently approved Chinese-made masks for medical use. China says that between the 1st of March and the 4th of April, they've exported over 3.8 billion masks and thousands of other pieces of PPE. Now, customs officials here are being pretty vague on how long these delays will be to get to the supplies to where they're needed, and also whether these questions of quality are actually being answered. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads across the country, get expert answers to your questions to help you navigate an uncertain future. Join Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb for a primetime special tonight at 1010 on the networks of NBC News.
If it's digging in on the issues. Let's talk about money and politics. If it's asking the questions you want to ask. How do you reassure those supporters that you will sustain this? Just watch me. If it's navigating the winding road to the White House. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. How do we know who belongs in isolation? What should we be conscious of? What's being worked on today? At a time of national crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. The death toll in New York State, now more than 10,800, and those fatalities are weighing on funeral directors who are also acting as caregivers for the families of the deceased. NBC News' Alexa Liotto has the story. Right now we're seeing record death tolls in New York City. What does that mean for funeral directors in the state and in the city? And we have uh, this incredible amount of volume of death that's taking place right now, and it takes time to treat somebody with dignity and respect after they've passed, uh, to prepare them for a viewing, to bury them properly, to cremate them. The, the sheer volume is just working against us because we don't have enough time. This is, again, really new for people, even just in terms of the pandemic. It's a crisis. It feels very scary, especially in New York City. What's the worst case scenario in the city right now? The worst case scenario is probably playing out right now, um, actually, as we speak. It's just that high number of deaths that are taking place and um, just having the system at its max capacity where it's just really hard to keep up with the number of deaths that are occurring. So what that's causing is when a family member calls a funeral home, many of them are just at capacity right now because they're waiting for the ability to have someone they're helping now be buried or be cremated. What does the strain look like? We have funeral homes that help about 100 families on average a year. Uh, we have some funeral homes in the city who in the last week or so have helped 40, 50, 60 families already. So imagine doing half of your year's business in a week's period of time. What are you hearing from folks that you've either worked with in the past or that, you, um, that your association works with? What are you hearing from folks? I've spoken to a couple of funeral homes recently who say their average day right now is 7 a.m. to 1 a.m., uh, just taking enough time to sleep and rest a little bit. I had one funeral director tell me that he lost 13 pounds um, in the past week just from trying to you know, make sure that he's doing what he's doing for families. And I think the stress of it all is making it that much harder. As of right now, we are only allowed to bring in immediate family members for a private gathering. But when they come in, they have to maintain the six feet social distancing mandates. So it's hard for me to even imagine what a family member is feeling after losing someone. If I was with my sister in a funeral home um, because my mom passed away and I couldn't get close to my sister to hug her, uh, I couldn't imagine. People don't like to talk about death. But we've seen it front and center, unfortunately, in the pandemic. And funeral directors really are that last responder. They are on the front lines right now trying to help families. Um, so I think it's just really important that folks remember that um, when they see somebody who is a funeral director trying to help a family. 
The coronavirus pandemic is creating unimaginable obstacles for families. Some are dealing with economic hardship, others homeschooling issues. To overcome both of those challenges, one family took to the seas. Here's their story. You know, looking at our finances, we realized we're not going to make it unless we turn back to our essential business. So we went back to what we've always done, which is commercial fishing for halibut. Except for now, we go with the, with the whole family. We can either split up or we can stick together. And so we decided to stick together and find a way to bring the whole family to work. Fishing days are long days. So there's times when the wind's not blowing, the fish aren't biting, so the kids run out on deck, get their schoolwork set up on top of the fish box and start doing their worksheets and their flashcards. And then the wind might blow, the fish might start to bite. We put away the school materials and focus on the fishing. The first thing that they've learned on the boat is hard work, unloading fish at the at the wharf for the first time. And Hazel's you know, had to reach into the into the cooler and just dig through the ice, and her fingers were really cold. And she was in a lot of pain, and her eyes filled up with tears. And she's like, "This hurts." And you know, we looked at her and I was like, "I know it does. Hard work sometimes it hurts."